the hair-raising adventures of Sam Spade, detective. Brought to you by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Sam Spade, Detective Agency. It's me, Effie. Oh, Sam, I've been worried about you. Sid Rice was just on the phone, and he says digging up a corpse without a permit is against the law. It's all right, Effie. I just dug him up to say hello and put him back again. Oh, Sam. I'll be down in a couple of minutes to dictate my report, sweetheart. If I get lost on the way, you'll find me in City Hospital, the psycho ward, third straight jacket from the left. <laughs> Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented each week by Wild Root Cream Oil, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that will put your hair back in place again, grooming it neatly, naturally, the way you want it. Fellows... If a girl can spend half an hour under a hot dryer in a beauty parlor to look her best for you, certainly you can spend half a minute sprucing up with Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic to look your best for her. That's all it takes, and Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, the way girls like to see it. Besides, it relieves dryness and removes loose dandruff. There's not a drop of alcohol in Wild Root Cream Oil. It contains lanolin. So get the big economy-sized bottle at your drug or toilet goods counter. And now, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in The Adventures of Sam Spade. Date, August 2nd, 1946. To Mrs. Gregory Denov. Subject... Death of Dr. Denov. I was sitting in my office with nothing to think about except a horse named Corkscrew Jr. My secretary, Effie Perrine, came in and said there was someone outside. I didn't look up from the dope sheet, so she said it again. Someone outside, Sam. What's he look like? Um, blue double-breasted custom-made suit, count of maritai, hand-tailored shirt, English shoes, hand-trimmed Van Dyke. Get me a blank check and send them in. Okay, Sam. Please come in. Mr. Spade will see you now, sir. Thank you. You you are Mr. Spade, Sam Spade. What can I do for you? I'm Dr. Gregory Denov, a psychoanalyst. I I need your help. Lie down, doctor, and tell me all about it. (laughs) I I see you might also be noted for your sense of humor as well as your discretion. Who told you I was discreet? A man named Nicolaitis. Well, you tell Nicolaitis, I think he's cute, too. What else does he say about me? That I can trust you with $10,000. Oh. Is this Mr. Nicolaitis one of your patients? No. No, he isn't. As a matter of fact, he... He's gotten possession of some private records of mine. Well, it's rather involved. Nicolaitis is shaking you down and he picked me as the middleman. Is that it? This is not an ordinary case of blackmail. Blackmail is blackmail, even if you do it in technicolor. Well, as you may know, a psychoanalyst keeps a faithful transcript, a detailed record of everything a patient says during consultation, no matter how intimate or shocking. Yeah. This man, Nicolaitis, has managed to gain possession of a copy of one of these case histories. The patient is a very celebrated person, and should this material be divulged, it may have very serious consequences for both my patient and and for me. Doctor, your best bet's the San Francisco Police Department. No, no, that's out of the question. Then I'm afraid I can't help you. Why not? Nicolaitis said I'm that a private you're... detective. When I take on a client, I take on his troubles. My job is to protect him, not to stand by and see him milked. You want to hire me on that basis, I'll listen. Oh, I'm I'm so tired. I must trust somebody. What can you do for me, Mr. Spade? Write me out a check for $1,000. Got a pen? Yeah. All right. You see, Nicolaitis figures that if I'm getting a cut, I'll have to keep my mouth shut. I'll spend it all the same. Here you are. Thanks. Now, uh, what was the last thing Nicolaitis told you? That he would pick up the $10,000 here and deliver to you this file in question. Can you reach him? Yes. Call him. Tell him you've seen me. Tell him I won't do that kind of business in my office. Tell him to come to your house. I'll be there. What if he refuses? He won't. Tell him I have the whole $10,000. What time? How about in an hour? No, no, I'm sorry. We'll have to make it around three or 
Oh, goodness, I'm late now. I, I really... That's a beautiful watch, Mr. Denno. Yes. Foreign? Uh, yes. May I see it? My watch? Why, oh, really, Mr. Spade, I'm very late. I have so many things to do, and I have to be at the Majestic Theater well before the matinee starts at 2.30. Oh, are you going to see me at 3 o'clock if you're going to the theater? Oh, I'm not going to stay for the performance. Well, Mr. Spade, till 3 o'clock then. Oh, my office is in my apartment. The address is here on my card. It's the penthouse. Penthouse, huh? Okay, doctor, I'll come formal. I'll wear the top to my bathing suit. I left my office around 2.30 and started walking up Knob Hill. The Versailles Apartments, where Denov's place was, took up the whole 300 block, so I didn't have any trouble finding it. I stopped across the street for a minute to get my breath after the uphill climb, mopped my face, and started across. Just as I got to the middle of the street... Packed in so close around, I couldn't see who'd done the Brody, but I had a pretty good idea. The cops had the sidewalk roped off and guards posted at the building entrance. It took me maybe 20 minutes to elbow my way through and show my credentials. Sergeant Levine had the front door, so they let me in. Lieutenant Dundee of Homicide met me at the door of the penthouse. Hiya, Sam. What do you want? I want to see Dr. Denov. The doctor's dead. Dead? Yeah. He's my client. They can't do this to me. How? Hit a Brody out the window? What are you here for? To see his wife. Okay with you? Why not? She's inside. Thanks. <laughs> Mrs. Danoff, please. With all due respect for your grief, I must have the keys to the cabinet where Gregory kept his confidential files. You realize that he wished me to take charge of his patients and that I am responsible. All this police and so on. We must get those files out of here as soon as possible. <clears throat> yes? My name is Spade. I am Dr. Zoya. I was poor Dr. Denov's oldest friend. If there's anything I'd like to I... see you, Mrs. Denov, alone. <laughs> but you police have already asked her so many questions. You see, she's not in the... I'm not with the police. I'm a private detective. I was working for Dr. Denov. A private detective? He was in trouble, you see. You see, Dr. Sawyer, the police won't believe me. Mm. Mr. Spade, you'll tell them. You will tell him he didn't commit suicide. Well, Mrs. Denov, I guess that takes care of everything here. It's clearly suicide. Oh, idiot, blind, stupid idiot. Suicide. Mm. My husband, he treated suicides. He would never... No, please, it will be all right, my dear. I'm sorry. She's hysterical. Yeah. If I had the time, I would... Tell them, tell them. Please, Mrs. Denov. The undertaker has been arranged for a burial at 7 o'clock, Beit Israel Cemetery. Now, please, the key to Gregory's files. Here, take it and go. Go ahead, all of you. Okay, well, we'll not call you later. No, oh, I'm so sorry, gentlemen. This hysteria is simply traumatic condition. If I only had the time. Oh, who can I turn to? Who will help me? You think it's pleasant? You think my husband would rest if they said I committed suicide? What shall I do? What shall I do? What shall I do? Oh, oh you... Dr. Zoya didn't have the time, neither have I. Do you think it's murder? Who do you think killed your husband? To name someone? That's a very serious charge, Mr. Speed. Goodbye, Mrs. Denov. Constance Brent. You mean Constance Brent, the actress? Yes. Yes, she was his last patient this morning. She had threatened to kill him before. How do you know? My husband said so. To you? Well, he, he'd written it down on his notes on her case. Once before, she'd almost pushed him from that same window. How about your husband and Miss Brent? Oh, I knew she was falling in love with my husband. That always happened. They, they call it a transference. But in this your case... Your husband told me Miss Brent was acting in a play this afternoon over at the Majestic. Yes, Midsummer Night's Dream. But she was here. I know she was here. Miss Ray, the receptionist, was coming back from lunch when she heard voices arguing inside. And she was sure it was Miss Brent's voice. Show me the doctor's case history on Miss Brent. I can't. It's missing. As soon as it happened, I went to the files. I meant to show it to the police. Who could have taken it? Constance Brent was the last one in that room before he died. Yeah. When did you see Nicolaitis last? Nick who? Skip it. Uh, where can I reach you in case... For the next couple of hours, I'll be at the Majestic Theater. I want to see how good an actress this Constance Brandt is. Tongue, we will make amends. There 
there long. Else the pop the liar call. So good night unto you all. Give me your hands if we be friends. And Robin shall restore a man. Yes? Miss Constance Brent's dressing room? What do you want? I want to talk to Miss Brent. Well, you can talk to me. I'm her husband. So you're Mr. Brent. I'm Jonathan Wallace. She's Mrs. Wallace. Now, what do you want with my wife? I've come to tell her that Dr. Denhoff is dead. D- uh, are you sure? You try falling from a 12th floor window sometime. Well, that's the best news I've heard this year. I'm afraid it would be a shock for Constance. Maybe, maybe not. She was the last person to see him alive, as far as anybody can make out. Uh, are you from the police? No, uh... I'm from the insurance company. Claims investigator. What do you want to see Constance for? The policy wasn't made out to her, was it? No, made out to his widow. But she can't collect. Police say it was suicide. <gasps> that settles it. This is the last time I play Titania. Stand around while Puck talks his head off. Who is this person? Darling, I'm afraid this is going to be a shock. This man is from an insurance company. Dr. Denov is dead. Oh, what a pity. What happened? The police say he jumped. His wife says he was pushed. She also says that you, Miss Brent, might have been the pusher. Oh, now, really, it's too absurd. How like a wife. What time did your play start this afternoon, Miss Brent? Matinee at 2.30. Always. Always. And the late lamented Dr. Denov jumped at 3 o'clock. I didn't say he did. Doesn't this news, uh, shock you? But of course. Do you think good psychoanalysts are easy to find? Looks like your next doctor will have to start from scratch. Your case history seems to be missing from Dr. Denhoff's files. Missing? No. Where is it? Has a man named Nicolaitis been in touch with you? I've never heard of him. Chances are you will. Does he have Dr. Denhoff's notes on my case? Could be. <gasps> this is frightful. Hot reading, huh? You seem to know this person, Nicolaitis. Get that file for me and I'll pay you well for it. Just a minute, my lovely Titania. We we don't know who this man really is. He might even be Nicolaitis himself. Let me see your company credentials. Now, what do you know? Somebody picked my pocket. My wallet's gone. I thought so. All right, you tell me who you are. I'll call the police. Oh, no, no, Jonathan. No police. Let's get off the merry-go-round. My name is Spade. You'll find me in the phone book under S. My office is open until 6 o'clock. And if a man answers, don't hang up. It'll be me. <laughs> Hello, Effie. Hmm? You found a Nicolaitis yet? Not one. I even tried spelling it backwards. <sighs> Nobody ever heard of a man named Nicolaitis. I'm beginning to think there ain't no such person. Pardon me. Uh, do I hear my name mentioned? I'm Nicolaitis. Sam, I still think you're right. Come all the way in, Mr. Nicolaitis. Sit down. Oh, thank you. If you need me, Sam, just scream. What can I do for you? Oh, I've come for my money. What money? Well, the $10,000, you remember the $10,000? Refresh my memory. Oh, Dr. Denhoff, the gentleman who visited you this morning? Oh, uh, that $10,000. Oh, you see, you see, you remember now. Yeah, yeah, it all comes back to me now. Uh, you were supposed to deliver something for the money. I think Dr. Denhoff is dead. That is no longer important. You will give me the money, please, and I will not disturb your afternoon any further. Suppose I refuse. Oh, that would grieve me. In my grief, there is no telling what I might do. Dr. Denhoff's dead. There's nothing more you can do to hurt him. Oh, never would I attempt to hurt poor Dr. Denhoff. But in my sorrow, it would be so great if I should be forced to hurt the woman he loved. After all, as Titania says, these are the forgeries of jealousy. Sonia, huh? Ah, yes, uh, Midsummer Night's Dream, Act 1, Scene 18. <laughs> I'm a little rusty on my Shakespeare. Oh, you are indeed, Mr. Spade. Titania doesn't appear until well into Act 2. She doesn't, huh? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah. I guess she isn't on for 40 minutes or so. Yes, indeed, Mr. Spade, but I didn't come here to discuss drama. What else have you got to discuss? When Dr. Dunhoff died, your market died with him. That is a very unprogressive view, Mr. Spade. There's always a gentleman named Jonathan Wallace. Why, you fiend. 
You don't mean you've sold to both of us. Mr. Spade, how can you have such a low opinion of me? I will prove my integrity. I will give you the material. You give me the money. Hand it over. In the Levant, Mr. Spade, we have a saying. He who goes too close to the bear soon loses his beard. I have left my beard at home. Okay, I'll meet you anywhere you say, anytime you say. Excellent. At seven in your apartment, hmm? Won't that be walking into the bear's cave? In the Levant, Mr. Spade, we have a saying. Private dicks do not kill people in their own apartments. It was then 6 p.m. I called Effie for messages. She told me that you had been phoning frantically, Mrs. Denov. I still had maybe 30 minutes before Nicolaitis was due at my apartment, so I breezed on up to your place on the hill. We had a very interesting chat, uh, remember, Mrs. Denov? Looking back on it, that was probably the most interesting conversation we had. Funny, I can't remember much of anything you said, but it was so uh, cozy there in your place. And what with your clock being about 20 minutes slow, it must have been something like half past seven before I left you. I grabbed a cab and told the hacky to step on it. I hope Nicolaitis was still waiting at my apartment. He was. Mr. Nicolaitis, I'm sorry to be late. He was lying on my bathroom floor. The little guy was looking just about as natty as when he'd been in my office, except that the beautiful silk scarf he'd been wearing was twisted into a tight noose around his neck. Mr. Nicolaitis was a very dead blackmailer. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the fourth in a new series of programs bringing to the air for the first time the adventures of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Men at the racetrack, the man who has something better than a mere hunch is said to have it straight from the horse. Of course, that's a humorous expression, but it shows how to get facts, go straight to the real source of information. And that's why we went straight to hundreds of men in metropolitan New York to find out what men really want in a hair tonic. And their answers show that Wild Root Cream Oil has all five advantages chosen by this impartial consumer jury of men. One... Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, never leaves it sticky or greasy. Two, Wild Root Cream Oil relieves annoying dryness. Three, it removes loose dandruff. Four, it's non-alcoholic. And five, it contains soothing lanolin. Remember, no other leading hair tonic gives you all five of these important advantages. Is it any wonder that four out of five users in a nationwide test preferred Wild Root Cream Oil to all other hair tonics they'd tried? So next time you visit your barber, ask for Wild Root Cream Oil. And get the big economy-sized bottle of Wild Root Cream Oil at your drug or toilet goods counter. And now, back to Sam and Psyche. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. His eyes were open, and he seemed to be looking right at me as I bent over him. The finger marks in his throat were too blotchy to be of any use. Pretty soon, Lieutenant Dundee and Sergeant Polehouse came in and walked over behind me. We all stood there for a second, and then Polehouse bent down and closed those eyes. You know him, Sam? His name is Nicolaitis. That's all I know about him. What did he come here to your place for? I don't know. You invited him? I wouldn't have been surprised to find him here, but not like this. You boys got a smear on him yet? Sure, he's an old customer of mine. Runs a photo lab. Photostats, microfilm. Microfilm. Nobody makes any sense. They're all screwballs, psychos, neurotics. What am I doing in the middle of this anyway? Sam, don't scream at us. We're just doing a job. Oh, I'm sorry, boys. This Dr. Denov was my client. Man, and I was... expert. That Denov probably had a screw loose somewhere and needed a psychoanalyst himself. Say, maybe he was... Yeah. Yeah. Hey, look, Dundee. Hmm? I'm going out of here now. 
Do I call Sid Weiss and we go through all that again, or are you going to let me walk? Why, Sam, you can go. I know where you sleep. I'll wake you when I'm ready for you. Well, Mr. Spade? I want some answers, Dr. Zoya, and you're the guy who can give them to me. I'm listening. Just let the questions flow into your mind and do not try to repress any of them. Speak instantly, whatever... Okay, question number one, without thinking. Do you think Dr. Denhoff was a suicide? Well, I had not seen Dr. Denhoff for many years. He had been my student in Vienna. I was his analyst, in fact. That's all very interesting, Doctor, but my question... Yes, yes, sir. Did poor Dr. Denhoff commit suicide? I have reviewed all the material, manifest and hypothetical, and I came to the conclusion... No. No, it was quite impossible. You see, these paranoid... Okay, question number two. Was uh, Dr. Denhoff in love with Constance Brent? I suppose I can now answer that question. When I arrived in San Francisco, I found him in great distress. He told me he feared he was losing his objectivity towards this patient. In other words, he was in love with her? Yes. You think she might have murdered him? All psychoanalytical subjects develop aggressive feelings toward the doctor... Nearly all of my patients have threatened me at one time or another. You don't say. Uh, tell me, Dr. Zoe, you know anything about Jonathan Wallace, Miss Brent's husband? A violent type, almost psychotic. Yeah? How about you, uh, Dr. Zoe, yeah? Could you have done it? That is a most interesting question, Mr. Spade. When I arrived here from Vienna without funds, dependent on the kindness of my former students, I must confess that I felt a certain antagonism. It disturbed me to realize that a man of my standing in the profession should have been dependent on the goodwill of a younger and, (laughs) I sincerely believe, less gifted man. However, I overcame this, and I didn't kill him. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, yeah, Doctor, thanks a lot. <laughs> oh, peep, peep. Uh, truly a life study. <laughs> there is no accounting. <laughs> For instance, Dr. Denoff. He came to me only this afternoon with the strangest request. Yeah. He gave me the gold watch, the gold watch which I had presented to him many years ago upon his graduation in Vienna. He had a patient waiting and so had not much time to explain. Where is this watch? Please, I'm coming to that. He asked me to promise that I would have the watch buried with him if something should happen. That has been done. But Dr. Denhoff just died at three o'clock. It is a mosaic law that the deceased be buried before sundown. Uh Uh-huh. Thanks, Doctor. Thanks a lot. Hmm. I hope I've been of some help. Doctor, you'll never know how much you've helped me. Who is it? Spade. What's happened? I think I got the answers, Mrs. Denhoff. That file on Constance Brent. Your husband knew that you'd been going through it. Mr. Spade... Shut up and listen to me. He took it out of the files, had it microfilmed for his own private records, and destroyed the original. Really? The man who did the microfilming was Nicolaitis. He delivered one print to your husband and kept another for himself. He was murdered in my apartment for the copy he used to shake down your husband. The killer now has that copy, if it hasn't already been destroyed. But we can still put our hands on the first strip of microfilm which you delivered to your husband. This is astonishing. How? It's in the gold watch which was buried with him. Uh, Oh, the the watch that Dr. Zoya... That's right. Denhoff made up his mind that whatever he knew about Constance Brent was going to go to the grave with him. What are you doing tonight? Uh, Nothing. And we got a date, sweetheart, you and I. I'll be back toward the wee hours. All paths lead to the grave. Ophelia, Act 6. Gregory's grave? But shouldn't we get a court order and have it done properly? The courts don't open until 10 in the morning, sweetheart, and Lieutenant Dundee's going to start asking me some questions about that stuff in my apartment before then. 
You see, baby, I can't wait. Mr. Spade, we shouldn't be doing this. If I'm wrong this time, it won't be wasted effort. I'll crawl into the grave myself and pull it in after. Here. I struck it. Give me that crowbar, Mrs. Denhoff, quick. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Put that flashlight in, sweetheart. You look the other way. Yeah. Yeah, here it is. Look. What, Mr. Speed? What have you got? The watch. Here, put the flash on it while I open it. Here's my nail file. Pry off the back. Thanks. That does it. Here's, here's, here's the film. All right, Mr. Spade. Give me that film. It wasn't the second grave digger from Hamlet, Mr. Constance Brent. Stop clowning and hand it up to me. You better do as he says, Mr. Spade. We both got guns. I was expecting that. It took you a long time to get here, Mr. Wallace. How did dear Constance make out as Lady Macbeth? Just give me that film. Stop being an idiot, Wallace. The cemetery is crawling with cops. Put that gun away before you drop it and break your foot. Come up out of that grave, Spade, or you'll stay there forever. Okay, Dundee. All right, all right. Get those hands up, everybody. Go ahead, Dundee. Make the pinch. Okay. Sam Spade, I arrest you for body snatching violation of graves under the civil code number... No, you fool. You're supposed to arrest Mrs. Gregory huh? Denov and Jonathan Wallace for the murder of Gregory Denov and Pericles Nicolaitis. But I... Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, I... No, you don't! I... It was smart of you, Mrs. Denov, to make me late for my appointment with Nicolaitis. You did that so that Wallace could nail him in my apartment for the microfilm. You thought you could use that film to pin Denov's murder on Constance Brent. But after your late husband caught you tampering with his files, he added a few well-chosen words to it so that the film put the finger on you and your boyfriend, Mr. Wallace, in case anything happened to the doctor. So Wallace had to kill Nicolaitis. You weren't smart to push your husband out the window. That looked like suicide. You might have gotten away with it, Mrs. Denov, if you'd bashed your husband's head in with a bottle. Uh, that reminds me, Effie, pour me a drink that all? Sign it, put a special delivery on it, and send it care of the matron to Hatchapi Prison. Go on, have one yourself. Oh, thank you. Here's how. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. You'll get used to it. <laughs> Good night, Sam. <laughs> Good night, sweetheart. <laughs> Wild Root Cream Oil presents The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective produced and directed by William Spear. Men, on these warm August days, the sun beats down on your hair, may leave it looking dry and brittle. That's why, now especially, you need Wild Root Cream Oil. This grand non-alcoholic hair tonic has just what it takes for summer grooming. It contains lanolin, the soothing oil that's so much like the oil of your skin. Wild Root Cream Oil keeps your hair neatly in place, gives it the handsome, successful look that helps you get ahead on the job. And Wild Root Cream Oil removes loose, ugly dandruff and actually relieves annoying dryness. So tonight, take the famous FN test. Check your scalp. Signs of dryness or loose dandruff tell you, you need Wild Root Cream Oil right away. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Fred Essler was Dr. Zoya. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. Don't forget, next Friday, the three masters of the art of hair-raising, Dashiell Hammett, William Spear, and Wild Root Cream Oil, join forces to bring you another hair-raising adventure with Sam Spade. Smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too, for quick, good grooming and to relieve dryness between permanents. Mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. Dick Joy speaking. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Sam State Detective Agency. Ahoy! It's me. Just came ashore. From what? A boat? A ship, Effie. A ship. Anything over 400 gross tons is a ship. Anybody knows that. Well, may I inquire what was your port of call? Calcutta. 
My, that was a quick trip. Well, Effie, I'll tell you. I got so homesick for you, I couldn't stand it, so I assembled my gear and jumped ship. Why, Sam, how sweet. How fast there, gal. I'll be right down to dictate my report. <laughs> Alive. Bon voyage, Effie. I've been worried sick. Where have you been? On my way to Calcutta, sweetheart, where the dawn comes up like thunder. Hey, what are you talking about? Calcutta? And the flying fishes play. Ready, Effie? Sam, why did you want to go to Calcutta of all places? I didn't, Effie. I hate Calcutta. I was Shanghai. <sighs> to, uh, Mr. Philip J. Fogg, purser, S.S. Lurine. How do you spell that, Sam? L-U-R-E-N-E. Oh, that's pretty. Sam, how could you be shanghai in this day and age? I mean, isn't it against the law? Stow it, Effie. You're pumping bilge water. Sam, I am not. From Samuel Spade, license number 137596, when you have the time, regarding the Calcutta trunk caper. Dear Mr. Fogg, the following report will explain the enclosed voucher, which is a claim against your company for the amount of $500 and no cents. It will also answer any questions you might be asked concerning the recent unpleasantness on board your ship. It all started yesterday morning in San Francisco when my secretary announced briefly and caustically that there was a lady outside who wanted to talk to me. I judged that she was worth talking to. She was. Your secretary let me in. Well, I'm glad she did. What can I do for you? I'm Marsha Hopkins. I see. Mrs. Marsha Hopkins. I see. However, my husband is dead. I see. It's about my sister that I've come to you, Mr. Spade. I'm dreadfully worried about her. Uh, who's your sister? Miss Constance Pendleton. And she's become involved with a, a ne'er-do-well, a completely worthless scoundrel and a real foreign bluebeard. All three? It's one man, Mr. Spade, a Bulgarian, Major Andrea Rodnik. They're going to be married this afternoon, and I'm positive that his only interest is in her money. I'm convinced that he's going to kill her soon after the ceremony. He's done it to other wives in Europe. I've warned Constance and pleaded with her, done everything I could to stop it. But she's completely infatuated with him and refuses to listen to me. Mm -hmm. now, what do you want me to do? Prevent the marriage if you can. Get the truth about Rodnik's background and face Constance with it. Oh, Mr. Spain, in some way you've got to make her realize the seriousness of the situation. He's a ruthless character. <clears throat> well, do what I can, Mrs. Hopkins. Oh, thank you, Mr. Spade. Oh, I've felt so alone and helpless uh, until now. Oh, really? But you will do everything you can, won't you? We've got to save her life. She daubed at her eyes with a stamp-sized handkerchief, patted the red-gold hair of the temples nervously, smiled at me bravely, and swayed out. By telephone, I learned that the Vrodnik Pendleton marriage license had been issued four days before, and that on the same day, Constance Pendleton had withdrawn a savings account to the tune of $45,000. I'd always wanted to, so I did it. I uh, called at the Bulgarian consulate. What can I do on you? What do you know about Major Andrea Vrodnik? Huh? Andrea Vrodnik? On him we have hate, great sadness, with shame for the ground that walked under him. Oh? Ha! Huh? Andrea Vrodnik? Uh, why is he so popular? On the devil he is driven without horns. Six women he has killed. Six times he has insulted the police of Europe by refusing to confess. We have proof of the matters, but never can we prove the proof on him. Yeah, sometimes it goes that way. <laughs> Never do we find the bodies of the six women. Only their money in the name of Andrea Vrodnik. <laughs> My pardon. Well, think nothing of it. You're, uh, you're just upset uh, on you. You're interested on him. Why? You go to Europe? No, uh, Vrodnik comes here. <laughs> here? Here on San Francisco? He marries again? So I'm told. <laughs> Oh, by all the means, you must prevent it. Go to him, brave man. You do the world a service. Make violence on him. Even do you hang for it, your name will live. The 
with those valiant words goading me on, I left. The farther I got into the caper, the more it looked as if Marsh's fears for Constance Pendleton were very real and very well-founded. When uh, Constance opened the door of her hotel suite, I could see three trunks and a number of smaller pieces of luggage, all locked and ready to be taken out. Yes? Hey, Constance Pendleton? Yes? Uh, I'm a detective. My name is Spade. Detective? What do you want? I, uh, want to talk to you about that bluebeard you're going to marry. Get out of here. Uh, you listen, I'll talk, and then I'll get out of here. I just left the Bulgarian consulate. Vrodnik has been accused of the murders of six women in Europe. Each of them were wealthy. Each of them married him, and each time Vrodnik came into all their money. Are you trying to blackmail me because of the lies about my fiancé's past? If you are, you're wasting your time. Well, no matter what I'm doing, I'm wasting my time. But to put you straight, your sister hired me, and I am now resigning. She's worried about you, not me. Then you should spend more time investigating your clients, Mr. Spade. You could have saved both of us some time. I have no sister. This is my wedding day. Goodbye, Mr. Spade. As I left the room, I maintained the stern facial expression I reserved for moments of great shock. But once outside the door, I allowed myself to be carried on the wave of rage and embarrassment for just a minute. And I kicked over two potted palms. As I uh, limped down the corridor, I was overtaken by none other than Marcia Hopkins. Did you see her? Let's talk about you first. Did you stop the marriage? Why did you really want that marriage stopped? But I told you. You told me you were her sister. Oh. She said she didn't have any sister. All right, Sam, I did lie to you about that. But I'll tell you who I really am. I don't want to know who you are. I don't ever want to know. All I want from you is my honestly earned fee and a brief but permanent goodbye. Oh, no, Sam, please listen to me. We've got to save that girl. I have $500. That's all I have. Would it be enough? What's your real name? Marshal Brodnick. Yes, he's my husband. I've been married to him for ten years. We've traveled all over Europe, and I never knew where the money was coming from. He left me at times for two weeks or a month, and then when he'd come back, there'd be more money. I just realized that that's when he must have been killing those poor women. And I know that's what he's going to do this time. I just can't stand it. You've got to protect her. That should be easy. We'll let him get married and meet him at the door with a bigamy warrant. Then you will see me through this. I might. Oh. In my bag, there's $500. Take it. If we can't stop the marriage, then don't let him out of your sight. Not even for a minute. He's a beast, Sam. A beast. Marcia dropped me in front of the Beast's Hotel, and I climbed some fake marble steps to the second floor and knocked at his door. The man who opened it was heavy, handsome, in a swarthy, coarse sort of a way, and glowing conceit through two eyes, one monocled, one not. You are facing Major Andrei Vrodnik, first Bulgarian horse. What want you? You are facing Saul Fox of the law firm of Fox, Smedley, Van Dusen, and Grip. You overwhelmed yourself. I came here to warn you. If you go through with a marriage to Constance Pendleton, you're going to find yourself tangled with civil law. Warn Andrei Vrodnik, who has personally led more saber charges than you have teeth in your skull. Yes. Who has personally split, slashed, and impaled on his own blade more men than you have fingers and toes. You warn me. What is this talk? You're going to have a bigamy charge slapped on you five minutes after you slip her the ring. The warrant signed by Mrs. Marsha Vrodnik. Bigamy. <laughs> I laugh. This is not bigamy. Marsha's your wife, isn't she? That bigamy was committed when I married her. I had another wife then. You call yourself a lawyer, then you know that only the second marriage is bigamy. The ones following that are nothing, nothing but interludes. Okay, Major, go ahead and have your interlude. I'm just warning you. Who speaks? We are being married on Redwood City from a justice of the peace one hour previous. Then we are sailing through the SS Lurin at midnight with our honeymoon. Already a droshky awaits for the baggage and luggage. Go now before I'm losing my temper. If you're ever in Calcutta, look me up. Da! I could see the direct approach was getting me nowhere, so I decided to proceed by stealth. I waited outside the building, and when he left, I tailed him. He made four stops. At a second-hand store, a hardware store, a surgical supply house, and an undertaker supply house. 
At these places, he purchased the following items. An oversized steamer trunk, black with brass fittings, a large ball of rope twine, two large lead sash weights, a set of surgical instruments, and at the fourth and final stop, the undertaking supply, he bought two items, a 20-foot length of rubber tubing and a pump. He returned to the second-hand store with his other purchases, put them inside the trunk and ordered it sent up to Constance's hotel immediately, and thereupon, it took himself to the same place. Marsha was waiting in the empty lobby when he went in. I crouched behind a pillar, turned up my hearing aid, and listened. Did you get the thing? Yes. Now listen, my darling, we must work fast. As soon as the trunk arrives, before she has a chance to get to the telephone... Yes, Andre, but please, no cutting in the apartment. (laughs) As you wish, my darling. Now, you know, you know what you have to do. While yes, I'm getting her into the trunk, you'll change her clothes, put on her traveling dress, the hat with the wet. What is it? What's the matter? Nothing, nothing. Come, we must make haste. They made haste to the elevators, and I made haste to the row of house telephone booths around the corner and called Constance's room. Hello? Mrs. Rodney? Speaking. Listen, get out of that room right away. Don't take the elevator. Go down the stairs. Who is this? W- what are you talking about? I haven't got time to explain, and you haven't got time to listen. All those stories about your husband are true. He's going... Hello? Hello? Are you still on the line? My hand clawed out Hello? to the door handle, but I couldn't reach it. I felt as if the walls were closing in around me, and just Can before it got dark, I had the crazy there? notion that I was inside Brodnick's big Anybody black trunk with the brass fittings. I could still hear Constance's voice way off in the distance, somewhere in the direction of Calcutta. I tried to shout to her, to warn her, and then the lid closed over me. I shook my head trying to get the bells out of it. Then I remembered where I was and what had happened. I was still wedged into the bottom of the phone booth where I'd slumped when Brodnick sat me. I got out of there somehow and grabbed a taxi for the Embarcadero. The time was 11.55. The SS Lorraine was scheduled to sail at midnight. I was no sooner across it than they hauled up the gangplank and the ship started moving out of the berth. I didn't know where she was bound for and I didn't much care. I checked the passenger list and found that Major and Mrs. Andrea Brodnick were in stateroom 12, A deck. One minute later, I was hammering on the door of stateroom 12. The woman in Brodnick's stateroom was Constance and she was not in a trunk. I thought I told you to stop interfering in our affairs. Yeah, your husband told me to, but I didn't like the way he did it. Get out from here, get out. I see you got your trunk in here where it's handy. Doesn't it make the stateroom kind of crowded? Why don't you give up, Mr. Spade? Two times already, you are twice a fool. Marcia has no money to pay you, neither have I, even if she had the case. And believe me, she has not. Oh, why do you even bother talking to him, Andre? Mr. Well, Spade, will you go now, or will I have to call the steward and make a complaint against you? I went. I still thought Marsha Hopkins was somewhere on that ship. I still didn't like the look of that trunk. I found the purse's office and went in. You looked at me as if you thought I was a stowaway, Mr. Fogg, and you were right. Well, I'll have to make arrangements for you to ride back with a pilot, Mr. Spade. You realize, of course, that you're subject to a fine. Look, I don't want to do anything illegal. You know, it was uh, just an impulsive thing. Uh, couldn't I book a passage? Oh, well, there's a the matter of your passport. Could arrange a visa and so on in St. Pedro. We'll put in there in the morning. Well, that's good enough. Uh, how much is the fare? Oh, let me see. That's four hundred and eighty-three dollars and eighty-seven cents, exclusive of tax. Oh, hey, now, wait. I wasn't thinking of taking quite such an extensive voyage. You know, I just wanted to get a little sea air. And uh, how much to Pedro? Well, I'm afraid you don't understand, Mister Spade. This is not a coastwise steamer. Our first official port of call is Calcutta. Yeah, I know, but Calcutta. That's in India. But, uh, uh, don't you have something a little less expensive, like, uh, steerage or, uh... There is only one stateroom available, number 14A deck. Take it or leave it. Okay, okay, Calcutta. (laughs) 
After buying my passage to Calcutta, I had exactly 12 cents left. This I gave to the steward who showed me to my stateroom. He uh, thanked me, kicked me in the shins, and left. Out on deck, a tall, red-nosed old gentleman in knickerbockers and a yachting cap was taking a turn around the deck. With him was a face I'd seen in the morning lineup down at the Hall of Justice a dozen times. He was a hotel thief by profession, name of Norman Gorman. He knew me, too, but he didn't give me a tumble. I fell into step with him. Ah, see ya. <laughs> Nothing like it, am I right? <laughs> yeah, I guess it's okay, but there's so much of it. Ah, uh, brisk, bracing, salt spray. Nothing like it. <laughs> yeah. Whoa. Uh, hey, Norman, my lad. <laughs> I hate it. I hate boats. Suppose there was a fire on board. Fire? Oh, ridiculous. Uh, this your first voyage to the Orient? Yeah. Uh, the inscrutable East. You've made this trip before? Oh, yes, indeed. I've worked this line. I, I mean, uh, yes, indeed. I make this voyage very often. Business interest out in India. Tea, you know. Runs in my family. Sturgis's golden orange in the little yellow package. Ever tried it? Uh, no, I never indulge. Huh? Don't drink tea. That's ridiculous. Commodore, I need a drink. I ain't happy. Suppose there was a fire on board here. Ah. Well, let's all have a drink. Yeah, suppose there was Shall a fire. Shall we? Come on, I'll shut you to a drink, sir. Uh, not me, Commodore. I, uh, just remember this is Fire Prevention Week. The nearest fire alarm to Brodnick's stateroom was on the companionway leading to the A-deck corridor. It was a glass-enclosed box with a small hammer hanging on a chain. I broke the glass and turned the key. In three seconds flat, the entire population of A-deck were shoving each other up the companionway, grabbing for life preservers as they went. The steward, hammered on the door of stateroom 12, opened it, shouted inside, and Brodnick and Constance reluctantly came out. I ducked inside, grabbed the handle of the trunk, and started dragging it. When I got it into my stateroom, I broke the lock and lifted the lid. It was Marsha, all right. There was just time to see that before the stateroom door flew open and the ship's officer stuck I, his head in. I didn't move you, didn't you? The alarm? Why, uh, no, I didn't. What's wrong? Never mind that. Here, take this life preserver. Get going Okay, now. okay. On. Don't touch me. It makes me nervous. Twenty minutes later, the captain announced to the mob up on the deck that it was a false alarm, and the passengers drifted back to their cabins. I tried to look casual as I unlocked my stateroom door and walked in. Then I stopped trying. The trunk was still there, but the lid was standing open, and it was empty. I went down to B deck and found the cabin occupied by Norm and the Commodore. That door was locked, so I kicked it in. You could still see the marks on her wrists and ankles with a cord. It was the girl I had seen in the trunk. It was Marsha Hopkins. And she was very much alive. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought it was... Oh, oh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? You've got to help me, Sam. Why should I help you? He's crazy. They're both crazy. It all depends on who's in the trunk, doesn't it, Marsha? When it was Constance, you didn't think he was so crazy. Oh, don't you understand? I had to pretend that I'd help him. He was going to kill her right there in the hotel room. I told him it was too dangerous. If anybody looked in the trunk, it would be safer if she was in there alive. We finally agreed and said he'd wait until we got out to sea to kill her. And then he was... Yeah, I know to... about that. Well, the idea was so awful, I, I couldn't stand it. I started to scream, and then he stuffed the gag in my mouth and tied me up. He must have used chloroform or something, because the next thing I knew, I, I was in the trunk. And that little dark man was leaning over me. He and that old man with the knickers. They brought me here. <laughs> so they pulled a switch on you. You were the fall gal all along. Oh, you've got to believe me. It was the only way I could save her life. You're the only one I can turn to, Sam. That little thief and the old man, they'd deliver me dead if there was an extra $25 in it. Oh, say you'll help me, Sam. Please say it. When you ask me like that, what, what else can I say? Oh, you do believe me, darling. You do believe me. Come on, let's get out of here. I'm sorry, Mr. Spade. Please step back inside. <clears throat> I promised my associate, Mr. Gorman, that I would not allow this young lady to risk her life by leaving this cabin. You're getting into this cave at the wrong end, Commodore. It's wound up. They've bungled it. It's no good anymore. You may be right. 
But you understand my position, sir. I can't take any chances. You've, uh, talked to Mr. Gorman? Norm? Yeah, I talked to him. He took you into his confidence? Stop making with the pistol, Commodore. You don't know how to use it anyway. Oh, heavens, Norm. You're, you're as white as a sheet. What is it? Oh, he, he's sick. Go, go get a doctor. Yes, yes, indeed. Right away. Listen, Spade. Take her with you. Get out of here. I don't want no part of this. You got it bad, Norm. I'm sick, I tell you. The way I had it sized, this was a clean caper, a snatch. I figured the dame here's an heiress or something. Maybe they drop her off in L.A., correct some, connect some ransom and go on. I, I figured there was enough for all of us. Oh, but that creep, that Rodnick, he's crazy. He's a regular Jack the Ripper. Stop babbling, Norm. Tell me what happened, exactly what happened. I get a sinking feeling in my stomach every time I think about it. Well, I go in, see? He's very smooth, very businesslike. He offers me a drink. I accept it. He mixes a couple of highballs for me and the dame, then he starts talking. I guess she don't know all about it before this, because she gets just sick as I do. First, I think he's kidding. Then he drags out this set of cutlery like a doctor uses to operate on people. Only he's got something else in mind. The portal, you understand? Oh, please. I don't want to hear anymore. Being as it's you he has in mind, I don't blame you. My, my stomach. Hey, Norm. Norm. Oh. Here he is, the ship surgeon. Uh, oh, dear me. What? 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 Uh, stand away from him, please. Help me get him into the bunk. Sure, Doctor. Uh, take the shade off that light, please. Ah, uh, yes, yes. He's dead, isn't he? Oh, yes, he's dead, of course. Who poisoned him? I didn't waste any time answering him. I grabbed him by the arm. Before he could object, I was pushing him up the companionway to A deck. It was probably too late to save Constance's life if she'd drunk the same poison, and I was pretty sure she had, but if I was going to nail him for the murder of Constance, I had to get there before the evidence vanished. We got there just in time. I don't need to tell you what we saw, and I'd rather not. Brodnick rose slowly to his feet, clicked his heels military fashion, and bowed very low. Ah, the ship's surgeon. How opportune. Perhaps you could advise me, Doctor. After all, I am, in all honesty, even still a mere amateur at this sort of thing. After Vrodnik had been taken into custody, we took another turn around the deck. It was daylight, and the ship was lying to off San Pedro. This time, the fresh air really felt good. And so did Marcia. It's all over, Sam. Yes, sweetheart. It's all over. But not between us. Say it, Sam. Say it's not all over between us. How can it be? I knew it. I knew you felt the same way. All my life before, it's been like a terrible nightmare. It never really happened. But it did happen, sweetheart. Oh, but you can forget it, darling. Can't you? Please forget it. I'd like to, Marcia. I really would. Hold me close, Sam. Never let me go. You're beautiful. Is that all, Sam? Nothing else? Yeah. Lots else. That's why I think we better say goodbye right now. Because when I feel like this, I get foolish. And if I get foolish with you, I'm likely to wake up in a trunk someplace. That, Mr. Fogg, is the true account of the Calcutta trunk caper. As my voyage was interrupted through no fault of my own, I trust you will advise your company to refund my passage minus the one-way trip to San Pedro. Uh, period, and a report. Sam Spade is played by Howard... The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective, brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. The non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Sam Spade Detective Agency. Me, sweetheart. Oh, Sam, I got it. Got what, my pet? A bank book, Sam. Well, you must advertise in the lost and found right away, Effie, and find the owner. 
There might be sickness in the family. Oh, but it's your bank book, Sam. What? Uh Uh-huh, it has your name on it. Samuel Spade, account number four. It's a forgery. Somebody's trying to pin something on me. Lock it up and don't touch it until I get there. Oh, all right. Did you make a lot of money on this one, too? Got the check right in my pocket, 500 bucks. Oh, Sam, we're making more money than a movie star. Well, almost. And all honestly, too. (laughs) 600 last week and 500 this week. Yeah, how about that? And life gives a three-page spread to I Spy Molten. But uh, we mustn't let it turn our heads, Effie. No. We gotta stay in there pitching. I'll be right down to pitch my report on the Adam Fig caper. I shall have it. America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. You've heard the saying, you never know until you try. Well, you'll never know how handsome your hair can look until you try Wild Root Cream Oil. See for yourself how neatly and naturally Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair. Note how effectively it relieves annoying dryness and removes loose, ugly dandruff. You can get Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic in either the big economy-sized bottle or the handy tube. Or you can ask your barber to use it on your hair. But by all means, try it. Don't delay. Get it today. Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in The Adventures of Sam Spade. Hmm? Oh, you're going to love it. Well, we got to watch these expenses, Effie. You know, there's always something. Yes, but this will be saving. It saves confusion and saves fretting. Mm-hmm. Now, this gadget here, what is it? It's a mineral robot. <coughs> a what about? It's for busy men like yourself, Sam, so you don't have to burden your mind with petty details. You see, it has this dial on it, yeah. right here. And you drop these little cards in this slot. Mm-hmm. You don't have to worry about that. That's for me to take care of. Oh, good. Then, when you come into the office, and supposing you have an appointment with Mr. Jones at 2 o'clock, and you forgot about it, you just dial 2 o'clock, and the little card pops out. And it says, Mr. Jones on it. How do I remember to dial 2 o'clock? Oh. Well, maybe it's in the instruction book. But anyway, now go ahead, Sam, please. The card's right in there. Now, dial 2 o'clock. Go on, Sam. Well, let's see, uh... It's like a telephone, Sam. Uh-huh. Now what do I do? Well, give it time, Sam. It's thinking. Must have forgotten. Uh, Jones. Mr. Jones. Ooh. Effie, do you think it's dead? Oh, Sam, I don't understand it. It was working perfectly. Well, I'll take it straight back first thing in the morning. You'll have to. It'll never find the way itself. <laughs> You got your book, sweetheart? Yes, Sam. I, I don't understand. It was working perfectly. Well, that's all right, honey. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Date, October 5, 1947, to Hillary Exxon Esquire from Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Oh, Sam, oh, honey, it's only a memo robot. <laughs> Subject, the Adam Fig caper. Dear Mr. Exxon... October 2nd in San Francisco was one of those days that you see blown off the calendar by a gust of wind in the movies to denote the time is passing. It was a day for scraping off the minutes with a fingernail file and wondering whether the display ad I'd paid for in the classified section of the phone book wasn't just a waste of money. It certainly wasn't the day I'd expect a leprechaun to walk into my office. He uh, said his name was Adam Fake. He said he was the butler at Exxon Manor in Los Nidos. The limousine, Mr. Spade, is waiting to take you away. We mustn't keep them waiting, must we? Of course we mustn't. Uh, who mustn't we? Why, Mr. Hillary, of course, sir. Oh, Mr. Hillary. And old Mr. Exxon. Mm. The old gentleman is very ill. Uh, Dr. Feige's office is down the hall. Turn to your right, second door. Well, I assure you, sir, that Mr. Exxon is the best of medical care. Your duty will be simple, to prevent his death. Uh, do I donate blood or just frighten away the evil spirits? Oh, it isn't quite that, sir. Someone is trying to kill Mr. Exxon. He's a very sick man, and I'm sure he'd prefer dying from natural causes. Uh-huh. I get $25 a day in expenses. Uh, here is an ample amount in advance, sir. 
But you should know, sir, that the old man is a nasty, cantankerous, villainous, crooked, intimidating Five hundred dollars? Please, Fig, you're talking about the man I love. Los Nidos was at least an overnight caper, so on my way out, my lovely and charming secretary, Miss Perrine, handed me a brown paper bag which contained A, one pair of socks, darned, B, one shirt, ironed, and C, the apple which she always polishes for me the night before. We arrived at your large southern-style mansion two hours later. Hey! Pig, where the devil have you been? To the city, sir. I can't find the keys to the liquor closet. Where are all the maids? What happened to that cook we hired yesterday? Who is this man, and why is he wearing that necktie? This is Mr. Spade, sir, the detective. Oh, oh, uh, I'm Hillary Exxon. Come in, come in, please. Go on upstairs, Fig. See what that girl is doing to my father. I don't believe she's a nurse at all. Very good, sir. In here, Mr. Spade. Pardon the condition of the house. The old man has been firing the servants again. Your father, you mean? Yes, yes. Every time he gets shot at, he fires all the servants. He gets shot at pretty often? About once a year. In the fall. Uh-huh. You always hire a detective? Uh, no. Oh, dear. I'm not keeping you up, am I? No, no. Excuse me, please. It's, it's much worse this time. I can't get any sleep. Guns going off in the middle of the night. The whole household disturbed. When and where was he last shot at? Yesterday morning at about half past one. I dug the bullet out of the woodwork myself, a thirty-eight caliber, embedded in the door frame that leads to Miss Kaywood's room. Oh, oh that, uh, that's his nurse. Was she with him at the time? No. No, Dad sleeps like a baby, full of sedatives, she sees to that. Shot come from outside? Yes, yes, but we found nobody on the grounds, no traces of anybody. I don't know whether Dad knows who shot at him or not. He's such a closed mouth old devil. You don't uh, care very much for your father, do you? To be frank, Mr. Spade, if hating weren't such an effort, I would despise him. He is without a doubt... Well, listen, listen. Get out of here. There, there, that's just a sample. Well, come on, come on, let's see what's eating him now. Get out! Well, you don't have to stand for it. Take that silly painted thing out of my side. Don't you dare to get out! I'm quitting. I'm quitting, Mr. Exxon. I can't stand it another minute. Yelling, screaming, throwing things at You must have done something to set him off. I didn't, I tell you, I didn't. This is Mr. Spade, Miss Kaywood. Oh, a detective. Will it make you happier to know that I'm a private detective, uh, Miss Kaywood? Well, Mr. Spade, I only hope you can prevent a murder. If there's any way at all that I can help, I... Thanks, I'll uh, see you downstairs after I've talked to the old man. You'd better go in alone, Spade. Oh, Miss Kaywood, do you have a throat spray downstairs? I seem to be congested. Oh, go away. Go away! Go away! Oh, (laughs) well... Wasting ammunition. Who are you? If you're a total stranger, come on in. But don't be afraid, son. Come on over where I can look at you. Uh, It's uh, hard to keep my eyes open. Oh, oh, I mustn't do that. mustn't do that. Oh, so you're the detective, eh? That's right, Pop. If you want to take a little nap or something, I'll come back later. Uh, Oh, 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 what did I say just now? Come back later? No, 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 no. There's no reason for you to come back later. I'll say everything I have to say right now. The shot woke me. I didn't see anything. I don't know anything. I've got a million enemies. I can't remember the names of any of them. Why don't you try to remember? I could have them checked. You're wasting your time, Sonny. In my day, I've wiped out a hundred men, and I'll outlive anybody who's gunning for me now. You must be proud of your past, huh? Proud? (laughs) Sonny... A past like mine is the finest thing an old man can have. I've swindled my partners and betrayed my friends. I've turned state's evidence just (coughs) to see my associate get sent up for 20 years. And they say my wife died under peculiar circumstances and I got rich off her insurance. Now I'm done talking. (coughs) Uh, Oh, do me a favor, son, please. I've got to get a half hour, 20 minutes sleep alone. You'll keep them out, everybody. Please, will you? Please. Sure, sure, Pop. Uh, go ahead, go on, sleep. Oh, thank you, thank you. That's it. He closed his eyes, rolled over, and fell into a heavy sleep. I stood there a moment, looking down at the frail, wasted old body. Then I cased the room. In digging the bullet out of the door, Hillary had done a good job of ruining any chance there might have been of proving the direction it had come from. I strolled out on the balcony. It was a pretty night. I lit a cigarette and took it in. Then I heard the door open and close softly behind me. 
Nurse Kaywood was at your father's bedside. She was filling a hypodermic from a small vial of bluish liquid. He didn't awaken when she jabbed it into his arm. Then she saw me standing in the doorway. She hastily dropped the medicine vial into her uniform pocket and came around the bed to meet me. Oh, oh Mr. Spade, oh, thank heaven. Why, why, when I saw you standing there in the half night, I thought you might be... Thought the... I was who? Why, uh, the man who fired the shot. It was a man? I... Well, I don't know. I, I didn't see it happened. I just assumed that me... You shouldn't have done it. I warned you, sir. Eleanor. Oh, uh, we're, dis- we're disturbing him. Let's talk outside. Okay. Oh, it's good to breathe something besides sick room air. I thought you got used to things like that in your profession. Why are you so unfriendly, Mr. Spade? Nurses are human, aren't detectives? Try me, sweetheart. Oh, I know what you're thinking of me. But after a week in this horrible house, that that poor old man, he's frightened. He's really frightened. What of? By, by the shots. Thirty-eight caliber or hypodermic? Surely you don't think that I... He's supposed to be under sedatives. The, the doctor's orders. Sorry, he... sweetheart. It's my job to suspect everybody. Oh. Can't you forget your job? Even for a moment? Sure. Sure, if you don't mind the fact that I know you're a liar, that I'd make book you didn't come here primarily as a nurse, and what's worse, your act's not even convincing. Oh. Is it that bad, Sam? Yeah. Almost bad enough to be good. Come here. Oh, Oh, I hate you. It was a very satisfactory love scene for both of us. For reasons of her own, Barbara wanted to keep me out of that sick room for a while, and she did. For reasons of my own, I wanted to get that medicine file out of her uniform pocket, and I did. Then, as suddenly as we had fallen into love, we fell out again. After she'd gone to her room, I went back to my sentry duty around the house. Under a light on the front veranda, I examined the bottle from which Barbara had taken the injection for your father. It was labeled sodium thanatol and had been dispensed by a firm called Ibis Chemicals Limited in Cairo, Egypt. The screen filled the house, high and frenzied. I started running toward Barbara Kaywood's room. I slammed the terrace door open and found the light switch. Barbara was sitting upright in the center of a bed. Her face jerked up so abruptly that it seemed her neck had snapped. She clutched both hands to her chest and fell face down among the bedclothes, staining them with her blood. I don't know whether I went through, over, or around the screen that stood between her room and the old man's. I circled Exxon's bed. He lay on the floor on his side facing the window. I went outside. A thirty-eight automatic lay on the ground a few yards away from the building. I put that into my pocket and listened. No shadows moving. Nothing. Then he was on me before I could be sure he wasn't a medium-sized tree. Oh, uh, break your back. Be the light. The warm stuff on my cheek might have been the thing's blood or mine. It gathered me up and bent me back and tore at my throat. <laughs> then I remembered that hands are stronger than fingers. I started with his thumbs. <laughs> Then his huge body began to twitch. He was holding his fingers and sobbing like a baby. I pulled him up to his feet and poked him in the back with the flat of my hand. I followed him through an opening in the hedges and down a long, pitch-dark lane toward the lights of a squat brick house set on the top of a slight rise. As we approached it, a door opened and light streamed out onto the porch. The tall man framed in the doorway was the last person in the world I expected to see. Ah, oh, Marcus, you brought him. Oh, Master, very delightful service, but have much pain in Always fingers. complaining, Marcus. Welcome, Mr. Spade. Come in, my dear fellow. Come in. I've been expecting you. Tell me, fortune. By, 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 uh, 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 blackmailing me. <laughs> And if you don't, uh, remit, Exxon could have you booked for forgery, uh, blackmail, definition of character. Oh, my, my, my dear fellow, please, this is, this, this is most painful. But if I had but the, the original letter, I could destroy it and go back to the felt. Ah, oh, the felt. What happened to it? Uh, that fig, that, 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 that stinker stole it. He burgled my home. Are you uh, taking pot shots at old Exxon? Well, don't be a fool, man. I want Exxon to stay alive. I must find out some part of his life which will have an exchange value that will cancel out what he has on me. By the way, old thing, uh, 
You met Miss Kayward? Mm-hmm. At the present moment, she's milking me for $150 a day. Oh? She's supposed to go to the old man, by whatever means necessary, into talking about his past. And that information she is to bring to me. Well, that ought to be easy. Exxon brags about his past. Now, so far, I've learned that Hillary Exxon stole two heifers at a livestock show in Abilene in 1906. I feel for you, Captain. That wouldn't get much on the uh, current market, would it? My dear fellow, I have, a, I have a proposition to make to you. Should you ferret out anything that would be of value to me... I'll reward you handsomely. Well, maybe something can be arranged, Captain. Good, excellent. May I have your word on that? Well, there isn't much time, Captain. I'd uh, better trot on back. I'll show you to the door, sir. And let me warn you, Mr. Spade, for your own good, should you ever hear the thrum of Ibis wings, run, flee. I assured him that I would heed his warning, bade him good night, and started back down the lane in the direction of Axon Manor. Business was going on as usual. There were no shots this time, only the screen. When I got to Barbara's room, you and Adam were standing at a bedside trying to quiet her down. Well, Mr. Spade, is this the way you guard the house against intruders? Where have you been? Ask Adam. What does he mean by that thing? I'm sure I don't know, sir. I've not left the house. What happened here? Oh, she woke up screaming. She said someone had come into the room and torn off her bandages. A nightmare, of course. Please, I want to talk to Mr. Spade alone. Oh, please, please go. Adam, you go, too. Please, Hillary, you go, too. Good. Some questions I want to ask you, sweetheart, alone. Oh, but look here, Spade, look here. She just had a terrific shock. She shouldn't be well, questioned. Well, the, the code of detective transcends that of the medical, Mr. Hillary. Huh? Perhaps he should have a few minutes alone with Miss Kaywood. Oh, very well, very well. I, I suppose he's no best. Uh, remember what the doctor said, Miss Barbara. Not too much exertion. <laughs> What happened, Barbara? Well, it, it could have been a dream. Somebody was standing over me in the darkness and peering down at me. And then he started to rip off my bandages and I screamed. And when Fig came into the room and, and he turned on the lights, he was gone. It, it could have been a dream, Sam, and I could have been clawing at the bandages myself in, in my sleep. But you weren't. It wasn't a dream. I've been talking to Captain Sherry. And, and then I thought... Oh, oh, well, how much do you know? That you've been feeding the old man truth, sir, and beginning to talk in his sleep. Oh. How much talking has he done? Well, plenty. How much have you told Sherry? Well, just as little as possible. Why? Because, Sam, if, if we can keep that old man alive and out of jail long enough to sell what we know to Sherry for what it's really worth, we'd be fools not to do it. What makes you so sure you'll stay alive long enough to collect, sweetheart? Well, because you're going to help me, aren't you, Sam? <laughs> So I helped her, but not for the reason she thought. I made a lot of noise, leaving her room and going to mine. Going back, I didn't wear any shoes. I slipped into a clothes press in her room so quietly that even she didn't hear me. I left the door slightly ajar and waited. Time passed, and I was stiff from standing still. It happened at about 3 a.m. The feverish glare of his eyes told me that the threat of the gun in my hands meant nothing to him. I jumped to his side, twisted the knife away from him, picked him up in my arms, and carried him, kicking, clawing, and swearing, back to his bed. He lay there, breathing hard. Then he smiled. You're a smart one, Sonny. You had me figured out the first time you came in here, didn't you? Not quite, Mr. Rexon. The gun under your window was the clincher. That gun? Sure. I had it under my pillow all the time. I got tired of shooting into door frames. Look, you're dying, Mr. Rexon. There's no use trying to make up stories now. <laughs> you're right, Sonny. I knew that nurse would sit up in bed after I fired tonight. And then I let her have it right through the screen. Why? You know why well enough. She was doping me up and sneaking in here at night. Listening to what I was babbling about. Maybe you weren't saying anything important, Mr. Exxon. I might have, Sonny. I might have. Fourteen years ago, I killed my wife. I wanted to carry the secret to my grave. <laughs> you nearly made it at that. Uh, Mr. Spade! 
What's happened? Is he dead? He's dead. Did he say anything, sir? Did he confess anything? You must tell me if he said anything. I didn't hear him say a word. Oh, well. Hmm. Yeah, Mr. Spade. Charged with a certain texture, a significant quality. There's a certain smell, yes. Ah, oh, an omen. You can inhale it, sir. Journey thou to Nairobi on the felt. Tarry seven days, and you will collect the fabulous golden skull of Wizami, king of the Bojamas. Aha! Marcus! Yes, Master. Unhook the hooker! Pack the marmalade! We are off to the felt! <laughs> Just then, a flock of birds broke across the horizon, screaming. There must have been thousands of them, but not ibis, Mr. Exxon. Vultures. I suppose if you're going to pay any attention to omens, it's a good thing to know your birds. Period. End of report. Right now, I have something to say to every man who doesn't use a hair tonic. To every man who says, I don't believe in it or I don't need it. That all depends on what you mean when you say hair tonic. If you mean the old-fashioned greasy kind that leaves your hair smelling like a perfume factory, you're absolutely right. But remember, Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic is nothing like that. Wild Root Cream Oil is an entirely new kind of hair grooming preparation. There's not a drop of alcohol in Wild Root Cream Oil. And it contains soothing lanolin that's like the oil of your skin. Most important, Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair the right way, neatly and naturally. Never leaves your hair sticky or greasy. Get the big economy size bottle and the handy new tube that's economical, easy to pack when you travel, and grand for the bathroom cabinet. Don't delay. Get it today. Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. <laughs> Takes a little time, sweetheart. Oh, read the card, Sam. <laughs> now, you see? You'd know you were supposed to see Mr. Jones at 2 o'clock. Isn't it wonderful? Well, this card doesn't even mention Jones. Huh? What does it say, Sam? Well, it says, uh, Journey thou to Friskin's Drugstore, wager $5 on Ira W. in the third at Belmont Park. Oh, Sam, it's psychic. Tarry but a moment. Yes? Thou wilt lose five bucks. Oh, Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd with musical direction by Lud Gluskin. This is Dick Joy reminding you that next Sunday, author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade, brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too, for quick good grooming and to relieve dryness between permanents. Mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Sam Spade Detective Agency. Hello, sweetheart. It's only me. Oh, Sam. Why so modest? Women, Effie. Age cannot weather nor custom stale their infinite variety. Huh? Against their incalculable wiles, mere man is a leaf in the wind. Oh, Sam, do you really... Oh... 
Who was she and how windy was it? Cyclonic, Effie. We had to close every window in the house. But I... If you will just contain your natural feminine curiosity for a few moments, I'll be right down to dictate my report on the bow window caper. <laughs> Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. To every man who says, I don't use a hair tonic, or I don't believe in a hair tonic, I say this. Decide for yourself. But don't decide until you've tried Wild Root Cream Oil, the entirely different hair tonic. There's not a drop of alcohol in Wild Root Cream Oil, and it contains soothing lanolin. What's more, it grooms your hair the right way, neatly and naturally. So get the big economy-sized bottle and the handy new tube at your drug or toilet goods counter. Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in The Adventures of Sam Spade. Sam, what's a bow window? Hmm? A bow window. A uh, bow window is a bay window that you look into instead of out of. Look into instead of out? Oh. Oh, Sam. <laughs> Get your book, Panther Girl, and slink on in. Well, what was she trying to see through the, the, the bow window? Hmm? I mean, whose house was it? Her own. But if it was her own house, then why would well, she... Well, it look just at... goes to show you, darling, what some women will stoop to. It does? Mm-hmm. It was a low window. Oh. Well, whenever you're ready, Sam. Uh, date, November 10th. Ninth. Ninth. Uh, correct. 1947. To Dr. Helmut Ries. I was right for once. Yeah. From Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the bow window caper. Dear Dr. Ries, I know that this report will not make pleasant reading for you, but you paid for it, so here it is. As far as I was concerned, it all started on Thursday morning when you called at my office. From your story, I gathered it had been going on for some time. You, you will say these are merely the actions of a jealous woman, Mr. Spade. But I assure you there's more to it than that. It is, it, it, it must be a carefully thought out plan to ruin my career, my, my whole life. In uh, what way, Dr. Reese? She spies on my private consultations. Insults my women patients. I can no longer even keep a nurse for more than a week at a time. Scenes, hysterics, she... Outbursts of violence. I cannot continue my work under such conditions. So why don't you give her a divorce? Why, no, no, no. This is not her desire. If it were, it would be, it would be simple. No, she wants to bring me to ruin. She wants to see me on my knees in front of the pocket. Why? That is what I want to find out. Why? Doctor, I think you ought to take this case to a head doctor. I have consulted a psychiatrist. The examiner. She's perfectly competent mentally. So you see, there is here already some mystery. For which one comes to a detective. Uh, how long has this been going on, Dr. Reese? Since three months only. But in this time, she has reduced me to utter desolation. Dr. Reese was a very good divorce lawyer right down the hall from my office. No, no, no. I discussed the matter of a divorce with her a few days back. This was her answer. Uh, you see... A receipt for the purchase of a gun. And this note in her handwriting. I hope you will not force me to use this. Esther. Yes. Well, what do you think she has in mind? Murder or suicide? She refused to discuss it. But one thing I have noticed. Since she has bought this gun, a new development, a strange man watches my house. Several times I have caught him following me. Well, she might have hired a detective to check on whether you visit a lawyer. Perhaps, perhaps, perhaps it is very simple, but it is all too strange to be harmless. I uh, half-heartedly agreed that it might be, Dr. Reese, and when your check for 100 bucks didn't bounce, I went to work wholeheartedly. I reached your house on Pacific Avenue just as the streetlights were going on. 
It's a quiet neighborhood, so I could hear it before I got close enough to read the number on the door. They seem to be slugging their way toward the back of the house, so I decided to risk an entrance. I found the doorbell, and I was about to punch it when I caught sight of your mystery man. He was crouched in a clump of shrubbery that grew under the bow window at the corner of the house. He was still there with his eyes glued to the window when I walked up behind him. Hey, let go of me. Let go. Come on, come on. You're going inside. Listen, I'm not just a snooper. I'm I only... didn't say you were. I'm just inviting you inside for a better look. Now, I'm warning you. If you don't let go of me, I'm... Stop squirming, will you? Go! Oh! The kick he landed on me wasn't according to the wrestling association's rules, but I let him get away with it mainly because I couldn't move for three or four minutes, and by that time he disappeared down the street. When I recovered my faculties and staggered back to the door, I didn't bother ringing the bell. I just walked in. The hen fight was still going on somewhere in the upper reaches of the house. Then a door burst open on the upper landing, and a girl in a nurse's uniform ran down the stairs toward me, pursued by a pale little woman with a pinched face who was brandishing a pair of brass fire zones. You brushed past me, Dr. Reese, and headed off the pursuer. Esther, stop it! Stop it at once! Have you gone crazy? Give me those fire zones! Give them to me! What's the matter, Helmut? Afraid I'll mar your light of love's beauty. What started this? I caught her creeping about the kitchen. She was going to poison my food. Explain to you, Mrs. Reese. The doctor... Oh, don't, 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 don't bother explaining, Miss Roberts. These morbid fancies of hers. Don't think I don't know what goes on in that office. That office where I'm not allowed anymore. That's only because you make the patient so nervous, Esther. I know what goes on. You and those women. That will do, Esther. Go to your room. Very well. But I won't have that woman in this house another day, Helmuth. Is that understood? Go to your roommate. I'm going, I'm going. But remember what I said. I've warned you both. I can't stand There, there, Miss Roberts. Now don't. There. I can't stand anymore, Doctor. I tell you, it's making me a nervous wreck. I jumped uh, Dr. Reese, I... huh? Oh, Mr. Spade. You saw, you heard? Yeah. Uh, uh, come into my office. We'll talk. I think we'd better. Uh, doctor... There's still one more patient waiting to see you, Doctor. Well, uh, yeah, have her wait a little longer. Yeah. Uh, uh, this, this way, Mr. Speed. Nurse. How much do longer will it The doctor wait? will see you just as soon as he possibly can. Have you been feeling any better, Mrs. Campbell? Uh, sit down, Mr. Speed. Thanks, but I can say what I have to say standing. Your wife's a very tragic woman, Doctor. Uh, I wish I could help her. I wish I could help you, too, but I can't. You heard her threat against Miss Robbins. Was that a joke? There's nothing funny about jealousy. Uh, but there is this man who watches the house. And the gun she bought. I collared him outside just now. Oh, well, did you get him to talk? No, but I wouldn't worry about him if I were you. And about that gun. The Constitution says every citizen shall have the right to bear arms. Even Parnell Thomas can't do uh, Mr. Spade. I've not yet told you all. If I... Oh, Doctor, I'm, I'm sorry yes. to interrupt, but this patient, she's been waiting for more than an hour. Well, who, who is she? Mrs. Cavanaugh. Cavanaugh? Cavanaugh, who? Well, has she been here before? Of course, last week. Here, here's her card. Oh, oh yes, yes. Uh, uh, I'd, I'd better get it over. Uh, send her in. Yes, Doctor, and... And, Doctor, I'm resigning. I'll finish the day, of course, and, and then I'm through on... I'm sorry. Yes, yes, well. Very well, Miss Robbins. I, I, I can't say that I blame you. Good luck. Goodbye, Doctor. Well, I'll be going along myself now, Doctor. Uh, no, 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 no. You must hear me out, Mr. Spade. I have not yet told all. If now, if you'll just wait until I have seen this patient. Uh, please, Mr. Spade, please. Okay, I'll wait outside. Oh, I beg your pardon. I beg yes. your pardon. Uh, c- come on in, Mrs. So, uh, you're leaving the doctor's employ, uh, nurse? I am, I am. Well, Mr. Spade, how does it look from the grandstand? Messy? Mm-hmm. You don't mind if I finish cleaning out his desk? Go right ahead. Thank you. What's the matter with Esther, anyway? Oh, I could sum the whole thing up in a single five-letter word, shall I? You have. Are you going to walk out on him? Aren't you? Yes. Yes, I am. Oh, but Esther isn't jealous of your type, if you don't mind my mentioning it. 
I feel heartened to think that you noticed I was different. Oh, I did, Mr. Spade. I really did. You don't seem uh, particularly nursey to me, either. I'm not. My, you have a fast pulse, Mr. Spade. Uh, yes, I've uh, been feeling very weak the last few minutes. I uh, need care. Oh, you know, you don't eat enough apples, Mr. Spade. Well, I guess I've finished. Oh, there's that old contract. I wanted to... Mr. Spade, will you tell the doctor I've left and thank him for me again? Aren't you going to see him before you go? No, no, I'm not. He'd only beg me to stay and it... Well, it's simply out of the question. Oh, the poor guy. I just don't know what I'd do if I were in his place. For you, Mr. Spade. <laughs> I did, and I told her. She told me I was a victim of hypertension and left me with my mouth open and no thermometer in it. Five minutes after she'd gone out to the front entrance, your wife came down the stairs looking knowingly at me and the door to the doctor's office and left by the same route. Ten minutes after that, I was halfway through a 1937 National Geographic that was the latest edition on the waiting room table, and it reached the third paragraph on the natural beauties of Winona County, Minnesota. But I never finished it. I will be back in a minute. The first thing I saw when I entered the room was Mrs. Cavanaugh, your patient patient. Why? Why didn't he do it? You, doctor, were standing over her, nervously twitching off the rubber glove from your right hand. You tested her throat for pulse, then listened through a stethoscope. It was purely a formality. One of the 38 caliber slugs had entered the right temple. The other had torn through the base of the skull. How did it happen? I, I don't know. I had completed the examination and walked over there to put my instruments away. When I turned when I turned back, she had a gun in her hand. Before I could stop her, she pulled the trigger. Suicide, of course. Why? Well, I just told her the truth. That there was nothing I or any other doctor could do for her. That she had perhaps a month, perhaps less. She had suffered great pain, of course, for some time. Uh -huh. You saw her shoot herself, you say? Yes, yes. The gun, she took it out of my desk drawer. I'd removed it from my wife's room earlier today. I see. Well, doctor, this is the neatest suicide I ever saw. No powder burns, and from the way she's lying, she must have shot herself in the direction of that window, at least ten feet away. She screamed before the shots were fired and had time to fire a second bullet into her head and throw the gun across the room before she fell. Well, Helmer, at last it's happened, hasn't it? Esther, leave this room. I told Helmuth one of the husbands would catch up with him. Pretty, wasn't she? I don't remember this one. The expression on your face might have been horror or fear or both, Dr. Reese. But your wife was smiling. When my eyes left her face, I noticed a leaf clinging to the hem of her coat. It might have come from the shrub that grew up against the house. And her shoes were splotched with mud that could have and probably did come from the cultivated flower bed just outside the bow window. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Now, here's important news on good grooming. Better than four out of five users of Wild Root Cream Oil say they prefer Wild Root Cream Oil to all other hair tonics. Here is new and even more conclusive evidence that Wild Root Cream Oil is again and again the choice of men who put good grooming first. So if you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked... How does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. And no wonder. It gives you the advantages that men consider most important. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, and removes loose dandruff. What's more, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil is the only leading hair tonic that contains soothing lanolin. That's like the oil of your skin. So ask for Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, 
the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, back to the bow window caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. Obviously, there were two equally good suspects in the Kavanaugh murder. Either your wife had killed her in a jealous rage, or you'd killed her with your wife's gun to frame her for the murder. I decided to let the police worry it out and went home to bed. The morning headlines were a bit of a surprise. Nurse sought in shooting a mystery woman, item. The cops had found Celeste Robbins' fingerprints all over the murder gun. And item. Mrs. Cavanaugh, the murdered woman, had given a vacant lot as her address, and her body was lying unclaimed at the morgue. I decided to pay her a visit. Maxie, hey, Maxie. What? Oh, Sam. Sammy, my boy. Hey, it's good to look on you. How are you, Maxwell? Oh, fine, fine. What brings you here, Sam? The Kavanaugh woman. The Kavanaugh? Oh, Kavanaugh, huh? Ah, uh, let's see who's with us today. Uh, Stiftle, Milton, Schwartz, Kelly. I knew him, nice guy. Feige. Aha, uh-huh. Kavanaugh. Rose. Hello, Rose. Hey, Sam, don't you want to look at Rose? No, I've seen her. Ah. Uh, yeah, just checked her back in. Autopsy. Say, you do collect queer ones, Sam. Mm. Now, you take her. Why would anybody in the world knock her off? In her condition, all he needed to do was wait. A month, a couple of weeks. Bad as that, huh? Worse. Anybody claim her yet? Well, they... Hello. Something we can do for you? My name is Kavanaugh. I've come for my wife. He was standing with his back to me, and I didn't get a good look at his face until he walked over to the desk with Master. The voice tipped me even before I saw the face. It was a man I'd caught outside your office window less than half an hour before the murder. If he recognized me, he didn't let it show. I waited while he went in with Maxie. When he came out, there were tears streaming down his face. I'd been waiting for two reasons. I had had some questions to ask him, and I had wanted to pay back that jolt he'd given me the night before. I left without doing either. Oh, sweetheart, any calls? Lieutenant Dundee of Homicide, yeah. uh, Dr. Reese, mm-hmm. and there's a girl waiting inside. Wouldn't give any name. So you let her wait in my private office. Well, I don't think you'll mind when you've seen her. She's by way of being a knockout. Well, uh, thank you, Effie. That was uh, very thoughtful of you, huh? You're welcome, Sam. Sam, please, please don't be angry with me for coming here. I had to talk to somebody. What you need is a good criminal lawyer, Nurse Robert. Oh, no. Oh, no. Do you think I killed that woman? How did your prince get on that gun? And don't tell me she threatens you with it and you grab it out of her hand. No, no, I didn't. I did nothing oh, at take all. Take it easy, nurse. Take it easy. Would you like a drink or something? No, no. Thank you anyway. I'll, I'll be all right. Well, she came in from shopping three days ago. Just as nice as pie. And she came creeping around. You know how she is. And she said, I bought something today. It's lovely. And with that, she hauled this gun out of her handbag. And so, to humor her, I took it and I looked at it. That was foolish. It certainly was foolish. When Nico played it, I deal surface for fingerprints. And I remember she was wearing gloves. Struck me as peculiar at the time, but I'm I'm so stupid. I didn't think of it until just now. Everything's a little peculiar about this caper. A woman who was dying anyway gets shot. Nobody even seems to know who she was. Doesn't make sense. No. No, it doesn't make much sense. What should I do, Sam? Give myself up. I think you should. Yes, I thought you'd say that. All right, phone the police. You got a lot of courage. Sure you don't want to drink? No. No, thank you. I'll be all right. I'll be all right. Uh, homicide. Dundee. Uh, Dundee, Sam Spade. I got the Robbins girl here in my office. She wants to check in. Oh? Uh, well, tell her to forget it, Sam. Reese's wife just made a full confession. That tore it. In my anxiety to see how you were bearing up under the shock, Doctor, I blew a buck and a half of your money on a taxi all the way out to your address on Pacific Avenue. To my astonishment, you were wearing a look of real distress. I... 
I don't understand it, Mr. Spade. This confessing, it's, it's not like her. It's all too strange to be harmless. Dr. Reeves, I'd like to talk to you alone. Do you mind, Mr. Spade? You're right ahead. I strained my ears outside your consulting room, but all I could hear was a few vague murmurs. Then, for no good reason, I decided to have a look at your wife's bedroom upstairs. The cops had been there before me, so I didn't expect to find much, and I didn't. I was tapping the woodwork for secret panels or something when I heard a heavy tread on the, on the stairway. I wheeled around, my hands inside my coat. A jolly-looking character in coveralls was standing in the doorway. Home electronics. I beg your pardon? Go hang it. Home electronics. <laughs> I come to take the equipment. What equipment? The dictograph. She don't need it no more. <laughs> Ask me, she hurt too much. Mrs. Reese had a dictograph installed? Yeah, her metal type installation. Yeah, this here's a speaker. <laughs> yeah, my own design. Looks like a portable radio, don't it? Yeah, where's the other end? Where's the uh, microphone? It's in the doc's private office. Uh, you interested, eh? Yeah, turn it on, will you? Oh, sure. <laughs> Yeah, we'll get it tuned in a minute there. Uh, oh, feedback. Wait a minute. I'll fix it. Let her talk. Let her talk. What can she tell? I don't know. But it's uncanny the way she knew nice, huh? Every word we spoke together. <laughs> it's because of the dictograph. They rig, huh? Shut up. My we cannot allow this terrible tragedy to come between us. We love each other. Nothing can change. Oh, boy. Yeah, that's as nice, ain't it? Quiet, quiet. I just... No, please. Please, don't. Now, just stop it, Helen. I don't want you. Please, don't. What is it, Celeste? What has happened to Jane? What has happened? You ask that. Well, I've been attacked by a mad woman and accused of murder all in the space of 12 hours. But it's all over now. Just so, Helen. Yes, all over. Well, don't you turn it up a little more? Oh, sure, sure, turn it up. Hold it, hold it. I'm very, very ashamed. I suppose it was my usual thing. I always get sorry for a poor, weak man and get involved. But this time, I'm sorry for her. Celeste, please. When I was a kid, I liked it. It used to make me feel powerful and, oh, to watch them squirm. But it's no fun anymore watching another woman in the agonies of jealousy. And you... I thought you were just weak. You're a brutal, unscrupulous murderer. What, what are you saying, sir? You killed Mrs. Cavanaugh. Why, that's... That's impossible. You stood deliberately in that window and you fired two shots right at... Hey, what gives you? Why weren't my fingers on that gun? Because you were wearing your rubber gloves, Doctor. Celeste, don't say any more. No, no. <laughs> Help me. Help me get his shirt off, Mr. Spain. You've been shot. Who shot him, you? <clears throat> Through the window, the same man, the one who watched the house. Hold, hold this tourniquet tight, please. Uh, it's nothing. A flesh wound. His aim was bad. Yeah, too bad. <laughs> Cavanaugh, you still out there? You got nothing to worry about. He's still alive. I missed him. Give me a hand. Come on. That's it. I missed him. Yeah, that was lucky. You're taking the rap to your wife's murder, too, if you're a better shot. He did it. He killed my wife. I was at the window. I saw him. What I don't understand is why his wife confessed. You loved him, Mr. Cavanaugh. You should understand that. that. I guess that's what happens to love when it gets crossed up. Why didn't you tell the police what you saw? I, they'd have hung it on me. She she was a stranger to everyone else. I'd been quarreling with her, suspicious, acting like a maniac. Oh, she never told me. She must have been going to one doctor after another, trying to find one that would give her one ray of hope. In pain all the time, too, and never let him on. Never. Even after that first visit she made to Reese's office, I didn't tumble. I, I thought she was meeting him on the sly. And I followed her both times. That last time I carried a gun. I might have killed her if what I suspected had been true. Uh, I'm very sorry, Mr. Cavanaugh. I, I didn't realize. You're pretty late with your regrets, Doctor. I don't quite figure you either. Maybe the prison psychiatrist can. Dundee homicide. Uh, Dundee... Tear up Mrs. Reese's confession. Come on over and get the doctor. Dr. Reese? Yeah. Uh, uh, oh, by the way, he accidentally shot himself in the arm. Isn't that right, doctor? Uh, what? Oh. Yes, yes. Accident. Why didn't she tell me? Why didn't she tell me? I don't know, Kavanaugh. Women. Sometimes they make too much sense, sir. We don't make enough, or... Maybe we're all crazy. 
And that, Dr. Reese, is the crop. The risk of laboring a point, there's also the mystery of why a nice girl like Celeste Robbins ever fell for a guy like you. You'll have plenty of free time to think it over between now and the trial. If you find the answer, drop me a line. Period, and a report. You know, Sam, that, that Celeste, I like her. I wish we could do something for her. Well, I've already thought of that, Abby. Oh? What are you going to do, Sam? Type that up, sweetheart, and I'll write you a happy ending. Here's how you can find out whether the hair tonic you're using today is giving you what you ought to get in good grooming. Ask yourself, does my present hair tonic groom my hair neatly and naturally, or does it leave my hair sticky or greasy? And does it relieve dryness and remove loose dandruff, too, or does it do just a halfway job? Unless you can honestly say that your present hair tonic does all that for your hair, you owe it to yourself to try Wild Root Cream Oil right away. Try Wild Root Cream Oil and see for yourself how it improves your appearance. Grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose dandruff. It's non-alcoholic and contains soothing lanolin. Get the big economy-sized bottle and the handy new tube that's easy to pack when you travel and grand for the bathroom cabinet. Don't delay. Get it today. Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Oh, here's the report, Sam. You want to read it over? I do not. File it under F. But forget. About that poor Celeste, Sam. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, I made a date with Celeste to take her dancing tomorrow night. She uh, needs cheering up, you know. Well, what for? Well, you said she needed help. Well, that isn't exactly the kind of help I had in mind. Oh. I don't see why it's necessary Effie, to take... we must each of us give what particular kind of help each of us is particularly equipped to give. Very well. If you wish to... She used to make over men just to get the other women jealous. That she did. Aren't other women silly to allow themselves to get jealous when they know just what she's up to? Very idiotic. Just idiotic. Sure thing. And go home, Effie. I'm a lousy dancer. Oh, very well. Have fun, Sam. <laughs> Good night, Sam. <laughs> Good night, sweetheart. <laughs> The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd, with musical direction by Lud Gluskin. This is Dick Joy, reminding you that next Sunday, author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade, brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too, for quick good grooming and to relieve dryness between permanents. Mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. The non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Sam Spade Detective Agency. It's me, sweetheart. Risen from not one, but two deathbeds. Oh, Sam, I bet not. You wouldn't take that line down. Oh, Effie, you made a joke. Well, you did first, Sam. I did not. Oh, you mean you actually... Oh, don't pin me down. Anyway, I was present at two dying declarations. Would you believe, Effie, that a man could say something that wasn't true at a time like that? Oh, no. You mean a man would be lying on his deathbed? Oh, Effie, you made a joke. Oh, Sam, now stop it. I don't know what you It's all right, Effie. I forgive you. You can atone by telling me how wonderful you think I am. I think you're... That you may do when I arrive in a trice to dictate my report on the deathbed caper. (laughs) 
Marshall Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Tell me, mister, how many times a day do you have to comb your hair? Not many, I'll bet, if you groom it right, first thing every morning, with Wild Root Cream Oil. For this famous hair tonic grooms your hair neatly and naturally, and helps it to stay that way throughout the day. Wild Root Cream Oil also relieves dryness and removes loose dandruff. With Wild Root Cream Oil, you don't have to keep combing your hair every two minutes. (laughs) That is, unless your gal can't resist running her hands through it. Get Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. Many brave hearts are asleep in the deep. Oh, Captain Sam, is the brig for you? You got your logbook handy, gal? Oh, yes, Captain. So beware. You make it that's awful deep. Be. Oh. Uh, date, June 20th, 1948. Where? Oh, Sam. I have no shame. To uh, Marin County Sheriff's Office, San Rafael, California. Attention, Deputy Woodington from Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the uh, deathbed caper. Dear Bill, the uh, dawn came up like thunder out of Chinatown across the bay. In San Francisco, all we could see was fog. But on your side, it must have lifted briefly because somebody named Dan Starbuck managed to find his way to a phone booth, call me, and asked me to meet him at the Third Street Pier in Sausalito. I didn't see him when I first got there. I didn't even see the pier. It was too foggy. But in the glow of the neon lights in front of the Viking saloon, I saw a man who seemed to be waiting for somebody. He was a big guy with a good face, but plenty of worry on it. Mr. Spade? Yeah, Mr. Starbuck? Dan Starbuck. Come on down to the end of the pier. I'll explain as we go along. we got to hurry. You act hot. You want it for something? Well, not yet. What's the caper? Well, it... My brother's out there on his yacht, the Marguerite. He's dying. When he's dead, they may call it murder. I want to be there with a witness. That's you. In case he has anything to say about it. who did it. Who did? They think I did. Did you? Well, honestly, I don't know. It happened night before last. I went out there to see him. We've hated each other for years. We're both been drinking, and we drank some more. Then there was a fight. I drew a blank somewhere. Next thing I knew, it was around midnight. I pulled myself together, went into his cabin. Gordon was lying there with his head all kicked. I realized I was covered with blood, and I was holding something in my hand, big glass paperweight. I dropped it. I got out of there fast and swam ashore. I planned to tell you a different story, but that's it. You want the job or not? You think you'll make a deathbed statement that'll clear you and you want me for a witness? Yeah, that's it. You got a lot of guts. I'm hired. Good. Uh, Alverson? You down there? Alverson! Who's Halverson? Uh, he's a boatman. He'll row us out. Halverson? Hey, Nils? Danny? Yeah. Is that you, Casino? Sure. Can I do you some favor? Uh, I want to go out to the Marguerite. I can't find Halverson anywhere. Well, I guess I can take you. Are you sure? Yeah, you... I'm sure. Uh, uh, Sam Spade, Del Casino. He's the boss of the Marguerite. Glad to meet you. Sam. Any friend of Danny's. Hey, listen, Danny, you sure you want to go out there? Any reason why you shouldn't? Well, it's up to him. In his place, I would be on a freighter for China, way out there where the fog is more thicker. No, it's all right, Casino. I know what I'm doing. Well, uh, your friend, you, you excuse me, your name? Spade. You Pardon me, I better ask. The police don't want you for nothing? Not yet, but don't make book on it. Uh, push us clear, Danny. This fog is closing in. But I can still see the lights from the Marguerite. I wish we don't find her. But we did. 
She was wearing clam diggers, an off-the-shoulder T-shirt, and was leaning against the rail as the dinghy pulled past the police launch and nestled in under the ladder of the yacht. Dell? Dell, is that you? Yes, Mrs. Starbuck. Who is that with you? Keep quiet. Dell. Dell, what are they saying ashore about... Oh, I I thought you... You're Mrs. Starbuck? Yes? I'm Sam Spade. I'm from San Francisco. I'm a detective. Your brother-in-law's in the boat. You captured him? He wants to come aboard. He wants to... Why? He's hoping your husband will say something to clear him before he dies. Is there any reason why he shouldn't come aboard? Oh, there's every reason in the world why he shouldn't. The police are in there with my husband right now. Yeah? The doctor says there's a possibility that he may regain consciousness long enough to make a... dying declaration. Mm-hmm. If... If he's face to face with Dan, there's no telling what he'll say. I wish Dan wouldn't... My my husband is dying. Dan? Yeah, what's he say? I don't know, but I think you'd better come aboard. He seemed almost delighted as he swung his weight up out of the dinghy and climbed the ladder. Del Casino, the bosun, followed, wearing a puzzled expression that turned to fear as we entered the cabin. The yellow glare from the lamp swinging overhead was almost blinding to walk into out of the foggy night. The first thing I focused on was the bunk that held the dying man. His head was heavily bandaged, his skin was chalk white, and his lips were beginning to turn blue. The room was tense with waiting. Ranged around him in a semicircle were the supporting players. Two doctors, one family type with a nurse, one police medic without, one sheriff with cigar, one police stenographer, female with pencil and notebook poised, nine-tenths of a widow, and us. At 18 minutes past seven, somebody moved. It was the dying man. The two doctors rushed forward, took his pulse and blood pressure. Miss Scott, adrenaline 3 cc, calming one, saline solution. Oh. Oh. All right, Sheriff, he's conscious now, but uh, you'd better hurry. Ah, uh, Mr. Starbuck, you can hear me all right? Mm-hmm. Take that down. Can you hear me? Affirmative answer. Now, Mr. Starbuck, we have to ask these questions. One, what is your name? Please try to answer. What is your name? Gordon M. Star. You got that? What is your name, Gordon M. Star? Yeah, that's close enough. Fill it in later. Now, Mr. Starbuck, where do you live? Uh, where do you live? I'm dead. You got that? 1277 Marymount, Pasadena. Hey. Now, Mr. Starbuck, let's try a little harder. Hmm? This is a long one. Uh-huh. Have you been injured? What was the cause of your injury? Uh, yes. Hurts my... You got that? Affirmative. Now, the second part. What was the cause of your injury? Uh, head. Uh, head on head. Uh, do you believe that you're about to die as a result of your injuries and have you no hope of recovery? <laughs> I know. No hope. Ah, ah, now let's get to the point. Who inflicted said injuries? My. Hey, Mr. Starbuck, My. please, you haven't much time, you know. Go away. Doc, is there anything you can do? I'm afraid not. Oh. Oh, this is ghastly. Oh. Can't you leave him alone? Can't you let him die in peace? What are you afraid of, Maggie? Uh. What are you afraid he'll say? All right. All right, tell them, Gordon. It was Dan that struck you, wasn't it? He was jealous. He always hated you for marrying me. It was Dan. Now, 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 Mr. Starbuck, I know how you feel, but we can't allow this sort of thing. Please step aside so we can finish up here. Uh, Mr. Starbuck. Doctor? Uh, very low pulse. I'm not sure. Dan. But... Dan. Is Dan here? Here I am, Gordon. Tell him. Tell him the truth. Do you identify this man, Mr. Starbuck? Yes. He's my brother. Dan. Yeah. You got that? Brother Dan, he's... He's the one. He's lying. Gordon, you know who did it. Why don't you tell the truth? What do you got to lose now? Nothing. Nothing. I'm finished. You got that? You finished me. Gordon! Uh, Gordon, not yet. Uh, I'll come back. Uh, Doctor, can't you? He's dead. Well. Okay, Doc. 
Dennis Starbuck, it is my duty as sheriff of this county to take you into custody on suspicion of murder. And I must tell you that anything you say may be held against you. You'd better come along too, Spade. Routine questioning, you know. Okay, sir. Well, I don't think we'll need the handcuffs, will we, son? No, I'll go with you. Yes, indeed, son. It's always smart to come along quietly. Yeah. Look, this is as far as I'm going. Hey, Sam, come back here. Hey, Use your hand. He only had one friend. He was the best friend in the world for a man on the land, the fog. The searchlights on the police launch spun frantically as the craft heeled around in a half circle to head him off. Instead of cutting the fog, the beams from the powerful lights bounced back from it and blinded the men behind them. After ten minutes of that, they gave up. The sheriff had a theory. Ah, uh, don't worry. Between the fog and the currents, I doubt if we'll make it. We'll probably recover the body in the morning. And they did. But it wasn't Dan Starbuck's body. It was the bosun, Del Casino. And he was found in Richardson Bay, adrift in the dinghy from the Marguerite. Somebody had creased his skull with the same type blunt instrument that had been used on Gordon Starbuck. But Dell hadn't lived long enough to make a dying declaration. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Now, here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. And no wonder. It gives you the advantages that men consider most important. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, and removes loose dandruff. What's more, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil is the only leading hair tonic that contains soothing lanolin. That's like the oil of your skin. So ask for Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil too, and mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. And now, back to Caper with Two Deathbeds. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. The police theory of the Del Casino killing went something like this. Casino had shoved off in the dinghy to join in the search for Dan Starbuck, had rescued him, and been maced for his pains. Also found in the dinghy, but not as yet worked into the police theory, were two items. One, a waterproof wallet containing the seaman's papers of one Nils Halverson. Two, a tattoo mark on the right bicep of the deceased. A small heart with a name in it, Maggie. The brand new widow of the same name was waiting in my office when I got there the following afternoon. Hello. Hello to you, Mrs. Starbuck. What can I do for you? Mr. Spade, I I know very little about the ethics of your profession, and... Well, are are you still working for Danny? If you mean, do I know where he is, the answer's no. Oh, I hoped you'd say that. Why? Because I want you to work for me. Need a new bosun? You needn't have put it quite so crudely. No, I needn't. Since your work is confidential, I'll admit I've... I've done a few things that... Well, it's all too true... My first mistake was marrying Gordon Starbuck when I didn't love him. And I should never have let myself fall in love with Dan. I certainly should have known better than to let Dell fall in love with me. What about Nils Halverson? And me? Well, hardly. No. Nils Halverson was employed by my husband for various odd jobs whenever we put in at Sausalito. Mostly he'd row the guests out to the ship. He rowed Danny out the night my husband was killed... At least I think he did. I didn't actually see him. Where's Halverson now? 
I don't know. He he goes off on drunks for days at a time, but, but... But I have a feeling that someone has paid him to disappear. He he might have overheard something. Hold on a minute. You're going too fast. Are you uh, working up to a confession? Oh, no. It's, it's just that I'm afraid a great injustice may have been done to Danny. After all... Mr. Spade, a man who's dying, I-, I don't see how he could be altogether in his right mind. Do you? The law says he is if he knows his name and address. A deathbed accusation is the strongest evidence a lawyer can shove at a jury. He can't cross-examine a dead man, and most people have the quaint idea that a man on his deathbed is a lot more truthful than he was when he was hale and hearty. Then you think Gordon may have been lying? Could be, or wool gathering, or picking up some of the lines you were feeding him. Oh, I, I-, I was just afraid he might die before he... You, you see, I thought I might shock him into saying yes or no. He, he, he could have said no, couldn't he? Well, make up your mind. Oh, all I know is it's on my conscience now. If we could find old Halverson and force him to tell what he knows. He's a very strange man. He's devoted to me. If, if the police find him before I do, he, he might refuse to talk out of a mistaken loyalty. To you? Well, I, I meant if he thought I had anything to do with the... Well, he's very strange. I told you that. What makes you so sure he's alive? Why wouldn't he be? If I'd been the killer and he'd rode me to and from the scene of my crime, I'd see him secured in Davy Jones' locker. Fish feed, lobster bait, asleep in the deep. Will you work for me? I'll let you know. I didn't have time to get tattooed, but the rest of me was marinated enough. On my head, I was wearing a dirtied-up yachting cap. And the rest of me, I was wearing a pea jacket, dungarees, and sea boots. I was also wearing clamshell number five as I rolled up to the Viking saloon. Well, what did be, mate? Uh, Arkevit and Vakta. Uh, have you seen my cousin? Your cousin? Who's your cousin, Prince Valiant? Uh, no, m- my cousin, Niels Halverson. Uh, Niels Halverson. Oh, no. You're Niels' cousin, mm, are you? Yeah. Well, uh, coming from the old country? Uh, yeah, uh, Minnesota. Uh, by you, Minnie. Well, no, he'll be right glad to see you then. Uh, where uh, fair is he? I'll, uh, <clears throat> I don't want to say this too loud. Yeah. Bend over there. Yeah. He's in trouble, you know. Oh. Yes, I got him holed up down below. Oh. Yeah, come on, come on. Well, by golly, I sure been glad to be going to see my cousin Niels. <laughs> Niels Halverson. Drop the act and get down there. Hey! Okay, Joe, I'll take over from here. Easy, easy. Okay, Danny, me boy. I got his gun. Well, watch him now, watch him. He's full of smorgasbord. Well, Spade, you're the one person I didn't expect to see. But I'm very glad to. Yeah, I wish I hadn't found you. I wanted to find somebody else first, Halverson. Yeah. He's here. Want to see him? That's what I came for. And under here. Watch your head, low bridge. Here we are. Where? A boathouse under the pier. Halverson used to hole in here to sleep off his schnapps. Where is he now? Over here. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, he's going to be a long time sleeping this one off. He'd been missing since that night. Nobody knew he was here till last night. I headed for the saloon when I swam ashore. Joe hit me out here. He could still talk then. What'd he say? I wrote it down here. But it's no help. Let's see it. It's just a jumble of words. Uh, Marguerite. Marguerite. Merry Christmas drink. My beautiful Helga. Row, row your boat. Now throw me back. Row me back. Twenty dollars, good and drunk. Fog rolling in, good and drunk. Gonna be five days, no business. Oh, my head. Paint the book. Oh, crazy stuff. Twenty dollars, uh, Did you give him twenty bucks to row you I out? I didn't even see him. I swam out. My loving brother wouldn't have let me on board if he'd heard me arriving like a gentleman. Twenty bucks. Did you frisk him? No. I'll have a look. No, I don't... Hey, wait... Huh. Real soggy, but a 20. I don't care. I'm sticking to my story. I swam out there. I didn't give him that 20. <sighs> Maybe you didn't. Maybe you didn't. Well, you got to believe me. I didn't even have 20 bucks. That's why I Shut got... Shut up. What's the matter with you? What are you going to do? Come over here, Dan. What? Hey. 
I don't believe a word of your story, and even if I did, it wouldn't make any difference. What are you... Shut up. You're going to stop talking and listen for a while. I stuffed a gag into his mouth and muscled him over to a piling and handcuffed him to it. He didn't even look surprised. He just stood there staring at me as if he'd lost his last friend in the world. But I wasn't looking at him as much as I was listening to those footsteps on the boards overhead. I waited for them to come back. They did. I walked across the soggy planks to where Nils Halverson lay in the shadows. Nils, I want you to answer these questions again. Now, this time, I'm going to take them down. You get lots of $20 and lots of drink. Now then, I know you don't feel so good. You don't have to talk if you don't feel like it. Just nod your head for yes and shake it for no. Okay, Nils? That counts in a court of law as long as there's a witness. Okay. Now... Your name is Nils Halverson. Your address is 213 Bayview Sausalito. That's correct, is it? Nod your head. Good. Good. That proves you're in your right mind. You know you were injured. Yeah. You know the cause of your injury. Hit on the head and thrown over the side of your boat. What? Huh? Not from... Oh, dinghy. Well, it's the same thing. All right. Now, you know you're dying, you have no hope of recovery. That's obvious, but nod your head. That's the boy. Now, uh, Nils, on the night of the 18th, around 10 o'clock, after your usual working hours, you rowed somebody out to the yacht Marguerite in return for which this person gave you a $20 bill. This person is also the person who killed, who, in, who inflicted your fatal injuries. It is. Now, uh, the name of that person, if you can possibly speak even in a whisper, so there can be no mistake. Can you hear me? Just say it close to my ear. Yeah? Yes. Yes, I got it. That's all. Now, I know you don't write, Mills, but make your mark here. Come on, I'll guide your hand. There. Now we're going to take... Mills. Mills. Well, anyway... All right, Maggie, come on in and join the party. Uh, don't try anything. The light's on you. I'm a better shot than you, and if there's a ruckus, the whole saloon will be down on us. They're all friends of Danny's, too. Stop there. Toss the gun. Okay. What's the matter, Angel? You look kind of scared. No. Just disappointed, that's all. Don't give up so easy, sweetheart. I always wanted to take a trip around the world. We might go on the Marguerite together. Yeah, yeah, sailing into the sunset, sleeping with our deathbed statements under each other's pillows. I see what you mean. I guess it wouldn't work. How much for yours, and what do we do about him? Dan? I'll take care of that. Throw it in with a deal. Okay. But I want it in writing. A little statement to the effect that I can keep under my pillow. Fair enough. Now, all I want from you is a little statement from you to this effect. That you, Marguerite Starbuck, employed Nils Halverson to row you out to the yacht on the night of the 18th, that you there overheard a quarrel between your husband and brother-in-law, and that taking advantage of said brother-in-law's inebriated condition, you sneaked up behind your husband, hit him with a paperweight, and decamped, leaving the murder weapon in Dan's hand. You then started back to shore in the dinghy, and realizing that the only witness who could testify you were aboard that night... All right, all right. All right, I'll sign it. Okay. We'll have plenty of time to put in all the legal decorations later. I'm afraid we won't, baby. You're going to be spending all your available time at the Hatchapi and points west. What are you talking you about? You just made a full confession in front of a witness. You heard it, didn't you, Dan? Every word. Oh, we're fight. Honest. An honest man. Well, I did tell a fib. Now, this is really going to hurt, I'm afraid, Maggie. You see, we didn't actually have any deathbed statement to match yours. No? No. Nils Halverson was a good deal too dead to have made a deathbed statement just now. He's been stiff for 12 hours. Uh, period and a report. Well, Sam, I'll type this right up because then I'm leaving. Wait a minute, Effie. I had to do it that way. Don't you understand? Of course, Sam. I quite understand. But you object, huh? A cruel, ruthless, murdering, though beautiful woman, foiled by a clever ruse, a great acting performance by the greatest private detective of them all. Is that all? You're still leaving? Yes, Sam, my bags are packed. Well, pardon me for having feet. There.
there's a reason, men. In fact, there are five big reasons why more men every day are turning to Wild Root Cream Oil for well-groomed hair. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally. Wild Root Cream Oil relieves dryness and removes loose dandruff. Wild Root Cream Oil is non-alcoholic and contains soothing lanolin. Five big reasons why you, too, should join the millions with handsome, well-groomed hair. Why you should step up to your drug or toilet goods counter and ask for Wild Root Cream Oil. Get the big economy bottle and the handy new tube that's easy to pack when you travel and just right for the office or plant. Also, ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Well, here it is, Sam. Goodbye. Now, wait a minute, Effie. You can't leave like this, not without... Oh, all right. I'll talk to you while I'm putting my hat on. Well, can't you at least look at me? After all, you should give me a chance to justify... Sam, apparently you're laboring under an apprehension. Of course I am. Oh, boy, am I glad I picked the last in June and the first in July. What are you talking about? My vacation. Vacation? You just had a vacation a few months back. Well, Sam, that's a year. Well, if you want to take advantage of a legal technicality... Now, Sam, don't say goodbye, man. Well, it... Well, it's customary, I suppose. It's... It's lucky that some of us keep our nose to the grindstone, our ear to the ground... An eye to the future. Huh? Television's just around the corner, you know. Oh, Sam. <laughs> Come here, sweetheart. You look lovely in it. Come here. Have a wonderful time. <laughs> oh, Sam. Oh, Sam. Come here. <gasps> now go on. You missed your train. Uh, where are you going? To Los Sierras. Well, just so you don't go to Canab, Utah. All right, Sam. You know best. Good night, Sierra Sue. Now, who can we get for that part next week? The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd with musical direction by Lud Gluskin. Join us again next Sunday when author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keeping all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get Wild Root Cream This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. The non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Office of Samuel Spade, Private Investments. I mean, Investigations. Good morning. Uh, evening. Effie? Miss Perina's on a vacation. Perhaps I may be of assistance, no doubt. I don't know. To whom am I speaking to? I am sorry. I cannot devolve that information to an entire stranger. May I take a message? Look, uh, Miss Whoever you are, I don't want to discommode you, but... I... I am sorry, but I will have to ask you in no certain terms to resist from this line you are handing me. I am not the type secretary. Forget it. I'll just call Miss Perrine long distance and dictate my report over the phone. <gasps> oh, my stars and God, how utterly gouge of me, Mr. Spade. Oh, I'm Bernadine, Effie's relief. Uh, I mean yours. I could use some. Oh, shall I send out for some medicine? Yeah. The phone number's on the wall behind the water cooler. Tell them the hundred proof, bond it, and hang the expense. I'll be right down to dictate my report on the bail bond caper. <laughs> Thank you.
Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Only three days left, gals, and June, the month of weddings, will be over. But don't worry, there are still 187 days left in leap year. Still time to snag the man of your dreams. You know, the one who uses Wild Root Cream Oil on his hair. He and millions of other men use Wild Root Cream Oil daily. Because Wild Root Cream Oil grooms the hair so neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose dandruff. Any smart man who wants to look smart always insists on Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. You just gotta be. Yes, but why? It was fate. I knew it was going to be like this. I had my qualms too, Bernadine. Oh, that's good. I-, I sent the other back. The other what? I called that number, but it was euphonious. They sent whiskey. Is something the matter? Uh, no, no, nothing at all. I'm perfectly qualm. Well, I'm glad. My previous employer was very nervous, which is why I just happened to be tentatively at large when Effie reproached me about being a relief to her. Figures. Uh, Bernadine, now I'm not being fresh. Honestly, I'm not, but do you take shorthand? Yeah, but I don't speak it. What is that you speak? Don't answer. Uh, ready? Rodney. Uh, I mean, Roger. Uh, uh, date. I'll have to ask my mother. Down, Bernadine. Uh, date, June 27, 1948, to Miss Effie Perrine, care of Perry's Lodge, Canab, the Pearl of the West, Utah. What? Oh, uh, wrong letter. I'll get to that later. Uh, date, uh, June 27, 1948, to Leo M. Scarlett, care of Leaf Branch, Root, Knox, and Wood, attorneys at law, 333 Pine Street, San Francisco, from Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the bail bond caper. Dear Leo, I'm sorry things turned out the way they did, Leo, and I'd like you to know how I got into it. It wasn't for the reward. I don't take rewards. I'm not in love with your wife, no matter what she says, and I wasn't sore at you about anything. I was just sitting in my office, minding my own business when the door opened, and Vivian walked in. She looked every bit as beautiful as she did when she lived under me in Ma Tuttle's boarding house in 41. In fact, I didn't recognize her until she slithered out of her mink. Hello, Sam. Surprised to see me? Uh, yeah, but I'm trying not to show it. What's on your mind? Is that all you've got to say to me, Sam? Well, you're here on business, aren't you? All right, I don't blame you. It all happened pretty sudden, Leo and me. I should have written or phoned you, I suppose, but somehow... Forget it, Vivian. Now, uh, what do you need a detective for? Are you uh, thinking of divorce already? Oh, please don't, Sam. If it was a mistake, I'm the one who has to live with it. And I made up my mind when I marry Leo this time, it's for keeps. No matter what. Mm-hmm. What's the what? He's in trouble, Sam. Well, that's nothing new. Well, this time I don't think it's his fault. When Leo went legit, he meant it. What's he say he's doing now? He's a bail bond broker. Judging from your new look, I'd say he's a success. Sam, a man called him on the phone today. I answered. He said his name was Holiday, but I recognized his voice. It was an old friend of Leo's, Charlie Rosenfoy. Charlie, huh? When did he get out? A couple weeks back. He was paroled. I don't know what he said over the phone, but Leo looked scared and sick. I don't wonder. The word around town was that Charlie took the rap for Leo. Well, I don't know anything about that. All I know is Leo's on the level now, and Charlie never will be. He did plenty on his own during that time he served. Well, I won't argue that, but from where I sit, it looks like Leo better start wearing a gun again. He has. That's what I'm so frantic about, Sam. Do you hear any of the conversation from Leo, Sam? He didn't say much. But I did hear him say, All right, ten tonight, I'll meet you there. That wasn't very smart of him. I know, but that's the way he is. It might be only for a payoff. I thought of that, too. But Leo hasn't got that kind of money. He's been dropping a lot at the racetracks lately. And even if he had it, he's not the type to pay blackmail. I don't like it. Why should I stick my neck out? Why did you have to come to me, anyway? Because I trust you, Sam. 
I know you were jealous of Leo. I was? Sam, if we ever meant anything... If you meant half the things you said to me when we... Stop it. That's blackmail. Oh, I feel so lost and alone. I don't know where to turn. Okay, okay. Now I'll see what I can do. Oh, Sam. I'll make it up to you somehow. You see if I don't. Sure you will. And tell Leo to stop dropping his money at Tan Ferran. This is going to cost them plenty. Vivian had said that your rendezvous with Charlie was scheduled for 10 in the p.m. and that you were too upset to go to work that day, so you'd be at home, 1246 Dunbar. I took a plan in your apartment building from a sleepy lagoon-type cocktail bar across the street called, you guessed it, the Sweet Leilani. Your wife joined me, and after a while, we got around to talking. At least she did. <laughs> I bet you can't guess what I'm thinking about. Huh? Listen, Sam. You remember that night we drove to the half... Mo- half moon... The bay. Oh, you do remember. Oh, we used to do the craziest things. I should have married you, Sam. <laughs> Please, not while I'm drinking. You know what? The trouble with crooks... <laughs> They have to work day and night. Yeah. Hey, you're not listening. No, but everybody else in the place is. Let's talk about you, Sam. Did I ever tell you how I met Leo? No, and please don't. And then he opened a bucket shop. You know what a bucket shop is? Yeah. It's stock bro- uh, brokerage. Brokerage. Yeah, that's right. Only it's crooked. That was the first business Leo started when he went legit. Mm-hmm. He had to shut it down on account of those securities <laughs> somebody was always stealing out of the safe. Were they insured? Yeah, but they wouldn't renew his policy. So after the second nightclub burned down and he couldn't get any insurance at all, even on his own life. That's why I'm so frantic, Sam. Hey, give me a nickel. I want to play sweet little Annie. Fifty nickels and two hours later, sweet Leilani broke under the strain, so we had Princess Papuli to leave and that gave out, and we were starting on the Hawaiian war chant when she disappeared through a door marked Wahini's, Hawaiian for powder room, and never came back. Around 9.45, I mumbled something to the bartender about the lady will pay, put on my smoked glasses, and strolled out and across the street. You came out of the building a couple of minutes later. You led me a zigzag course up Merchant Street to Salon, across Salon to Commercial, down Commercial to Drum, and made a lateral pass over Drum back to Dunbar. Your destination, I'd never have guessed it, was the Sweet Leilani. Happily, they were not playing Sweet Leilani. It was very, very quiet. The regular customers had taken a powder, and I didn't blame them. In the new crop at the bar, I counted ten broken noses, at least five broken paroles, assorted knife scars, and four pairs of cauliflower ears, and one maverick. You slid into a booth at the end of the bar, took the gun out of your shoulder holster, and laid it down on the table in front of you. I walked over, turned it around, so it was pointing at the jukebox instead of me, and sat down. Some other time, Spain. Some other time I drink with you. I'm waiting for a friend. Why the gun? You selling it to him? Maybe I give it to him. Go on, you drink at the bar. Ah, it's kind of crowded. Looks like uh, Charlie Rosenfoy's old mob. Who are they gunning for? You or Charlie? Why don't you ask them? What are you drinking, Leo? I was with that bottle all day. Got a bad taste. Do me a favor, Spade. There's a bar two doors down the street. Go drink there. There's my friend coming in the door. Any friend of yours is a friend of mine, Leo. Look, Spade. Hello, Leo. What's the matter? You bring a bodyguard to meet your old friend, Charlie? This shamus threw his weight in here. I didn't ask him. I don't need him. Huh. That sounds like the old Leo Scarlatti I used to The know. name is Scarlet. Oh, pardon me. I've been on the rock for so long, it's hard to catch up on all the changes. There's been a war, Charlie. Anyone tipped you to it yet? You got a smart bodyguard, Leo. Let's talk. Let's go somewhere else and talk. Uh-uh, I like it here. Okay, we start. How come you tipped the mob we were coming here? You promised you wouldn't. Like the shamas, they got a drink somewhere. All right, say what's in your mind and I'll go. Yeah, and if you don't mind, I think I'll uh, do my drinking at the bar. (laughs) 
Both of your guns were on the table. It didn't look as though you were going to use them on one another, and I figured that neither of you was going to do much talking in front of me anyway, so I strolled back to the end of the bar to look at the television. The 10 o'clock news roundup was on, and the ticker tape that was moving across the screen said dot, dot, dot in Atlantic City today, period. I ordered a highball, and then the ticker tape started again. This time it said San Francisco, million-dollar bail bond robbery. One million dollars in negotiable bonds is tonight in the hands of a group of daring hold-up men who commandeered an armored truck at the very portals of the police department in the Hall of Justice. And it said this concludes the 10 o'clock edition of the Television News Roundup. I had a slight hunch that if the television boys had had their cameras on the big bail bond robbery, that at least some of the characters would have been played by at least some of the bad actors that were foregathered in the sweet Leilani. In fact, what you and Charlie were saying and doing when I walked back to your booth was almost too much to the point. You let me see the bulky portfolio Charlie shoved across the table at you. It looked like a carrying case for bonds, bank messenger type. But it was sealed with wax blobs bearing the imprint of the great seal of the state of California. I was impressed. Where'd you get this? You can read about it in the papers, and if I was you, I'd get this out of sight before them papers hit the street. One thing more, don't try to clip none of them coupons. And one thing more in addition, don't open it at all. Sure. Spade? Yeah, Leon? I think I hire you after all. I took the job and you handed me the portfolio. Outside, we flagged the taxi and you gave the driver an address on Portsmouth Square... Your office, I hate to remind you, was behind one of a bunch of neon-lighted storefronts across from the Hall of Justice. The sign on the door said, press the button and let freedom ring any hour, day or night. The only bell in sight was a stop-press-type burglar alarm. You unlocked the door and we went in. You paused in front of a big green safe with a combination lock and started twirling the knob. The tumblers clicked into place. I picked up an inkwell and waited for the safe to open. All right, Spade, give me it. I did. With both hands. With my left, I handed you the portfolio, and with my right, I pitched the inkwell at a well-wired slab of plate glass window. When the burglar alarm went into action, so did you. You dropped everything and were out of the door and out of sight before you could say, let freedom ring. While I was waiting for the cops to arrive, I helped myself to a $500 bearer bond I found lying loose in your safe. I had a feeling I might be needing some bail myself. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Now, here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead, socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. And no wonder. It gives you the advantages that men consider most important. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, and removes loose dandruff. What's more, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil is the only leading hair tonic that contains soothing lanolin. That's like the oil of your skin. So ask for Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil too, and mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. And now, back to the Bail Bond Caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. I had hoped, Leo, when I made my spectacular move in your Bail Bond office and set the bells to ringing, that I'd get the caper off my neck and onto the capable shoulders of the police where it now belonged. Then I told myself I could go home and get some sleep. I had never been that fond of Vivian anyway. 
I was holding the million-dollar portfolio, complete with its big official seal still unbroken, ready to hand it over with a flourish to the first boy in blue that rushed in. But then I saw something that dashed my hopes. There was a strip of scotch tape across the bottom of it. It wasn't up to me to tamper with important evidence, but I didn't have to. It was only a question of what magazine had been cut up to replace the million dollars in bearer bonds. That question was answered at headquarters 20 minutes later. It turned out to be the last 52 issues of Radio Life, which even Captain Walsh of the robbery detail admitted was no help. Neither was Captain Walsh. Now, Spade, in your statement here, you state, uh, so and so and so and so and so and so, uh, sweet Leilani, and that Rosenfoid did hand portfolio exhibit in question to Leo M. Scarlett, alias Scarlatti, at approximately 10.20 p.m. this day. That's it, Captain. Now, uh, you sure you want to stick with this? You don't want to change any part of the statement? No, I just want to go home and go to bed. I'm afraid you're going to stay with us for a while. Who, me? Um, statement of Jordan Joyce, M.D., statements of Hilda Sackwriter, R.N., and Mildred DeVille, Biss, R.N., day and night, nurses, respectfully. Who's sick? Rosenfoy. He's been quarantined in his home in Daly City since his release from Alcatraz four days ago. Chicken pox. Sorry, Sam, I'll have to book you. You sure you don't want to add anything to that statement? <clears throat> Only this. Kelsey Walsh, if you continue to do such brilliant police work, you will be waving a stop sign at a school crossing in time for the fall semester. You are a hangnail and a finger of justice. <laughs> I thought I had been courteous and cooperative, but even so, it was the middle of the afternoon by the time they set my bail. Fifteen hundred bucks. That made it light. But I hadn't had time to hang the curtains in my cell when I got even worse news. My bail had been posted by who? Vivian, a banana peel, and the steps of progress. She met me outside. Well, aren't you going to thank me? What for? Getting me in jail or getting me out? Getting you out, of course. It was all the money I had in all the world. Leo's money was impounded, you know. But, Sam, when I thought of what you and I once meant to each other, and maybe we still... Yeah, could. yeah, well, uh, you'll get your money back. I'm not really guilty. Oh, I know that. What else do you know? I guess it's safe to talk. Leo phoned me today. Where is he? He wouldn't say. Some pay station. He kept putting in nickels. Sam, you've got to talk to him. You've got to convince him it's best to give himself up. Now you're beginning to make sense, sweetheart. But how can I get to talk to him? I've arranged it. He's to meet us at the Club Leilani. You know, where we had our reunion yesterday. That place on Dunbar? Yeah. Oh, that's great. A crowded saloon less than a block from the police department. Besides, the place has lousy memories for me. By the way, did you ever get out of the ladies' room? If you don't mind, I'd rather talk about something else. Okay, let's talk about how do we bring this big secret meeting off in a crowded cafe. Is Leo coming in a false beard? You really think I'm stupid, don't you? I didn't say so. Well, it so happens that the place is closed on Tuesday. See that sign in the window? Closed Tuesday? Mm-hmm. Now, how do we break in? I was counting on you. You're a detective. Can't you use a glass key or something? Did you say that bail bond you bought for me was all the money you had in the world? That's the truth. Then get ready to forfeit it. It's a risk I've got to take. You've got to take. Sam, please, if we ever meant anything Yeah, to... I know. Half Moon Bay. But sometimes I wish we hadn't been childhood sweethearts. Wait here, I'll case the alley. The alley wasn't much better. There were two windows, washroom type, all glass brick, except the two small ventilators big enough to put your hand through. The only hope was the kitchen skylight. I didn't have any trouble getting up to it, but once I was there, things didn't look so good. The view from the roof was a garage door with two green lights flanking it. Then it struck me where I was and why I was there. The Club Leilani backed directly on the Hall of Justice where the big bail bond robbery had taken place at 5 p.m. the night before. Without further ado, I put my foot through a pane of the skylight, reached in, unlatched it, and dropped. Hurry up, come here, Sam. Up at the front of the building, I could hear Vivian clamoring for admittance. I decided to let her clamor for another minute or two. It isn't a thing I often do, but I walked resolutely into the ladies' powder room. It was very well equipped. 
It had furniture, a telephone, and more clues than I needed. The magazines were there, the razor blades were there, the scotch tape was there. There was even a scraping of red sealing wax on the steel frame of the window slot. But best of all was what I found in the paper towel dispenser. I lifted it out and moved it next door to the men's washroom. Then I let her in. What kept you so long? You'll spoil everything. I was afraid you'd... Here comes your husband. <gasps> oh. Come on, let me in. What happened, Leo? You're early. Any objections? I just got itchy, that's all. How are you, baby? Don't, Leo. I'm so nervous. Strange. What are we going to do, baby? What's Spade going to do for us? Tell him, Sam. I'll leave you two alone to talk it out. I'll freshen up a little. Haven't had my face on all day. Poor kid. Well, Spade, let's have it. Yeah, she's right, Leo. I can do a lot for you. But you've got to do something for me. Spade, this is level. I never saw those bonds. I know that. Then what are you after? The truth. It's the only thing that can save you. And if you take this rap, I take it too. I'm in clear up to my neck. Okay. Charlie Rosenfoy came around to Vivian and made her this proposition. He was going to pull this bail bond job and plant the goods on me. To get even for the rap he thought he'd taken for me. Mm -hmm. Vivian pretended to play along with him, only she got hold of the package long enough to take the bonds out and put the old magazines in instead. Mm -hmm. The idea was the mob would think Charlie had double-crossed them, taken the goods for himself, and delivered a phony packet to their banker, which was supposed to be me. Cute. Only you had to get smart and set off that burglar alarm. Now I'm getting the squeeze on all sides. The mob, the law, Charlie are all gunning for me at once. Don't worry about the mob and the law, and don't worry too much about Charlie. What are you driving at? That'll be him now. Who tipped him I was here? Get back in the corner. It's dark in here. You'll never see you. I'll take care of him. All right. Hello, Charlie. Who? Oh. Come on in. Get his gun. You're my friend. Sure, I'm your friend. Come here. Yeah, sure, Spade. <laughs> Pleasant dreams, fellas. Now I act. Hey, Charlie. No, Leo. Vivian? Sam? Is that you? Yeah. The last of your boyfriends. You mean Leo? Charlie? Yeah. They just knocked each other off. Oh, Sam. I can't see. It's dark. Where are you? Right here in front of the jukebox. You sure? Hope to die. <laughs> Drop it, Vivian. It's empty. Sam, I... Sam! <laughs> Vivian, how could you? After Half Moon Bay. I'm sorry I had to knock you boys out, Leo, but uh, better lumps than bullet holes, eh? After she started wrapping up the caper, it wasn't too hard to figure what she was up to, providing you could keep her smoke out of your eyes. She told Charlie how to operate on you and told you how to operate on Charlie. A million dollars for her and two dead gangsters lying on the floor of an empty joint where they'd shot it out. The secret of the missing bonds would have to be written off by the police as having died with either one of whichever of you ever had them. Period. End of something. Pardon me, Mr. Spade. I, I know you're tired, and if you're too brushed, please feel free to elude the whole matter. But... Yes, okay, let's do that. Thank you. Effie said that you were always glad to qualify any little points that she didn't understand. Mm -hmm. She said that, did she? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But she also said that quite accidentally that you sometimes leave things out that should be left in. Bernadine, times are very bad. They're cutting salaries everywhere. But where were they during the whole nefarious affair, if you'll pardon the expression? The bonds? In the paper towel dispenser, didn't I say so? Oh, that's what you moved to the men's. Mm -hmm. But how did they get there? In the Walrini's, if you'll pardon the expression. Simple. When the thieves whizzed through the alley after the heist, Vivian had her well-manicured little lunch hook thrust through the window slot to receive them. Oh, that's how the red sailing wax got there. Bernadine, you're spectacular. Now go and type this up. You're making me nervous.
You know what they say about people who like mysteries? Once a mystery fan, always a mystery fan. And that goes for hair tonics, too. Once a Wild Root Cream Oil fan, always a Wild Root Cream Oil fan. Just try it and you'll see what I mean. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms the hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So tonight, or first thing tomorrow, step up to your drug or toilet goods counter and ask for Wild Root Cream Oil. Get the big economy bottle and the handy new tube that's easy to pack when you travel. Also, ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Well, here it is, Mr. Spade. I hope it's not too erroneous. Oh, I'm sure it's quite offensive. Don't you mean inoffensive, Mr. Spade? Have it your way. I don't want to sound imprudent, Mr. Spade, but I must say that your conduct through the whole thing was very brave and outrageous. Don't you mean courageous? <laughs> oh, now I've got you doing it. You're going to be just like Mr. Cummel. Your uh, previous employer, no doubt. Yeah, poor man. You know, he finally became completely erasable. They had to take him away. Mm-hmm. What were his symptoms? Well, when he ordered the puppy biscuits, I thought he was just being concentric. But after a while, he wouldn't answer to anything but Rover. I had to sprinkle his flea powder in the morning, you know? And then he had his little tricks. He always wanted to show off, you know, sitting up and rolling over. He could shake hands, too. What's so great about that? Any dog can shake hands. Yeah, but can you scratch your ear with your foot? If I uh, set my mind to it. Now go home, Bernadine, or I'll report you to the SPCA. <laughs> You can't frighten me. Effie told me that your bark is worse than your bite. Good night, Mr. Spade. Effie in far-off Canab, come home, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tolman and Gil Dowd, with musical direction by Lud Gluskin. Gil Dowd directed tonight's broadcast in William Spear's absence. Join us again next Sunday for another adventure with Sam Spade, brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keeping all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get Wild Root right away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. The non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Sam Spade, Detective Agency. Good evening. That sounds funny in dialect. Good evening to you and happy 4th of July, Bernadine Hampton. Oh, Mr. Spade. What was the caper? Don't you mean caper? No, the caper. The high point of the caper. The climax, the crescendo, the pinafore. Well, that's better. For a minute, I was afraid you were uh, learning English. Oh, no. I'm studying Spanish. Soy infeliz que inicia... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, mucho interesting. Uh, gracias. Shall I go home now? No, uh, mal suerte. There's a little matter of murder in two languages, neither of which is Spanish, so stay where you are. I'll be right down to dictate my report on the Rushlight Diamond Caper. <laughs> Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Listen, men, to this holiday tip on good grooming. To help spark up your whole appearance, first be sure that your hair is well-groomed. Be sure it's groomed with popular Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic. 
Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, the way you like it, the way she likes it. Wild Root Cream Oil also relieves annoying dryness, removes loose, ugly dandruff. So look your best all the time by sprucing up right with Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. Date, July 4, 1948, to Mrs. May Rushlight, 21A, Granite Court, from Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the uh, Rushlight Diamond. Dear Mrs. Rushlight, it was the kind of nice, relaxing assignment that comes my way just often enough to remind me that gum shoeing can be respectable. There was an air of quiet elegance about 21A, Granite Court, and about the butler who answered the door. He uh, took in my rented gray topper and doeskin gloves, nodded approvingly at my wing collar, watered silk ascot, pearl gray waistcoat, morning coat, pinstripe trousers, and my spats with the mother of pearl buttons, and asked me if I were a florist. I set him to rights, and he led me up a flight of stairs to the early a.m. annex of your morning room. Mr. Samuel Spade. You're just on time, Mr. Spade. Mrs. Rushlight will be pleased. I'm Nancy Ward, Mrs. Rushlight's social secretary. And if you don't think that's tough to say, try it. Uh, Mrs. Rushlight's socials... Uh, what's tough about that? Uh, you'll do. Definitely you'll do. Shall we dance? I will dance at her wedding. But don't get me wrong, I'm not secretly in love with Ralph Rushlight, and the bride is lovely. Just hate to see all that money going down the drain. Is there anything else you think I should know? You know what your job is. You're supposed to guard the wedding presents. That's simple because it's nothing but a lot of cheap silver. And stay away from the champagne. It's non-vintage. The food will be foul. The guests are the most dismal aggregation ever assembled. Sounds like a lovely party. I arranged the whole thing. I told you she's a lovely bride. What's she ever do to you? I'd rather not say. I don't want to sound bitter. This way, Mr. Spade. The old hat. Mrs. Rushlight will see you now. Thank you, Florence Nightingale. Nancy? Oh. This is it, darling. Mr. Spade. Come over here, young man, so I can get a better look at you. How's this? Hmm, it's good. Turn around. Yes, you'll do. Uh, that'll be all, Nancy. Oh, couldn't I be finishing up these place cards while you talk? Take them with you. Do them outside. Very well. <laughs> Nosy girl. But nice. Nice nose. Oh, you too, eh? Well, I agree. That's why I'm marrying off my nephew to that wretched girl, Lotta Van Eyck. Have you ever seen Bugs Bunny, Mr. Spade? You don't mean the... They protrude. The ears? No, the teeth. Oh. As my late husband used to say of her mother, she could eat a tomato through a tennis racket. Oh. There's only one thing that'll prevent this wedding from being an utter disaster. She doesn't understand much English. Uh-huh. Well, what's the matter with your nephew? A great deal, but it doesn't show. Suffice it to say, he has criminal tendencies and the mentality of a snail. Mrs. Rushlight, I don't like to seem forward, but why are you telling me all this? Oh, you're, you're supposed to mingle with the guests. You'll need some conversation. Now, as to your assignment. The bride, being what she is, the wedding presents are hardly worth guarding except <coughs> for one. Ironically enough, it's from me. What is it, a machine gun? Oh, 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 oh that's good. Oh, oh, excuse me, I must write that down. And then tear it up immediately. <laughs> oh, dear. No, no, Mr. Spade. But it's bad luck, the Rushlight Diamond. You've heard of it? Uh, something about it in the American Weekly a while back, wasn't there? Yes, yes. It's not as large as the Hope Diamond, but there's not a flaw in it. My late husband, Roy Rushlight, bought it for his first wife. She sank with the SS General Slocum in Hellgate, the East River, 194, over a thousand lives lost. Luckily, she was wearing a paste copy at the time. I was only a young girl when I married Mr. Rushlight, and... A oh, fool that I was. I signed anything his lawyers asked me to sign. After his death, I discovered that the diamond was to be mine only until the marriage of my husband's male heir, at which time it must go to his bride. Well, that's too bad. Uh, you say, though, that the rushlight diamond is bad luck. Oh. Oh, there's that, of course. <laughs> I wonder if it's too much to hope. Hmm. Well... I must go and help dress the bride. Go along downstairs, Miss Spade. Take this jewel case with you. Put it on the table with the other presents and guard it well. 
So I took the old velvet-covered case you held out to me and checked the contents. It was an old-fashioned lavalier with a clear stone pendant only slightly smaller than an eight ball. Didn't look like a diamond, but smooth-cut diamonds hardly ever do. It didn't look like bad luck either, but... A mirror broke in the hall as I passed it, then I fell all the way down the stairs, and as I entered the ballroom, I knocked over a punch bowl. Nothing uh, really terrible happened until just before dark when the guests began to arrive. In theory, a detective guarding wedding presents is supposed to make himself indistinguishable from the other guests. In practice, it never works out that way. He has to spend most of his time within sight of the booty, so he is very easily spotted. I don't believe it. He's too good-looking. Oh, but he must be. He's not anybody we know. Well, ask him. It's leap year. Oh, here comes Colonel Bixby. He'll know. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Beauty gathered round the booty, eh? <laughs> and much more beauty than booty, though. <laughs> yeah. Say, when are they going to hang the diamond on that drip? No, no, there's no way to talk about the blushing bride. Is that it in the crummy old case there? That case is heirloom, young lady. The stone that reposes in it is worth a king's ransom. Now take your grubby hands elsewhere. Be off with you. Go on. Well, just because he's going to give the bride away, he thinks he can order everyone around. Uh, Mr. Spade, allow me to congratulate you, sir. These affairs, one all too often sees the detective on guard duty at the punch bowl. I was forewarned. Oh, yes, very bad champagne. Flat. (laughs) I'll be glad when these ill-starred nuptials are consummated. And by the way, Bixby's my name, Colonel Lysander Bixby. Colonel? It is my melancholy and thankless duty to give the bride away to the hapless groom, Ralph Rushlight. However, it's much better to give than to receive. <laughs> you tell that to May Rushlight, eh? Yeah. Quite a trinket. Uh, 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 uh. Mustn't touch grubby hands, remember? Oh, <laughs> sense of humor as well as sense of duty, eh? Candidly, if I knew a place to fence it, I'd be the... Colonel Bixby. Oh, Miss Ward. Ah, How lovely you look. Poor Ralph. Mrs. Rushlight asked me to warn you to get ready. The bride will be down any moment. Good grief. Well, I suppose I must steal myself. Where did I leave my glass? Keep your eye on that old goat, Mr. Spade. I don't trust him. Who is he? He's the only one here who knows why this wedding's happening. He's the bride's foster father. You mean he's got something on the family? You'll never know how much until you kiss the bride. Look, Nancy, it's none of my business, but I... Oh, I'm starting. I'll have to go in now. Now, wait. What? Uh, how does it go? Uh, speak now or forever hold your peace? No, I, I can't do that. Thank you for understanding. I didn't witness the ceremony, but judging from the mood of those who had, it was just as well I didn't. They shuffled back into the ballroom looking as if they'd witnessed an execution. Nobody seemed to be in a hurry to join the receiving line. After a few half-hearted handshakes, the groom left the bride standing alone, looking kind of bewildered, and came over to take inventory of the presents. Look at that junk. I'm Ralph Brushlight. Who are you? Spade. I was hired to guard this junk, as you call it. Sorry I'm wasting my time. The rush light time. It's bad luck. Look at what it did to me. Look at her. Did you ever say anything? Give it to yourself. Why should I? Because I'm liable to slap you clear across this room. Haven't I been punished enough? Go on, go on, Scram. Keep your hooks off that necklace. That's mine. I heard it's your wife. Come along, well, you heard here. Wrong. Come along over here. Oh, Mr. Spade, you haven't met the bride yet, have you? Uh, no. Thank you. I, uh... Uh, I wish you a lot of luck, Mrs. Rushlight. You're going to need it. Thank you. Well, I suppose now as well as any time, Colonel. Oh, oh very well, my dear. Mm. Uh, quiet, please. Mm. Quiet, everyone. Uh, uh, Mrs. Rushlight, the old, uh, the elder Mrs. Rushlight, that is, has something to say to you. Mr. Spain. Yes? The necklace, will you please hand it to me? With pleasure. I'm tired of looking at it. Oh, you're not done yet. <laughs> Stay close by my side. <coughs> Dear friends, at this solemn moment, I want, first of all, to welcome this dear little girl into the Rushlight family. Thank you. Yes. Uh, And now, dear Lotta, I will place around your neck the gem which was my heritage when I became a Rushlight and which is now yours. Thank you. I was wrong. Lotta, come back here. Lotta! I'll go out to the carport and head her off. You leave her alone. I'll take care of her. Whose wife is she, anyhow? Lotta, come back here. Lotta, bring it back! I was
was almost a shame to join in the chase, but I had to because I'd been hired to guard the Rushlight Diamond, and for my money, the best way to do that was to help her get away. And somebody got to her before I did. A strip of wedding gown satin marked the spot. The body lay crumpled under a hedge, but it wasn't the bride's body. It was the groom. He'd been stabbed to death with a pair of garden shears, which made sense. But what didn't make sense was that the necklace she'd been wearing was still clutched in his hand. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. And no wonder. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms the hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, and removes loose dandruff. What's more, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil is the only leading hair tonic that contains soothing lanolin. So ask for Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil too, and mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. And now, back to the Rushlight Diamond Caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. Number 21A Granite Court was teeming with motives and suspects. But the police were primarily interested in locating Lotta, the missing bride and widow of Ralph Rushlight. So was I. She looked like less work than the rest of you because if she had killed him, it was self-defense if she knew enough English. By 10 in the a.m., when I checked in at my office, she was still successfully eluding the police dragnet. That was because nobody, including me, had thought of looking in my office. Wow. Good morning. Thank you. Is that all the English you know? Thank you, no. I want my necklace. The police have it. You go with me. Tell them who I am. Okay, but first, I have to know who you are. Where you came from, what your connection with Colonel Bixby is. I am in Macassar, being born. In Macassar? Dutch colony. Uh Uh-huh. My father, there seven years ago, dying is. When I, 13 years old, have arrived. I see. Colonel Bixby in San Francisco, the financial representative from my father, us. I am adopted to him, not for a father, but so he takes care of my monies, which coming of age am I a rich Dutch woman. Uh Uh-huh. But legally, he's your foster father. yeah. Also, legally, I'm not a wife of Rushlight. I want my necklace. You married him for the necklace? Yeah. Why did he marry you? For one half of necklace when we sell. But all, everything to take he wishes. You and Ralph were going to divvy the take from the Rushlight diamond, you thought. Yeah, yeah. And what was the colonel going to get? Money's for Mrs. Rushlight. Oh, no, wait, that doesn't make sense. Mrs. Rushlight stood to lose a small fortune by that marriage. Why should she pay the colonel to promote it? You the detective, ah? You said that. Where my necklace are. That I say. Yeah, well, look, I'm not as sure as I was. Uh, wait just a minute. I'll uh, check on it. <clears throat> Homicide, Lieutenant Dundee. Uh, Spade, Dundee. Uh, yes, Sam. What's new on the rush light caper? Oh, you know I can't talk about the case, Sam. Oh? I got a line on that girl. Oh? Well, where is she? You know I can't talk about that, Dundee. Oh, you can't, can't you? Well, let's see if this doesn't change your mind. The necklace we found on Rushlight's body was a phony, a face copy. Uh Uh-huh. Does that make her guiltier than she was before? Well, now she's got a motive. Throws all our previous theories into a cocked hat. Now, where's the girl? She's in my office, Lieutenant, dear. Come and get her. Thank you. Oh, it's you, Sam. Back again? Yeah, do you mind? Well, that depends on who you came to see. 
you, sweetheart. Oh. But uh, first, I'd like to talk to Mrs. Rushlight. But well, she can't see anyone. She's in a state of nervous collapse over the... over Ralph's death. Oh, that's too bad. Mm. You uh, seem to be holding up pretty well. well. I'm relieved. He's better off dead than married to that... Yeah. Rushlight Diamond's still unlucky, you know. What do you mean by that? I was just trying it on for size. Uh-huh. Uh, does it fit? Yeah, but uh, you and Mrs. Rushlight are about the same size. Her uh, nerves getting any better? You're the doctor. If you want to see her, go ahead. She's up there. Thank you. <laughs> Mrs. Rushlight. Go away, I'm ill. Oh. I'm sorry to break in on you like this, but I haven't got much time. How dare you! Nancy! Nancy! Why is that girl? Mr. Spade, please leave me alone with my grief. Funny thing. Yesterday, Nancy was carrying a torch for Ralph, and you were holding the torch to him. Today, it's different. Oh, good Evans, you, you, you don't think I'm grief-stricken over Ralph. Good. That's one less mystery. M- Mr. Spade, what do you want? Your nephew's killer. Oh, does it matter? It does to me. Somebody getting knocked off right under my nose is bad for private detectives everywhere. Oh, <laughs> For a moment, I thought that... Say, wouldn't you rather make some more money? I refuse to marry Lotta. Oh, no, nothing like that. It's the necklace, Mr. Spade, the genuine. What is? I don't know. All I know is the other one isn't. Who told you that? Well, well the p- police know. It's, it's in the papers, isn't it? Not yet. Well, how else would I learn? The murderer is the only one who could have told you, unless you're the murderer. I see. Very well, Mr. Spade. I'll tell you what I know. I'm not as wealthy as you might think. In, in, in fact, I have for four years lived from pillar to post, from hand to mouth, ragtag and bobtail, struggling to make ends meet. Yeah, what you mean is you're eking out a meager existence, keeping your head above water, one jump ahead of the sheriff, stalked by the grim specter of poverty. Is that right? Oh, how well you put it. In, in fact, Mr. Spade, I'm something of a crook. I've borrowed large sums of money from Colonel Bixby, putting up as collateral something that was not mine to forfeit. Uh Uh-uh. Don't tell me. Let me guess. Uh, it was the Rushlight Diamond? Well, you seem to know everything. All but one thing. Why did you think you could palm off a paste copy on an operator like Bixby? He sent you here. I I won't tell you another single thing. Well, then I'll tell you a few things. The only way the Rushlight Diamond could be transferred legally into the hands of Colonel Bixby was by tricking Ralph into marriage with Lotta, since Ralph's wife automatically became the legal owner. With Ralph dead, Bixby would be in line to inherit the diamond from her. Inherit? California state law. Foster parent may inherit from a foster child in absence of any direct heir. Well, why, then he planned. He... He, he'd kill her, too. M- Mr. Spade, we must stop him. She's safe for the time being. I had her thrown into the pokey. They can hold her 48 hours for questioning, but they can hold you longer. They can even hold you as an accessory before the fact. Why? Why, I, I didn't know he was going to kill anyone. Lotta was just going to hand over a million buck diamond to Bixby out of the kindness of her heart? Oh, no. Lotta wanted to become an American citizen. Marriage is the quickest way. For her, Ralph was the only way. Okay, I'll buy that. Now, tell me honestly, Mrs. Rushlight, what happened to the genuine stone? I honestly didn't know. I wasn't sure. But now there can be only one answer. Nancy with the laughing face? She went with me when I went to the bank vault to get the Rushlight diamond to present to Lotta after the ceremony. Uh She looked after all my jewels, including the paste copy that I habitually wore. Homicide, Lieutenant Dundee. Uh, Spade again, Dundee. I, uh... I think I got the rush light caper all wrapped up. I'm heading for your office now, so wait for me. And whatever you do, don't let that lot of dame out of your sight. Thank you. Goodbye. Wait a minute, Sam. Wait a minute. Yeah? The lot of dame. She's already gone. Escaped? Bailed out. Custody of her foster father. Wait a minute. I got the name here, sir. Bixby. He's a colonel, and no wonder you're only a lieutenant. Uh, Mr. Spade, can't you stay for tea? Not thirsty. Fancy? Nancy, where are you? Oh, here I am, Sam. I-, I was waiting for you. You got the keys to that car out in front? Why, yes. Do you want to borrow it? Yes, with you in it. Why, Sam, where did I put my face on? Let it go. It's as good as lost anyway. Oh, 
Come on. What is this place? Where are you taking me? Never mind. Just hang on. I'll fly you up to the second floor. <laughs> Sam, that was a shot that sounded like Lotta. You stay here. Don't come in until I call you. Bean, what are Get you doing? Get back in there. Oh, Drop it. No. Drop it or I'll crack your elbow. Oh. That's better. Now sit down. I want to look this over. Looks real cute. Uh huh. Powder burns, gun beside the chair, and what's this? Well, 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 a note in Dutch. It's a suicide note. She killed herself. I can almost believe that. You've handled this very well, considering the bad breaks you've had. Only one thing wrong. Do I scent a bargain? I don't have to bargain. I've got the diamond. All you've got is two murders wrapping on your thick noggin. Don't be absurd. I know who has the real necklace. Then you better talk to her directly. You can come in now. Sam, was that... Oh, that poor, homely little dame. What did she ever do? Stop. You're breaking my heart. She committed suicide. You know better than that. She committed suicide. If the colonel's price is right. Oh, Oh, I see. I'll put it to you directly. It's not easy to fence. It'll have to be cut. That'll decrease the value considerably. Say, uh, $10,000. No questions asked. Pardon me. That uh, suicide shot, it's ringing in my ears. I can't hear you. Uh, 20000 50 All right, 100000 Sam, don't be a fool. Take it. I'll give you a real break, uh, Colonel. That's the cops coming after you. No, anything, Spade. What do you want me to do? I want you to try and get out of here. Uh, what, what are you going to do? There's the door. Go ahead. All right. I thank you, Colonel. All right, men, remember, he's desperate. Big speed. We're giving you a chance. Come down or we're coming up after you. Come on. Come on. Get up, Colonel. Here he comes. Kevin, it may be a trick. Watch it, Dundee. Here he comes. And that, Mrs. Rushlight, is the crop. For a man that went down fighting, Colonel Bixby didn't need much persuading once they got him under the lights down at headquarters. He confessed to everything, and the murders weren't the worst of it, the way I figure. The worst of it was the cruel way he victimized the poor little ugly duckling, Lotta Van Eyck. It's tough enough to be whipped before you start. Period and a report. My goodness, that was muy triste. I, I mean, I'm beginning to see why Effie gets so repressed sometimes. Effie, depressed? That little doll told you that? Only between she and I and the lamppost. She's so sensitive, you know. Not like I, of course. I invariably cry at weddings. You don't say, Bernadine. Uh, you attend uh, weddings often? Hmm? With high frequency, Mr. Spade. You mean frequently? No, no. The last time it was FM. You know, frequency moderation. Oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> moderation in all things, I always say. You mean you attend radio weddings? Oh, yeah. I've been married six times. My next date is television. You've been married six times? Well... To each his own, Mr. Spade. You mean six men have... Oh, no. No, I only marry my husband. Repetition is the spice of variety, I always say. Is that legal? If it's not after six weddings, what isn't? (laughs) To uh, each his own, as you say. Well, we don't presume to make a career out of it. As soon as we get the mangler and the deep freeze, we're gone on our honeymoon. Well, congratulations, and uh, type this up when you... Have the time, Mrs. Uh, Bernadine Hemp. Every day, more and more men are turning to Wild Root Cream Oil for truly handsome hair. And that's not surprising, for what other leading hair tonic gives you these big advantages? It grooms the hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, removes loose dandruff. What's more, Wild Root Cream Oil is non-alcoholic and contains soothing lanolin. No wonder Wild Root Cream Oil is the favorite with so many millions of smart, particular men. Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Well, here it is, Mr. Spade. 
afraid. I'm sorry it took so long, but I kept relapsing into Spanish. Yes, I know how. And Effie's typewriter doesn't have any upside down question marks. Upside down. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Take a memo. Call typewriter man. I already have. Oh, um, I almost forgot. You received a telegramic commutation. A telegramic what? A wire. Oh, a wire. Well, open it and read it in English, por favor. Uh, it says, uh, dear Sam. Figures. In the haste of my departure, I neglected to warn you about. Bur- well, when I do that one another favor, she'll have silver threads. Who? That ball of fire, whom I'm taking the place of in order to be double crossed of by Effie. Is she、uh, still in far off Canab? And good rubbish, if you'll pardon the expression. Oh, Bernadine, let me see that. Hmm. I、uh, <clears throat> I neglected to warn you about Bernadine. I'm sending the tales air mail special, but in the meantime, whatever you do, don't go to any radio broadcasts with her. And if she comes to work in a wedding gown, take the day off. Love, Effie. And I had two tickets for honeymoon payoff, and now she went and spoiled everything. Ah,、oh, now there, Bernadine, you just have to marry your husband again. That's all. I wouldn't have had the time anyway. I know. It's just the principle. Good night, Mr. Spade. Good night.、Uh, buenas noches, hasta la vista, Effie. Why did you ever leave me? The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tolman and Gil Dowd, with musical direction by Lud Gluskin. Gil Dowd directed tonight's broadcast in William Spear's absence. Join us again next Sunday for another adventure with Sam Spade. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. This is Dick Joy reminding you to get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that. You will have a tough time, Charlie. Keep on all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get wild root right away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Sam Spade Detective Agency. Are you still there? I believe that interpolation is hardly rhetorical, Mister Spade. To what have you been up, if you'll pardon the expression? And has that girl regained her facilities? I、uh, wouldn't know, but her、uh, faculties are as good as ever, if you'll pardon the expression. Mister Spade, sometimes I think you're a regular philanthropist. Don't you mean philanderer? How much money did you make out of that case? Well, I、uh, broke even anyway. That's what I mean. You're a philanthropist. Well, you know best, Bernadine. By the way, was that man really murdered with the bus saw, or was that just publicity? He really was, Bernadine. Why? There just happened to be one lying around. Oh, I don't mean that. Why was he killed? For the wheel of life. Oh. You're not going to ask what that is? Some curio, no doubt. Listen, Bernadine, the wheel of life is.、Uh... Oh well. I suppose I don't have to tell you to stay where you are. Just sit quietly with your book in your hand, and I'll be right down to dictate my report on the wheel of life caper. <laughs> Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end. 
with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Come on, mister, give the gals a break. Treat them to a look-see at a really handsome head of hair. Neat, well-groomed hair, the way yours is going to look when you spruce up with Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Famous Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, removes loose, ugly dandruff. So, how about it, men? Why hold off any longer when now's the time to get Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic? Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. I went down to St. James Infirmary to see my baby there. Ready, Bernadine, little flower? I'm way ahead of you. Keep it clean. No more than three erasures per page. Okie dokie. Oak. I mean doak. I mean date. Oh, I'd love to. July 11, 1948. To uh, Detective Lieutenant Dundee, homicide detail, San Francisco police. Subject, the uh, wheel of life caper. Now, don't go away, Bernadine. I don't know why these things always have to happen to me. Under private detectives in the San Francisco Classified Directory, they're listed somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 agencies, several with large display ads. But somehow she managed to find me. It's all so strange, Mr. Spade. I hardly know where to begin. Well, the beginning is always a pretty good place to start, Miss O'Farrell. Uh, yes, the beginning. It was like waking out of a nightmare you can't remember. Everything seemed out of proportion. Even the buildings along the street seemed to be leaning at a crazy angle. And then I realized I was traveling down a hill. I looked wildly around for something to help me get my bearings, and there was a street sign, O'Farrell, stuck in my mind, so I gave it to your secretary when she asked for my name. Uh-huh. And uh, what's your real name? I don't know. I don't know who I am, where I came from, or where I'm going. Mr. Spade, I'm so frightened. Uh, now, wait a minute. A lot of people suffer from uh, temporary loss of memory. Uh, most of them recover But amnesia is a sickness, and I am not a doctor. Oh, and you won't even try to help me? Well, I can give you the name of a good head doctor right here in the building. There's also uh, missing persons. But I'm not a missing person. I'm right here. Yeah, I mean, where you aren't, somebody might be missing you, Nespa. But the police... Oh, I'd rather not. I I might be wanted for some crime. How do I know? You sure you want to find out? Oh, yes, I do. I do. It's terrible not knowing. But I want to find out for myself. Can't you understand that? What do you think I can do for you? You might save my life. From what? I'll try to tell you exactly how it happened. First, I looked at my watch. It was three minutes past ten. The cable car stopped at the corner and a man got on. I I couldn't remember ever having seen him before, but then I couldn't remember anything. He sat down beside me and he caught hold of my arm. I tried to pull away. You can see the marks where he... Well, who was he? He acted as if I were... I think I know what you mean. Did you uh, find out who he was? No, no, I was too frightened to speak. What did he say? He sort of growled it out of the side of his mouth, but it sounded as if he said, Lathrop wants to see you. Mm-hmm. You remember anybody named Lathrop? I can't remember anything before three minutes past ten this morning. Well, let's go on with since then. The guy grabbed you, said somebody named Lathrop wanted to see you, and then what? Well, I-, I went into a panic. I managed to jerk away from him, and I jumped off the moving car, and then I looked in the classified section, and I... Found you. Why me? I don't know. The name, I guess. A spade to dig up my past. Please, Miss (laughs) O'Farrell. Do you think I'm very silly? No, I think you're very beautiful. I wish you could remember whether you're married or not. Oh, no. Well, at least I have no wedding ring. Uh, What have you got? I mean, besides what's visible. Well, I couldn't find much of anything. I went over my clothing. There don't seem to be any any marks of any kind. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you got any money? A little over three hundred dollars. Let's have it. The purse too. All right. Uh huh. Lipstick, aspirin, bobby pins, Kleenex. Uh, nothing here. They couldn't have been bought in any drugstore. <sighs> powder. <coughs> hey, what kind of powder is this? Uh, then there was this in my coat pocket. A match folder. Sailor's Rest Bar, Hotel Calcutta, eleven hundred Embarcadero. Little number written inside. 120. What's that, a room number? I don't know. My purse, you have to destroy. Here's $10 of your own money. Buy a new one. 
Well. Did you find something? Coin, Chinese bit. Good luck piece, probably sewn in by whoever made it, maybe in China. That uh, ring any bells? Mm, no. No, I'm afraid not. Shoe. What? Your right shoe. Let's see it. Take it off. Uh, you aren't going to tear it up the way you did the purse, are you? Uh, dust. Plaster dust. Is that a clue? I don't know, is it? I'm not a detective. Well, you are in this case, baby. If it doesn't mean anything to you, it doesn't mean anything. Well, it doesn't. That's everything. What am I going to do? Well, let me see. First, we better give you a name. Oh, Farrell's all right. You look like, uh, well, uh, Lana would do, but, well, that's in use. Uh, how about, uh, Poppy for forgetfulness? Poppy O'Farrell. <laughs> that's a funny name. Oh, you think so? Huh? Uh, I think I like it. You do? I think I like you, too. <laughs> I liked her, too. There may have been blanks in her brain, but the rest of her figured. In the elevator, I started adding it up. And by the time we reached the street floor, it came to quite a tidy sum. Where are we going, Sam? Far, I hope. But uh, first, we're going to find your place to stay. Oh, yes, we must be practical. No use overdoing it, huh? Oh, no, Sam, I didn't mean... <gasps> Wait. What's the matter? You remember something? That man, the one who followed me this morning, he's standing right out there waiting. The one in the straw hat leaning against the newsstand? Yes. Where are you going, Sam? You stay here. I just remembered something I hoped I could forget. Hello, Shuggy. What brings you back to town? Do I know you? That doesn't matter. I know you. The name you were using when you blew this town was Shuggy Bellows. You wouldn't take the risk of showing your face here again unless the caper was worth it. You've got a big nose. Keep it clean. You've been tailing that girl all day. Why? Damn what damn. Who's Lathrop? I don't remember. Okay, I'll give you a chance to think it over. Hey, officer! You dirty hey, shamash yelling cop. No, 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 you don't. Come hey, here. Here, what's right going on here? Break it up. <laughs> oh, oh, Mr. Spade. Hey, is this fella giving you trouble now? Yeah, what kind of a beat are you pounding here, Clancy? Letting a cheap grifter like this walk around with an armpit full of gun? Or are they handing out permits to characters like these this day? Uh, these well, days? now, uh, how about that, son? Uh, have you a permit now? And a goop, copper. Oh, so, one of them clever lads he is. What? Come along, me bucko, before I lose me temper and give you your lumps now. Okay, Stop I'm coming. That's better now. Uh, much obliged, Mr. Spade. I'll pay you for this, Thomas. And a goop to you, too. I was sure he would, but I was also sure that I wouldn't have to worry about him for the rest of the night. I checked Poppy O'Farrell in at the Belvedere, locked her in her room, and told Tiny Stover, the house dick, to keep an eye on her. When I left him, he was, and uh, he seemed to be enjoying his work. Then I headed for the Embarcadero. I found the Hotel Calcutta, but I couldn't find the lobby. There wasn't any. It had been squeezed out by the Sailor's Rest Bar. So I tried the bosun-type bartender. Howdy, mate. You, you got business aboard? Yeah, where do I find the purser? Hey, one ashore. All the officers went ashore except the janitor. He's passed out in his bunk. Oh, uh -huh. how about the passengers? Uh, you're in the thick of them right now. They spend most of their time and their money right here. Uh, which one belongs to 120? Uh, you a dick? Yeah, but I got ten bucks. Well, what I can tell you ain't worth it, but thanks anyway. He stayed in his cabin. I only saw him at once. That's when he went ashore. I says to the deck steward, that's room clerk to you, who's a general. He says, name of Coralenko. I noticed him because he was a real creep, see? Six foot four, a solid brass. His head stuck up in the air, and he didn't move nothing from his stern to his shoulders. A real Frankenstein. Hey, uh, do I keep a ten? Yeah. Do I get a look at his room? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Who's stopping you? So I went. Nobody stopped me until I opened the door to 120. Then I stopped myself. It was an inside room with one small window and an air shaft. But it looked as if a flurry of snow had blown in. The floor and the rest of the flat surfaces were sprinkled with a fine, dirty white powder. It wasn't snow, it was dust. Plaster dust. Like the stuff I'd found in Poppy's handbag and on her shoes. I shook the place down, not expecting to find anything. I didn't until I opened the wardrobe. the body of a well-dressed ship surgeon, but his uniform was rumpled, torn, and bloodstained. From the look of him, his throat had been cut. 
I wondered if Poppy would be able to jog her memory that far back. When I found the murder weapon, I hoped she couldn't. I really did. It was not a knife. It was not even a razor. It was an electric buzzsaw. That tore it. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. And no wonder. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms the hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, and removes loose dandruff. What's more, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil is the only leading hair tonic that contains soothing lanolin. So ask for Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too. And mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. And now, back to the Wheel of Life caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. Times being what they are, I could use a little publicity. And so could you, Lieutenant Dundee, what with the elections coming up and you with no promotion all these years. This one time, I got it instead of you and wished I hadn't. The morning papers called it the buzzsaw murder and went on shamelessly from there. Horror killing related by private eye. Stan Slade, ex-Pinkerton man, mum on Mystery Woman. Elderly sleuth, dodges photographers, denies hotel visit, was in bed with Apple and Good Book, says Peeper. There wasn't a word of truth in it, mainly because nobody could get at the facts. I wasted most of the day down at headquarters trying to find out what name Shuggy Bellows had been booked under. Then I dropped in at the Belvedere. Poppy had checked out. I decided to go back to my office and drink poison. I hardly got the desk drawer open when a sobering influence walked in. It was a Mr. Six Feet Four of solid brass. The Frankenstein who had been described to me by the bartender as the occupant of room 120. Excuse me. I am Korlenko. Please, I shall sit down. I am so heavy. Make yourself at home. Oh. Mr. Swade. Uh, Swade. Uh, uh, excuse me. I am so heavy. I, I am Korlenko. So you told me. I am really Spade myself. So. Why are she hiding from me? Who? That girl, Miss Paget. Her, I am paying one month in advance, $300 American. Me, she have dessert. I am not rich, only moderately wealthy. But you understand, it's not a question from Modius alone. That ship's doctor, he was most kind to me. He cared to me even after I arrive. Now he are dead for his pains, his dirty trick. Yeah, 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 I know how you feel. Now, if you'll uh, take it a little easy, I think we'll get farther. You say this girl's name is uh, Paget, and she traveled with you. Uh, from Macau, da. Uh, where she is the Florence Nightingale for Portuguese hospitals, forcing me to employ her, all others being Chinese nuns. That figures. You were uh, sick? No, only I am so heavy, they are breaking my back in traffic accident, a rickshaw collusion. You're uh, wearing a plastic cast? Yes, like a turtle, I am close with my neck sticking out. Look, see? Now it is better as before. The ship's doctor trimmed the rough edges with buzz saw. Buzz, 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 I can walk. But it's like suit from armor, for which I alive. Look. I looked again where he opened his shirt front, exposing the gray-white shell of plaster that surrounded his trunk from collarbone to hips. In a six-inch circle over the left side of his chest, I counted four bullet gouges. I dug one of the slugs out and examined it. It was 32 caliber. The plastic cast, which was molded to the shape of his body, was no more than an inch thick. 
I didn't see how it had stopped the slugs, but it had. About then, the parts of Korolenko that were not held rigid in the cast began to tremble violently. Why are they doing this? Why? To a virtual, a helpless man. Why, Mr. Spade? Why? 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 Uh, where did you have that cast put on? Don't I said Macau? The Portuguese hospital there? The same. They are hanging me up with the neck and plastering me. Comes great pain, they put me to sleep from anesthetic. I, I are waking up in ambulance arriving at shipboard. Uh, why you wish I should tell you my operation? More important things we should be discussing. Yeah, I think so, too. I think Miss Paget and her friends had something they wanted to smuggle out of Macau and into San Francisco, and you're it. Oh, excuse me. I, I am not comprehensible. Look, I mean, while you were out with the anesthetic... They uh, planted the goods, whatever they are, in or under your cast. Oh, oh, that is why I am so heavy. The wheel, the wheel. The what? The wheel, look, I'll show you. He hauled a manila envelope out of his overcoat pocket and waved it in my face. I took it over to my desk and fished out the contents. It was a set of X-ray films. Three of his spine showing the fractures, four of the skull, three I couldn't figure out, and one of his rib cage... Only something new had been added. In silhouette, it looked like the wheel off of a child's wagon. What is it, this wheel? What to do? What to do? Six months, I must remain in this straight jacket. If I remove it, I die. If I keep it on, it, it, they kill me to get their smuggled. Well, you look to me like the luckiest man alive. That wheel, or whatever it is, saved your life by stopping four slugs. But still, I shall die. How shall I die? When shall I die? Your best advices, please. Korolenko, I think you'd better die right now. Excuse me? It's the only safe place for you. The morgue. I called my friend Maxie the morgue man, gave him pitch number 137596. He agreed to play along. An hour later, I stood on the curb, head bowed, hat in hand, as the morgue wagon drove away into the gathering mist. Stay facing away, uh. What do you want, Shuggy? I want to blast this gun straight through you, and I will if you give me any excuse at all. You sound like you mean that, Shuggy. You're getting smart, Shamus. I get going. Where to? Mr. Lathrop wants to see you. Shuggy, dear boy, you've not failed me this time. This will be the fabled Mr. Spade, eh? Come in, come in, come in. Ah, sit down, Mr. Spade. We'll talk. Tell your guns to get that pistol out of my ribs. Oh, yes, indeed, Sugar. You mustn't overdo it. And get him out of here. I'm tired and nervous, and my price goes up a thousand bucks every minute he's in this room. When I get to ten thousand, I kill him. Then the price jumps to a hundred to take care of me on a murder rap. I should ought to plug you downstairs. Come, come, Sugar. Don't be ungracious. You wait in the other room now. Okay, it's your party. I get mine later. <laughs> oh, dear. His bite's much worse than his bark, Mr. Spade. Don't start boring me so early in the evening. I came here to talk about the wheel. Oh, so you know about the wheel. I do better than that. I've got it. That may well be, but uh, do you know what to do with it? I got two possibilities. I can turn it over to the cops and you with it, or I can sit on it until it hatches. <laughs> A quaint conceit, sir. Round and round the little wheel goes, and where it shall stop, nobody knows. That's where you're wrong. It stops right here. So you better start placing your bets. Yeah, just what do you mean by that, sir? There's part of it. What is it? It's one of the slugs your guns will throw at Korolenko. I got three more just like it that I dug out of him before he was carried to the morgue. Well... An advantage, I'll admit. But uh, hardly worth your while to take advantage of. Don't be too sure of that. Just uh, how much do you know about the wheel? So far, it's been worth two human lives to you at the risk of your own. That tells me all I need to know. Oh, no, not quite. Men have been killed in hold-ups for a few paltry sovereigns, but the wheel oh, is a horse of another color. Well, let's not change wheel horses in midstream, Mr. Lathrop. <laughs> yes. You must understand that the wheel has no absolute finitive value. Uh, monetarily speaking, the British Museum might pay close on to 5,000 pounds, hot as it is for the privilege of returning it. <laughs> Occidentals aren't the puka saives that they once were in the Orient. The theft of the wheel, if countenanced by the Western powers, would have most grave consequences. Most grave. Uh, are you attending, sir? <sighs> Wake me up when you get to the point. Ah, well, the point, sir, is this. That little wheel, that little wheel of gold, is the wheel of life. 
which the Buddha himself is said to have received into his hands from paradise. Now, given such a relic, a few old Buddhist monks can set up a shrine which even in the most miserable surroundings can attract enough pilgrims to outgross Radio City, Madison Square Garden, and Miami Beach in season. To say nothing of Hialeah. Uh, yes, quite. In short, we propose to act as booking agents for the wheel on a royalty basis with the percentage of the house. Mm-hmm. Why did you bring it to San Francisco? But good God, sir. Were we to bargain in the Orient, we should be hacked to pieces in our beds. I'll settle for a lump sum and let you do the bargaining. Uh, and uh, your price, sir? We can talk money later. First, I got to give the cops somebody for the doctor's murder and for Korolenko. Uh-huh. Well, that ought not to be too difficult. Uh, when may I expect delivery? I'll check on it. I went out to St. James Infirmary. <laughs> City Mark. Maxie, Sam Spade. Yes, yeah, Sammy. Uh, deal's okay. Send it up. The address is... Sam, the... Sam, wait. Yeah? Sam, he ain't here no more. What happened? Somebody claimed him. A girl. Eh, said she's his daughter. What did he do? When I'm playing dead like you told him to. Maxie, where did she send him? Uh, Avalon Mortuary, Corner Lynch and Haight. Okay, uh, uh, by the way... Uh, yes, yeah, Sammy? Uh, Maxie, put some clean sheets in that morgue wagon, size 16. I may be your next passenger. At the Avalon Mortuary, the night watchman let me in. He said Mr. Korolenko's daughter had brought an overnight bag and was keeping a vigil by his beer in slumber room number seven. I approached on tiptoe. Just as I reached the door, I heard the most terrible sound I've ever heard. It was a buzzsaw biting into plaster. How deep, I didn't like to think. I did the first thing that popped into my head. I grabbed up a lamp from a console, smashed the bulb, and plunged it into a vase of flowers. As luck would have it, slumber room number seven was on the same fuse box. As luck would not have it, I was facing a desperate woman in the dark. I hugged the carpet while she emptied her gun. I hoped she didn't have a spare. I forgot about the buzzsaw. The room lighted up momentarily from the lights inside my head, and I staggered back against the wall. I waited for her to get her bearings again. There was no hope of me getting mine. Then I heard a big, hollow thud. The whole room shook, and the lights went on. Poppy O'Farrell and or Paget lay on the floor under the stony weight of Coralenko plus 60 pounds of plaster. Get up! Get up! You're crushing me! I can't. I'm so heavy. You, uh, you comfortable there, Coralenko? Comfortable in such situation? Do you ask the turtle? Are he comfortable? Is Faker on bed of nails? Is equally here as elsewhere. Yeah, okay, okay. Just, just hold her there until I get a statement. And he did. Item, statement by the aforesaid. It was like waking out of a nightmare you can't remember. Everything seemed out of proportion. That was her story, and I had to admire the way she stuck to it. But if you keep trying, I'm sure she'll get back enough of her memory to confess that she planted the Wheel of Life in Korolenko's turtle shell when she decided to double-cross Shuggy and Lathrop. They never tumbled to her hiding place. They were gunning for Korolenko because they thought Poppy was working with him, which was true in a way, but not the way that they thought. That's why they tortured the doctor in an effort to learn Kay's whereabouts. I understand your boys have picked up the rest of the trio, and they can tell you everything except why I conceived the brilliant idea of having Korolenko play dead. Between you and me, uh, amnesia's a handy little gadget to have around, Dundee. I'm trying to draw a few strategic blanks myself. Period. End of report. Pardon me, Mr. Spade. Yes. There are just a few little coincidentals that I do not find entirely reprehensible. Such, uh, such as? Well, I don't want to appear lucid or anything of that type. Believe me, you doesn't. I mean, don't it? Oh, you say the sweetest thing. Mm. Uh, but it's about the wheel. Oh, yes, the wheel. Well, I'll tell you what you do. You type that up. I've got to call in about that now. <laughs> Tonight, when you're making out your must-do list for tomorrow, why not include a reminder to get Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair? Honestly, man, you'll be delighted with the neat, natural way Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair. The way it relieves that annoying dryness and removes loose, ugly dandruff. Just try it and see if I'm not giving you a good steer. Make a note right now to call at your drug or toilet goods counter for Wild Root Cream Oil. 
Get the big economy bottle and the handy new tube that's easy to pack when you travel. Also, ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. down on the wheel of life? I certainly didn't. No, we won't know about that for six months. <laughs> because definitively, I mean definitely, that plaster cast has to stay on him. Doctor's orders, you know. Oh, but I won't be here six months from now. You can say that again. But I won't be here six months from now. Stop repeating yourself. But you just said you can say that again. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Just as distinctly as if I was sitting here. Uh-huh, that's what I like about you, Bernadine. A, a woman of distinction, that's what you are. Well, if you want to take me dancing, why don't you just say so? Oh, Bernadine. It's leap year, and I always say discrimination is the better part of value. You are absolutely corrupt. Well, I'm glad I'm right about something. Good night, Mr. Spade. Good night, and I'll say if it kills me, sweetheart. <laughs> The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tolman and Gil Dowd, with musical direction by Lud Gluskin. Gil Dowd directed tonight's broadcast in William Spear's absence. Join us again next Sunday for another adventure with Sam Spade. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keeping all the gals away. Hi, you baldy. Get Wild Root right. Away. If you're thinking of volunteering for the U.S. Army or Air Force, here's a word of reassurance. As an Army and Air Force man, you'll become a skilled professional in a specialized field. The training you get will always be useful, not only in military, but in civilian life as well. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. The non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Sam Spade, Detective Agency. Bernadine. Anything wrong? You sound almost human. It's not Bernadine, Sam. It's me, Effie. Eff! But I'll tell Bernadine about your compliment. How are things? Well, uh, I've made out as best I could. I don't want to... Don't want you to think that I begrudged you a vacation. After all, you have worked hard. You, uh, did deserve it. Sam Spade, is that all you have to say to me? I'm not putting the blame on you. After all, it is a state law, so I can hardly accuse you of letting me down at a time when I needed you most. Well, you might at least ask me if I had a good time. I'm sorry if your conscience bothered you. Oh, well, it didn't. I had a divine time, and I met all sorts of interesting people. Mostly men. You don't say. What else? Well, it was this desert ranch, you know, with a lot of uh, buttes around. You uh, mentioned those. No, Sam. No, no, no. They're the result of erosion. Those outdoor types, they go to pieces. Sam, are you pulling my leg? Not over the phone, Effie, but stay where you are. I'll be right down to look at your snapshots. And when you have the time, I'll dictate my report on the missing news hawk caper. <laughs> Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Wild Root Cream Oil. That's the famous name to remember, men, next time you buy hair tonic. And look what Wild Root Cream Oil does for you. 
It grooms your hair neatly and naturally. Wild Root Cream Oil also relieves dryness and removes loose, ugly dandruff. Yes, men, Wild Root Cream Oil is your shortcut to really handsome hair. So be smart. First chance you get, get Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. <laughs> Side of Canab on Virgin River. Canab, the Pearl of the West. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. And did I mention the buttes? Oh, well, they're very interesting. The uh, result of erosion. Yes. And it's authentic, too. Fay Hamlin's ranch. You uh, mean a working ranch? Yes. You see, that way you get into the spirit. Mm-hmm. My job was to feed the chickens. And that's how I met him. <sighs> One of the buttes? Oh, Sam, he's a very cultured gentleman. Culture smulcher. What's he do for a living? He, well, he, he cures stammering. You don't say. What's his name? Charlie Shank. Charlie Shank? He's the founder of the Shank Institute of Articulative Correction, which I should learn. Articulative Correction. Where is this institute? Oh, I have the address here. Um, General Delivery, Butte, Montana. Mm Mm-hmm. You're sure you didn't help him break parole, Effie? Oh, no. Oh, no, no. We just went on long walks together. Where to? Oh, different points of interest. Like, uh, like Wolf Canyon... Figures. Uh huh. He invited me on this camping ship, a trip, honorable, of course. Mm. But I couldn't go on account of my sunburn. Oh, oh. I had an awful, awful. Oh, I still got bad. it, you see. Mm. And then, then he went back to Butte. He had to leave in such a hurry, you couldn't even say goodbye. Well, it was a pity too, because an old friend he hadn't seen in years came looking for him just a few minutes later. With a warrant? No, no. He was an attendant in a nearby hospital. Mm. Mental? Oh yes, very intelligent. <coughs> he read me some of his poetry. Maybe you've heard it. Um, a loaf of bread. A jug of wine and thou. Yeah, wait a minute. Isn't that the ruby out of Omer Cayenne that was written by a guy named Fitzgerald? Well, of course. That's his pen name. Quite a penman. Yes, but he's paid his debt to society. And the other time it was a bad beef. Oh, no. He told me all about yeah, it. Yeah, sure. He cried on my shoulder afterwards. Sweetheart, when you make a mistake, it's a beaut. Sam, nothing happened. Well, I'm glad he cured you of stammering, anyhow. <clears throat> Ready? Oh, yeah. I've got a brand Work, new you notebook. Know. Life goes on. I've got a brand new notebook, Sam. I'll just turn over a new leaf. Not a bad idea, dear. <laughs> uh, date uh, July 18 to Mr. Alex M. Youngblood. Uh, mm, try that again. Mr. Alex M. Youngblood, P.O., Box 317, San Francisco, from Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Dear Mr. Youngblood, I need a vacation myself. You need Charlie Shank. <sighs> sound tired, Sam. Fortunately, until I met you, my only experience with any of the men and women who make your newspaper run had been with one of your corner newsboys who shortchanged me two times within as many days. I have not read your rag since. But your name looked imposing, and so did the $300 check upon which you had written it. Per your instructions, promptly at 4 p.m. on the 15th inst., I much through the litter of your city room toward a door marked A.M. Youngblood, publisher, managing editor, and city editor. I wondered if you were ambitious, frugal, or three men. I did not know that you had good taste until I saw the trim, 20-ish, and toothsome secretary in your outer office. Hello. You're new here, aren't you? Uh, well, I'm not exactly here. I'm just here to see Mr. Youngblood. Oh. The name is Spade. Samuel Spade? Sam, except for my most intimate friends. <laughs> well, my advice to you, Sam, is to be the hasty retreat. He's in a foul mood. Oh? Uh, why? Is he blind or older than he feels? I refer, of course, to your spectacular charm, Miss... Uh, if I may call you Miss. Oh, please, this is neither the time nor the place. My name is Phyllis Watson and my phone number is in the directory. If you're really interested. I could be. Thank you. And if a man answers, tell him you're my French teacher. We. Oui. <laughs> you better go in now. If you're late to an appointment with him, you're through. Do uh, you have any more words of wisdom? No, but I hope you can do something to improve his state of mind. Spade. That's right. You're almost late. Sit down, Spade. Cigar? Uh, no, thanks. Well, don't expect me to offer a drink. You aren't a drinker, I hope. You don't listen to the radio, do you? Well, you'll not drink in this office. Nothing here but a cooler filled with water from a clean, gurgling, laughing mountain stream. You sound like a reformed drunk, Mr. Youngblood. What's that? Well, it was a good many years ago. 
If you don't mind, I'll just paste up the weather report for my morning edition before we talk. Oh, you do that too, huh? Yes, obviously. And with good reasons. I remind myself that I was once a copy boy, and I find it a splendid way to, uh, at least once each day, to lower myself to the level of the working man. There we are. Very hot in Phoenix, I see. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, just what do you want a detective for, Mr. Youngblood? I was coming to that, Mr. Spade. Sorry. Now, uh, well, first let me warn you that your assignment is a highly confidential one. They all are. In this case, a man's life may be at stake. Mm-hmm. The situation, my newspaper, at my order and under my guidance, has launched a campaign against crime. Not aimed at the petty criminal, but at the easy living leeches at the controls of the rackets. The hoods and bankers' clothing. The mansion house parasites who direct the pickpockets, the second story men, the housebreakers, who gamble away yeah, half a million uh, dollars a year easy. and uh, pay uh, income taxes. Yeah, yeah, don't go to pieces. Of that uh, yes, I understand, I understand. Uh, you're after the boys on the safer side of the fences. Uh, uh, nicely put, Spade, yes. Oh, thank you. Well, the long and short of it is this. The author of the expose series, Ray McCulley, my top crime reporter, has been missing for two days. I want you to find him. What makes you think he's still alive? Good heavens, Spade. Why must you suggest that he isn't? Because if I were a mansion-housed parasite in danger of being unhoused by a newshawk, I'd see said newshawk standing in a cement block in the bottom of the bay. I will accept that only when no stone has been left unturned. Every straw and every haystack has been searched. Every... Uh, nook and cranny? Uh... Yes. Sounds as though you need at least one police force, Mr. Youngblood. Now, why don't you just... No, 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 no. Impossible. We've already had a brush with the police over the expose. I'll not be dictated to at this stage of the game. I started this investigation, and I'll finish it alone. Well, it's a pretty big order, Mr. Youngblood, but uh, times are tough. I'll see what I can do. Good. I hereby turn over to you all the resources and power of this, my newspaper. When one of my reporters is in trouble or danger, sir, I will spend every penny of my fortune, if necessary, to deliver aid and succor to his side. You then gave me Ray McCulley's expose stories to date. I saw why you, his family and friends, and his creditors could have been worried about him. They were hot. One followed a stolen car from the time of the heist through the alteration of the body color, tire brands, license number, motor serial number to the time it was shoved onto a used car lot. They named names all the way through. And another did the same to the firm of Otter, Badger, and Mole, furriers, and alleged manufacturers of coats from clouted pelts. Ray McCulley had dropped out of sight right after that story had been published. So I left your office hoping that I'd reach the address of Otter, Badger, and Moe before closing time. I did. The plushy showroom was occupied by a dozen attractive fur-bearing models, female, but wax. The live models, male, were wearing padded shoulders, pointed shoes, and coats tailored for underarm artillery. They would have looked more natural at Madame Tassard's waxworks, Bertram the burglar section. Hey, you, oh, hey, what'll that be? Something for a little woman? Uh, where do I find Mr. Otter? Are you the law? Uh, Leo sent me. He's in his office. Come on. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Don't crowd me. You say you want to see the boss? On business. Stop nudging me with a rod. In there. Hey, move. Okay, okay. Hey, your boss. Yes, Woody? Here's a Joe here to see you. Leo sent him. Well, nudge him in, Woody. No nudging, Woody. Well, well, well. So Leo's sending a man to see me. I wonder why. If you'll uh, comb this character here out of my hair, I'll try and tell you. Sit down, Woody. Mm. Thanks. You're new in town. Uh, yeah, that's why Leo sent me. A local muckraker named Ray McCulley interviewed you. He also interviewed Leo, but it didn't get printed yet. Uh, Leo wants to find him. So do I. How can I help? Well, uh, he walked out of here, went to his hotel, wrote the story, and mailed it in. That's the last anybody's seen of him. Uh, Leo was just sort of hoping that you'd already taken care of him. Not yet. That's all I wanted to know. Thanks. Just a moment. Yeah? Leo sending you out alone? Why not? That's a tough boy, that McCulley. He's got plenty of protection. That's what you need. What kind of protection? Go along with him, Woody. Who, me? You're Woody, aren't you? Now, look, uh, look, Mr. Otter. I don't want to look a gift horse in the mouth, but the way I see it, this is a a lone wolf-type caper. Hey, what's the matter, hey? You think I'm too good for you? Well, Woody, I wouldn't say that. Good. It's settled, then. Take care of him, Woody, and don't mix it up with any of Leo's boys. If he's out to get that rat McCulley, he's our friend. (laughs) 
was beginning to wonder who Leo was. I'd grabbed the name off a calendar on the wall, Leo's van and storage. I didn't know whether he was the Leo Mr. Otter didn't like, and I hoped I wouldn't find out. The best way I could think to keep from finding out was to shake Woody. On the way uptown, I walked them past four police stations. Crossing Market Street, I pushed them straight into the arms of a traffic cop who begged his pardon and let me off with a warning. At the Blue Bottle Bar and Grill, I gave Joe, the bartender, the Mickey Finn sign, but Woody liked it. He ordered another. Then he said he knew a place on Columbus where the drinks were even better. It was called Leo's Place. I wondered if that meant anything. Hey, oh, hey. Uh, who, me, huh? I want your drink. Don't you like this joint? Yeah, sure, it's fine. Uh, we're not getting anywhere, though. You really take your work serious. Me, when I go gun for somebody, I go where I'm least likely to succeed. You live long. Yeah. Uh, Woody, what do you know about this guy, uh, McCulley? You hear the puss. He says he's a rat. Yeah, but he said he's got plenty of protection. Who's furnishing it? Well, you see, there's a... Boy, oh, boy. Look at what just walk in. I looked. What I saw was not disappointing. She was wearing a skin-tight black satin with a plunging neckline and a new look only in places where it didn't matter. But she still looked enough like your secretary, Phyllis Watson, to be out of place in Leo's place. She didn't stay there long. She made a beeline through the kitchen to the rear exit. I made a beeline right after her. Woody was breathing down my neck as I started up the rickety outside stairway at the back of the building. I uh, stopped the landing and turned around to face him. See you later, Woody. I didn't wait to see if he made it all the way to the bottom of the stairs. I was more interested in what was going on at the top. A door had opened and Phyllis stepped inside. The man who let her in looked like Ray McCulley. Who are you? Well, the name is Spade. I don't know that name. Your boss hired me to find you. Private Dick. Yeah. Can I uh, talk to you for a minute? Sure. Put your hands behind your neck and walk up slow. Okay. All right. Go inside. Well, what's the matter? You're not acting glad to see me. This is the guy, fellas? Yes. Alex hired him this afternoon. There you see. Now, uh, what do you want me to tell Youngblood? You're not going to tell anybody anything. Oh. It caught me right behind the ear. The last thing I saw was that plunging neckline as Phyllis rushed forward. I didn't know whether she was rushing to my rescue or to get in a few licks of her own. Five seconds later, I didn't care. As the design of the linoleum slammed up at me, I had just time to wonder why, of all the people who were looking for Ray McCulley, I had to find him. Then I was out. Boing. Maced for my pains. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. And no wonder. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms the hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, and removes loose dandruff. What's more, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil is the only leading hair tonic that contains soothing lanolin. So ask for Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too. And mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. And now, back to the missing Newshawk caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. I was lying on the floor in a room with nothing in it but a sink, an army cot, a square of dirty linoleum, and a body. I staggered to my feet, ran some cold water over my head, and took a closer look. It was Ray McCulley. He was a very dead, crusading reporter. He'd been stabbed clean through with a long-bladed kitchen knife. It set on the handle, property of Leo's place. I went through his pockets. and his wallet, a press card, a police card, union card, and ten genuine, crisp, new thousand-dollar bills. 
That gave me a line on the killer. He was crazy. So was I. I left it on him, too. Folded up in his vest pocket, I found two newspaper clippings, one from the Chronicle and one from your paper. Both weather reports for the same date. It was very hot in Phoenix, according to both papers. But according to your weather report, the temperature in Needles, California, was 135 degrees. That needled me. So did the slip of paper I found on his shoe. The number nine and a date had been stamped on it with a rubber stamp. The date was the same as that of the weather reports. I turned it over. It said Ruthie's booth, Manson Bowling Alley. You're the cigar type. Corona's a panatelli. Uh, thanks. I'm just shopping. Uh, I got a nice line of notions. So have I. Uh, no, I mean the dolls, the Hollywood dolls. You know, for the bed, only a dollar plus tax. Very reasonable. Say, what's on your mind? Uh, Leo sent me. Oh. Are you going to collect the slips hereafter? Well, uh, not tonight. You see, I'm uh, sort of a troubleshooter. Leo's uh, checking up on some of the numbers that didn't come out right. Listen, I'll tell him to his face. I don't want any part of those wrong numbers. They're scary. Nuts. Who bought this one? Let me see. Oh, last Thursday. Oh, number nine. How can I forget? He put $500. And honest, if he's been around once, he's been around a hundred times to see if it paid off. Did it? What's his name? Mr. Spinelli. He buys a slip every day. And if you ask me, he's learned his system. Because he's been winning, you know. Dimes and then a dollar and then five dollars. And then when he come in with 500 on number nine until he dropped dead, did it win? Where does he live? <gasps> it did. Wait, I'll look on the sheet. Hey, somebody else was in just this afternoon. Give me that address. Hurry up, will you? It's right around the corner on Manson, 810. Say, maybe that's his system. Eight and one. Don't that add up to nine? Hey, what's the matter? Where are you going in such a run? Please, come back later. Tomorrow... Next week. Are you Mrs. Spinelli? Yes, please. I had so much trouble. Is your husband home? Oh, my poor man. They take him away. He's dead. Oh, I'm sorry. How did it happen? Who are you? I'm a detective. Maybe I can help you. May I come in? All right. Come on. It took quite a while to gain her confidence, and after that it took still quite a while to piece together the grief-stricken grumble of words that poured out of her. When I got it down in the form of a statement, I asked her to read it over. Item. Statement by Mrs. Arturo Spinelli. All the time he played those numbers. I told him they're just a bunch of gangsters. They don't let you win. Then he met this man Macaulay, all right, for the newspaper. My husband says this man shows him how to win. He wins and wins. Then he goes to bank and takes out all our savings. I begged for him not to do it. But no, no, he was greedy. And this Macaulay poisoned his mind. Sure, he won. And brought the money home in his hand. Ten thousand dollars. I don't want it. I am scared. I took it while he was sleeping with wine and gave it to the men. I tell him all I want is the 500. He tried to tell me we do good. We help catch the big gangsters. I say we don't want to do so good we get murdered in our beds. So he says, okay. But if I change mine, here is address. I don't change my mind. Because already my husband, he is dead. Has home. Stand. No, I don't change my mind. She signed it, and I left her alone with her grief. I wasn't working for you anymore, Mr. Youngblood. You hired me to find your reporter, and I had. And I wished I hadn't. The rest of it I did for myself. You weren't in your office when I got there, but Phyllis was. I found her behind the city desk in the act of dropping tomorrow morning's weather report into the slot. I grabbed it out of her hand. What? 
Oh, oh, it's you. Where's your boss? At home, I guess. We'll talk in his office. Come on. Sam, uh, I can explain how I have. You're going to be... explain plenty before I'm finished with you. Sit down. Oh, you... I don't have to be so rough. What's the matter with you? Plenty. I'm stupid. I was stupid to take this job, and I was stupid to play it cagey with you. I should have beaten the story out of you before the trouble started. It's a little late in the day now, but not too late to send you up for McCulley's murder. Oh, you're insane. Ray McCulley was... I'm the only one who ever tried to help and you. And I'm the only one who can place you in that room, not ten minutes before the murder. I told you I can explain Stop why... trying to save your own skin. Spinelli was only one of a half million poor dumb yucks that lose their nickels and dimes and dollars every day in the policy racket. Only he had the bad luck to win. There won't be any more lucky dead people like him if I have to make a patsy out of you to stop it. It won't stop it. Nothing will. Ray talked big and brave like you. Now he's dead. Yeah, with 10,000 bucks dirty money in his wallet. I won't let you say things like that. Ray was an honest reporter, too honest. He thought young blood meant what he said about that cleanup campaign. Yeah, he did. He wanted to run this town by himself, clean up his competition. When Ray started collecting material on the numbers racket, he still thought young blood was on the level. But that was before he stumbled onto the thing about the weather reports. Yeah, yeah, that was a new one. The old Dutch Schultz mob used to add up the stock market quotations. If they cheated, they knew their customers weren't good enough at arithmetic to prove it. But who knows how hot it is in Phoenix unless they live there. I don't know what you're talking about. Listen, that's how the number game works, sweetheart. The suckers pick a number from one to ten, see? The operators tally up the slips, and the least popular for that day has to win. The weather report doesn't have to pass through the copy desk, and with young blood pasting it up with a few strategic corrections, it was easy to make their winners look as if they were on the level. Oh. But of course, you had no way of knowing that. You only watched them do it day after day. You know, I couldn't understand why he did those things. It, it seemed silly falsifying a weather report, but it didn't seem as if it could do any harm. What did you meet McCulley for? To get your cut of the ten grand Spinelli was killed for? How dare you? I went there to warn him about Who you. Who killed him? I don't know. You're lying. All right, I'm lying. But I can prove that Ray was on the level. I've got the proof right here. The whole story he wrote on the numbers racket, even naming Youngblood as the head of it, his own publisher. I went there to get it. I was going to take it to another newspaper. Why didn't you? I can't tell you that. You don't have to. Mrs. Spinelli was confused, grief crazed. She had to put the blame on somebody, and when she did, she got her revenge the only way she thought she could. She may have been right about that, but she killed the wrong man. Why didn't you tell me you knew who killed Ray? I wanted to give you a chance to tell me yourself. I'm glad you didn't. And that, Mr. Youngblood, is the crop. I'm sure you appreciate the fact that I gave the double scoop to your paper. Like uh, Mrs. Spinelli, I have my own ideas of vengeance. Besides, it may up your circulation a little, and you can certainly use a little extra money for your defense. Uh, by the way, who's Leo? Uh, period, end of report. But Sam... Yes, Evie? I thought Mrs. Spinelli killed Ray McCulley. The vacation helped. You were absolutely correct. Mrs. Spinelli killed Mr. McCulley, if you'll pardon the expression. But why did she kill her husband? I was wrong. The vacation didn't help. You mean she didn't? She killed McCulley to avenge the murder of her husband. You mean Mr. McCulley killed Mr. Spinelli? Effie, stop. I'll go mad. Oh, you need a vacation, Sam. Look, type that up. The clatter of the keys may stimulate you to further cerebral activity. I beg your pardon, Sam? Brain work. Now, shoot. Oh, brain work. Oh, you know best. Tonight, men, or first thing tomorrow, get Wild Root Cream Oil and see what wonders it does for your hair. Notice how easy it is to apply. Notice what a neat, natural job it does of grooming your hair. Notice, too, how effectively Wild Root Cream Oil relieves annoying dryness and removes loose, ugly dandruff. No getting around it. Once you try it, you'll never be without it. So tonight, or first thing tomorrow, call at your drug or toilet goods counter for Wild Root Cream Oil. Get the big economy bottle and the handy new tube that's easy to pack when you travel. Also, ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic. Again and again, the choice of men... Who put good grooming first? Well, here it is, Sam. And you were absolutely right. The typing cleared my mind. It's all clear now except for one thing. Well, let's clear that up right away. Why did Mrs. Spinelli kill her husband? She did not kill her husband. Oh, I'm sorry. I meant, why did Mr. McCulley kill Mr. Spinelli? Kelly did not kill Spinelli. Who's Kelly? McCulley. McCulley's real name was Kelly? Now, let's start all over again. Disregard everything we said up until now. Make your mind a complete blank. All right, Sam. In the first place, McCulley did not kill Spinelli. That's what I said. It was his wife, wasn't it? Now, wasn't it, Sam? Oh, stop teasing me. 
Sam, why do you look at me like that? Effie, Mr. Spinelli was killed by one of the policy racket hoods to get back the ten grand he won on the numbers game. Then how did the money get into Kelly's pocket? Macaulay's. Why do you insist on using his alias, Sam? Effie, Effie that was a tip of the song. I, I mean, look, Mrs. Spinelli took it to him because she was afraid her husband might be killed then for it. Then why didn't they take the money when they killed him? Because Mrs. Spinelli had already taken it. Then she did kill him. Go home, Effie. All right, Sam. I'm sorry I'm so irritable to you, but I, I thought it's... Well, it's been so long since oh, I've no, been here, you there, know, Sam. Angel, and I... Angel, you're just tired. Vacations have a habit of doing that to you. After a week or two in the office, you'll be all rested up again. I'll take it You easy. act as though you thought my mind were affected. Come here. Come Sam, here. now don't my sunburn. Oh, it hurts. Mm. It's nice to have you back. You look good, too. All tanned and healthy. You're... It's great. I think my nose is feeling... Well, don't pick at it. <laughs> I won't. <laughs> Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd, with musical direction by Lud Gluskin. Gil Dowd directed tonight's broadcast in William Spears' absence. Join us again next Sunday for another adventure with Sam Spade, brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keeping all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get Wild Root right away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective, brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Detective Agency. Same what, sweetheart? Oh, Sam, how did it go? Well, it uh, wasn't exactly a ten and one outfit. Uh, more of a mud show, dog and pony type, you know, rag front. Sam, what are you talking about? Hmm? And by the way, where were you last night? I uh, missed the last bus in from the cow palace, so I had to do a star pitch. Connie talk at me. Oh, if you think I'm going to ask what a star pitch is, you're mistaken. What were you doing at the cow palace? Oh, just bulling around. Oh, Sam? Yes? Um, Sam? Yes? Sam... Uh, you ask too many questions. Sweetheart, in the patois of the carnival, I'll be right down to pitch my spiel, spiel my pitch, and make with a canvas on the bluebeard caper. Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama... Join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Say, Mom, if the summer winds are making Junior's hair drier and mussier than it should be, why not borrow a little of Dad's Wild Root Cream Oil and restore that sweet, angelic look? You'll find Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic comes in handy for every member of the family. It grooms the hair so neatly and naturally, relieves that summer dryness, and removes loose dandruff, too. Better check on your supply right now. If it's running low, then tonight or tomorrow, first thing, get Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. <laughs> Oh, 
Ready, Effie? Yes, Sam. By the way, what is a star pitch? Hmm? Oh, your clothes. You look as if you'd slept on the ground. <clears throat> That's what it is. Uh, date, August 8, 1948. Two, Detective Lieutenant Dundee. Homicide detail, San Francisco Police. From Samuel Spade, license number 17596. Subject, the uh, Bluebeard Caper. I uh, will not offer as an extenuating circumstance the fact that business is bad all over. But it is true that I had been sitting in my office for four hours and the phone had not rung once. This one didn't phone. From the looks of him, he didn't have the required nickel. But the hangover he was wearing under his eyes had cost someone a pretty penny, so I figured his credit might be good somewhere. Uh, Mr. Spade? Yeah? Oh, my head. Here, try this. Oh. Want it mixed? Oh, uh, no, no, no soda. I couldn't stand the noise. Where'd you wake up? In these same clothes. Figures. Uh, it, it all started at my sister's engagement party. Uh, mint juleps. Mm. They must have been full of flukum. Flukum? Uh, you don't happen to have an ice bag. It's customary for my clients to bring their own. Oh. Well, now here's a spiel. Uh, did I tell you my name? The name you gave my secretary was Ned Towers. You want to stick with that? Uh, yeah, Ned. Uh, Ned Towers, yeah. Uh, it, it's about my sister. She's... Um, her name? Uh, Sylvia. Sylvia Towers. Uh, Sylvia Towers. Uh, but it's not about her, really. It's about that bluebird. I, I mean, bluebird she's married. Uh, Jefferson Davis Calhoun. What about him? Oh, that, that marriage has got to be stopped. I found out that his name's not Calhoun at all. That he's been married three times under three different names. And that all his wives died mysteriously. And, and that he collected their insurance... And now he's talked my sister into insuring herself for a hundred thousand bucks in his favor. When did you learn all this? In a barber shop yesterday. Oh. I, I went in to get a manicure and I picked up this old detective magazine. Here's his picture. Oh, look at it. I had heard of the case. In his heyday, the papers had called him the Mint Julep Romeo. And any name he happened to be using at the time had Colonel in front of it. None of his three wives had survived the honeymoon. Wife number one, an aviatrix, bailed out at 10,000 feet over Mount Hood along with her husband. His parachute opened, hers didn't. They found the body the following spring. Wife number two, a snake dancer, died of snake bite when she squared off with a full fang diamond back instead of her usual non-poisonous partner. The cause of death was never officially proven because the body was embalmed by mistake, it said there, before the coroner arrived. And finally, number three... A professional stunt woman disappeared over Niagara Falls in a beer keg instead of her specially designed barrel and was never seen again. Well, Mr. Spain? Yeah, but are you uh, sure your sister's fiancé, this uh, Calhoun, is the same guy? Well, here's a picture of them together. Their engagement photograph. What do you think? Hmm. Brunette? My sister? Redhead. Uh, that's him on our left. Redhead. Well, uh, Mr. Towers, are we going to sit idly by and see another poor girl go to her death? How much money you got? About a hundred dollars. I'll take fifty now. You are going to help. How much does she already know? I tried to tell her. She's beautiful. She wouldn't even listen. I thought she might listen to you. I pray she will, Ned. I pray she will. There were two aspects of the case that I wanted to look over more closely. A, Sylvia's red hair, and B, the red splotches on my client's face. I had a hunch she might be suffering from more than a hangover. So I dropped him at the address of a medical friend of mine who specializes in poisons. He said the tests would take most of the afternoon, so I decided to find out who was Sylvia, what was she, was she as kind as she was fair. Yes? Yes. I beg your pardon? Miss Towers? Yes, I'm Sylvia Towers. Are you the florist? You're expecting maybe a detective? Come in. Thanks, I will. Well, as a matter of fact, I wasn't expecting a florist or anyone else. But I'm glad to see you. I really am. Huh? Sit down here. I was just relaxing. Oh, no, over here. Oh. Well, why not? There. Isn't this more cozy? Yeah. Take your hat off. Oh. You'll have me believing you really are a detective. What do I look like? Well, I'll have to mull it over. Now, don't tell me. Let me dream. Look, Sylvia. Uh, Miss uh, Powers, I mean. Oh, uh, Sylvia. I like the way you dress. Nice and casual. Oh, you do? But, you know, 
You really should wear a handkerchief. Hey, hey. <laughs> you ticklish. Well, look, if you want to frisk me, get it all the way. That's your apartment. you got a right to. Well, isn't this way nice? Sure, it's fine. It's just that, uh, well, you know, I just didn't expect. I uh, just didn't expect. Well, what do you want, a butterfly act? No, it's just that my feelings have hurt you. Haven't asked me who I am or what I'm doing here or anything. Oh, I don't care. I like you. Is this how you got engaged to Calhoun? No, he was selling some phony stock certificates, so I bought a few. They were phony, so you bought a few. Figures? He'd had bad luck with marriage. It was the only way I could force the issue. You're forcing him into marrying you? Darling, don't be so critical. I did it very nicely. I'm sure you did, but why? Oh, I don't know. He's so... so courtly. A real southern gentleman. How real? Uh, hand me that cushion, darling. Oh. Oh, no. Here. Behind my head. Oh. Oh, that's better. Oh, don't go away. Why do you want to be number four on the Bluebeard Parade? Oh, do you really think he did kill them? Oh, that's one of two theories. He either did or he didn't. Oh, I love your hair. <clears throat> so nice, bristly. <clears throat> Does this bother you? Yeah, but don't stop. Uh, now, uh, wait a minute. Look, I've... Uh... I got my client to think about, and I'm, I'm trying to think about it. Darling. I didn't want to take this assignment, but he really seemed to be worried about you. Oh, now, who on earth would be worried about me? I'm a little worried about you myself, and I'm not even distantly related to you. Well, don't say that yet. This marriage may not last long. Don't you say that. Oh, I know his marital life has been full of tragedy. But I'm not superstitious. I think I may change his luck. Okay, Sylvia, okay, it's your life. I told your brother I'd talk to you, and I have. My brother? Yeah, Ned. I think maybe your boyfriend tried to poison him last night. Oh, no. I... Uh -huh. Oh, Jeff, you're just in time. Well, my dear, we will discuss this further in private. I have only this to say at the present time. In the South, it is not customary for a lady to receive a gentleman alone just prior to her marriage to another gentleman. But, Jeff... I know your motives were pure and innocent. Customs differ, that's all. I am Colonel Calhoun at your service, sir. I'll uh, call you when I need you. I'm afraid I must ask you to remain. Sylvia? Oh, Jeff, I meant to tell you. It was just a flirtation. Yeah, that's I didn't all. think it... You mean... Well, she didn't think. He made certain proposals? Well, what well, did I do? What could she do? He said there were things in your past, Jeff. Yeah, that's what I said. Things that... Oh, well, there, there, my dear. It was blackmail. That's all I wanted. I did it for you, Jeff. Go to your chamber, you. Sylvia. I will deal with this adventurer. If this were the South, there would be better ways. But never fear. Where there's a Calhoun there, too, you will find Southern chivalry. Please. No, Jeff. Phone the police. Sylvia, I must insist that you do as I say. Very well, Jeff. You know best. Yeah. Well, sir, how about you and me putting our heads together over little old mint julep, huh? Thanks, <laughs> I'm not thirsty. Uh, what's the pitch, Colonel? How come your girlfriend yelled, hey, Rube, just now? What is your asking price, sir? What's your bid? Uh, 5000 now, 5000 after she's buried, 20000 after the insurance people pays off. No dice. Caper's worth a hundred grand. Fifty for me, fifty for you. That is out of the question, sir. Okay, from here I go to the cot. Uh, then our son, let's not be hasty about this. It will require a slight change of plan, but, uh, I reckon I can swing it. All right, fifty-fifty. When are you gonna knock her off? Shh, shh. You want her to fly the coop? Is there another way out of here? Well, not that I know of, but, uh, she's crafty. She's crafty. Well, come on, let's get it over. Yes, you're right. Maybe now or never. That's right. Sylvia? Hey, wait a minute. Huh? Come here. What is it? How are you going to do it? Well, hit her with this and then out the window. Let me see, then. Gee, that's got quite a heft to it. Where'd you get this sap? Souvenir of Niagara Falls. Know where you're going to get it? What are you, Yankee? <laughs> The souvenir of Niagara Falls was deadlier than I thought. The blow spun him around like a top, and he went down on the other side of the room, taking the bar and the mint julep ingredients along with him. I headed for the room Sylvia disappeared into. But she had already disappeared out of it. I looked in the closets, the bathroom, under the bed, tapped the walls for secret panels, and then forced myself to look out the only possible exit, the open window. Ten stories, sheer drop to the street. Two stories, sheer unclimbable masonry to the roof. Now get this, Dundee. No other exit, 
No horizontal ledges, drain pipes, niches, cornices, not even a helicopter landing. I asked myself, who is Sylvia? What is she? The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead, socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. And no wonder. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms the hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, and removes loose dandruff. What's more, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil is the only leading hair tonic that contains soothing lanolin. So ask for Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too. And mothers say it's grand for trading children's hair. And now, back to the Bluebeard Caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. There was no use wasting any time trying to figure out how Sylvia had done whatever she had done to escape from that escape-proof room. There was nothing of interest in it but a diving helmet, deep-sea type, and the current issue of Billboard, a magazine which records the movements of show people. Under uh, carnivals and tent shows, an item was circled. Colonel Carlyle's (laughs) colossal carnival and tent show, which was currently playing San Francisco out by the Cow Palace. That reminded me of the colonel in the next room. I went in to hit him again, but somehow his not being there didn't surprise me a bit. What I found on the roof did surprise me a little. It was a rope and grappling hook, human fly type, which fitted with the circusy aspect the caper was beginning to take on. But I'd never have taken Sylvia for a stunt woman. I uh, did a neat, uh, deep knee bend to get into condition for what lay ahead. Slid down the banister to the top floor, somersaulted into an elevator, and rode it down to the lobby, no hands. Pausing only to acknowledge the applause of the scrub woman, I skated on over to the phone booth. Sylvia's hands like the night. Here, uh, uh, Dr. Mandel's office. Bernie, Sam Spade. Oh, say, I'm glad you called, Sam. That uh, patient you brought in here, uh, Ned Cowers? Yeah, what about him? Well, your hunch was right. There was enough poison in him to kill him twice. Uh-huh. And that ain't all. He dead? Mm, no. Then what's all? Well, his stomach had enough foreign objects in it to keep all the newspapers in town in Monday morning feature stories for the rest of the year. What type foreign objects? Oh, uh, glassware, spoons, hunting knives. Nothing valuable. Where'd you send him? Oh, he he wasn't a hospital case, Sam. Enough poison to kill him twice, glassware, spoons, hunting knives, and not a hospital case, huh? The poison, he's uh, developed an immunity. The other stuff, uh, it's harmless. Harmless, Do you want me to send you the complete report? Uh, no, no. Forget it, Bernie. You've given me enough. Thanks. From then on, Dundee, it was, uh, mostly entertainment. I, uh, headed to the carnival grounds outside the town, and, uh, Colonel Carlyle's Carlossal Carnival and tent show unfolded before my very eyes just west of the cow palace. In the interests of artistic endeavor, Mademoiselle Mahala, the favorite dancing girl of the Sultan of Zanzibar, brought direct from the perfume gardens of the Mystic Orient, every muscle of a gorgeous body shakes. And now, now, ladies and gentlemen, in the interest of science and the furtherance of national defense, one of the medical miracles of the 20th century. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, a man with the iron stomach and the asbestos esophagus, Professor Delator. Professor, if you please, sir, give the folks a sample of your control over the fiery elements. I will light the torch and hand the to the professor. And now, Professor, if you will kindly... The coach dancer left me cold, but the uh, fire-eating professor looked hot. 
It was none other than my client, the man who had called himself Ned Towers. I moved as close to the platform as I could without setting fire to myself and caught his eye. When he caught mine, it singed my eyelashes. Hey, scream all I got my act to do. I can't talk to nobody. Where's the colonel? Uh, there ain't any colonel, just for the banner tack. Where's your sister? I ain't got no sister. Then who is Sylvia? Hey, do me a favor, Shamus. Keep the 50 and forget the whole pitch. Now be it, huh? Oh, I want to see the show. Okay, you paid for your duck. Stare your eyes out if you want to. Okay, but just start squawking. They're drifting away. And that, ladies and gentlemen, that was only a sample. Only a sample. Why, he eats the stone and throws the beach away. And he uses powdered poison on his soft boy legs. Now tell me, if you will, is there a doctor in the crowd? I uh, drifted on down the midway. There was uh, Boona Boona, nature boy. Gilda and Hilda, the Siamese twins. There was Shorty, the fat man, and Fatty, the short man. A bearded lady and several natural freaks of nature. At the very end, there was a big canvas enclosure. The act was called the Three Death-Defying Darlings. From the noise inside, I judged that to be an understatement. I bought a ticket and got inside just in time to see a trim, energetic blonde in tailored coveralls crawl out of the twisted wreckage of the car. She'd just driven point blank into a concrete wall at an advertised speed of 80 miles an hour. She took a bow, tripped lightly out of the ring, and a brunette about the same size and shape, but wearing a costume consisting mainly of three live rattlesnakes, passed her coming in. I swear she did. I also swear that she danced so well I didn't even notice the snakes after I got used to them. Before the lead snake had taken its final bow and wriggled out of sight, a redhead in green coveralls appeared at the top of a 60-foot tower. She climbed into a barrel and some stupid fool pushed her off. The tank she landed in was no more than three feet across and couldn't have had more than a foot of water in it. But she emerged from the splinters with her face wet and some of the greasy carnival-type makeup washed off. The red-headed branch of the death-defying darlings was, you guessed it, that miraculous escape artist, the one and only Sylvia. I was anxious to meet the rest of the act, so I vaulted over the canvas to their trailer dressing room. There was a sinister buzzing sound at my ankles as I entered. I jumped out of the way just in time to miss getting bitten by one of the brunette's dancing partners, the Diamondback. Sylvia looked at me pityingly, grabbed it expertly just behind the head, and shoved it down into its basket. Sam! You should have known better than to come in here unannounced. Strangers make Salome terribly nervous. Then we're even. How did you know I was here? I didn't. I was looking for my client. Then you are working for Ned. Who else? Well, when I heard you bargaining with Jeff, I didn't know what to think. Before that, I'd been so sure. Look, sweetheart, I haven't been sure of anything in this caper from the start, least of all you. No matter how sure I get, I still won't believe it. Look at me, Sam. Touch me. I'm only flesh and blood. Yeah, well, anyhow, uh... How did you uh, meet yourself coming on with the snakes when you went out in the coveralls? Oh, zippers. I was wearing the snakes underneath all the time. Snakes? Uh, doesn't the auto crash make them nervous? Oh, no. They're used to it. Mother trains them. That was after father... Never mind your family. Let's talk about you. All three of you. Well, after mother and father... Well, the act was a threesome, you see, and they wouldn't keep me on as a single. Yeah. So Jeff Calhoun worked out a routine so only one of me would be on at one time. That figures. How often do you uh, come out of it alive? You mustn't say things like that, even in joking. I'm terribly out of condition. I haven't had a real workout since... Since you went over Niagara Falls on that beer keg? And by the way, how did you manage that? It's simple. Relaxation. Secret of everything. I could teach you that, Sam, darling. Mm. Jeff could never learn it. How long do you think we'd get away with it, sweetheart? Aren't you taking rather a lot for granted? Maybe not enough. So far as I know, you've only been killed and resurrected three times. Darling, if it frightens you, I promise I'll never do it again. How did you drop 10,000 feet without a parachute? Oh, that Mount Hood stunt? Hmm. I crash-landed the plane, set fire to it. There were witnesses. Something dropped. Oh, nothing but a weighted flight suit. Whose body was that they found? There are always bodies when the snow melts. By the time they get to them, they could be anybody. Oh, that's a relief. Uh, what about that other body? Which other one, darling? When you were embalmed after the snake bite. Oh, oh. Well, Jeff just claimed somebody from the morgue that nobody else wanted. Don't be so critical, darling. We didn't hurt anybody. Better not try to tell that to those insurance companies. Well, they should be happy. Jeff says it helps them with their taxes. 
Does it make you happy, dying and being dug up every year or so? Well, it's better than doing it every night. But I couldn't go back to Jeff. He lost his nerve after Ned found out. You see, Ned's the only one left who knew me in the old days. If I were dead, he couldn't prove anything. Jeff really meant to kill me this time. What was Ned after? Blackmail? Oh, no. He wanted me back with the show. He hired you to frighten Jeff into letting me go. After all, I am the best threesome in the business. Well, uh, uh, anyway, in the stunt field. Did you see my review in Billboard? I saw for myself. You know something? I was thinking. With all you know about crime... Don't say it. But, darling, it's so easy, and we could have a honeymoon every time I, I came back and we got married again. Thanks for the offer, but if I get married, I want my wife to stay alive every night. But I wouldn't really be dead. Only legally, for the insurance. Only legally, Sam. Come here. Sam, darling. Look, uh, <laughs> sweetheart, let's not relax. You're not safe. Not as long as that insurance policy's floating around with Jeff's name on it as beneficiary. He'd never think of looking for me here. All the same, you better take that policy into town in the morning and make some changes. Where is it? Oh, it's in my safe. You got a safe here in this trailer? Oh, well, it's just a secret place. I only call it a safe. But it is safe. Oh, dear, I thought I'd find you here. But I hardly expected to see Mr. Spade. You don't surprise me a bit, Bluebeard. Hello, Jeff. Sit down and stop waving that revolver. What do you want? That policy. I heard every word you two have been saying. Not that that piece of paper means anything. You won't even be around when the bank's open. But having the original policy in my hand will save a lot of delay, red tape. Of course, Jeff. Where is it? Uh, oh, what's the use? It's in the basket, right by the side of your chair. Wait a minute. Don't move, Spade. If you do, I'll bless you. Listen to me. Don't raise so this that is list. You're safe. Still a child, aren't you, Sylvia? Don't do it, Calhoun. Don't do it. <laughs> And that lieutenant dear took the lid right off of the caper. Due to my Boy Scout training, my split-second timing, and the fact that Salome's fang missed an artery by a thirtieth of an inch, I understand uh, Calhoun will live long enough, which as far as I'm concerned is any length of time you care to name. About Sylvia, I uh, really don't know how to advise you there, but if you're uh, planning on charging her with attempted homicide, you'll find that there are three darling sisters listed as U.S. citizens and residents of California. It might be hard to figure out which one of her to indict. Period. Uh, end of Nightmare Alley, Bluebeard Division. Any uh, questions, F? Oh, just one, Sam. A grammatical error, but I'll correct it. And just whom do you think you are to be correcting my grammar? Who, Sam? Nominative case. Nominal. Nominative, Sam. The most frequently used cases in English are... Nominative, accusative, and possessive. Mm. Now, I'm referring to your sentence which reads, It might be hard to figure out which one of her to indict. Yeah. Of course, you meant them, since they're three darling sisters. Her uh, being singular. Indeed, her was singular, Effie. Oh, Sam, you made a joke. That's a very small one. Now, uh, type that up and leave my grammar as is. It's colorful. Oh, very well, Sam. I'll just fix the syntax as I go along. Syntax? In California? <laughs> Say, are you looking for a hair tonic that will groom your hair neatly and naturally? Then you're looking for Wild Root Cream Oil. Want a hair tonic that relieves annoying dryness? Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Like a hair tonic that removes loose, ugly dandruff? The answer again is Wild Root Cream Oil, the famous hair tonic that gives you the big advantages men consider most important. Step up to your drug or toilet goods counter first chance you get and ask for Wild Root Cream Oil in the big economy bottle, and the handy new tube that's easy to pack when you travel. Also, ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Right, she was only one girl, so I left it to her and made the correction back farther. Back where, Twinkle Toes? The sentence just prior. Hmm? Twinkle Toes. Hmm. You know, where you said three darling sisters, I changed it to one. That's impossible. It takes two to make a sister. That is not funny, Sam. Who's laughing? It's no laughing matter, Sam. After all, that Sylvia, the darling sister, whatever she's... Now, I don't care if she can go over Niagara Falls in a barrel. Let's get it right, a beer keg. In fact, the only funny thing is you being taken in. After all, snake charmers of that type are a dime a dozen. Oh, here's 20 cents. Phone up that place. What place? Where you get the red-headed snake charmers, 12 for 10 cents. <laughs> 
dime a dozen, Sam. It's a figment of speech. Mm, you can say that again, sweetheart. Penny, to be three people, all with different hair, and wearing snakes under a coverall. Oh, okay. No normal girl would do that, Sam. Hmm, I don't know. Women do all kinds of work. Uh, oh, Sam. Why can't I be an adventurous like some girls are? I wouldn't trade you for 30 cents worth of snake charmers. Oh, Sam. That's the nicest thing you ever said to Well, me. next to the nicest. Good night, Sam. Good night, Salome. Twinkle, Salome. Twinkle, Salome. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Dove. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tolman and Gil Dowd, with musical direction by Lud Gluskin. Join us again next Sunday when author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keeping all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get Wild Root right away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective, brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic the non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Sam Spade Detective Agency. That is the correct answer. You have just won $104 million, six deep freeze units, a stable of polo ponies with matching saddle soap, a terry cloth robe with chocolate bars pre-melted into the pockets, and a full-size, real, honest-to-goodness dreadnought, such as is used by Uncle Sam's Navy. Oh, I'm sorry you'll have to call back. I'm expecting to be taking dictation from my employer very shortly. Oh, I am sorry. Your time is up. And Edna St. Vincent Markowitz, who sent in the question, gets bumped off in front of the studio audience gathered in the Dredgewood Room here in Columbia Square. Next night, don't answer your phone, stupid. Oh, Sam. Let's have no coaching, please. Oh, well, did you find the cop? Was it murder? Was it really worth, um... Well, well, you know, priceless and like that, and was it fun? Yes, 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 and no. And finally, are you kidding? Well, then why was it called the Vapio Cup? It's a very old Greek expression, which is what I'll be wearing as I sit in your lap dictating my report on the Vapio Cup caper. <laughs> Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Remember the Romeo of yesteryear? Hair parted in the middle, all plastered down... Man, what a difference today. Today, all a guy has to do to impress a gal is use Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms the hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose dandruff. If you're still using old-fashioned hair tonics, or none at all, then for her sake, spruce up today with Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. In bottles or the handy new tube, it's again and again the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. Blow the man down, bullies, blow the man down. Why do they want to blow the man down? Uh, 
uh, date, uh, August 22nd, 1948, to uh, Jethro Chiswick, Esquire. Oh, spelling, Sam. Uh, E-S-Q-U... No, Sam, I meant the name. It's, um... Chisro Jethwick. I did not say Chisro Jethwick. I said Jesro Chithwick. I mean Chisro... Ch- uh, look, we'll check it later. Oh, Sam, it might... I have an uncle in Berkeley named Smithwick. Leave your family out of this, Eph. But he's only by marriage, Sam. It's quite a common name. Name three people named Chiswick. No, Smithwick, Sam. Now, let's see. There's Uncle George and Aunt Amelia by a previous marriage. Then there's my cousin Rupert on the Christie side. When you have finished ruminating amongst the foliage of your family tree, Miss Perrine. Well, I only mentioned it in connection with right, that name we'll that you thought you... All right, we'll all over again. Tear out that page. Yes, Your Highness? No, no, please. No need to curtsy. Uh, to uh, Jethro Chiswick. No comment, please. From Samuel Spade, license number 137596. <clears throat> What's that? Nothing, sir, nothing. Throat. Subject, the Vafio Cupcaper. Dear Commodore, that's the way I like you. Meek. I had always considered myself fairly well-versed in the subject of cups. But if anybody had told me there was such a thing as a Vafio Cup, they could have knocked me over with one, which they did. Mr. Spade? Yeah. I'm Chester A. Brody. I talked with your secretary on the phone. Do you follow? Oh, uh, yes, Mr. Brody. Sit down. Rest your package. Thank you. I prefer to hold it for the time being. My card, sir. Theophilus and Brody, importers and exporters, mm-hmm. Mr. Theophilus is my partner. Dimitri Theophilus. Do you follow? I follow. It was Mr. Theophilus who brought the Vafio Cup into the firm. I furnished the cash capital. Vafio Cup, I do not follow. Yes, indeed. The only one of these treasures to fall into private hands. One of the fabulous Vafio Cups. Those exquisite and cunningly wrought examples of the art of the ancient Grecian goldsmith. Excavated by the great Schliemann from a beehive tomb in Sparta. Hmm, beehive. Mycenaean age. Just west of the Lion Gate. Oh, the Lion Gate. Pardon me, uh, Mr. Brody. Are you trying to tell me that this cup is very valuable? Priceless. And that you will finally manage to find a buyer? Do you follow? And that you want me to deliver that package containing your priceless cup and return with your customer's cash? Accurately put. I presume you're bonded. Uncork me and see for yourself. <laughs> you are a droll fellow, to be sure. I had a light breakfast, drolls and coffee. Now, uh, what is this uh, Vafio cup? I will show it to you. You're about to see a treasure, but few eyes have looked upon in our time, Mr. Spade. The Vafio cup. Handle it carefully. It's fragile. You could crush it in your hand like so much tinfoil. Yet this golden relic of a golden age has come down through the centuries miraculously unscathed. Note the delicately wrought lines of the bas-relief. The exquisite draperies on the figure of the caryatid. The anguish on the face of the fallen hunter. The sheer brute force of the wild boar charging to the kill. Holding this golden cup in your hands, you encompass 3,000 years. Do you comprehend why there's no question of insurance here? Frankly, I don't. My dear man, an item such as this is worth only as much as a collector will pay for it. This particular collector has offered $200,000. It might never be offered again. You follow? I follow. Very well. Here's your fee. $100. I follow. And here is the address of my client in Los Angeles, Commodore Jethro Chiswick. Oh, now, wait a minute. You will take the noon train. Any questions? Yeah, why can't I go on a plane? Because I've placed an item in this afternoon's papers to the effect that the treasure is to be transported by plane. If I were a gunner and I read that item, I'd uh, take the train. That would be your first thought. Then you would think they're saying they're taking the plane to make me think they're taking the train. Therefore, you would take the plane after all. Oh, would you? If you were really clever, you might say they're taking the plane to make one think it's the train, so I'll take the plane after all, and therefore... Never mind. By this time, he's decided on the bus. The train is perfectly safe. You follow? The package was light in the drawing room and the train was comfortable. Seemed like an easy way to earn a hundred bucks. I knew it wouldn't last. Never does. I was prepared for the knock on the door and I got ready for the inevitable small dark man who plays the Peter Lorre part, but this one fooled me. He was a tall, thin actor with sandy hair. Okay, Shamus, hand over the package. You won't be no trouble. Sure, there it is on the seat. Take it. Huh? It's okay. You got me covered. I won't make any move. Hey, what are you trying to pull? It's a stick-up, isn't it? Hey, maybe I got the wrong compartment. No, that's it. The cup's in there. Unwrap it and see for yourself. Oh, no, you don't. I ain't picking up no booby traps. Oh, you're yellow, huh? <laughs> I know that one, too. I don't cut no ice for me. Suit yourself. 
Game of gin? Hey, you're nuts. I'm getting out of here. Hey, wait a minute, pal. I'll buy you a drink. I know drink. Lunch? In a goop. <laughs> yes, indeed, Mr. Spade. I agree. Clarence is a very comical fellow. So are you. I took the liberty of stepping into your folks hall whilst you had your bit of railway in the after companion way with my mate, dear Clarence. Do you mind? Uh, not at all. Well, sir, I'm afraid you're going to mind a great deal. Oh! And that's how I met you, Commodore. I was so busy sizing up the 45 in your right hand that I didn't even notice when you left whipped out of your coat pocket with one of the largest saps I have ever felt. The next time I saw light, you were gone, the Vafio Cup was gone, and the train was pulling into San Jose. I got off, rode back to San Francisco with a truckload of chickens, and headed straight for my client's apartment. got here quick. Yeah. Come in. Thanks. <clears throat> well? Well, what? Look, uh, we can't both play this dead pen. We'll stay no place. It's in the back room. What is? The body. You're from the police, aren't you? I'm a private dick. How dare you? Hey, what was that for? For spying on me. You and all the other cheap gumshoes my husband hires. You're a Mrs. Brody? I'm Enid Theophilus. Didn't to meet... Did my husband hire you? My name is Sam Spade. I was hired by one Chester A. Brody, your husband's business partner. Well, Sam, I hope he paid you in advance. Because he's the body. Chester A. Brody was just barely identifiable. Somebody had worked hard trying to persuade him to say or do something he either couldn't or wouldn't do. The only interesting clue was in the wastebasket. At first, I thought it was a flattened beer can. But it was the Vafio cup, or a facsimile thereof. Well, how do you like it, Sam? I don't. He was my client. I wasn't hired to protect him. I didn't like him, but he was my client. How would you like me for a client? I'll give you the name of a lawyer, sister. My name is Enid. Ain't it? Now, let's see what I can squeeze out of you before the cops do. Brody was your husband's business partner, and you're, uh... You don't have to be subtle. He was mad about me. I'm... I'm all broken up about his death. So was he. That wasn't funny. That time I deserved it. You don't like me, do you? Can't you get it through that steel-jacketed brain of yours that you're in bad trouble, that there's a dead man in the next room beaten to death and you're not supposed to be here? Oh, I was supposed to be here. We were going to elope as soon as you brought back the money from that, uh... Greek thing. Yeah, what about that Greek thing? It was an antique. It was called the Vafio Cup. Yes, I know about that. Yes, well, my husband dug it up in Greece and smuggled it into the country. Yeah. It was all he had, but it was such an important piece that he was able to persuade Chet, um, the late Chester Brody, that is, to let him in as a full partner. Then what? Well, they quarreled. My husband made some bad investments, and Chet wanted to sell the cup to save the firm. Dimitri refused. I didn't think it was fair, so I got the keys to his safety deposit box where the cup was, and Chet arranged to sell it to the Commodore. Did, uh, did you get the money from the Commodore? All I got from the Commodore was lumps. He stole the cup? Roger. You've got to get it back. I've got it. Where? Here, take a look. <gasps> Why, it's ruined. Where did you find it? In a trash basket where it belongs. Dimitri did it. He must have suspected something and substituted a fake. That's it. He knows where the real one is. Somebody thought that your boyfriend knew. The one that killed him? That's the way it looks. And maybe that's the way it was meant to look. You know, somebody might get the idea that you palmed the genuine when you got it out of that safety deposit box. If I did, it was legal, and don't you forget it. A wife can't steal from her husband. Legally, they're one person you can't steal from yourself. That's the law. I was wrong. You don't need a lawyer. Will you help me? I may hurt you, and it'll cost you anyway. I know what's good for me. Money. Find that cup. I know what's good for me, too. So I uh, took her hundred bucks, advised her to go home, and made for my own humble lodging. They were not only humble, they were crowded. The man was small, but the gun was enormous. I said... Uh, don't bother to introduce yourself. Your name is Dimitri Theopolis, and you want this package that I'm carrying. The 
makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. Remember, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil contains lanolin. It grooms the hair naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So if you want your hair to be more attractive than ever before, get the generous new 25-cent size of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's leading hair tonic, on sale at all drug and toilet goods counters. It's also available in larger economy bottles and the handy new tube. Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way... Smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too. And mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. And now, back to the Vafio Cup Caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. He didn't answer me, so I said it again. Uh, Don't bother to introduce yourself. Your name is Dimitri Theopolis, and you want this package that I'm carrying. Of that be assured. You obtained this from my dear wife. And how did you find my darling? Not at the city pond, surprisingly enough. Oh, you know my dear wife. How soon you know my darling so well, more than I her husband. (laughs) Is it possible? I don't know, is it? I don't know either. I employ a detective. Not this one. I have need... My poor partner, Mr. Brody, you are interested... If you are interesting about who killed your partner, that's one thing. But if you want somebody to dig out your family secrets, that is nothing. With me, you are, shall we say, no place. But why don't I got the right to know? There'll be no trouble, no scandal, no divorcement suing. Of that be assured. Even poor Chester is dead, so... He's what one calls ancient history. While he lived, I knew nothing. I was blind. After he died... I see certain things. Yeah, well, uh, do you see that maybe your wife had a hand in Brody's death? What then? Well, if it so happens that you cannot separate my darling from that, uh, do you follow? Not quite. Ah. I'm not an old man. But my dear wife is but two and twenty and a truly lovely person. She's all right. Uh, Would it not be the part of husbandly wisdom to have... uh, Shall I say, uh, a hold over her? If she's guilty, you won't need it. Good. <laughs> Please, I cannot hold the gun and handle my wallet at the same time. Please. Uh, no, thanks. You keep the gun, I'll take the wallet. Oh, you trust me. You will work for me. Yeah, I'll work for anybody. Here, I, uh, left your cab. Tray. Oh, assuredly, you are so very kind. Oh, I'm not so kind. the pockets, yes? No. The- then I don't hesitate to suit you. Now, wait a minute. Yes? This is the fake. You sure you want this? Assuredly, yes. A man has already been killed for it. Your life's a high price to pay for a fake, though fancy, tin cup. You still think that's the price? Brother, I know it. Then you know I will kill you for it. Okay, if it means that much to you, and I guess it does, it's all yours. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, please remain where you are. If you follow me, I will surely suit you. my front window, I watched them come out downstairs and start across the street. Then it happened. I saw the gun flash as it fired, and Theophilus slumped to the pavement. The package slid away from him into the gutter. I beat it down to him. He'd taken all three pellets in the midsection from close range. His pulse fluttered once or twice and then stopped. When I went to look for the package, it wasn't there. I called homicide and waited until they took him away. When I told Lieutenant Dundee what I had in mind, he congratulated me on my brilliant scheme and told me to go ahead with it. That was his mistake. I even talked him out of assigning any of his harness men to watch my building for the next couple of hours. That was my mistake. I went upstairs, opened the bottle, and waited for your knock on my door, Commodore. 
Well, sir, a man would almost think you expected us. Keep a better eye on him, Clarence. Don't let him get to Leward. Aye, sir. Welcome aboard. No time for scuttle, but Mr. Spade. We are bound for Bullylong Bali on the MacArthur Maru, sailing at dawn. I want that cup. The true, the genuine, the Vafio cup. No more deceptions, no more trickery. You will hand it over without further delay. Sure. Be glad to. Oh, no, not like that. You will tell Clarence where it is stowed, and Clarence will fetch it above decks. Why, you old barnacle. Theophilus never had his mitts on a genuine Vafio cup. Bilge water, sir. When Theophilus landed in San Francisco, he didn't have a farthing. Now he owes half a million dollars. If he hadn't got the genuine cup, how could he have borrowed all that money? Because a bunch of morons like you believed he had it. Blast my binnacles, man. You sound as though you believe what you're saying. Look, uh, Commodore, you're interested in high finance. Now, how did Ivor Kruger make his millions? Why, matches. He was the match king, sir. Uh, matches had nothing to do with it, Commodore. He uh, started out with 15 million bucks worth of phony government bonds that he printed himself. Follow? They weren't even good counterfeits, but he was smart enough not to try and cash them. He just kept them in a safety deposit box and borrowed money. Theophilus uh, used his phony Vafio cup the same way. Lost my binnacles, man. You sound as though you believe what you're saying. That has a familiar ring to it. I do. And I'll tell you why. He knew that that was the fake in the package when he held me up for it. He was willing to risk his own life to get it out of circulation. Dash my timbers. Old Theophilus has left us without a shot in the locker. You steer us onto the shoals. We're on our beam ends. Hey, turn him off, Commodore. You're pumping bilge flush. We better haul our wind. Yes, indeed. I'm afraid it's getting rather warm in San Francisco. Bully long beckons. You won't make it past the potato patch. What? The cops are going to want some answers about a couple of stiffs you left behind in San Francisco. I'm glad you reminded me. Shall I plug him? No, no. We are taking him with us. Oh, uh, that's what you think. Uh, take it easy, uh, mate. Uh, this ain't going to hurt a bit. Uh, a reek of chloroform filled the room and a fist pounded into my belly. It knocked my wind out, and at the same time, my nose collided with something wet and cold. I swung out but didn't connect. Before I could swing again, the room blurred and a ceiling light floated down to meet me. Then the lights went out altogether. At first, I couldn't figure it. It uh, sounded like what a doctor hears through a stethoscope or maybe an earthquake or maybe ship engines, which it turned out to be. When the lights came on again, I was lying on a bunk in a stateroom. I staggered across to the wash basin and splashed water in my face. Hello, you. Oh, Enid, as I hardly live and breathe. It could get worse. Yeah, where are we? Oh, not very far out. Not past the Farallon. Uh, good, I'm a stowaway and I'll put me off with the pilot. Oh, no, you're not. Your passage is paid. Mine? It is, huh? It is. Do you know who you are? Who am I? Chester Brody. Then I'm dead. They'll bury me at sea. Roger. Who are you? I'm your widow. What's the score, widow? Chester and I booked passage on this ship a week ago. It was part of the plan. Chester and the Commodore worked it all out. Yeah, the cup was to have been stolen from me on the train. Yes, but when the Commodore discovered it was a fake, everything fell to pieces. Yeah, he thought Chester was double-crossing him. Hmm? They forced Chet to talk. He told them Dimitri still had the genuine Vafio cup and had hired you for the double-cross. Maybe he really believed it. Anyway, they killed Dimitri. Yeah. Well, there's nothing on them yet. But uh, you're a material witness, sweetheart, to at least one of the killings. That's extraditable. When that dawns on them, they'll uh, scuttle you, too. It's already dawned on them. I'm desperate. Yes, I notice. For you, you're practically hysterical. We have to face facts. Yeah, well, give me a couple to face right now. Where are the Commodore and Clarence? Up on the bridge. Good. All you have to do is walk straight up to the captain. He'll put him under arrest. Well, that might be a good idea, darling. Only... Only what? Only the Commodore is the captain. That tore it. Your uh, salty talk had fooled me, Commodore. I never dreamed that you were really an old sea dog, and I do mean dog. But two can play at that game. From my own intimate knowledge of Sea Story magazines, I realized that all hands would be turned to on the cargo gear, and the crew quarters would be therefore empty. In more time than it takes to tell... Enid and I had fitted ourselves out in dungarees, jumpers, and watch caps and turned to with them. Everyone's coming with Get out of the hell! You to hell and all! You left some walking on the boat behind there! Yeah, you took 
Crew, look alive. Stow that preventer. Who, me? You uh, may recall, Commodore, you may recall me as the man who ran for a fire extinguisher when the bosun yelled, stow the preventer. But experience is the best teacher, and by the time we hove to to put the pilot over the side, things were in such a state of confusion that you had retreated to your cabin with a quadruple ration of grog. Seizing that moment, I threw Enid over the side, yelled, Man overboard! And jumped in after him. Once safely aboard the pilot schooner, we revealed our true identity and a merry laugh was enjoyed by all. It uh, dropped us at the foot of Margaret and we waved warm farewells to our erstwhile rescuers. Then to the snug haven of my office in a friendly cup, if you'll pardon the expression, in the grateful warmth of a gas radiator. Mm. Unhealthy. <sighs> Who, me? Gas fumes. Mm. Why don't you move into a building with steam heat? I, I like this building. Uh -huh. yeah, I've been here for a long time. You don't make much money, do you? You don't have to rub it in. It's a living. <laughs> you happy? Mm, sure I am, I guess. Well, I guess it's all right, then. <clears throat> you know, sweetheart, uh, mm. there's uh, something missing in you. Huh? What? Uh, well, I don't know. And then how do you know? Forget it. Well, I guess I'll go. Do you, uh, do you mind if I don't see you to the door? Why should I? What? <laughs> hey, you are human. Yeah, they're wet. Go ahead, sweetheart. Cry on you want to. It's been tough. You shouldn't have kept it bottled up this long. No, it, it, it's not what you think. Well, what is it? It's you. You're so nice. I'm nice. Yeah, but you're no place. You never will be. And neither will I. And that, Commodore, is the cargo. It was nice seeing you again down at the hall. They uh, tell me you and Clarence are both trying to turn state's evidence. But according to the late bulletins, Clarence was leading by a neck in the stretch. Get it? The DA was afraid the jury might not understand your salty talk. Period. End of sea chanty. Oh, Sam. Yes, what, what, what? Oh, Sam. Hmm? Well, I just can't. I, well, why I can't, can't you? Are, are you feeling okay, F? Oh, Sam. Hmm? You betrayed your trust. You... Effie, speak oh. to me. What is it? What is it? I betrayed my trust. What? What? Well, those criminals were on that boat. Yes. And you... You jumped overboard. You feel that I was recalcitrant? Is that it? That my actions were not true blue? Clear cut? Is that it? Oh, I'll just go type this up and I'm sure you can explain. I hope you can. I hope. Sour racket. <laughs> Question. What's the easiest and best way there is to give your hair that well-groomed look? Answer. Wild Root Cream Oil. Yes, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil with soothing lanolin gives you the advantages considered most important in a hair tonic. It grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, removes loose, ugly dandruff. Call at your drug or toilet goods counter tonight or first thing tomorrow for Wild Root Cream Oil. If you've never tried it before... Get the generous new 25-cent bottle just introduced. Also, ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Oh, here it is, Sam. I hope the spelling is all right. I was so upset. You hate me, then? Oh, no. No. I suppose it's foolish going along thinking that your ideal doesn't have feet of clay. Oh, Sam, I, I, I just can't. I just can't imagine. Don't you think... Don't you think I can explain, Ed? Oh, yes, I'm sure you can explain. But you did. You deserted your post and jumped overboard like a thinking rat. That's right. Oh, Sam, that's so unlike you. It was just by chance they were apprehended. By chance, you say? Who do you think it was that got himself shot out of a torpedo tube in that submarine? You, Sam? No, you think I'm crazy? 
I did something few radio detectives ever do, sweetheart. I called the Harbor Patrol single-handed using only one nickel and had them picked up. Oh, Sam, I wish I'd been there. Well, it was just a small phone booth. Besides, if you'd been there, it would have been out of order or something. Oh, Sam. You came through after all. Aren't you ashamed that you ever doubted me? Yes, I am. I'm a fool. There, there, there. I forgive you. Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. <laughs> The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Dove. Lorreen Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tolman and Gil Dowd. Musical direction is by Lud Gluskin with score composed by Rene Garrigan. Join us again next Sunday when author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keep on all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get Wild Root right away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Sam Spade, Detective Agency. Hey, it's me, hey, Sammy the Spade. Sam, Sam, it's not true, is it? Every word of it. What? That you've been consorting with unsavory characters? Well, uh, she was a savory enough girl, Effie, although a crook. Well, according to the paper, she's practically a murderess. Not to mention that she's dancing the Roomba with you. That's a lie. There's a picture of you. Virginia Vale, gangland glamour girl, caught at the Club I Beria in barefoot Roomba with private eye. It was not a Roomba. It was a bambuco. Oh, Sam, not over the phone. Boom, I can't stop it. Boom, 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 boom. Stay where you are. Boom, 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 boom. I'll be right down to dictate my report on the lawless caper. Boom, boom, boom. Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama... Join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Say, have you gotten acquainted with Wild Root Cream Oil yet? Tell you what, mister, if you haven't, even if you don't use any hair tonic at all, why not ask at your drug or toilet goods counter tonight or tomorrow for the brand new 25-cent Get Acquainted bottle of Wild Root Cream Oil. You like the way Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose dandruff. You never dreamed one hair tonic could do so much. So give it a try. Get the generous new 25-cent bottle of Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. <laughs> I think I'm getting it now. You've lost your shoes. Uh, ready, sweetheart? Yes, Sam. Uh, no questions? No, Sam. That uh, picture in the paper doesn't mean a thing, Effie. There was nothing between Virginia and me. Just wasn't room. Well, uh, 
that bamboo you know. That's the way we dance it. Authentic. Sam, I trouble to call my girlfriend, Edna May Schwartz, who is an instructor at Arthur Murray's. Mm-hmm. I quote, The partners exchange graceful nods in the center of the dance floor and then separate. Well, uh... As the senorita provocatively leads the pursuing caballero through a series of gay whirls, turns, and figures. There, you see, provocative. But he never catches her, Sam. Well, I have my shoes off. That gave me the advantage. <sighs> you know best, Sam. Well, that clears that up. Uh, date? August I... 29th. I will give the date. Fill it in. That still doesn't explain your operating on the wrong side of the law. Down, Effie. This goes to John M. Lawless. A known gangster. What else? From Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Boom. Thank you, Effie. Subject, uh, Joe Morales. Uh, dear Johnny. You uh, hired me yesterday morning, but the real start of it was back in 45. Flashback. San Francisco was just recovering from VJ Day, and crime was practically at a standstill. Because your number one competitor in the West Coast mobs had just been rubbed out, and you were on trial for same. Nothing about the trial made any sense. The tea time chatter in the better pool rooms was that you were taking the rap for your worst enemy, Joe Morales. What made even less sense, the lawyer defending you was Joe's brother. So I wasn't a bit surprised to receive your check for $25, together with an invitation to be in the third row of the courtroom when the jury returned the verdict. I was. The defendant will please rise. (coughs) Step forward, please. (coughs) Have you anything to say why judgment of this court should not be passed upon you? Yeah. It's a bad beef. (coughs) The judgment of this court is that you, John Lawless, for the crime of manslaughter having feloniously run down, run over, and killed with a certain automobile the deceased person named in the indictment, and having subsequently departed the scene in violation of the hit-and-run statute, are hereby sentenced to a term of three to ten years in the state prison of the state of California. You didn't even look at the judge while he was dishing it out. Your eyes were on the man sitting directly in front of me. The man you were supposed to be taking the rap for. The man you had deliberately planted me behind, Joe Morales. I wondered what that meant. When the judge brought down his gavel, I found out. You came up the aisle with a deputy on one arm and your lawyer on the other. He seemed upset about something. I'm sorry, Johnny. I did the best I could. They've given me the judge I asked you for. You passed I... on the jury, you cheap shyster. Okay, just wait till you get my bill. Shut up. Now, wait a minute, Sheriff. I want to speak to a friend. Hey, Johnny, hurry up. we got a train to catch. Hey, you, Joe. Yeah, Johnny? I got just this to say to you. I'm going up, but I'm not staying, see? If I'm not paroled out in three, I'll break out. Either way, I'll get you, even if it means a murder rap. Oh, now, listen, Johnny. You, you heard know... me, Spade? Yeah, Johnny, I wish I hadn't. Well, oh, Johnny, we've got to go. Okay, okay. Don't forget what I said, Joe. So long, Sam. Good luck, Johnny. Hey, Sally. Yeah, Joe? You hear what he said? I know. He's going to knock me. Hey, this guy's a witness. Name is Spade. Spade, uh, my brother Sally. Salvador Morales. You may have heard of me. Yeah, if I'm ever up in a hit-and-run, remind me not to hire you. <laughs> How long, Spade, where we can talk quietly? Just over here. My conference room. Look, uh, we got nothing to talk about. Oh, yes, we have. Watch it. I just got this suit press. Yeah, right in here. <laughs> Sally, is it all over? How did it come out? Where were you? In here. I couldn't force myself to stay out there. What did he get? Three to ten. Three to ten? Is that... Oh, I mean, how terrible. How terrible. Best I could do... This is Sam Spade, my dear. This is Virginia Vale, Johnny Lawless's fiance. The San Quentin widow. Well, uh, how's Trex, Virginia? Why did they bring you here? Maybe they know. He's a witness. Witness? To a threat Johnny made against my brother's life. My own client. <laughs> What's funny? Ask your brother. That threat would even get you rid against him to keep the peace. What do you mean, Sam? Uh, sweetheart, threats don't mean anything in law unless they're backed up by some action. Even if he told you the when, the where, and the how, it wouldn't be worth anything until you're dead. But it would be worth something then? Sure, it shows premeditation. And if he knew he was overheard, you'd be forced to testify if anything happened to Joe. Hey, beautiful, what are you trying to do to me? Oh, I mean, he'd think twice before he tried anything. You'd be safe, Joe. Well, honey, I, uh, I didn't know you cared. About you, I don't. I just wouldn't want Johnny to do anything foolish. <laughs> End of flashback. That was uh, three years ago. A lot of big news has broken since then, but the only items that interested you in San Quentin were printed on the inside pages of the local press. Item. 
Virginia Vale, your fiancé, got herself engaged to Joe Morales, your worst enemy. And item, Salvador Sally Morales, your mouthpiece, had taken over your mob. Which brings us up to yesterday morning. Yeah? That you, Sam? Who's this? Johnny Lawless, remember me? No. I was hoping you'd say that. Look, Sam, I, I got a job for you. Call Peeper Breen. He may need it bad enough. I've got no contacts in the mobs anymore. This is clean. How clean? A chance to save an innocent man from the gas chamber. Well, There's I... a grand in it for you. Wait till I get a pencil. Now, uh, what was the address? The Alma Arms on Pine Street near Jones. Yeah? Buzz me three times. One long, two short. And make sure there's no one on your tail. Got it. I was not tailed. I found your name on the bell panel, buzzed one long and two short, and the automatic lock clicked me in. You were waiting one flight up in the open door of your apartment. You didn't say anything, just made sure it was me, motioned me inside, locked the door, and led me back to a bedroom. Well, there it is, Sam. Mm Mm-hmm. Joe Morales. Dead about three hours, I'd say. Four slugs, chest, shoulder, and head. Looks like amateur work, a professional aims for the belly, or did you mean it to look like an amateur job? Would I be sap enough to drop him in my own apartment? Besides, he's my lawyer's brother, and I might need Sally again. Why did you call me? Well, you heard what I said to Joe after the trial. Who told you that, Virginia? Yeah, but she didn't have to. Didn't I ask you to sit there? Well, that's one thing that worries me. Look, uh, let's go in the other room, huh? I feel like a drink. Well, here's my pitch, Sam. I checked out of San Quentin yesterday morning. I didn't have a mark against me. The warden himself put my case before the parole board. He called me the ideal prisoner. Shall we dance? Okay, Sam, okay. But a man can change a lot in three years. So can a woman. (laughs) Virginia met me at the gate when we drove into the city. We didn't have a thing to say to each other. The way I felt by the time the ride was over, Joe could have her and welcome. I had other plans. Such as? Well, the parole board was getting me a job with a mining firm, a, a surveyor. I took a course up at Quinton. You uh, seriously expect me to swallow this line of guff? Listen, you don't get fat making a living on the mace. Take half of these guys you hear telling the world what wonders they are at puffing boxes, knocking over joints, and the rest of the lays. Yeah, not half of them make three meals a day at it. Then what chance has a guy without a regular racket? And brother, that's me. I'll buy that for now. Let's uh, talk about that dead body. All right. Well, I, uh, I called Joe on the phone this morning, see, and I told him to meet me here at three this afternoon. I wanted to tell him, forget about what I said about how I was going to get him. Not that I wanted to write off that rap I took for him. But if he was scared, he might come gunning for me. I might have to break parole to defend myself. About Virginia, like I told you, we got nothing to talk about. Yeah, yeah, it was beautiful while it lasted. So he was due here at three, huh? Huh? Uh, yeah, yeah, I was held up. As a matter of fact, I was with my lawyer at the time. Sally? Yeah, I, uh, I phoned the building and uh, told the superintendent to let him, let Joe in, and then I got here about a quarter past four. But I didn't find him until just before six when I called you, Sam. How come? Well, I, I just didn't look in the bedroom. I figured he got uh, tired waiting and left, you yeah. know. Mm-hmm. Well, look, uh, Johnny, assuming your story is true, and if it isn't, you ought to be ashamed of yourself, who do you think did it? Well, that depends on why. If it was somebody gunning for him, it would depend on what's going in the mob since I've been in Quinton. You know more about that than I do. If it was somebody trying to frame me... What do you mean, trying? Hey, wait a minute. I got a phone homicide. You must have known that when you called me. Yeah, that's why I ripped the wires out. That's cute. That's very cute. Oh, look. That makes you look real good. Look, look, Sam, look. I'm not asking you to do anything extracurricular. Sure, you have to yell, cop. But you'll do it over a pay station downstairs. And by the time anybody can get back up here, that stiff will be out. It will. Well, how's that going to be done? I, uh, I got a friend in the undertaking business. Met him up at Quinton. He just installed a new crematorium. You should have called him first. I did, but I can call him off. You're stir happy. Look, Sam, look, how about it, huh? So the cops come in tonight, tomorrow. Who cares? Not Joe, the weather he'll keep. What do you say, Sam? What do you say? I say you're probably bluffing, that you got no way of getting rid of the stiff, but on the outside chance that you might not be bluffing, I'll swing along with you for a couple of hours. If I don't turn up anything by then, the deal is off. Okay, that's fair enough. Yeah, but this isn't... <laughs> hey! Sorry, I got to do it. No! Oh. Oh. <laughs> I hated to do it, Johnny. You were out of condition and you weren't expecting it. But I wanted you to look like a hospital case. 
After you went down and out, I transferred my fee from your wallet to mine, examined your wounds, and decided you were good for two hours at St. Agnes Hospital, where I know the head nurse. Uh, incidentally, that reminds me. Uh, uh, so without further delay, I toted you downstairs, threw you into a taxi, and delivered you to the ambulance entrance. That's when I remember that I had forgotten one thing. I hadn't given you a chance to call off your alleged undertaker friend. I was sure that that part of your story was bluff, but just to make sure, I rushed back to your apartment in less time than it takes the average undertaker to back his hearse out of the garage, I thought. When I got there, I wasn't so sure. The apartment had been tidied up, ashtrays emptied, glasses put away. They'd even vacuumed the rug. The blood-stained bedspread had been removed, and with it, the corpus delecti. I found myself humming an old tune. I ain't got no body. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead, socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. Remember, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil contains lanolin. It grooms the hair naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So if you want your hair to be more attractive than ever before, get the generous new 25-cent size of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's leading hair tonic on sale at all drug and toilet goods counters. It's also available in larger economy bottles and the handy new tube. Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too. And mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. And now, back to the lawless caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. In most murder cases, there are too many suspects, too many motives, and too many clues from the very beginning. I'd been on this one three hours, and I succeeded in turning up no suspects, no clues, and the most shameful thing of all, I had lost the body of the victim. I consoled myself with the thought that he was in no condition to tell me anything anyway, but then neither were you, Johnny. You'd uh, checked out of the hospital, no forwarding address. But in a gin mill down on the mission, I found a character with the unlikely name of Porky Grout. Now, uh, Porky is theoretically alive and will tell all he knows about anybody, which is plenty, for two fingers of rye. I gave him a handful. Uh, easy, easy. Uh. Uh, the, uh, the Joe Morales smiled, huh? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, they dusted this town. They moved to Las Vegas five, six months ago. Uh, how come uh, Joe stayed in San Francisco? Oh, uh, him and his brother had a beef with each other. That's uh, Sally Morales, the lawyer? Yeah, the mouthpiece. No, he, not, not too close. <laughs> yeah, what was it all about? Oh, that dame, Virginia Vale. You know, after she and Joe framed Johnny Lawless on that hit-and-run job, well, they disagreed on methods of administration. <coughs> yeah, not so close. Oh. So she and Sally team up. And Sally uses his business connections to pull off this big combine, you see? Yeah, I heard of it, Las Vegas. Uh, how do I get to Sally? <laughs> oh, my, my throat's dry. I can't hardly talk. Uh, hey, uh, Riley, put out the bottle. Uh, and bring an air wick. Yeah. Yeah, here we are. Yeah, that's right. Oop, it's a sloppy. Easy, easy. I'll help you. Uh, great, huh? Great stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, not too close. Uh, now, uh, when do you want to get to him? Tonight? Uh, right now. <clears throat> Let me see. The dame don't dance to nothing but rumba music, and she don't drink nothing but imported French champagne. Yeah, but yeah. Furthermore, she don't go nowhere where she don't get her picture taken, and he don't dare take a drink in a place that pays him protection. Well, this being after hours, there's only approximately one place they could be at. 
That's the Iberia out on Van Ness. <laughs> Uh, oh, uh, yeah. Thank you, and good night, Porky Grout. If your friends won't tell you, I will. What? Please don't bother to answer. I didn't have any trouble picking out their table. Virginia spotted me at about the same time, grabbed up her purse, muttered an excuse to her escort, and edged around the dance floor. She caught me in the middle of a bambuco, a combination of a rumba, a samba, and guarasha. And whirled me lightly out onto the floor. I followed as best I could. Listen, you shouldn't have come here. Yeah, well, how did I know? Our first dance would be at Don Puco. Now you dance divinely. Oh. But you must leave at once. Uh, Sally is insanely jealous, and he's in an especially bad mood tonight. Yeah, so am I. I know why you came. Yeah, you won up on me. Johnny Lawless has been in touch with you, hasn't he? You uh, talked to him since yesterday morning? No. He's bound to get in touch with you. Yeah. I don't know what story he's told you, but don't believe a word of it. He only wants to get you out of the way so he can get back at Joe. Joe thinks Joe framed him into San Quentin. Oh, you can stop worrying about Joe. Huh? Sam, what are you... Uh, he's dead, if that's news to you. I... I think you'd better talk to Sally after all. Come on. Well, I was just getting the hang of it. Well, my dear. So you've met another old friend. Hello, Sally. Hello. Sit down, Spade. Thanks. Sally. Huh? Sam says Joe is dead. Joe? Murdered? Yeah. <sighs> well, it was bound to happen. I warned him to get out of town before Johnny Lawless came back. Johnny says he was with you when it happened. <laughs> sure he's don't go for alibi, Spade. Best defense I could give him would be that I defend him despite the fact he's accused of killing my own brother. But look here. As his attorney, I have the right to know what he retained you for. To find out who did kill Joe. Yeah? That's what he said. Have you found out? Not yet. Any leads? Not many. Now, what's the difficulty? The corpse. Somebody swiped it. You can't mean that. I can, and I do. Well, that doesn't make sense. Unless Johnny arranged it himself. But he couldn't have. No contacts. Of course, he might have disposed of it without help. It's been done, you know. Not tonight. I'm his alibi there. I don't believe it. You're just telling that story to see how we'll react. That's why I'm telling it, but it's not a story. It's the McCoy. Sally, yes, what sir. can it mean? If Johnny didn't do it, then somebody must have done it to frame him. And if they did that, they wouldn't turn around and get rid of the evidence, would they? What? Well, the whole thing is wild, wild. You know, uh, there might have been two people who thought they were a team, but one of them was really working against the other and for Johnny. Huh? Well, that's absurd, isn't it, Sally? Is it, my dear? He's trying to play us off against each other. Don't fall for it, Sally. I had nothing to do with any of it. You've got to believe that. Yes, I was sure of you when Johnny was out of the way. You wanted him out of the way, you admit it. You're still in love with him, aren't you? Oh, aren't you? Alice, you're hurting me. Hurting? Yeah. I'll help the DA write his brief. He'll go to Tehachapi for body snatching. Go ahead. I can't wait to get on the stand. The things I'll tell about you, how you let Johnny go up on that hit and run when you knew it was my idea and I was in the car with Joe. Oh, you will. Not a jury in the country would blame me for protecting my own brother. Protecting him? You were framing him even then. So you can have me for yourself. Oh, I'll have you in the gas chamber if you keep insisting. Uh, Your own brother. Squeeze out of that one if you can. Uh, how I about can. the body? Love of woman surpasses brotherly love. <laughs> I can see the jury now. Edie, get up. Victim of a designing woman caught in the court. Are you... Nuts, nuts. I don't care whether either of you is guilty or both or neither or whatever. If I get that body back tonight, I'll let the cops worry about it. If I don't, I'll confess to everything myself and name all three of you as accomplices. You... All right. All right, Spade. You say your only concern is that body. Right. Right. Here. Here's $500. Another 500 when you find it, huh? Does that convince you? Well, it helps. Here, my diamonds. Take them all. Now, now, keep the diamonds, Virginia. If Sally gets sent up first, you'll need them for your defense. Think it over, kids. I'm calling the cops right now. Uh, Roy, Sam Spade. Where's Dundee? Oh, he's asleep. Sam, I've been trying to reach you. Yeah, but do you know why? Why, sure, about Johnny Lawless. I... Is there something we don't know, Sam? Well, uh, I'll uh, come down and give you a statement. It's about Joe Morales. Well, what about him? Well, he got knocked off and uh, somebody lifted the corpse. Oh, Sam, nobody lifted it. Uh, well, then who did? We picked it up, Sam, right after you called us. Right after I... Oh, yeah. Yeah, what time was that? Uh, let's see, I got it here. Uh, 20 minutes past six. Lose your watch? 
That ain't all. What's that, Sam? Call you back. What's up, Sally? Uh, come out of there. Well, I wasn't planning to spend the night in a phone booth. It's for you, Sam. You must be nuts pulling a gun in a crowded joint like this. <laughs> hey, stop looking at it. Come on. Up those stairs. Now, look, sir. In there. Easy. Where's your girlfriend? Well, I... I sent her home, Sam. She can't stand the sight of blood. <laughs> you clown. Oh. <laughs> you were pretty funny, too, when you made that phone call. I didn't believe you'd go through with it. What makes you think I'm interested in that old rap? Johnny's already done the time for it. Joe can't talk, and I don't want to. I don't care what you want. It's what I want. That's what counts. Does it? You want it, Virginia? You got it. Oh, not the point. Just doesn't sound good. Salvador Morella's sweetheart going up on a murder rap. Well, you trimmed it down to manslaughter for Johnny Lawless, and she's enough prettier to rate an acquittal, or are we talking about the same killing? <laughs> you think Virginia killed Joe Morellas, don't you? Why? I... Because she seems so anxious to pin it on Johnny Lawless. Well? Well, nothing. Only I've got a score to settle with Johnny Lawless myself, you see. Uh, he uh, left me out in a limb with that body snatch. If I can pin the killing on him, I got a story for the cops. Now, show how smart you are. Shoot me. I fully intend to. Now, look. Well, hold it, Sally. Hello, Johnny. Hey, you can do it yourself, Johnny. I was going to do it for you, but you can I do it yourself. I don't get it. He's trying to pin that murder on you, Johnny. Like you pin that old hit and run on me? But it's not the same, Johnny. Joe's killing is worth life if you're lucky. I never had much luck. Let him have it, Johnny. What have you got to lose? Well, you want me to... No, no, no. Uh, step back, Sally. Okay. <laughs> he dead? Yeah. You planned a different, didn't you, Johnny? Yeah. Yeah, but I might as well get two for the price of one. Yeah, I planned it different, but I don't seem to care anymore. Well, then you won't need that. Huh? Sorry, Johnny. By the way, I'd like to thank you for keeping me in the clear. How come? That phone call you made the homicide using my name. Without that, I might be going up with you. How'd you figure it? Nobody but you had anything to gain by making that body seem to disappear. You knew I wouldn't check with the police till I'd made a try at locating it on my own. You knew I'd use the disappearance as a handle to shake what I could out of Sally in Virginia. You knew they'd suspect each other because I had you alibied by the time of the body snatch, and that would start them screaming accusations at each other. Did they say enough to send them up? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know how much will stick, but enough. They both admit Joe did that hit-and-run job I was sent up for? He and Virginia together. So she was with him. Three years ago, I wouldn't have wanted to know that. Now it sounds good. <laughs> I didn't think it really sounded good to you. I was sorry to hear it myself, and after all, I'd only danced a bambuco with a mouse. I'm sorry things turned out the way they did, and it's a little late to be making with the advice, but, uh, well, you know, the best laid plans of mice and men gang after glade. what? And as you say, what chance has a man got without a regular racket? Period. End of report. Well, heavens to Betsy. Oh. How can you be so sympathetic with a girl who did all those terrible things? Oh, I know, F. I know. It's a silly dance, but she looked cute while she was doing it. I don't mean the dance. You mean the best laid plans? What does that mean, Sam? That gang after glade? I'll give you a hint, sweetheart. It's something you never need worry about. No. <laughs> Here's why, men. Here's why Wild Root Cream Oil is again and again the choice of men who put good grooming first. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms the hair neatly and naturally without giving it that plastered down look. Wild Root Cream Oil relieves annoying dryness and removes that loose, ugly dandruff. So if you're not using it now, or if you're not using any hair tonic, get Wild Root Cream Oil at your drug or toilet goods counter in the new 25-cent Get Acquainted Size bottle. Also, ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Well, here it is, Sam. My, terribly confusing. I sensed that somehow. Who was that hit-and-run victim? Well, they named that dance after him, uh, George L. Bambuco. I don't believe it. <laughs> Sam, what does it mean? What does it mean? You know... A uh, gang after Glay? Snafu. Oh, why didn't you say so? <laughs> Dialects yet. <laughs> Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. The 
Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tolman and Gil Dow. Musical direction is by Lud Gluskin with score composed by Rene Garagang. Join us again next Sunday when author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keeping all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get Wild Root right. Away. 50,000 Americans die from tuberculosis every year. Yet tuberculosis is curable. The disease can be wiped out. The secret is, discover it in its early stages. Why not be sure you and your family don't have tuberculosis by getting a chest x-ray right away? This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. The non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Uh, listen, you, uh, phone down to the drugstore and tell them to send up three gallons of black coffee. Who is this? I, are you sure you have the right number? I'm sure I've got the right number, but I'm not so sure who I am. Oh, Sam, it's you. You must have had a frog in your throat. Did you oversleep? Effie, don't say things like that. Oh, I'm sorry, Sam. Oh, you poor dear, you've been working. You're tired, that's it. Tired? I've only just brought Lazarus back from the dead. Well, then you better get some rest, Sam. You can dictate your report tomorrow. That's what you think. Now, stay where you are. If I'm asleep when I get there, wake me up. I'll be right down to dictate my report on the Lazarus caper. <laughs> Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Next time you buy hair tonic, be sure you buy Wild Root Cream Oil. For you see, Wild Root Cream Oil gives you these advantages... It grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, removes loose, ugly dandruff. Wild Root Cream Oil is non-alcoholic and contains soothing lanolin, so much like the natural oil of your skin. Yes, friends, next time you buy hair tonic, look for that famous name, Wild Root. Get Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. Effie! In here, Sam, in your private office. Yeah, private, she says. I'd like to know what's private about it. I have everything ready for you, Sam. What's this? Oval team, to relax. I don't want to relax. I don't dare. Oh, there you go again, Sam. Going on nerves. How long do you think you can keep it up? With your help, I'll be in a coma inside three minutes. Thank you, Sam. Now, you just lie down here on the couch, and I'll take your shoes off. Now, look, uh... And I can take dictation while you relax. Nuts. Where's that black coffee? Sam, you're angry with me. Your eyes. Please don't glare at me like that, Sam. I can't bear it when you... I am not glaring. I'm trying to keep them open. Now, sit down. I got to keep moving around. Oh, you moving shouldn't around. drive yourself like this, Sam. Uh, uh, please, Effie, please. Uh, date, uh, fill it in. Well, it's your life. 
Go on. Burn yourself at both ends. Yeah, I'll see you. Two uh, A.J. Tatspaw, claims manager, all risk insurance company, Tide Building, San Francisco. From Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Oh. Dear sir... The following is an accounting of my services to your company in connection with the claim of Emma R. Lazarus on the life of the assured Timothy R. Lazarus. The latter called at my office yesterday at approximately 11.30 a.m. He was tall, bald, gray-faced, and dusty. He looked as if he'd been buried and dug up several times. This, this may sound like a poor sort of jest, Mr. Spade, but my name is Lazarus, and I want you to bring me back from the dead. Well, sounds interesting. Why did you die? When did you die? And how did you die? I was declared dead by the appellate court of the state of California, August 28th last year, by reason of seven years' absence. Who took it to court? My wife, Emma. Insurance? Yes. My wife and I agreed between ourselves to insure my life in the amount of $100,000 that she would collect on legal presumption of death after my disappearance and continued absence for seven years. That's the law, Mr. Spade. Yeah, it's been tried a lot of times. What went wrong in your case? Wife double-cross you? If that's your attitude, I'm afraid I've come to the wrong man. Uh-huh. You're still in love with her. Well, that makes it tough. You know they'll nail her for perjury if you prove you're still alive? But that's why I didn't go to the police. E even though we'd planned the deception together, she had reason to believe that I was actually dead. Suppose you cover the whole thing from the beginning, Mr. Lazarus. Yes. <clears throat> I, I, I married her back in 1940. And for a while, we were happy. And... Then she became restless. You mean you were not able to support her in the manner to which she was accustomed? She was young, lovely, you wanted her to have nice things, but on your meager salary, it was impossible. Oh, I know, it's an old story, but life is like that. <sighs> well, uh, you said it. Yeah, well, there you are. I was assistant cashier at the Golden Gate Bank. Oh, no, not that. I, I started taking small sums at first, meaning to repay them later uh, look, on. Look, let's not go through the whole script. How much did you embezzle? Uh, $20,000. Yeah, so you decided to take it on the lamb before the auditors came in, and... I was going to give myself up, but Emma wouldn't let me. We, we made our plans that night, and uh, I left for Mexico the following day. In Mexico City, I had plastic surgery done on my face, and then I settled down to wait the seven long years until I would be declared legally dead. <sighs> I suppose you might call it poetic justice, but just before the end of the seventh year, I contracted malaria was confined to a hospital for more than 11 months. Mm, you have had it. Oh, the doctors gave me up for dead and asked me to notify my next of kin. I gave them Emma's address. I never notified her. To the contrary, because it seemed to, to, to fit in so well with our plan. Too well, huh? Yes. I, I'd been to see her, and she refuses to believe that I am her husband. Oh, of course, my appearance is, is, is very much altered, but there must be some way to prove my identity. You worked in a bank. They must have taken your fingerprints. I removed them from the files and destroyed them. How are your teeth? My, my teeth? Teeth. Who was your dentist here in town? Oh, oh, oh. Uh, 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 Dr. Smith, the Drake Professional Building. You'll still have your dental x-rays on file. They're as good as fingerprints. You go there this afternoon. Don't give your name. Tell them you're Mark Humboldt. Have a new set of x-rays taken and I'll do the rest. Uh, what's your wife doing these days? Why, uh, Emma... Emma's married again. Who's the sucker? Pardon me? The man. Oh, he's a doctor. Dr. Ernst Wilhelm. Wilhelm? He's quite well known, I believe. Yeah, and the cops would like to know more. Now, about my fee... Uh... Oh, uh, Mr. Spade, I have no money. Oh, that's great. You have no money, and all you want is to hire a man to bring you back from the dead. And the more I succeed, the less chance I'll have of collecting. If I might make a suggestion, Mr. Spade, I... I don't know the ethics, but uh, perhaps the insurance company? You would be doing them a great service. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think you're going to live, Mr. Lazarus. They can't keep a good man down. I'll collect from them. I knew there wasn't a chance in 100000 of shaking a fee out of your company. After all, you have your own investigators in the payroll, and contract work isn't deductible under the new tax law, but something about Lazarus had gotten to me. Something else about him got to me at the Blue Bottle Bar and Grill, where I stopped for lunch. Mr. Spade? Yes, indeedy. Uh, I'm Emma Wilhelm, Mr. Spade. Emma Lazarus Wilhelm? I see you do know who I am. May I sit down? Slide in, Mrs. Wilhelm. Thank you. <laughs> I'm glad to know you have a sense of humor, Mr. Spade. Hmm? 
It's about that man, of course. Surely you didn't believe a word of his story. Which word? Oh, I'll admit there are slight traces of the truth in his raving. My first husband, Timothy Lazarus, was an embezzler. He did disappear, and it's quite true that I have collected the insurance on his life. I might even believe that Tim is still alive. But that man is not he. Then what are you so upset about? Oh, it's perfectly obvious what he wants. He's an extortionist. You're wrong. He doesn't want money, Mrs. Wilhelm. He wants you. Oh, uh, Mr. Spade, how much do you know about my husband? Which one? Don't be flippant. Dr. Ernest Wilhelm? He uh, made his first million panning lead nuggets out of gang war casualties and lost it on the stock market. He uh, cut his second million out of Knob Hill and called it surgery. He lost that on horses, blinds, and malpractice suits. The last time he was mentioned in the paper, there was a big picture of him pumping sleeping pills out of the stomach of an aging burlesque queen. It uh, may or may not have been coincidence that she did not recover and that she was the ex-girlfriend of one of our better-known racetrack haberdashers, and if he got a hundred bucks for the job, he was paid off in boodle. Oh, please. Please don't say any more. That poor girl. And he'll do the same thing to me. Well. If you persist in helping that imposter, you'll be responsible for whatever happens to me or anyone else you involve. Mm-hmm. Anything else I should know? Yes. Both you and your client are being watched and followed. You can't escape him. He's not quite the has-been you'd like to think he is. After she had gone, I scraped the tears off my butter, finished my lunch, washed my hands with a nationally advertised soap, and mushed over to the Drake Professional Building. I found my client's dentist in his lab polishing up a set of gold inlays. Humboldt? Oh, yes, yes. His x-rays have come through. Only set today. They're on the clamp there. Don't touch them. They're not dry yet. Oh, I'm sorry. Now, what's your interest? Uh, police identification? You guessed it. Always happy to cooperate. Thanks. How about digging in your files for the x-rays on a patient named Lazarus? Oh, yes. Be glad to, of course. <clears throat> Well, let's see now. Larrabee, Lavelle, Lawrence, Lawson, Gluskin. That's G. What's that doing here? Ah, Lazarus. Timothy R. Is that your man? That's the name. Oh, Jimmy, April 1940. Should have been in for dental hygiene. Have to remind Miss Baker. That's my nurse. These uh, pictures, how do they compare with this new set? Well, now let's have a look. Switch on the light there, will you please? And let's see. Malocclusion, lava, cuspids, impacted third molar. Ah, erosion in the way. Yes, it's very interesting. You mean they're the same in both sets of pictures? Oh, dear, no, no. A uh, man's mouth could change a lot in seven years, could oh, it? Yes, especially with dental neglect, but that would never cause a man to grow new teeth. Oh, well. You see here, Humboldt has one more lower incisor and two more molars in Lazarus. And the whole character of the mouth is different. Well, these two men would not look even faintly alike. Well, uh, could there have been some mistake in filing? Oh, dear, no. Miss Baker's been with me for ten years. Never made a mistake yet. Mm hmm. Could I talk to her? Not in today. Been out since Tuesday. Cold. Oh, say, by the way, you're a detective. How's this for a mystery? She phoned me this morning and thanked me for sending a doctor around to examine her. Now, this is the peculiar part. I have no recollection of having done so, and I'm not acquainted with the doctor she said I sent her. That wouldn't be a Dr. Ernst Wilhelm. What? Why, yes. Wilhelm. That was the name. Do her another favor, will you? Call a doctor you do know and tell him to get over there as fast as he can. Come on, come on, open up. Get your shirt on, and I'll come in as fast as I can. What you want, kiddo? Which is Miss Baker's room? She's sick. Ain't having no callers. I'm her doctor. Oh, you can't fool me. Where's your little black bag? If I had one, it would be around your neck. Now, March, show me the way. You can't force me. I know my rights. Oh, you do, do you? Well, it might interest you know that your vents are faulty, your wiring is illegal, your drains are unsanitary, and your apron is dirty. Them's rust stains. I'm neat as a pin. You're as neat as a mud pie. Now get going before I have the board of health down on you. All right, but you can't make me climb them stairs. Come on, come but on. sciatica I have. Here's a key. Okay. First door to the right. And whenever she's gone, I hope you catch it. Thank you, Elsa Maxwell. She was stretched out on a bed, her left arm twisted under her and her right dangling over the edge. On the floor beneath it was an empty pill bottle. 
A few red capsules were scattered near it, and some more were spilled out among the bedclothes. It was a standard sleeping pill suicide scene, but I didn't believe it. The body was still warm, but no pulse. I didn't waste time giving her the mirror test. Instead, I looked around for a phone. It was on a table near a window. I meant to dial the police number, Sutter 12020, but SU was as far as I got. It felt like a bee sting or a quick jab with a needle. I spun around and swung out blindly. The face that I missed was suntanned under a shock of iron-gray hair. It was wearing the same white-toothed grin that Dr. Ernst Wilhelm always wore for newspaper photographers. I started towards him, and he backed away, still grinning. Come ahead, Spade. Come and get me, but hurry. You have only 20 seconds more. Shall I count them off? So far, you have three, four, six, seven, eight, nine. The floor kept dropping a foot at a time as I walked toward him. But every time I got to the bottom of the incline, it tilted up the other way and I slipped back. He kept dropping out of sight, and every time I got him back into my line of vision, he was farther away. The walls of the room opened out and disappeared into some clouds. The ceiling spun around faster and faster until it whirled away like one of those flying discs. Then the floor turned into gelatin, and I sank into it. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Now, here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead, socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. Remember, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil contains lanolin. It grooms the hair naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So if you want your hair to be more attractive than ever before, get the generous new 25-cent size of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's leading hair tonic, on sale at all drug and toilet goods counters. It's also available in larger economy bottles and the handy new tube. Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way... Smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too. And mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. And now, back to the Lazarus Caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. The dream lasted about 300 years. Around Christmas time in the year 2247, another bee stung me. I opened my eyes, but the lights on the tree were too bright, and Santa Claus was bending over me with a brandy breath. Come on, man. Come on. Come on. A little willpower. You're conscious. Uh, that's it. That's it. Uh, sensation returning. Uh, here. Try and sit up. Uh, the girl. How about her? Uh, too late. Did everything I could. Suicide pact? Well, one of your brothers in Apollo was a little too handy with a needle. Here's the mark on my arm, and you'll find one on that stiff. Those sleeping capsules were a plant to make it look like suicide. Uh, you'll be feeling better soon. Now, come along. Up on your feet. Must keep moving. Restore circulation. Yeah. Hip, hip. Uh, 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 thanks. Thanks. You, uh, you the man Dr. Smith called? Yes. So, you're a private detective. Uh, how do you feel now? I'm still dopey. You, uh, give me something to pick me up? I've given you as much stimulant as it's safe to administer. For the rest, you'll have to sleep it off. And you will. I advise you to hurry home. Get into bed before this wears off. How long have I got? A mm, couple of hours if you keep moving. Maybe three. Yeah. Mm, but if I were you, I wouldn't stay out. You don't want to fall asleep in the middle of Market Street. Get run over by a bus. Worst things can happen to you in your own bed. Look at her. Murder? You think you can prove it? I don't know. I couldn't. Not on her. And I've been an autopsy surgeon for 20 years. Well, cheer up, doctor. If you miss on her, you may get a second chance. Huh? 
Yeah, me. Mm -hmm. Uh, Those eyes are looking better. I think you'll live. I wasn't so sure. Unless I could nail Wilhelm before my three hours was up as a safe bet he'd nail me again with that needle. He had done me one favor. He'd convinced me that my client was really the man he claimed to be and that Wilhelm and Emma knew it. My best hope of smoking him out was to dig out some solid proof. I spent ten minutes of my three hours getting to the hall of records and ten more finding out there was nothing there on Lazarus but his death certificate. I had a gander at the wanted file at police headquarters. They'd checked him out in August of 47 when the court had pronounced him dead. I looked at my watch. With two hours and 17 minutes of wakefulness left, I just didn't have time. I stopped by Lazarus' hotel, got a set of his fingerprints and several samples of his signature, took them to a penman I know down on the mission, and between us we forged the most amazing set of documents ever assembled on one man. All dated, notarized, certified, witnessed, registered, one even bore the great seal of the state of California and the signature of the governor. I squeezed them all into a large briefcase, propped my eyes open with toothpicks while I drank half a gallon of black coffee, then phoned Dr. Wilhelm's night number. I told him I was one of Russian Leo's boys, and a cop had just winged me on the lamb from a jewelry store job. He agreed to meet me at his office. Hello, Wilhelm. Yes? Is that all you got to say to the guy you knocked off an hour ago? I'm afraid I don't quite follow. Who are you? Look, I know that you know, and you know that I know. They even wrote a song about it. So let's get off the dime and don't reach for a needle. This gun is bigger and it shoots farther. Well, I can see you mean business. What do you want? First, I want to show you a few things. Here, take a look. Mm Hmm? Well... This is very impressive. Yeah, I thought you'd be impressed. You, uh, need any more proof that Lazarus is Lazarus? What's the matter, Spade? Getting sleepy? Don't get your hopes up. I can squeeze this trigger in my sleep. Mm -hmm. Are these papers for sale? Why do you think I brought them to you? What's the price? Half the take on Lazarus' insurance. That's very high. I haven't finished. This time, Lazarus has got to be really dead and you're going to do the job. Come on, come on, stop stalling. I can't do that. Why not? Why, Emma, she'll make trouble. She said she would. She's still in love with him? Why do you say that? I just wondered. What reason did she give you for not wanting him knocked off? Well, the cops work harder at identifying a dead man than they do a live derelict that looks and talks like a crank. I had the same idea myself. Then you're stupid. With him dead, she can tell any story she wants to. With him alive and all this proof of identity, he's in a position to nail both of you for fraud, conspiracy, perjury. Shall I go on? Uh, One thing. Does Emma know about these papers? Sure. You're lying. Sure, I'm lying. And those documents are forgeries, if that's the way you want it. I haven't got time to argue. I can't stay awake much longer, and you can't bring it off without me. I'll have Lazarus at my apartment in 30 minutes. Bring your needle and the 50 grand. All right, Spade. I'll be there. I made two phone calls on my way to pick up Lazarus, one to Emma and one to Lieutenant Erlinger of Homicide. Dundee was asleep. The Lieutenant and Sergeant Poolhouse were perched on the fire escape outside my window, and Emma was waiting in the living room when we got there. Tim, oh, my poor darling. Emma, you recognize me. Of course, darling, from the beginning. But I didn't dare speak out in front of Ernst. I know. Mr. Spades told me. Now, listen to me, you two. You sure you can go through with this? Oh, are you sure there's no danger? That's him now. Come on, Lazarus, get in the bedroom there. Now, do what I told you. Don't worry, Emma. Oh, I'm so frightened. Quiet. Hello, Spade. I got here just at... Emma, what are you doing here? Uh, Mr. Spade phoned me. I agreed. It's the only thing to do. I wanted you to know that. Well, I'm glad to see that you've come to your senses for a while there. You see, you were wrong, Spade. Did you bring the stuff? Uh, here's your money. I have the hypodermic in the case here. It's already loaded. 
<laughs> we both need a sterile needle. <laughs> Where is he? In there on the bed. He was asleep a minute ago. The grogginess that had kept coming back over me in waves for the last two hours swirled over me again as Wilhelm leaned over the bed where Lazarus lay, stretched out with his eyes closed. For a split second, I blanked out, and I was afraid it had already happened. But then I saw Wilhelm's hand coming down at an oblique angle toward Lazarus's forearm. Then my vision blurred again, and my arms felt too heavy to lift. It was Emma's scream that jolted me back. I clawed out blindly. <laughs> Drop it. You let go of it. You, you get it in your own arm. Let go. Swine, you double crossing. Now, here's a little sleeping medicine for you. Okay, boys. Come and get him. Good boy, Sam. Good boy. We won't forget this. Yeah. A likely story. Uh, get that broken glass, pole house. Put it in the Dixie cup. I handle it careful. One analyze that medicine. You okay? Uh, who are these people, Sam? Accomplices? Yeah, but not for homicide. What about Ernst? They won't let him go free, will they? Don't worry. He's out of circulation for good. Mr. Spade. Yeah, Lazarus. I, I, I don't know how to thank you. Yes. You don't know what this means to us. Uh, yes, I do. It probably means another long separation. The state prisons aren't co-ed. But if you insist on being alive, you have to take life as it comes. Period. Uh, end of bedtime story. Oh, Sam, it's so sad. That poor couple, so much in love. Mm. But you had to do your duty, didn't you, mm. Sam? Mm? They had to pay their debt to society, of course. Mm. That's why you had to be so hard and unrelenting and not give in to your better nature. Oh, that's right, that's right. Never give in to the ship. <laughs> Don't tread on me. It was uh, Hobson's... Hobson's... Um, yeah, what was it that Hobson... Uh, you may fire when ready. You know best, Sam. I just go type this up. And now, listen to this. A good friend of the family. That's Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic, folks. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms the hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose dandruff. Now, get Wild Root Cream Oil at your drug or toilet goods counter in a new 25-cent Get Acquainted bottle. Also, ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Oh, there you go, away. Your apron's dirty. Sam, I'm not wearing an apron. <sighs> then why don't you let me sleep? Sam, you've got to wake up. Your coffee's here. And tell him I'm in conference. No, Sam, no. The black coffee. You said to order three gallons. What? I couldn't carry it all. I'll make another trip. Twenty-four cardboard containers. You'll have to drink it up fast now. They're, they're leaking already. Abandon ship, all ye who enter here. Oh, Sam, what am I going to do with it? Uh, open a restaurant. Good night. Oh, good night, Sam. Number three turrets, open fire. <laughs> The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Loreen Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd. Musical direction by Lud Gluskin, with score composed by Rene Garrigan. 
Join us again next Sunday when author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keeping all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get Wild Root right away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Uh, this is Sam, Black Lake Spade, the third most dangerous gambler on the Barbary Coast. Oh, Sam, not horses again. Horses, women, and the gaming tables, Effie, the diversions of the elite. Well, divert yourself with this, Sam. The phone company has sent the pink notice. Aha, uh-huh. pay it no mind, sweetheart. We are healed. We have hit the cashier's cage, annexed the pot, broken the bank, and we're standing on velvet. Sam, are you sober? Uh, definitely velvet. Hmm, warm, too. Sam, from where are you calling from? You're wrong, Effie. It's a drugstore. Stay where you are. I'll be right down to deal out my report on the hot hundred grand caper. Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. It's smart to buy things the whole family can use, isn't it? That's why I say it's smart to buy Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic. To mom, to dad, to the children, Wild Root Cream Oil is really a friend indeed. Non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil with lanolin grooms the hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, removes loose, ugly dandruff. I hope you have a big family-sized bottle of Wild Root Cream Oil in your home. Get Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. Uh, Date, uh, September 19, 1948. To uh, robbery detail, San Francisco Police, Attention Sergeant Walsh. Uh, from Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Uh, dear Joe, here's the rundown on that hot hundred grand. It started pleasantly enough when my secretary, Miss Effie Perrine, cute little mouse, eased into my private office, closed the door behind her, and leaned back against it with that air of pained resignation, which generally means there's a customer outside that she doesn't approve of, but that I'll see her anyway. It's up to you, Sam. She's very well dressed, and I imagine she can afford you. How do you uh, deduce that? Well, she dropped her purse. I didn't get time to count it all, but there was a hundred-dollar bill on top. Well, sure, in, Effie. Sam. Go ahead, say it. Oh, I don't know, Sam. Sometimes, well, there's just money. No. No, that's one of the reasons I hire you. What's the matter with it? Nothing. That's just it, Sam. She's very Mm good-looking, cultivated, and very kind and considerate. And she seems sincerely troubled. You mean her act is a little too good? I felt that too, Sam. Thanks, Angel. I'll keep that in mind. Tell her to come in. All right, Sam. Mr. Spade will see you, Mrs. Kilcourt. Thank you. Thank you for seeing me, Mr. Spade. My pleasure. Uh, Won't you sit down? Oh, thank you. 
I'm Lorraine Kilcourse, Mr. Spade. It's about my husband, Leonard Kilcourse. Husband? Oh. We've only been married a short time. It was a quiet ceremony at the San Cedro Mission. Mm -hmm. Leonard didn't want to subject me to any publicity. The difference in our ages, you know? You mean you want me to keep it a secret? Oh, no. No, except for the newspapers, of course. Naturally, all of Leonard's friends know. Well, he doesn't have many from what I've heard. I thought it strange, too, that such a prominent man should have such a small circle of acquaintances. I met him only a short time before I married him. He's been very kind and absolutely devoted to me, and I suppose I should feel ashamed of myself for, for coming to you. But there are so many things about him that are mysterious that I... Sometimes I... I can't seem to find my handkerchief. Here. Kleenex. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. I uh, take it you're not a San Francisco girl. No. No, I met him at a dude ranch. Well, uh, maybe I can clear up some of your mysteries for free. The reason your husband doesn't have many friends is because they keep dropping dead. I don't understand you. Uh, forget it. He's a big public servant. He's built a lot of sidewalks. The streets of the city are paved with his good intentions. His name is on a thousand manhole covers. If the names of his former business associates land on headstones, it's stuffing to me. I got my own racket. Well, what? I think my husband is paying blackmail to someone. Uh-huh. And upon what do you base your suspicions, Mrs. K? It started about a month ago. He began withdrawing large sums from our joint account. First it was 10000 then then 20000 and last week, 50000 mm -hmm. and, and this morning, he closed out the balance of the account. $100,000. Yeah, well, he's got it to spend, Mrs. Kilcoy. Well, I, I won't pretend the money doesn't interest me, but... What's behind it, Mr. Spade? Each time he withdraws these cash sums, he leaves the house without a word to me. And sometimes doesn't return until dawn. My husband is not fond of nightlife, Mr. Spade. Only a desperate situation could induce him to leave the house after dark. <clears throat> yeah, so I've heard. They say that's how he kept his health as long as he has. All right, uh, you want me to trail him, find out what he does with the money. Just one question. Why'd you pick me for the job? I... I, why, your reputation... That's is... local. You say you're new in San Francisco. Well, I, I do read the local papers. Your picture was in only two weeks ago. Yeah, well, that caver didn't help my reputation. I like your looks. A nice, honest face. A man I could trust. Well, don't buy that. And I'm sentimental, too. Your picture reminded me of someone who was very dear to me. My brother... Of course, you're nothing like him, really, but, but you do look alike. I suppose that sounds like a silly woman's reason for... Yeah. What's your address? Well, I have a little place of my own out on Divisadero. The Balboa Apartments near Normandy Terrace. Mm -hmm. You'd better keep in touch with me there. I don't want Leonard to know. The Kilcourse Mansion is at 1316 Clarendon. 1316. Mm -hmm. He returns from his office around six in the evening. Do you have a car? No. Do I need one? Well, I don't know where he may go. Now, here are the keys to my car. It's parked in front of the main entrance, a gray Plymouth. He won't recognize the car. It, my, my, it's my brother's. Now, about your fee. A hundred bucks now. If I need more, I'll leave you now. I had an uneasy feeling I would need more. The last detective that tried to follow Leonard Kilcourse had hospital insurance. I don't. But I'm a gambler at heart, so I parked Lorraine's Plymouth across the street from the Kilcourse mansion and waited. At 9 and a p.m., Mr. Kilcourse, much, much too old for her, came out the front door and flagged down a taxi. I made an illegal U-turn and followed. The trail ended across the Golden Gate Bridge in Marin County. It was a country club-type building on top of a hill overlooking the bay. It did business under the name of Ernie Nogales' Racket Club. The racket had nothing to do with tennis. It came from two sources. The moans and groans of the customers losing money at the roulette wheels and crap tables, and the glad hand the management threw at my quarry as I followed him in. Well, Mr. Kilcourt, surprised to see you. Since when you go out after dark? Well, I thought a little nightlife might agree with me, Nogales. Oh, 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 that sounds like you, Mr. Kilcourt. I didn't know you better. I think you was afraid to go out night. <laughs> well, now, I was thinking of buying this place to retire to. Ah. But I figured it'd be cheaper to win it at your roulette table. <laughs> What's your limit here? Ten thousand. But for you, wide open. The sky. 
A hot hundred grand for a starter? Well, any time they catch you with hot money, Mr. Kinko. <laughs> Come over to the cashier. I send you the chips myself. I didn't have to bother making myself inconspicuous. Everybody in the joint stopped playing to watch Kilkos while he shoved his hundred grand roll through the cashier's window and scooped up four stacks of thousand buck chips. Make your bets, please. All right, you. Spin that wheel. Huh? How much you got there? Twenty-five grand. Any objections? Is that okay, Mr. Nogales? Uh, spin it, Joe. I'm covering through the table, person. Okay, sir. Around and round the little ball goes. Fifteen pay, fifteen and the red. Maybe next time, Mr. Kimco. Why don't you double up, play the red and the black? Safer. I'll stay with the numbers. Fifty thousand on fifteen. There. Spin it. It's okay, Joe. I'm still covering. Well, it's your money, Mr. Nogales. Number four pays. Number four and the red again. Well, 25 grand more on 15. Uh, look, Mr. Kilcoles, go on, enjoy yourself, take it off your income tax, but please spend those... Spread them out a little there, those chips, huh? It looks bad for the house. What kind of a joint is this? Can't you cover the bets? Okay, Joe. He asked for it. Okay, sir. <laughs> I didn't wait to see where the little ball went on the last spin of the wheel. I would have made a side bet with any taker that Kilcourse wanted to lose that hundred grand. I would also have made book he knew I was following him. As I left the table and walked out of the club, I braced myself for what usually comes next. There would either be a dead body in the car or somebody would crease my noggin with a sap. But nothing happened. I switched on the headlights and stood in the glare of them for fully a minute, but nobody even shot at me. I flushed the shrubbery. No gunman. Check the ignition wires. No booby traps. Driving back to town, I racked my brain for some way to bring them out into the open. I felt like a man with his life savings all on one number waiting for the wheel to stop spinning, which wasn't far from the truth. Not much of a cliffhanger, but the best we could do this week. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective... Sam Spade. Now, here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead, socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, How does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. Remember, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil contains lanolin. It grooms the hair naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So if you want your hair to be more attractive than ever before, get the generous new 25-cent size of Wild Root Cream Oil. America's leading hair tonic, on sale at all drug and toilet goods counters. It's also available in larger economy bottles and the handy new tube. Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too. And mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. And now, back to the hot hundred grand caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. Yeah? Uh, this, uh, Mrs. Kilcourse's apartment? Yeah. She here? Yeah. Well, uh, can I come in? Yeah. Call me? Yeah. Who is that, Mr. Spade? Yeah. Oh, this is this is the detective I was telling you about, Tommy. Remember? Yeah. The one who looked so much like you? Yeah. No. Oh, excuse me. This is my brother, Tommy Lane. Yeah. I mean, uh... Tommy, won't you run down to the corner and buy me some cigarettes for about 20 minutes? I have something to talk over with Mr. Spade. Yeah. Nice boy, your brother. 
Small vocabulary, but big feet. Well, he, he's shy. Now, what did you find out about Mr. K- uh, my husband, Mr. Spade? He uh, dropped a hundred grand in a gambling joint. Ernie Nogales' racket club. You know it? No, but I know Ernie Nogales. I knew him in Reno before I met Leonard. He lost his license there for running a crooked wheel. The way Kilcourse was playing tonight, that wheel didn't have to be crooked. He was trying to lose that hundred grand. But why? Why would he do a thing like that? One of two reasons. Either he's paying off to Nogales or he's paying off to somebody else and Nogales is the go-between. Well, I don't believe it. Ernie is a crooked gambler, but he doesn't touch blackmail. And your husband isn't stupid enough to drop a hundred grand in three turns of a wheel. Anyway, I'm not tangled with him and or the Ernie Nogales mob for a hundred bucks of your money or anybody else's. Here, take it. Well, but... And here are your car keys. No, no, wait, please. You, you can't desert me now. Why not? Well, I haven't told you everything. I'd hoped I wouldn't have to. About your brother? How did you know? The only place you get a green suntan is in a pokey. Besides, the act's kind of stir-crazy. Spent a little time in solitary, didn't he? He won't talk about it. But that's it, Sam. That's why Leonard is paying that blackmail money to Nogales. Uh, you just said Nogales wouldn't touch blackmail. Any other corrections you'd like to make in your copy before we proceed? Yes. Uh, well, I might as well tell you everything. Why not? I knew when I came to you this morning that my husband was paying this money to Nogales. I knew because I asked him to. You and Ernie Nogales are working together? I'm not that rotten. I didn't say you were, but you're a rotten liar. There's that much in your favor. But I'm telling the truth now, Sam. You must believe me. Everything that has happened is my fault. I persuaded Nogales to give my brother a job in his place in Reno. Mm-hmm. They quarreled, and when he got closed down, he, he blamed Tommy. He swore he'd kill him when he got out of prison. That's why I begged my husband to pay him to save Tommy's life. Who did rat on Nogales about that crooked wheel in Reno? I did. That's why I feel responsible. Leonard is so fine, so so generous. But I can't let him go on paying for my mistake. Yeah, like you said, he's going to run out of money. Look at me, Sam. Do I look like the kind of a woman to whom money means everything in the world? No, but you're looking at me, not at Kilcourse. You're laughing at me. Oh, I know what you think. Perhaps I did make a mistake in marrying Leonard, but he was so kind, so considerate, like my father. Everybody reminds you of your relatives. You don't believe my story? Well, since you asked. Well, all right, then. Here's the truth. I'm really Jack the Ripper's granddaughter. My parents were terribly wealthy. I harpooned my mother in her Beverly Hills swimming pool, set fire to my father with a $50,000 negotiable bond, and eloped with John Wilkes Booth. That brings us up to 1865. Shall I go on? Don't stop. It's great. Oh, get out of here. Get out of here and leave me alone. After you've told me all your secrets, I'm not that rotten. You won't help me. You never intended to. Why go on torturing me? Oh, now, stop that. (laughs) Please, please. I, I believe you. I believe all your stories. Now, uh, what is my next smart move? Sam, the only way to stop Ernie Nogales is to prove that he's running a crooked wheel. And then he'd pay back all that blackmail money, and, and he wouldn't dare lay a hand on Tommy. Well, it's going to be hard to prove and expensive. Oh, but... I'll have to lose a little on that wheel before I can figure the way it's rigged. How much can you invest? Well, I, I have about a thousand dollars of my own. With you? Yes. Here. You take it. Hmm. Smells nice. Sam. Yeah? Sam, after all this is over, and after I've put things to right with Leonard, I should have told him before this, but I owed him so much, I... Oh, Sam, I'm so glad it's you. Yeah. Me too, Angel. Go now, darling, before I beg you not to. What time does that joint close? Well... Well, it runs all night, I think. Good. Let's stay up late and raid the icebox. Around 2 in the a.m., when I low-geared the Plymouth up the long, steep driveway to Ernie Nogales' racket club, backed into the parking space nearest the road with a car headed downhill for a quick getaway just in case, and I went in. The joint was still going full blast. I bought 500 bucks worth of chips, swaggered over to the table where Kilcourse had dropped his hundred grand and nonchalantly flipped the blue chip onto the red. A police it, sir, ladies and gentlemen. Make your game. Okay, that's all. Around and round the little ball goes. I didn't look to see where the little ball went. Most of the money was on red, so it was bound to turn up black. 
Oh, I've read the page. What? Oh. Number 15. Place your match, please. Hey, no. Make the game, ladies and gentlemen. They're round. They're round again. The chips were spread around more the next turn, so I stacked 100 at the bottom of the 1 to 34 column. With a crooked wheel, my 100 made it the best bet to lose. And 19, and the red wins again. Hey! I plunked 500 down on number 5 and raked in 17,500. I left my original bet on the table. When the little ball fell into the pocket, I was 35,000 bucks to the good from my point of view, but not from my clients. I doubled my bet and looked apprehensively around. There were no surly characters edging up behind me. In fact, the only surly character in sight was Ernie Nogales, and he looked happy. That didn't make much sense. When my bankroll got to 105,000, I played a hunch. I threw five grand of it back on the table and lost it. That made a kind of sense. I cashed in the rest of my chips and squeezed the hundred grand U.S. currency into my inside pocket. If anybody aimed for my heart, it was thick enough to stop the slug, which was some comfort. But what I saw when I walked out to the parking lot was no comfort at all. I'd gotten just a glimpse of it through some trees. A sedan backed into a driveway halfway down the hill. It was blacked out except for five glowing cigar ends that showed through the windows. I could think of only one reason for five cigar smokers to be parked in that particular spot at that particular moment. The Plymouth is where I had parked it, pointing straight down the hill. I slammed the door but didn't get in. Then I listened. The car down the hill was getting ready, too. I cracked the door of the Plymouth wide enough to get my arm inside and pressed the starter with the heel of my hand. I switched on the lights, pushed the clutch with my left hand, used my right to shift it into low... And I pulled the hand throttle out all the way and let it go. What's the big idea busting into my office? We're going to have a talk, no, Gallus? Please, don't wave that heater at me. It makes me nervous. I don't like guns. I don't either. That's why I'm here. Put your hands on top of the desk and keep them there. All right. Give me back that roll. I give you clean money for it. It was a gamble, so I lost. Can you blame me? Where'd you get this money? I buy it. Fifty cents on the dollar. I don't ask where it came from, but I read the papers. I figured it was that ship row, that shipyard payroll job a few days back. Like it just fell in my lap. I figured it'd make 50 grand instead of kill course five. I guess that was dirty trick you just out of stir, Tommy, huh? I got news for you, Nogales. I didn't know this money was hot, and I am not Tommy Lane. No? Then what? Private Dick. Tommy's sister hired me to take the fall for him. Look, I uh, got most of the cape. But Kilcourse wanted to pay Tommy a hundred grand. You rigged the wheel so Kilcourse would lose it one night and Tommy would win it back the next night. Now, uh, what was Kilcourse paying him off for? No caper, legitimate. He was sent up for bribing a public official. You mean he was the payoff man for Kilcourse's contracting firm? Sure, legitimate business. And the grand jury went out after Kilcourse. Tommy took the rap, that's all, for a price. Yeah, a hundred grand. Thanks, Nogales. That's all I needed. Oh, Sam. I was afraid I might be too late. You are, sweetheart. Oh, I have so many things to explain. Where, 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 where can you talk? Right in here. But who's this man? Why, that's your old sweetie from Reno, Ernie Nogales, oh. remember? What's the matter with you two? You oh. crazy? Oh, Sam, I should have told you the truth from the beginning. Check. For Nogales yarn, I can understand. But why did you tell me you were killed cause his wife? I was desperate. I had to say something. It was the only explanation I could think of for my interest in this case yeah. without telling the truth. But you were making a pigeon out of me. I don't know about such things, Sam. All I know is I'm here in time to warn you. You mustn't walk out of here with that money. Listen. They may kill you to get it back. They already did. They're combing the wreckage of that car right now looking for my body. <gasps> Then Tommy was right. They did mean to kill him. How'd he get the rumble? While he was in prison. From another man that killed Course Framed. He was in for life, so it was safe for him to talk. Hey, you... Oh. Yeah, no, Gallus? That car that just drove up. I think that's Mr. Kilcourse. Oh, I... Hey, what's your let hurry? Go, let me go! Come on, what's your hurry? Tommy's out there in that cab. I've got to warn him. Or a tip-off Kilcourse. Which is it? No, Sam, you've got to believe me. Sit down. Oh, don't... 
Stop that. You two have fun. I'm getting out of here. Go ahead. Now, uh, listen, sweet Lorraine, you may as well save your breath for those explanations. You're staying right here until the cape is all wrapped up. Here he comes. Have you got a gun, Sam? Yeah. Well, you do better have it ready. Mm-mm. But Sam... Where's no Gallus? I want to see him. Uh, he was called out of town, sir. I'm in charge. Uh, you Mr. Kilcourse? That's right. I want to know why you people have been interfering with my business. It might interest you to know that this building site's on an old Spanish land grant. Title's very shaky. I'll run an eight-lane highway straight through the middle of it and turn the rest of it into a game preserve. <laughs> That's what I do to people who double-cross me. I tried to tell Mr. Nogales that, sir. He wouldn't listen to me. He tipped Tommy off for a split of the hundred grand, but I knew sooner or later we'd have to answer to you, Mr. Kilcourse. Oh, well, what's that? Here's your hundred grand, sir. Count it. Sam. Well, 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 well. What's your name, son? Sam Spade, sir. Well, I'm glad to meet an honest lad. Well, come along. Uh, you too, young lady. We'll all walk out together. Sam, shut what up, are you... What? Uh, Spade, huh? Yes, sir. I'm a private detective, but I'm ambitious. Hmm. Politics? Uh, yes, sir. Well, we'll run you for assembly. In the meantime, I believe there's an opening in one of the public services. Garbage disposal. Executive end, of course. Where the devil is that man with my car? Oh, there he is. Now, you drop around to my office in the morning. Thank you, and good night, Mr. Kilcourt. Yes. Uh, drive on, Horace. Back to the city. Oh, Sam. How could you? Hmm? All those lies and, and just handing over the money like that. It, it wasn't yours. It wasn't Tommy's either, sweetheart. Get in. Well, Tommy, are you all right? Yeah. Drive us across the bridge, Tommy, will you? Yeah. Tommy. Yeah. Tommy, I'm afraid we'll have to do without the money. Yeah? Sam gave it to Mr. Kilcourse. Yeah? Now, now, don't get excited, Tommy. I'm sure Sam had a reason. Didn't you, Sam? Yeah. I mean, that was marked money from a payroll job. Oh, then it won't do him any good. It'll send him up for a good long stretch if the eyewitness story that goes along with it is good enough. And you're just the girl to tell it, sweetheart. Am I uh, right, Tommy? Yeah. Period, end of report. Already? But, Sam... Yeah? What happened? Who were the five men in the car, the ones who shot at that Plymouth in the mistaken belief that you were in it? Their names are of little account, Effie. Suffice it to say that Kilcourse pointed his pudgy finger at them in the hopes of keeping the charge of attempted murder out of his indictment. But I was too clever. I identified them. But, Sam, you didn't see anything but their cigars glowing in the darkness. Have you never heard of Sherlock Holmes' monograph on the 49 varieties of tobacco ash, you oh, fool? Oh, but, Sam, Sherlock Holmes is only the segment of someone's imagination. He's a fictional detective. Well? You mean... Oh, Sam, you're tired. Yes, I am. It's affected your mind, well. winning all that money. Now, you just sit here and rest. Oh, all right. Think of the snowy mountaintops and uh, blue skies. Mm-hmm. I'll just go and type this up. Snowy mountaintops. Winter sports yet. And now, listen to this. If you haven't yet tried Wild Root Cream Oil, the famous hair tonic that grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness and removes loose dandruff, then here's a wonderful way to get acquainted. Buy Wild Root Cream Oil in the new 25-cent size bottle at your drug or toilet goods counter. Also, ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Well, here it is, Sam. And not that it made any difference, but how did you guess that she wasn't Mrs. Kilcourse? Simple. Kilcourse didn't recognize her. But Sam, that was after you denounced her. I did no such thing. From the report, Sam, in black and white. Quote, why did you tell me you were Kilcourse's wife? Unquote. At that point, you assumed that she was not Mrs. Leonard Kilcourse. I did not. I merely wondered why she had told me. Well, with all the lies she told, you might have assumed anything she said was totally devoid of truth. And I did, sweetheart. I did. Oh. Oh, well, that's a relief. I was afraid for a while she'd taken you in. What's that got to do with the truth? Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. 
Sadie Thompson appeared as Lorraine Kilcourse. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd. Musical direction by Lud Gluskin, score composed by Renee Garrigan. Join us again next Sunday when author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keeping all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get Wild Root right Away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Sam, sweetheart. Any calls? Only one, Sam. Lieutenant Dundee of Homicide. Mm-hmm. He wants you to drop around so they can get your formal statement. No hurry, not now. He told me what happened, Sam. I'm sorry. Yeah, so am I. I guess he was one of your oldest friends, wasn't he? You don't make any friends in this business, Evie. You can write that in your book now, and I'll give you the rest of it when I get there. You sound tired, Sam. Wouldn't you rather just... What, baby? Well, go home and, you know, just put it off until tomorrow. Or... Yeah, maybe I... No. No, I'll get it off my chest tonight. Stay there, Effie. I'll come on down and dictate my report on the Dick Foley caper. Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. No two ways about it, folks. Hair that's well-groomed can make all the difference in the world to a person's overall appearance. That's why so many men, women, boys, and girls are turning to the famous non-alcoholic hair tonic with lanolin, Wild Root Cream Oil. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, removes loose dandruff. If you haven't tried it before, you'll want to get Wild Root Cream Oil in a new 25-cent Get Acquainted size. Yes, get Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. Here, Sam, let me. Am I that shaky? Say when. Just for the top of the glass. Now, that's enough. You'll spill it? Yeah. Sam, what you said over the phone about not making any friends in this business, you didn't really mean that, did you? Forget it. You can label this, oh, a file on Dick Foley. Date, fill it in. Yes, Sam. To uh, Dundee at Homicide, I guess, from uh, Samuel Spade, license number 137596. The facts are all here. If you can dig a formal statement out of it, you're welcome. I'd known Dick Foley ever since I took out my license. We'd worked several big capers together back in my days as a continental lot. He and Mickey Linehan and I. Then he and Mickey opened their own office, Foley and Linehan, Private Investigations. Five years back, Mickey stopped the slug, and since then, the sign on the door read Dick Foley Detective Agency. I'd seen Dick maybe four or five times in the last half a dozen years just to have a drink and chew the fat about the good old days. He never talked about his private life. I assumed he didn't have any. 
So when I went to his office the day before yesterday in response to his call, I was surprised to find him in a clinch with one of the most beautiful nails I've ever seen. <clears throat> oh. oh. Oh, oh, Sam. Well, well. Uh, shall I uh, come back after lunch? Oh, uh... Uh, Sam, this is Maxine, my wife. Well, you don't deserve it, but I'm happy for you. <laughs> I'll return the compliment, Sam. I've wanted to meet you for years, but Dick wouldn't introduce me. Now you know why. Hmm. Well, uh... You run along, honey. Sam's here on business. All right, Dick. You can bring Sam home to dinner if you like. There's plenty. If he's not too busy, but don't count on that. Well, try anyway, won't you, Sam? I will indeed. Bye now. Draw up a chair, Sam. Hmm? Sit down. Oh. Uh, uh, what's on your mind, Dick? You remember Claude Spicer, that grifter I sent over for that jewelry store hike back in 43? You never told me you were married, Dick. I'm very happily married. Now, please pay attention. Uh, uh, Claude Spicer, yeah. Yeah, I remember the caper. Wasn't there a dame involved? Well, Spicer had a girlfriend, but the, the cops gave her a good bill of health. Spicer went up for a five-year stretch. They spung him last month. Whatever happened to that dame? Uh, now, look, about Spicer... He gunning for you? You hit it. How scared of him are you? Well, enough to ask you for help, Sam. What's eating him? Just revenge? Sam, I wouldn't tell this to anybody but you. But all the facts of that caper didn't come out at that time. Uh, I uh, saw to that. How come? Well, I couldn't have stayed in business in San Francisco if it had been generally known that my partner was the inside man on that jewelry store heist. Mickey? Yeah, Mickey Linehan. Ah, you and I are both great at choosing partners, Sam. They both deserved what they got. Only one difference. I sent up the killer that plugged my partner. Some people thought the way you gave evidence at Spicer's murder trial wasn't so hot. Well, he was alibied, Sam. In fact, the robbery was his alibi for the murder. I don't know how he managed it. I've been trying for five years to figure it out. Spicer's afraid I might succeed someday. That's why he's out to get me. What's he waiting for? Oh, I don't know. He won't do it simple. He'll have a fancy plan like the other time. He's tricky. Where's he staying? At the Belvedere. Here's his mug. I kept a plant in the building for a couple of days, but he stayed holed up in his room. I think he spotted me. Okay, Dick, I'll give it a buzz. Now, wait a minute, Sam. Yeah? I'm not asking you to do this for love. Standard fee, 25 and whiskey money. Okay? Forget it. This one's on me. In the elevator on my way out, I studied the picture of Claude Spicer on the old police circular Dick had given me. But a picture in the back of my mind kept getting in the way. It was Dick Foley's wife, Maxine. When I hit the street, I still saw her face before me, and it was no picture. Only pretty as. Sam, I waited for you. I've got to talk to you. My pleasure. Shall we uh, confer in an adjacent cafe? Wherever you say. Only I don't want Dick to know. Then you shouldn't have married a detective. Please, Sam. How's this? Uh, black watch. Yeah. Looks dark enough. Oh, that booth in the corner, it's secluded. Why not? Slide in. Oh, no, over here, stupid, not facing the street. Oh, sorry. I'm not much good at this sort of thing. Sam, I'm not asking you to tell me what it is, but if he's in really bad trouble, I think I have a right to know. What makes you think he's in trouble? Well, I'm not blind. You can't live with a man and not sense it when something goes wrong. I never thought Dick was the type to show it. Oh, he's, he's tried to hide it from me, and I haven't said anything. I thought if he wanted me to know, he'd tell me. It was a wise thought. Hold on to it. Well, I meant to. But then a terrible possibility crossed my mind. Sam, it isn't me, is it? In what way? Well, you know what I mean. He's been away from home nights so much lately, and he questions me so closely about where I go and who I see and so on, and I... Well, I may as well ask you right out. Did he hire you to check up on me? Then that is it. No. You're not lying to me, Sam. Why should I? Dick says you're almost his oldest friend. He's talked so much about you. And he must have told you I don't do that type of work. Why do you keep looking at me if... Sorry, trying to place you, Maxine. I keep thinking I've seen you someplace before. Oh, it must have been my picture. I was an actress. Yeah. Picture. Yeah, maybe that was it. Why do you say it like that? Like what? Well, as if you were angry with me. Because I just got the caption on the picture. Well, Sam, wait. Come back. Yes, I had. And the caption was from a newspaper circa 1943. And it read, Actress Lovely cleared in Lanahan slaying. 
I flashed my tin star at the room clerk at the Belvedere, learned that Claude Spicer was in, and stuck around to make sure the clerk didn't buzz the room to tip him off. Around 4 in the p.m., Spicer went out, very dressed up, umbrella, gloves and all. He walked down Geary to Grant and turned north. A cold San Francisco drizzle started blowing up from the bay. I wished I'd brought my overcoat. A half a block up from California, he entered Grayson's jewelry store. I peeked through the rain streak show window after him. Inside, pawing eagerly through a tray full of diamond clips while a long-suffering clerk eyed her hopelessly from his side of the counter was the actress Lovely. Maxine shot Spicer a quick glance of recognition as he entered, but they didn't speak. He took up a pose of gentlemanly patience, shrugged his eyebrows sympathetically at the clerk, and leaned elegantly on his umbrella while Maxine found fault with every piece of jewelry that was shoved in front of her. The bored expression left his face only once. That was when the clerk opened the vault and brought out some unset stones. Their act may have been fooling the clerk, but it was as plain as the nose on Spice's face, a very plain nose it was, that they were sizing up the joint for a pushover. Maxine left first. He stayed long enough to buy a cigarette lighter and then followed her out. As I took out after him, I stopped to read the sticker on the inside of the glass door. It said, These premises protected by Dick Foley Detective Agency. Maxine was waiting for him at the corner. I grabbed up a Chinese newspaper and used it to listen behind. But I needn't have bothered. They didn't seem to care. Well, are you happy? Ought to be about a million bucks. Why are you so disagreeable? You ought to be feeling good. Feeling good? Five years stretch, I come out to find my girl married to the joker that sent me up. You didn't think it was such a bad idea at the time. Well, I do now. Well, after tonight, we'll go east. You and me together, baby. He'll catch up with us wherever we go. Oh, he shouldn't live so long. How do you mean that? Just like it sounds, baby. Bye. Oh, don't leave. I'm going to get some sleep. I'll need a clear head. Claude, I I don't want to be alone. Oh, not even tonight? I don't want to be alone. (laughs) See you later, honey. Bye-bye. He went straight back to the Belvedere. No stops. Picked up his key at the desk, no messages, took the elevator to the eighth floor. Let himself into room 809, hung out the do not disturb sign, closed and locked the door behind him. I kept a plan on it till around midnight. Then I lifted the do not disturb card from the doorknob and wedged it into the crack of the door. It was a crafty move, and I had just finished doing it craftily when the door opened again in my face. Huh? Who are you? What are you doing here? Uh, uh, nothing, sir. Uh, I, I, I'm making a survey. What? Uh, I'm from the Trotter Pole. Trotter Pole. It's like the Gallup Pole, but we're not in so much of a hurry. Yeah? Just, uh, kindly answer this question. As a Democrat, do you believe... Do we, huh? I picked up the Do Not Disturb card and wedged it back into the crack of his door. As any house dick knows, except, of course, Tiny Stover, the night paper at the Belvedere, if anybody opens the door like that, the card will fall out. And somebody will always hang it on the knob. Another thing Tiny doesn't know is never to draw to an inside straight. We played nine different kinds of poker until 5 a.m. when I thought I'd go up and have another look. All was quiet on the eighth floor. From the elevator bank, I could see room 809. The morning paper was shoved under his door, and my do not disturb sign was apparently where I had planted it. I tiptoed up to make sure. Huh? Who are you? What do you want? Uh, me? Uh, the paper boy, sir. Your morning paper. You get around. Well, well. Good news in the paper, sir? Interesting, interesting. Jewelry store heist up on Grant Avenue. Oh, yes, sir. Our paper only comes... What? I grabbed the paper from under 805. It was the headline I could have expected if Spicer had left his room without my knowing it. Grayson's Jewelry Store, the shop he and Maxine had cased that afternoon, had been taken for an estimated million bucks in uncut gems. But Spice's door hadn't been opened, and there was no other exit. I sat down and thought. And what I thought of was that that sticker on the front door of Grayson's said, These premises protected by Dick Foley Detective Agency. When the 6 a.m. Oakland ferry boat fell its way blindly out of the slip, Claude Spicer was aboard, and so was I. Should have been getting lighter, but it wasn't. The fog was thickening over the harbor, and most of the passengers were inside drinking coffee. Spicer didn't go in. He climbed up to the boat deck and stood at the rail under the pilot's house. 
I planted between two wet paint signs and waited. Not for long. I couldn't make out any features on the man who came up and joined him. They stood face to face, not more than a foot apart, and talked in voices that couldn't get to me through the racket of the foghorns in the harbor. What spoke loud enough for me to hear was a gun. They seemed to fall into each other's arms, then collapsed in a heap on the deck. And when I got to the spot, only the dead one was there. It was Spicer. The other man had disappeared around the corner of the deck house. A ray of light from the pilot's window swept over him, and I saw a gun metal shine in his hand and then spin out over the rail as he threw it. What? Oh, it's you, Sam. I was afraid you'd lost him. What did you do it for, Dick? I had my reason, Sam. Now, trust me, I'll keep you in the clear. How long? As long as I go on playing sucker for you? What do you think I hired you for? Maybe I was supposed to say you killed him in self-defense. Maybe I was supposed to see him making passes at your wife if you needed that. But, Sam, you've got to... I've worked for killers before. I've even worked for thieves. But not for a detective that knocks over a place he's supposed to be protecting. Sam, it's not a... Save it for the cops, Dick. I'm turning you in when we get to Oakland. No, you're not, Sam. Dick, come back here. Let go, me. I'm going over the side. If you try to stop me, you're going with me. He fought away from me, got one foot over the rail, and kicked out at me with the other. It caught me on the point of the chin. I stumbled forward and grabbed out blind. I must have caught him by the belt just as he jumped. I remember something pulling me halfway over the rail and trying to get free of it. I did, but not soon enough. I was in midair, and the black water came rushing up to meet me. Makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Now, here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. Remember, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil contains lanolin. It grooms the hair naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So, if you want your hair to be more attractive than ever before, get the generous new 25-cent size of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's leading hair tonic, on sale at all drug and toilet goods counters. It's also available in larger economy bottles and the handy new tube. Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too. And mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. And now, back to the Dick Foley caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. I found myself mechanically keeping afloat somehow and trying to get out of my coat. I felt heavy and logged as if I'd swallowed gallons of water. The murk hung low and thick. There was nothing else to be seen anywhere. I swallowed what felt like several more gallons before I got rid of the coat. From out of the misty fog blanket, from every direction, in a dozen different keys, from near and far, a foghorn sounded. I stopped swimming and floated on my back, trying to determine my whereabouts. After a while, I picked out the moaning, evenly spaced blasts of the Alcatraz siren. But they came out of the fog without direction. It seemed to beat down on me from straight above. I was somewhere in San Francisco Bay, and that was all I knew... And I suspected the current was sweeping me out toward the Golden Gate. And a light came up ahead of me suddenly. A boat passing a few yards away. I lifted my head and screamed. But the boat siren, crying its warning, drowned out my shouts. It went on past and the fog closed in behind it. Then I heard a new sound. Seagulls. I swam towards it and it seemed to get lighter. Part of it was the dawn light beginning to cut through the fog blanket. But there was also a strange-looking man standing on the water and waving a green lantern back and forth. I yelled at him to wait for me, and a seagull got off his hat and flew away. When I got closer, I saw that it was not a man, but only a buoy, channel type. I used all the strength I had left to drag myself up on the base of it and let it rock me to sleep. Hey, 
Hey. Hey, mate. Oh. Put some more of the brandy into him, Gus. Yeah. Here. Get some of these down. <coughs> Where are we? Hey. It ain't heaven. You can tell that by the smell. Oh, fisherman's wharf. Yeah, take it easy. We got ambulance coming. You going to the hospital. No. No. No, I'll, I'll be okay. Hey, give me a hand. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Hey, you do us a favor, will you? Don't fall down till you get out of sight this time. We're tired of picking you up. I thanked the two kindly old fisher folk for their interest in my welfare, totted up the pier, fell into a taxi, and went home. Well, I soaked out some of my aches and pains and chills. I did some stewing about the caper so far and stewed up enough anger to carry me through to the finish. I checked the Coast Guard for news of Vic Foley. They told me his body hadn't been recovered yet. I got dressed and went over to his office. The cops hadn't been there. I went through the file cabinet. And what I found under Foley Private had me so interested that I didn't hear Maxine come in until she closed the door. What are you looking for? You, baby. I'm for you. Sam. Come here. Oh, Sam. Mm, nice, huh? Uh, oh, you dirty... Now, nah, don't be mad, you... Maxine. A gun makes a woman bulge in the wrong place. It's not my gun. We'll see. Sam, I... Shut up. Now, starting with the rap Spicer went up for, the same pattern. The way you worked this one tells me how you worked it the first time. You, you get something on a private detective. The first time, five years ago, it was Dick's partner, Mickey Linehan. Yeah. I don't know what Spicer had on him, but I do know he forced Dick to knock over Grayson's jewelry store last night. I won't listen to you. Okay, I'll talk to myself. I'm not saying you killed Mickey Linehan, but Dick did frame an alibi for you, didn't he? Didn't he? Oh, you're hurting me. Good. Try spending a night swimming around in circles in the middle of the harbor sometime. See how you like that. All right, it's true. Dick did help me out of that old jam. I'm not ashamed of it. I'm proud our love was that important to him. No, Spicer. That same old double cross. Only this time, I'm standing where Dick did five years ago. Dick was set up as a patsy the same way Mickey Lanahan was, but he got smart and pulled the trigger first. Stop it. Stop it. Where did that hurt? You fool. I loved Dick. Yeah. I loved him. That's something you can't understand. But it happens that way, no matter what people are. You sound as if you really mean that. But you're a little late, aren't you? He's not dead, I'm sure he isn't. If he's not, he's really in trouble. What do you mean by that? I found something here in the files that Dick left, just in case Spicer got to him first. What is it? A confession to Mickey Linehan's murder. That's impossible. Were you there? What are you going to do with it? Turn it over to the police. But if he's still alive... It still counts, unless he shows and revokes it, but I don't think he will. Why? Because I won't back up a self-defense play on the Spicer shooting. But you were Dick's friend. You were his friend. I wouldn't ask him to do it for me. Then what can I do for him? I'll do anything, anything, anything at all. Well, if he stays away, he's as good as dead. If he comes back, you'll get a jury trial. And if there are more men than women in the panel, he'd probably be acquitted on your testimony alone. Do you really think he might have a chance? With a jury, there's always a chance. But where is he? How can I get word to him? Well, if he's not fish food by now, there's one sure way of smoking him up. Something I can do? Nobody else. Oh, please, tell me anything. Sign a confession of your own. Confession? Not Mickey Linehan's murder or anything they might nail you for. Swear that you shot Spicer. What? Well, you can always renege. Make both of you look good, sacrificing for each other. How about it? Uh, all right. Tell me what to write. I did. She signed it. I had Effie dispatch it to all the papers and news services, and then I brought it down to the hall. Naturally, you didn't believe a word of her confession, Dundee, but when I took you aside and explained my stratagem, you endorsed it heartily and had her booked. She pressed my hand and thanked me. The look of resignation on her face was so real, it was hard to believe she was faking. When she turned her back to follow the matron down the corridor, I saw why. On the back of her coat, there was a smear of white paint. I remembered the wet, the wet paint signs on the Oakland ferry boat. Dick Foley gave himself up an hour after her confession hit the street. Screamed and yelled at everybody in homicide, trying to convince them that Maxine was innocent and he should take the full rap. But I'm afraid I cleared that when we confronted him with the autopsy surgeon's report. He tried to bluff even then when he read it. Pellet A ended right side between third and fourth ribs, penetrated left lung. Pellet B, plural membrane, side wound punctured. Well, so what, Sam? All three on the right side, angling up, you see? No! 
I don't know why... You even saw me on that boat. You saw me throw the gun over Oh, and... cut it out, Dick. What I saw was in the dark. But you two men were facing each other directly. If I were going to drop a man fast at close range, face to face like that, I would not put the gun in my left hand, twist it around, straining my wrist in the process, and pull the trigger with my thumb. Unless I were left-handed, double-jointed, and a trickier shot than you are. I'd blast him straight through the middle. All right. All right, yes, it was Maxine. Yeah. Well, that's good. Maybe you can get cured now. Why don't you open up some more? Let me put it down like it was business. All right, sir. Number one. Maxine killed your partner, Mickey Linehan, five years ago. Probable motive to eliminate him and send Spicer up for it. Yeah, yeah, she... She didn't figure on Spicer being smart enough to confess to the robbery and that alibi him for the murder. Two. You perjured yourself to clear Maxine of the murder. Motive? To prevent the truth about your partner from coming out and Maxine was motive enough for anything. Cut it out, will you? Sorry. Three. Spicer forced you to team up with him in the jewelry heist. How? Well, he threatened to make a full confession as accessory to Mickey's killing. I would have put the whole works on Maxine and leave him in the clear. Yeah. Can't be tried twice for the same crime. Four. You decided to rub out Spicer whether you could beat the rap or not and clear the books once and for all. So you pretended to play along with him, told Maxine to do the same, and called me in as umpire. Yeah, yeah, I'm... Sam, I'm sorry, I... Why couldn't you lay off Maxine? Why did you have to... Oh, I thought you were my friend. And that's about it. Period. End of friendship. Oh. You mean the confession that you tricked her into making turned out to... That's it, Effie. Oh. What'll happen to him? Hmm? What about Dick Foley? Dick? Oh, they got him on a number of things, I suppose. May take some time out of him. But I think he'll be an okay guy again. With her out of the way. With her out of the way. Sam. Uh, go and type it up, will you? It's late. I want to get out of here. And now, listen to this. When it comes to hair tonics, the best friend of the family is Wild Root Cream Oil. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms the hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, removes loose dandruff. Now, you can get America's leading hair tonic in the new 25-cent get-acquainted size. Also, ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. Well, here it is, Sam. I know how you must feel, so I won't... What's your hurry? Well, I thought, uh, well, you know how you always feel. Look, sweetheart, Dick Foley was a private dick. So what? You mean you can bring yourself to talk about it? Sure. Go ahead, try me. Well, Sam, it seems terribly complicated. I suppose because Mr. Foley was in the profession and thinks like you do. Up to a point, Effie. What's bothering you? Well, why did he call you in? You, another private detective, and he knew how smart you are and all, and... Yeah. And... I don't know, maybe he thought, well, if I turned up anything, I'd look the other way. Do you think that could ever happen to you, Sam? <laughs> That's a clever phrase you dictated. He called me in as umpire. That's baseball. But if he was so clever, why didn't he win, Sam? His mistake, Effie, was trying a quadruple play, which has never been heard of in the history of baseball or crime. All he wanted was to bat Maxine home safe. But it usually figures when three men are out, the side retires. Oh, well, I don't understand baseball, Sam. Well, that's all right. Football will be here soon anyway. Oh, but I don't... Good night, Levy. Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Lorreen Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd. Musical direction by Lud Gluskin, with score composed by Renee Garrigang. Join us again next Sunday when author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. 
This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's not alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keep it all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get Wild Root right away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Detective Agency. They offered me a cool million and a half, but I couldn't be bought. Oh, Sam, all the time fooling. Straight good, Savvy. Oh, really, Sam? Why didn't you take it? Oh, but you couldn't, of course. That's right, Angel. Taxes. Oh, you mean it would put you in a bracket? Uh, the girl's name, in case you were going to ask, was Sugar Cane. Was she sweet? Oh, Effie, you made a joke. Oh, not much of one, though. That is true. But even though you do seem to be, as you would say, in a jugular vein, I shall be right down, serious and frowning, to dictate a chronicle steeped in the bitter tea of general confusion, brewed in a witch's cauldron of murder, greed, and avarice. That's what gives it that nutty flavor. What, Sam? Silly girl, I refer to the sugar cane caper on which I will forthwith my report be down to dictate on, uh, uh, it... Uh, uh, with, uh, goodbye. Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the Hair. Want to look better on the job? Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Want to look better to that gal of yours? Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic improves your entire appearance by grooming your hair neatly and naturally, relieving dryness, removing loose dandruff. If your family hasn't yet enjoyed the benefits of America's leading hair tonic, here's what to do about it. Ask at your drug or toilet goods counter for the new 25-cent Get Acquainted bottle of Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic. Again and again... The choice of men and women and children, too. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. Hello, Sam. How are you, Sam? Hmm? You were so lugubrious over the phone. Sometimes you're so uh, bucolic, but tonight... What am I? When? Lugubrious tonight. Just, just, just bubbling over. Do you uh, possibly mean I'm being lush with my verbiage? There, you see? Well, that's because I've been at work in the environs of Snob Hill, where they never use one word if 12 will do. <laughs> Are you uh, ready for the, the dictation, I guess it is? I plan to be most amusing tonight. Already I am yet. <laughs> Look, I haven't even started. Oh. Really, I haven't. All right. <laughs> now, pencil. <laughs> Date. <laughs> Alan should have such an audience. Date. October 3rd, 1948, to Clifton Cavanaugh, Esquire. <laughs> Down, Effie. From Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the sugar cane caper. On Thursday last... At 11 a.m., as I waited for the traffic signal so that I might legally cross Powell Street in order to board a cable car, a cat rubbed up against my leg. I leaned over to stroke it and noticed that it had six toes. I wondered if that meant anything. It didn't. Most Knob Hill addresses don't mean much anymore, but yours still does. The house was big, hideous, and reassuring. Oh. Are you from Pepper's No... Uh, no, I'm in business for myself. Mr. Cavanaugh in? No. Oh, well, come on in. I can't understand what happened to that boy from Peppersnell. Oh, uh, 
Pardon me if I seem a little hungover. Gladly, but can you ever forgive yourself? <laughs> I like you. You got a sense of humor. You'll need it. You were uh, trying to tell me you don't approve of Mr. Cavanaugh? That perfume pothead. What did he do to you? He married my mother. Oh. Stepfather? Yeah. I'm Fred Blair. Spade's my name. Where do I find him? Detective? Check. I'll give you a clue. Look behind you. I did. I turned and found myself looking straight into your handsome face. You looked several years younger than your stepson, with regular aquiline features, dark, widely spaced eyes, and blue-black hair. Well, so you're the notorious Sam Spade. Well, I don't want to seem modest. Come into the conservatory. There's just the barest chance that we'll not be overheard. Good. There. Sit down. Uh, what's your problem, Mr. Cavanaugh? Problem indeed. Problems, plural. Starting with that junior grade lush that collared you at the door. He's very fond of you, too. Well, you can't imagine what a trial that boy's been to me. Both the children. For some reason, neither Fred nor his sister Eunice ever quite accepted me as their father. You don't say? I suppose my youth counted against me. I think they misinterpreted my motives. When any man marries a wealthy widow twice his age... Yeah. Yeah, why did you send for me, Mr. Cavanaugh? Well, it all started several months back, before my wife, uh, their mother, uh, 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 where was I? Oh, died. The scandal quite literally killed her. You're sure that's what did the trick? Fred, uh, who, among other talents, was a positive genius for knowing the wrong sort of people, struck up an acquaintance with a hoodlum named Johnny Verona. Nice, clean-cut gangster type, runs a joint on Pacific Street. Precisely. With the positively hysterical name of the Subtropico. Mm-hmm. Well, there was a sordid brawl of some sort. A man shot. Obviously, this Johnny Verona shot him. Fred had to give testimony before the grand jury. It was all we could do to keep it out of the paper. But you did. No. And old Eleanor, my wife, that is, uh, dropped dead when the butler brought in the Chronicle. But the worst was yet to come, Sam. Well, uh, don't keep me hanging, Cliff. Uh... Well, Fred continued to frequent this bistro, this dive of Verona's. I understand. I believe the bait is a toothsome little teaser with the unlikely name of Sugar Cane. She likes Fred. No woman in her right mind would look twice at that idiot, even if he were twice as rich and only half a sodden. That, uh, where was I? Oh, yes, this, this, uh, uh, this Verona person came here several times on the pretext of pouring Fred through the front door and thereby bet, met my, my, my stepdaughter, Eunice. Well, uh, that's a very interesting story, Mr. Cavanaugh. Now, uh, maybe you'll tell me what you want a detective for. Because my stepdaughter has brazenly informed me that she intends to marry this gangster. I want you to help me prevent that marriage. I uh, don't see. Don't see what? I don't see how I can. Well, perhaps I didn't make myself clear. When Verona was arrested for that shooting in his club, Fred didn't tell the grand jury all he knew. Now, if you could prove that Verona is guilty... Then we'd be rid of him for good. Is it Verona you want to get rid of or your stepson? Good Lord, you don't you don't think Fred did it? Do you? Why, no, of course not. Okay, supposing Verona did it, then Fred goes up on a perjury rap, maybe accessory. Oh. Well, I have no overwhelming desire to injure Fred. Uh, look, why don't you tell me what you have an overwhelming desire for? Well, under the terms of her mother's will, Eunice will inherit three million dollars as soon as she marries. When? Uh, when what? When do I meet her? Be serious, man. Now, I will pay Verona $50,000 in cash if he'll stay away from her. Would you take fifty grand as the payoff in a $3 million caper? In this instance, yes. Eunice is not very well. And you may quote me on that. Book, chapter, and verse. To Johnny Verona? Uh, to Johnny Verona. Okay. Water's mighty cold this time of the year at the bottom of the bay, but if you don't care, I don't. Thank you. Let me know how it comes out. Don't give it a second thought. You'll know. Uh, don't get up, Mr. Cavanaugh. I know the way out. Hey, Spade, wait up. Well, you look a little better. Listen, there's something you ought to know. He was my sister's boyfriend before he married my mother. He did it out of revenge because Eunice threw him over. He still wants to marry her. Any particular reason? Oh, my mother put that crazy marriage clause in her will. He's been systematically getting rid of every man who's been interested in her. Bought him off, threatened him off any way he could. Why? He thinks Eunice will eventually marry him to get her inheritance. But she won't. She'll kill him first, and if she doesn't, I'll do it for her. Fred. Huh. Oh, yeah? Fred, what on earth are you saying? Who is this man? Well, he's the detective. Sam Spade. You're Eunice Blair? Yes, I want to talk to you. Fred, go go and... Yeah. 
Uh, see you later, Spade. I know why my stepfather hired you, Mr. Spade. If you need the money, go ahead. But this time it won't work. You look as if you'd like to be a nice girl. How did you happen to settle for a cheap grifter like Johnny Verona? Because we understand each other and he can't be scared off. Any message I can take him from you? Tell Johnny I'll meet him at the usual place. And tell him I still like my coffee black. No sugar. I didn't ask her what kind of sugar she didn't want any of. I thought I knew. The only thing wrong with uh, Sugar Cane's dance was her dancing, but the customers didn't seem to mind, and I didn't either. It was a pleasure to size her up carefully, as I would have felt obliged to do anyway in my professional capacity. She was a black-haired number with aquiline features and widely spaced dark eyes. It was a beautiful combination, and I wondered where I'd seen it before quite recently. I decided to find out. What's the idea of barging in here after me? Can't you see the sign on the door? No customers in the dressing room. Then let's go someplace else. I want to talk to you. Beat it. Take it easy. This is on business. Oh, good. I'll fix it up with the boss. Johnny! Yeah, sugar? Uh, what's the matter? Is Joe giving you trouble? You trailed in here after me to cheat, Masher. On the pretext of discussing business affairs. Okay, out you go. Now, wait a minute. Come on, move. And don't uh, come back. Well? Uh, sorry, I had to give that bum's rush routine. I don't want to get her excited. She's a nice kid, and she doesn't know why you're here. I take it you do. Yeah. Eunice called me and told me you'd be down. Okay, Johnny, I'll give it to you fast and get out. Clifton Cavanaugh will pay you 50 grand to leave Eunice alone. He also made a few idle or not-so-idle threats about what might happen to her if you don't take his money. Uh, for example? He said she hasn't been feeling well, might not live long enough to get married. I don't have to tell you what I think about that kind of talk, and I wouldn't be peddling it if my office rent wasn't due. That's why when you started giving me that bums rush, I made only, shall we say, a token resistance. Yeah. Now, about me, Mary, and Eunice, you can tell Clifton to stop worrying. Hmm? Yeah, Eunice and I got married three weeks ago. You what? Married. Now, you want to see the papers? Why the secrecy? I don't want her to get hurt. You're scared of Clifton? Nah, sugar. She's got a very low boiling point. She's a... Oh, uh, pardon me. Yeah. Yeah, Nick. What is? Go ahead. Yeah, I heard you. No, no, don't touch anything. Don't let anybody in. I'll be right over. Bad news? Yeah, Eunice. She's dead. How? Uh, one of my boys found her in my apartment. She was supposed to wait for me there. How did it happen? He's not sure. He thinks she took poison. I had to give Johnny Verona one thing. He didn't make any pretense about being grief-stricken. But after all, he just inherited three million bucks. Sugar Cane took it standing up, too, but she just lost a rival and got her man back three million bucks richer. I wasn't with you when you got the news, Mr. Cavanaugh. But the one I really wondered about was Eunice's brother, Fred. What brought that on was something I picked up in Johnny Verona's apartment where we found Eunice's body sprawled out over a tray of coffee things. It was a medicine bottle with a doctor's prescription number on the label. The name of the druggist that had put it up was Pfefferschnau. I remembered what Fred had said to me when he admitted me to your house that afternoon. Quote, are you the man from Pfefferschnau's? I wondered if I'd answered yes, would Eunice still be alive? The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective... Sam Spade. Now, here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked... How does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. 
Remember, non-alcoholic wild root cream oil contains lanolin. It grooms the hair naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So, if you want your hair to be more attractive than ever before, get the generous new 25-cent size of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's leading hair tonic, on sale at all drug and toilet goods counters. It's also available in larger economy bottles and the handy new tube. Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too, and mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. And now, back to the Sugar Cane Caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. The morning papers didn't carry anything new on Eunice's death. The cause was put down to an overdose of a toxic drug... The doctor who prescribed it said she'd requested it for migraine headaches, which he suggested might have driven her to suicide. He did not explain why she had taken four doses in capsule form and dissolved the rest of it in a decanter of coffee. I thought somebody else had dosed the coffee, and so did you, Mr. Cavanaugh. Verona did it, of course. He knew she was taking those pills and dosed the coffee just enough to be fatal when added to what she took voluntarily. You knew all that, too. Well, so did Fred. But you had more reasons, three million more. But they were already married. You know that when you hired me? Yes. Then how come? I knew she was planning to do away with herself. I thought if we could pin it on Verona, after all he's guilty of that old murder, Fred's a witness to that. Well, if he were convicted, the money would revert to me. Nuts. You don't believe me? She wasn't planning suicide, and you know it. Well, then... I don't care who takes the fall, but I got less on Verona than I got on you. Then I'll give you something. Here. Take a look. Verona's lawyer sent this around before her body was cold. A claim for three million dollars notarized yesterday while Eunice was still alive. Well, Mr. Spade. <sighs> Pardon me when I drop dead. You did and waited hopefully, but I managed to stay on my feet. I even managed to make it down the hall to the bar where I found your stepson ambushed behind a row of empty bottles. Fine detective you turn out to be. I warned you. Stand up like a man. That's all right. I'll take on both of you. Come on, sober up. Makes sense. Where's my drink? Who took my glass? Here it is. Give me a Sure. You spill it. Ice on my shirt. Listen to me. This is very important. Important? You were expecting a delivery from a drugstore when I arrived there yesterday morning. Who ordered it? She did. Eunice, she told me to watch for it and bring it to her. Did you do that? No. No, she wasn't here. What did you do with that bottle of medicine? I'm sleepy. I gotta get some rest. Wake up! I said, wake up! Leave me alone! Now, now, listen. You took that bottle with you when you went out. Where did you take it? I tell you, will you let me go to sleep? You took that bottle with you, didn't you? You're guessing. I know you're third degree. You went to Verona's apartment, didn't you? Two gentlemen of Verona. Willie Shakespeare. You doped that coffee, didn't you, with the poison that killed your sister? I didn't mean it for her. I didn't know she was going there. Go on talking. I want a lawyer. I, I know my rights. Listen, I'm not a cop. I'm not taking a statement. You're too drunk for it to hold anyway, so you can tell me. Okay. Here's how it happened. She, she took four pills and went to bed. Yeah? I, I, I sneaked a bottle out of the medicine chest and I went over to his place. His boy Nick was there making coffee for the boss, he said, when he got home. I hung around talking for a while and I, I, I stripped some of the stuff in the percolator while he was getting out the cups. And, and that's all. Why did you want to kill Johnny Verona? So Eunice wouldn't have to marry him. What do you mean, have to? <laughs> She was doing it for me, so he'd keep quiet. About that brawl in the club, that old killing they tried to nail Johnny for? Yeah, yeah, that's it. That, uh, the gun that did it. He, he got rid of it before the cops arrived. That was my gun. Fred, straighten up. Look. Yeah. Johnny dictated the story you told the grand jury. How do I know he didn't dictate the one you're telling me now? Who are you covering for? I, I didn't say anything. I didn't tell you anything. Get out of here! What's the matter with you? I get down the window! <laughs> Revolver barrel that crashed through the darkened window pane behind the bar spoke twice. I answered it. I looked out into the darkness, making myself a good enough target to draw some fire. I fired back at the flashes. 
I was depending more on luck than aim, and luck was what I wasn't having much of. I went back to the place where Fred had fallen. The shots that had dropped him were luckier. He'd been dead before he hit the floor. What is it? What's happened here? See for yourself. Who? Shot through the window. Couldn't see anything but the gun muzzle. Looked like a forty-five. Johnny Verona, he packs a forty-five. Who told you that? It came out of that investigation. One of the reasons they couldn't indict for that old shooting. There were a lot of reasons they couldn't get that indictment. What are you driving at? Neither one of the leading suspects was guilty. I don't follow you. Sugar Kane did that job. Well, that's wild. What if I told you Fred made a statement of that effect before he was shot? You're lying. He confessed. Did I tell you that? Well, he must have. He, he always talked about it when he was drunk. All right. All right. I was bluffing. Why? Just a crazy hunch. I thought there might be something between you and Sugar. Now I'm sure there isn't. Of course not. Should have spotted it before. You're too much the same type. Even look alike. I can't make you out. Well, don't try. It's not worth it. Uh, you better call homicide about Fred here. Tell Lieutenant Dundee if he wants my statement, I'll be at my apartment. After I pretended to leave, I came back and did a little eavesdropping of my own. You didn't phone homicide, but you did spend an hour filing out the barrel of a forty-five automatic. Then you went out. I tailed you to an address on Sloat Boulevard. A short time after you went in, Sugar Kane came out alone. I followed her to, you know the answer, my apartment. I went in the back way via the fire escape and arrived in time to answer her buzz. Oh, Mr. Spade, thank heaven I found you at home. So am I. Come in. I know it's terribly late. Forget it. Won't you take off your uh, coat or something? Can't stay very long. It's not safe. I may have been followed here. Oh, surely not. Sam, you don't mind if I call you Sam? No. I'm so frightened. It's about Johnny Verona. I don't know what he may do. He's convinced that Fred killed Eunice and he's out gunning for him right now. We've got to stop him before he does anything rash. You come to the wrong party, sugar. I'm working for the enemy. Enemy? Kavanaugh. Oh. It's no skin off his nose if Johnny Verona drops Fred Blair or if you all drop. All he does is sit back and collect. Oh, he can't be as cynical as that. You ought to know. Has he told you anything about me? I'd rather hear it from you. May we sit down? Well, there's not much to tell. I played along with Johnny for one reason and one reason alone. To save Fred from that old murder rap. Were you uh, figuring on marrying into that family, too? Oh, sir. A regular pincers movement, wasn't it? Johnny and Eunice, you and Fred. All right. It's true I wasn't in love with Fred, but it wasn't all the money. I was sorry for him. Money's not what I really want. I know that now. What do you want? Someone. Someone I can trust. Me too, sugar. Oh, Sam, you're what I want. Say you want me to. Please say it. Don't answer it, Sam. Why not? Johnny may have followed me here. He's insanely jealous. Well, I gotta face it out with him sooner or later. Might as well be now. Sam, be careful. Stand out of the way, sugar. No, Sam. No, no, please. Don't reach, Johnny. I'm not gunning for you, Spade. In that case, come on in. Well, sugar... I didn't believe him that you were coming here. I had to, Johnny. He got some crazy confession out of Fred while he was drunk. I had to stall him until you and Cliff could talk to him. To save Fred, I mean. Oh, stop horsing around. We all know that we all know Fred is dead, and we all know that we all know who killed him. Oh, uh, then Cliff was leveling. You are trying to pin that on me. I don't need it, but if you want it, you can have it. There's three million bucks in my part of it. I'll split down with the middle with you. If you throw in with them, it's a three-way split. There's no split at all if you take the rap for Eunice's killing. And you will if you throw in with me. It's their word against mine. Two witnesses against one. And all I've got is a confession by a drunk who is now dead. Sam. Oh, Sam, I was sure for a moment you... Get away from me. Sam, <laughs> Go on. Go to work on him. I should have given you a little more time. That wasn't fair, was it, Sugar? I hate you. I hate you both. I never want to see you again. Get back in that room, Sugar. Cliff. What happened, Sugar? Why were you running away? Johnny double-crossed us. Now Sam knows everything. What does he know? The whole caper. Part of it I wasn't quite sure of until I saw you and Sugar standing side by side. That blue-black hair, the same eyes, plus the fact that the bell on Sugar's apartment on Sloat Boulevard reads Kane, parenthesis, Kavanaugh. You took a crazy chance when you knocked off Fred with me right there in the room. The kind of a crazy chance a brother would take to keep his sister clear. I could have told you that. It would have helped a lot, Johnny, but you didn't. 
When a man lets his sister go on dancing in a joint like yours after he's in the chips and she goes on liking it, you can be sure they're both playing for big stakes and for nobody but themselves. Where do you think you were supposed to wind up, Johnny? I'll tell you. Drinking that poison coffee that Eunice got hold of by mistake. That isn't true, Johnny. I never told Fred a thing. He thought you really loved Eunice. I don't know how he found out you were forcing her into that marriage. Uh, did you also neglect to tell him that he was innocent? That you pulled a trigger in that old killing and, and shoved a gun into his hand when he was too drunk to know what he was doing? I've heard enough. Watch it, Johnny. No! Ow! I winged you a split second before you fired. Your aim went wild. All I saw at first was that it missed Johnny. Then I saw him move forward in her direction. She was leaning against the wall, a puzzled expression on her face. Her hand plucking nervously at a spot of red that was spreading against the white of her dress. He caught her as she pitched forward and carried her over to a couch. She didn't speak again. You and Johnny knelt beside her until the cops arrived. If you were aware of each other's presence, neither of you showed it. Period. And a report. That was a sad ending, Sam. Yes, it is. I'm sorry it ended so sadly. Well, it was bound to one way or the other. There wasn't anybody in the whole gallery that thought about anybody but himself. Except poor Fred, I guess, and his his only friends arrived in bottles and left in the ash can. All those millions and millions. Oh, get the money now, Sam. I'm glad you asked that. It leaves me cold. Go type that up while I knit myself a sweater. And now, listen to this. It's the smart mother who sees to it that Wild Root Cream Oil is always kept handy around the house. For she knows that Wild Root Cream Oil grooms her family's hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, removes loose dandruff, Get acquainted by asking for the new 25-cent bottle. Also, ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. Well, here it is, Sam. Goodness, what a terrible group of unfortunates. Hmm? As you say, it just had to end badly. If you hope to get back in my good graces by quoting me, to trick me into agreeing with you, you have succeeded. There you go, Sam. So lugubrious. Effie, what is this? What means lugubrious? Oh, Sam, it's wonderful. It's my new habit. Oh? Every time I read a book now. Mm -hmm. And you know, like you read a book and there's a word you don't know what it means or you're not sure. Yeah. Well, I make it a practice now to write down and learn three new words per day. And learn the definitions to use them in conversation. You know, like, uh, desultory. And lugubrious. Yes, that's one of my three for today. Mm. You see? Lugubrious. Right here it is. Mm -hmm. To talk a great deal. Um, bucolic, state of being sorrowful. And verbose, to be out in the country. I see, I see. Very praiseworthy. <laughs> Enlarging your vocabulary. Yes, love it, I love am. it. But I don't expect to be really lugubrious for, oh, for the nonce. Uh, look, Effie, why don't you go verbose for the weekend? It's the best cure for the bucolic. Oh, Sam, look what I've done. What have you done? I've clipped the wrong definitions to the right words. Well. For instance, lugubrious, well, it isn't that at all. Mm -hmm. And bucolic, oh, let see. Oh, Sam, I've learned them wrong. I wasn't going to tell you, Effie. It's better to find out for yourself. It's more, uh, Effie cases. My new habit. Oh. Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Dove. Lorreen Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd. Musical direction by Lud Gluskin with score composed by Renee Garrigan. Join us again next Sunday when author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with Susan Lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keeping all the gals away. Are you baldy? Get Wild Root right away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Very funny. Certainly took you long enough. Oh, thank you, Sam. Well, do you like them? My oh. curls? Yeah, I guess so. It's your own hair, I trust. Oh, yes, Sam. When it's brushed out, you'll never know anything happens. Whenever you're ready, uh, curly. Oh, gee, you like it that well? Yeah, very cute. Well! Huh. It's a business. Yeah. To uh, Detective Lieutenant Dundee, homicide detail, San Francisco Police from Samuel Spade, license number 137596, subject, the bouncing Betty Caper. Uh-huh. Dear Dundee, it all began on a Wednesday. My uh, secretary, Miss Effie Perrine, tiptoed into my office and laid an engraved calling card on the desk in front of me. The name on it was Randall Carruthers. She said he looked like money, so I said show her in, or him in. She did. Good morning, sir. Do you wish the morning paper? Uh, thanks. I've read it. Dear me. What's the matter? Well, this ashtray, sir. Um, have you a silent butler? I don't even have a noisy one. Oh. In all my years of service, it has been my constant endeavor to keep things neat and tidy, down to the smallest detail. I see. Well, if it bothers you, just dump those butts into the wastebasket. Very well, sir. Uh, <laughs> If you will pardon the presumption, sir, you could use a well-trained servant in this establishment. <laughs> Waste paper baskets clean and empty at all times. Never allow refuse to accumulate. That's not refuse. That's this month's bills. So I noticed, sir. I also noticed that you have not opened them. From this, I conclude that your services are immediately available. Yeah, and I conclude that in spite of your glad rags and fancy handle, you are somebody's butler. Oh, that is correct, sir. I am first butler in the household of Dr. Mark McGraw. First? Yes. Bleakcliff is the name of the estate. It's near the village of Squid Beach, some 50 miles in a southerly direction on the Pacific coast. You know, I think I'm going to like you as a client, Mr. Carruthers. I mean, it's uh, refreshing to get a few accurate facts without, shall we say, uh, priming the pun. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank You're welcome. You. To continue, not counting the staff, there reside at Bleakcliff three persons. Mm. Dr. McGraw, master of the house since the death of his wife, his stepson, Mr. Anthony McGraw, of whom more later, and Mr. Anthony's sister, Miss Carthy. It is on her behalf that I've come to you, sir. Uh, what is her problem, uh, Mr. Carruthers? Uh, the correct form of address is Carruthers, uh, not Mr. Carruthers. Check. <laughs> yes, thank you, sir. Now, as to Miss Carthy's problem, sir, uh, someone is attempting to murder her. Specifically, she has, upon several occasions, been shot at from ambush. Twice she has awakened in the night to feel the hands of an assailant closing about her throat. And only yesterday, she narrowly escaped death when her motor car went out of control owing to some blackguard tampering with the steering mechanism. And upon numerous other occasions... That's enough. You have convinced me that she indeed has a problem. Uh, What do the local police think? No one has been to the police, sir. Why not? It's a delicate situation, sir. Uh, Miss Carthy's brother, Mr. Tony, is undergoing treatment for um, uh, nervous disorders. Mm -hmm. The family did not wish to place him in an institution, and since Dr. McGraw, his stepfather, is a psychiatrist, he is allowed to remain at home. I see. He's flipped. Uh, Where do I uh, fit in, Carruthers? Uh, Well, sir, if a reputable gentleman such as yourself were to come to Bleakcliff and witness these persistent attempts upon that girl's life, uh, perhaps they could be forced to put the boy away where he belongs. It's possible. I'm willing to try, for money. Oh, splendid, sir, splendid. I I took the liberty of drawing, in your favor, a draft upon the First National Bank of Squid Bay, one week's remuneration in advance of your services to the Bleakliff Estate in the capacity of chauffeur. uh, Uh, Chauffeur? uh, Yes, sir, I thought that might be a capital disguise. Um, Have you a better suggestion, sir? Well, uh... No, no, that's okay. Uh, This check. Yes, sir. Uh, Two hundred bucks. It's a pretty big weekly salary for a chauffeur, isn't it? Well, you will be allowed to shop for the vegetables, sir. Your cut has been added in. I told him I didn't know one vegetable from another, that I was a lousy driver, and in more time than it takes to tell, I was installed at Bleak Cliff, in a room above the garage, and told to wait there until summoned. I put on my pearl gray uniform with the brass buttons and leather puttees, looked in the mirror, and decided I had missed my calling. But not by much. Nothing happened for nearly an hour, and then I got my first buzz. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, garage. Phillips, the car, quickly! The main entrance! Keep your motor running! I have it locked in the living room, but it's breaking off! Okay, okay, uh, yes, ma'am. Oh. Uh, I'm sorry, miss. Well, uh, get going, please, please. Uh, darn it, miss. Uh, uh, where's the spark on oh, this? what's the uh, matter with it? Well, it, it's it's uh, flooded. The housing, you know. Uh, uh, oh, he's got the meat flavor again. Come on, get this door. Well, I'm well, trying. trying. Get out, I tell you. Get out. Stop it. Stop it. You're hurting him. No. Come on. Come on. Take it. All right. Put it down, kid. Put it down. Come on. Give it to me. No. What's going on? I say, who are you? <laughs> Haven't you been instructed not to disturb my patient? I'm sorry, I'm new here. When I saw him coming at Miss McGraw with that meat cleaver, I naturally thought... Oh, well, I... no harm done. Come along, Tony. Huh? Come along now. Come huh? along, boy. We'll have a nice long talk. Uh, what shall I do with this now? Oh, we'll put it back. Oh. You all right? Oh. Oh. oh, sure. I should be used to it by now. By the way, you're new here, aren't you? What's your name? Sam. Sam? That's nice. Uh, turn to the left outside the gate, Sam, and drive straight out to the shore road. Well, if I can just... Uh... Hey, I just turned that little key. Look, Ma, I'm driving. I adjusted the rear view mirror so that it showed more of her and less of the rear view. A mile from the house, she ordered me to stop, moved up to the front seat with me, and asked me to drive on. By the time we got to the shore road, she was driving, and I was resting my head on her shoulder. Where are we going? I've got a little hideaway down the coast. It's right on the beach, the foot of a tall cliff. Hmm. There's a fireplace, a little bar, some records. Got some bot? It's a wonderful there with the surf pounding outside, hidden away from the world. You feel so safe. Mm-hmm. Uh, don't stop. Oh, you like it there. You feel as if there's no one else on earth. Time standing still. Oh, if I could just be sure that Mother wouldn't worry about me. <laughs> You're impossible. Okay, Kathy, I'll be serious. Uh, what's with that brother of yours? Tony? I'd rather not talk about that if you don't mind. Well, uh, maybe I can talk about your stepfather. I really should know what kind of a man my boss is. I go for these drives to forget all that. Please don't spoil it for me. Okay, Kathy, okay. Please. The sharp turn into this driveway. Oh. Now we get out here. Yes, ma'am. Down this path. Uh-oh. What's the matter? Are you afraid of high places? Yeah, you just pushed me off of one. Oh, Sam, don't be like that. You're pouting like a little boy. Come on, I want to show you my little house. What's so special about your little house? Oh, Sam, if you only knew what my life is like. You only knew what mine is like. I need someone so much to talk to, Sam. As long as you can steer the conversation, you mean. Come on, Sam, I'll show you the house. The path led to a flight of wooden steps that clung to the face of a sheer cliff. There was something like the stairs you find yourself falling down in nightmares. They dropped maybe 200 feet to a crescent of white sand. Watch out for that one step. It's broken. Yeah. You have to make your dream house this hard to get to? Because of Tony. He has vertigo. What? When we were kids, he used to chase me, and I'd run down here, and he was scared to follow me. Afraid of heights. He still is. Oh. Well, you light us a fire, Sam. The wood's there in the box. I'll go make us a drink. Fire? Who needs a fire? I'm hot. What'd you do before you took up driving? Oh, I, I was a private eye for a while. Oh, how exciting. Nah, it's a sour racket. Tell me about it. Nah. Nah, let's talk about you. Here's your drink. Thanks. Well, what do you want to know about me? Uh, know me? Come here. The scent she was wearing was 20 carat. The story of her life was heavy melodrama. It seemed that Dr. McGraw, a handsome fortune hunter, was a folly of her mother's middle years. But she had come to her senses shortly before she died and cut him out of her will. But that was not the end of it. 
When Kathy's brother had been faced with the alternative of entering an institution or remaining at home under his stepfather's care, she had begged the doctor to remain in spite of his warnings that her brother might take a notion to kill her. But uh, get this, Dundee, it's real deep. In spite of visible evidence to the contrary, she was convinced that her brother was not out to kill her, but that the doctor was. I couldn't sell myself on that part of the yarn, but she looked so awfully pretty while she was telling it. And suddenly she didn't look so pretty. An expression of terror was on her face. No! 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 Get down! I rolled around to the floor and kicked the lamp out. By the glow of the embers in the fireplace, I could still see the gleam of the gun barrel shoved in through the broken window. I hoped he couldn't see so much. I knocked over a chair to give him something to shoot at. He was already halfway up the face of the cliff on those rickety wooden stairs. At the top, he turned and looked back. Who was it? It was Mark, wasn't it? The doctor? You know better than that. It was Tony. I thought you told me he was afraid of heights. Couldn't come down those stairs. He never did before. Don't you believe it? Yeah. Yeah, Kathy. I may wind up believing the rest of your story. I took Kathy back to Bleak Cliff and stashed her in my quarters over the garage. Then I went into the main house via the back stairs, found her room, and shook it down. In a cabinet, a bunch of war souvenirs. German helmets, grenades, rifles, and other lethal gadgets. In a desk drawer, I found a letter headed U.S. Army, Office of the Surgeon General. It certified that one Anthony McGraw was unfit for military service. Vertigo. Origin, childhood injury to middle ear. Downstairs in the library, I found a shelf of medical books. Vertigo. Vertigo was almost incurable, and there was certainly no quick cure. But some patients had lost their symptoms temporarily under hypnotism. Then it said, see narcosynthesis. I did. Speed, uh... I beg pardon, sir. Uh, Mr. Spade. Yeah, whatever are you doing in the butler's pantry, sir? Looking for a butler. Namely you, Carruthers. Oh, may I serve you, sir? Yeah. How do I get an interview with Dr. McGraw? Well, sir, I should... Oh. <laughs> Strange. After all my years of service, I I still start as a master summons. Hey. You did it again. Eh, well, I'm sorry, sir. I'd better see what Dr. McGraw wants. Forget it. I'm answering this one. You're not going to drop your disguise, sir. Why not? Who am I kidding, anyway? You rang, Dr. McGraw? Huh? Oh, I didn't ring for you. I rang for Carruthers. I ordered him to tidy up my office while I was at dinner. And look at it. Looks neat as a pen to me, Doctor. Oh, yes, you're new here. Chauffeur, huh? I'm only wearing his uniform. Here's my card. Oh, ho! Detective, eh? That's right, Doctor. And this one's just about ready to wrap up. Well, you interest me. Uh, go on. I will. I think you've been trying to use that boy as a murder weapon against his sister. Oh, and you call yourself a detective? If you can call yourself a doctor, I guess I can. You've been treating him with narcosynthesis, haven't you? Yes, that's right. Hypnotic drug. While he's under it, you brief him on his activities for the day, and he follows through, including assaults with deadly weapons. That would be possible with certain very suggestible patients. But I'm afraid impossible to prove. I think I can prove it, Doctor. You shouldn't leave your textbooks lying around loose. I found out the only way Tony could have walked down that stairway to Kathy's beach house without falling would be temporary relief of his symptoms due to hypnotic suggestion, unquote. I see. What do you intend to do about this theory of yours? What do you suggest? You see this row of buzzers here on my desk? Mm -hmm. This one is for my secretary. This is to summon Carruthers, and when I press this buzzer... Two of the most hideous plug uglies you've ever seen will rush into this office, beat you to a pulp, and dump you outside the front gate. That's what I think of your theory. Buzz away, Doctor. I think I like them better than I do you. <laughs> As you wish. From where I was on the other side of the room, I didn't know what had happened at first. All I saw was a lot of paper gushing out of the wastebasket. The Doctor sure was dead. His midsection was perforated like a shower drain. And in the walls, fanning out around the end of the room, about a yard up from the baseboard, there was a straight line of holes. I dug into one. What I took out wasn't a bullet. It was a perfectly round steel ball. Then I remembered the wastebasket, the paper flying out of it just before the explosion. In the bottom of it, I found the answer. The base of a steel mechanism with German lettering on it. It was a wartime anti-personnel mine that the G.I.s called the Bouncing Betty. 
United States Armed Forces Radio Service is presenting the weekly adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. I didn't wait for the Squid Beach Law to arrive. Who could? I went straight back to San Francisco. You, Lieutenant Dundee, were waiting at my office. Uh, morning, Sam. Hello, Dundee. Uh, about that McGraw killing, Sam. Mm-hmm. The chief down at Skid Beach has asked us to cooperate with the department down there at Skid Beach. Squid Beach, Dundee. Squid, that's right. They say you caught a bus at Skid Beach. Squid, at a, Squid. That's right. At a quarter of two in the company of a young woman answering the description of the McGraw girl. Uh-huh. They say that, do they? And they say they got a statement from that butler, Ruther... Uh, well, Ruthers. Yeah, well, it's open and shut anyway. The butler hired you, the girl is wanted, and you're hiding her out. Why? Why not? Well, it's established that the girl hated the deceased and bickered with him constantly. The doctor and the boy were pals. That girl's guilty, is You've been able to place her in the murder room? Well, no, but here's an item. She worked with an army ordinance uh, during the war mm-hmm. in research. Subject? I made a note of that. Uh, enemy landmines, anti-personnel. One of the reports she helped put out was on the bouncing Betty. Yeah? Definitely. It... Hey, where are you going, Sam? <laughs> It's been so lonesome cooped up here all day. Why didn't you tell me you were with Army Ordnance during the war? I don't know. I suppose it thought it was unfeminine or something. Try again. All right, I'll tell you the truth. I had a copy of that report with instructions for the operation of the bouncing Betty in the desk in my room. What the devil are you doing with a thing like that? I don't know. I was proud of it. It was the only report I worked on with the general. Should have got rid of it. I did. I burned it in the fireplace as soon as I learned what had killed him. You didn't burn it good enough. Sam, they found it. Yeah. Have they arrested Tony? Not yet, but he's definitely sane. He'll have to take the rap for anything he's done. I see. Well, I guess there's no other way. Tony didn't do it, Sam. I did. I want to make a confession. Not to me, please. Not to me. After what happened down at the beach when I knew I was no longer safe anywhere, I realized I had to do it. For Tony's sake as well as mine. When we arrived back at the house... I looked into the dining room and I saw Dr. McGraw eating dinner. I knew it was my chance to get into his office. Yeah? Then what? Well, the bouncing Betty was in my room. There was some wire in the tool chest, and I knew that Carruthers always went to tidy up while the doctor was at dinner. So I waited until I saw him come out, and then I went in. And I looked around for a place to plant it. Out of sight. Then I saw the wastebasket full of paper. It was the perfect hiding place. The whole thing didn't take more than five minutes. Well, say something. Go on, say you hate me. Say it. I don't. I wish I did. Oh, Sam. Help me. Help me. I'm sorry, baby. I am sorry. I don't know how long we sat there. I held her in my arms until she cried herself out. Then we just looked at each other. I knew if I put it off another minute, I wouldn't call you at all, Dundee. So, with my arms still around her, I reached for the phone. Homicide. Uh, Lieutenant Dundee, this is Sam Spade. Lieutenant Dundee. Uh, hello. Hello. Give me that. Lieutenant, this is Catherine McGraw. I wish to make a full confession in the murder of my stepmother. I walked out while she was still talking to you, Dundee. I knew she'd wait for you, and I didn't want to be there when you took her away. As I walked over to my office, everything she'd said kept coming back to me. I could see her sneaking into her brother's room and getting that contraption out of the cabinet. I could see her hiding behind the door until Carruthers came out after tidying up McGraw's office, dumping ashtrays, emptying waste baskets. And that's as far as I got. I went back to my office to wait. And sure enough, 20 minutes after the papers hit the streets with Kathy's confession, the door opened and he came in. Well, sir, I believe it's turning a bit raw out of doors. Gardner was saying only this morning that we should order out some shrouds for the Sepi Glows to see you after. Uh, am I discommoding you, sir? No, Carruthers, I've been waiting for you. Uh, uh, with your permission, sir, the ashtray. Just dump it in the wastebasket. Uh. Well, uh, 
I am gratified to note that your secretary has been looking after things and has emptied your waste paper basket as is right and proper. Quite, quite. Uh, yes, sir. And uh, speaking of waste paper basket... Now allow me, Carruthers. You have come to apprise me of your part in the death of the late Dr. McGraw. Am I in error? Uh, you've already divined my purpose, sir. Yes, it was I who placed that infernal machine. In the wastebasket, Carruthers, yes, I know. It struck me as a bit of poetic justice that the buzzer, which that dreadful man used as a symbol of his despotism, should be the instrument of his own destruction. I'm sorry, Carruthers. I'll do all I can. No need, sir. No need. I'm aware that there is no final justification for taking the law into one's own hands. Every man is entitled to trial by jury of his peers. But where, Mr. Spade, where could be found 12 good men and true who would allow themselves to be called the peer of that monster, Dr. McGraw? Period, and of report. Sam! There must be some mistake. Mistake, Effie? Mistake? Mis- well, well the, the butler can't be guilty. That's... That's old-fashioned. He was an old-fashioned butler, sweetheart. Where today can you get help like that? Somebody who empties the ashtrays, keeps the waste paper baskets clean, tidies up around the place. Well, I'd be only too happy to do the same for you, Sam. Well, I know you would, Doc. Considering what happened to Mr. Carruthers' employer, I... Effie, you mustn't allow your mind to dwell on such matters. It's wicked. Sam! Hmm. Who emptied an ashtray in that waste basket that I just finished cleaning out? Pay it no heed, sweetheart. I'll buy you a silent butler. I'll go tight that up. made any mistakes. I'm in such a hurry. Whatever did you do to your hair? Well, I brushed it out, Sam. What happened to the pen curls? I told you, Sam, when it was brushed out, it wouldn't be noticeable. Hours of torture sitting under a hot dryer for something nobody will notice. But, Sam, it, it puts bounce in your whole makeup. I get it. The bouncing Effie caper. Oh. Hmm, eyeshadow, new shade of lipstick. You look real gone. Oh, no. Whom is it tonight? Well, it, it's this friend of Maud, Sam. Of course, she's not really serious about him, so it's all right. You're conscious about him? Oh, no, Sam, no. He, and he's, um, he's definitely not serious about her. I mean, he... Well, uh, have fun, sweetheart, while Maud Byrne. Oh, well, she, she, she won't. And um, I suppose you'll be seeing that girl at, uh, what's her name? Oh, yes, Kathy. Well, at least, uh, F, I'm not playing in someone else's garden. No. Well, have fun anyway. Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Dove. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Private Detective, is a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education.
Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Then to uh, Detective Lieutenant Dundee, homicide detail, San Francisco Police from Samuel Spade, license number 17596. Uh, subject, the betrayal in Bumpus Hell. Fred Gillis was a raw-boned poke from the border country. He was a stranger to Bumpus Hell, but he was no stranger to trouble. He jogged his pinto down the narrow main street, not liking what he saw, and reined up in front of the sheriff's office. He dismounted and slapped the trail dust off his Levi's. Then he hitched up his gun belt and ambled inside. He looked at the heavy-shouldered, uh, blue-jowled man behind the desk, and he didn't like what he saw. Neither did the sheriff, Rance Blaggett. State your business. Ah, I can do it better than that. State your business and get out, he snarled. Red smiled thinly and drawled, uh, I'm looking for my brother. And uh, what be your name outside of Red? Here, I can do that better than that. And what be your name outside of Red? Red Gillis's hand slid toward one of his six-shooters as silently as the sun coming up over the butte. Gillis, he sneered. Red Gillis from the Tonto Rim. That's pretty good. The sheriff's muscles tightened like steel springs and pulled him erect. Ain't no Tonto Rimmer welcome hereabouts in Bumpus Hell, he cursed. That was real good. And then the slap of four hands on leather was followed by the simultaneous roar of four six guns. Hey, wait a minute. The sheriff. I know her in there. Well, who is it? The sheriff is just. Mrs. Mrs. Spade! Miss Kelsey, next door! Right in the most exciting part. Mr. Spade, now see here, I won't take no for an answer. It wouldn't be neighborly. What is it, Mrs. Kelsey? Never you mind, come along. What are you up to here, anyway? Who, me? Oh, nothing. I'm just relaxing with an apple and a good book, I that's all. I don't see no apple, and the only reading matter I see is some western trash. Trash? Now, come on, there's trouble on the third floor. Well, there's trouble in bump as hell. Don't you swear at me. I'm not... I know my duty, and I know your duty. Now, come on! Oh, Ouch! Okay, let go my ear. And that dandy, so help me, is how it started. Effie had just read a book called How to Relax, and it said there that Western stories were relaxing, and that's how I happened to be at home at 10 p.m., riding herd on a copy of Sheriff and Outlaw, rip-roaring adventures of the Old West. But bump as hell hath no fury like my neighbor, Mrs. Kelsey. I left Red Gillis and the sheriff face to face and vice versa, eyes flashing and guns ablaze, and followed her meekly up to the third floor. Room, you speak to them? Get out! Speak to them! You see this lot? No, here, under my transformation. Oh, well, why didn't you call a cop? Well, I wouldn't be neighborly. Hit me, the did. You see this lump? Yeah, yeah, you showed it to me. Put your wig back on. I'll see what I can do. And tell them about my lump. It's evident. Yeah, yeah, put it back. Hey, open up. I would not go back with you if you were the last man on the oh, ship. Hey, 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 open up. Have it your own way. Who you if I can't do without you, swear again, I'll tell you. Hurry up. Oh, you've had your boy, you're running up cheap grip for you. Well, you slam out of here before I'm forced to seek the assistance of a couple of flashy jokes. Do not try anything fancy behind my back, you big slob. From now on, you and me is strictly on the cool beady. Well, get on principle. Hey, let go of me. I'll hand me your... Hey, wait a minute. Hey, wait a minute. Don't I remember you from someplace? No, I'm only being neighborly. Why did you beat up on kind, nice Mrs. Kelsey? That is a gross falsehood. I did not lay a hand on the old wag. It was that odious stinker, Joe Donegan, who was just left. And you can tell him, as from me, that I'm extremely unimpressed with his cheap threats to rub me out. And that I intend to continue on seeing Mr. Hobson or any other Johns which I care to. That's a pretty good scene. Oh. Well, uh, you better tell him that yourself. I don't imagine I'll be seeing him. You won't. Hey, wait a minute. Who are you, anyway? Uh, just another tenant. I uh, live downstairs. Oh, well, now I recall whom you are. You are that Seamus, which lives on the second floor. Really. Uh, Seamus, we call it in the radio. Seamus, would you care to come in and discuss a certain matter? Well, uh, thanks. Another time. i got to get back to Bumpus Hell. Oh, whoever she is, let her cool her heels for a few moments. No, you don't understand this Bumpus Hell. This is an urgent matter, which I would like to hash over right now and without further delay. Well, I... Uh... May I invite you in for a straight slug? Well, uh, okay, but just one, uh, in a glass. All right, make yourself comfy. <clears throat> now, say when. Uh, just after the lipstick mark. Here you are. <clears throat> well, now, to make a long story short, Mrs. Spade, my name is Rosemary Fell, which remains my stage name, notwithstanding the circumstance that I am legally married to that barnacle which has just dusted this joint. Now, being as you are in the detective business... Now, wait I a minute. 
kindly permit me to finish, honey? Sorry, sweetheart. I'm not the type to jaw about my troubles just to pass the time of day. I'm sure you're not. I am an actress. I knew that. And although I'm low in funds due to being between jobs right now, on account of that knothead making a scene in the last joint at which I worked... <coughs> Cheap ginger ale. <laughs> <coughs> just to show you how the brakes fall, Mr. Spade, Belita Wilkerson, who just happens to be about the biggest talent agent in this city, if mm. you have the time, I'm phoned me, mm. phoned me on the telephone, I'm and arranged an audition. Ah. She also advanced me the sum of 100 clams. 100? Which I will pay you to put the B on that dog, Joe Donigan, the rat. Now, which is he? Uh, what do you mean, put the B on him? Listen, Sam, that grifter has got a record as long as my arm, and what I have got on him is longer than his arm. Please. In short... I should like him thrown into the can so that I can feel safe to sing on him. Hey, look, uh, Rosemary, so you had a fight with Joe. You're sore. You want him to pay, you want to pay him off. Now, right. why don't you just wait until morning and uh, see how you feel? Sam, then? listen to me. If that knuckle duster remains at large, I will be feeling no pain. Now, I, I know that from my flamboyant manner, you'd never guess it. But that is only the actress in me. In actuality, that flea intends to do me in. Oh, now, come, Rosemary. What? You disagree? Well, now, really, Rosemary. Why, you big pain in the neck. Rosemary. I am drinking my... Be- Pour that back in the bottle. Don, put it back in the bottle. Uh, well, I'll be going now. Only trying to be neighborly. Well, back to bump as hell. <laughs> Rance Blaggett, the smoking colt still gripped in his hairy fists, suddenly pitched forward like a fallen Joshua tree at Red Gillis's feet. Red leaned over with a thin smile playing at the corners of his mouth, not liking what he saw, and lifted the badge off of Blaggett's cowhide vest and pinned it on his own. Bumpus Hell had a new sheriff. Hmm? Uh, hey. Hey. Then I heard it. It sounded like a man sneaking up a fire escape. I went over to the window, raised it, and looked up. I didn't like what I saw. An overcoated figure reached the third floor landing and stood silhouetted against the lighted window of Rosemary's apartment. He was about the height and weight of that rat, Joe Donegan. By the time I'd rolled out the window onto the fire escape, his right hand had come out of his coat pocket. Donegan! Donegan, watch it! floor ahead of me, and I didn't want to get too close to him until I passed that lighted window. He made the roof just as I crossed in front of it. The flashes from his revolver told me that. They also told me he had two slugs left to throw at me. The only light up there was a feeble glow from the skylight, dead center. I headed for the cover of a brick chimney just to the left of it. I had two things in mind. The skylight was his most logical avenue of escape, and I hoped I could tease him into emptying his gun at me. It didn't work. I stuck my head out. No shots. But he did use his gun. Oh. I should have stood in bump as hell. The United States Armed Forces Radio Service is presenting the weekly adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. That rat do to you, the dog. Uh, Sam, Sam, speak to me. Uh, Here, uh, come on. Uh, send an Indian to oh. start his mill. Uh, huh? yeah, tell the governor the sheriff of Bumpus Hell is turning in his bed. Listen, bag. honey, you've uh, got to pull yourself together now. Come on, come on, come on. These delirious Trumans will get us no place now. Come on, uh, Sam. Yeah, I guess you're right. Come on, now. Oh. Now, do not rush things, oh, honey. Oh, that was oh. quite a clip he gave you. Yeah, where were you? I was combing my hair out of the window. Yeah, and he was on the fire escape, not four feet away. Not a very good shot, is he? No, he isn't. Oh, Sam, look at your poor little head. Here, now, let me kiss it and make it well. Hmm, wild root. Yeah, see how it gets me ahead socially and on the job? Oh, well, now, what next, Sam? <sighs> Rosemary, I am going to the top now. My dander is up. Let's have a moment of silence while I put through a call to Lieutenant Thomas Dundee of Homicide. It took your boys less than an hour to locate Joe Donegan and haul him in, Lieutenant. Rosemary's charges were not enough to hold him on attempted murder, and all I could identify was the back of his neck. But you were good enough to bag him anyway so Rosemary and I could relax. I went downstairs to bed and started Chapter 4. Aha. Red Gillis didn't trust Curly Mallard, the foreman of the Crooked S. Aha. Oh. 
Uh, unique, Ross. Harry speaking. Uh, Sam, this is Dundee. Yeah, uh, Dundee. Uh, what time is it? Uh, uh, oh, uh, 8.30. Uh, in the morning? Uh, yeah. Huh? Oh, yeah, uh, it's daylight. Say, about that, uh, uh, what was his name? Uh, uh Donegan? Uh, anyway, that fellow that we booked last night on your say-so. Uh, well, what about him? That was a bad beef, Sam. How come? Uh, you, you better tell me. Man was alibied, Sam. When did that happen? Well, a fellow named, uh, um, got it written down, yeah, Hobson. Warner Hobson says Donegan was with him at the time. Who else says so? Uh, Hobson's word's good enough for the commissioner. Ran for assembly once. Did you know he also ran for Donegan's wife? You don't say. Well, that's a real puzzler, Sam. The human mind is unpredictable, Dundee. Huh? Oh, yeah. Well, I, I hope you figure it out, Sam. <laughs> While I was shaving, I fought and fought. I wondered what Red Gillis would have done if such a situation had cropped up in Bumpus' hell. A thin smile began to play around the corners of my mouth as I climbed the stairs to Rosemary's apartment. When I got there, I didn't like what I saw. It was a note pinned to the door. It said, Dear Sam, I have been called to do another audition. If anything crops up, you can reach me at Gray Strom, 34292. The Belita Wilkerson Talent Agency. Hey, I want to speak to uh, Rosemary Fell. Hello? Yes, I'm still on the line. Who's calling, please? Uh, Sam, a spade. I'm sorry, Mr. Spade. Miss Fell can't come to the phone. Who's in charge there? This is Miss Wilkerson speaking. Yeah, well, uh, why can't she come to the phone? She's in the middle of her audition. Well. Is there any message? Uh, yeah, yeah. Tell her uh, Donegan's out and it's Hobson's choice. Yes? Mr. Hobson? Yes? My name is Spade. Oh, yes, Mr. Spade. Come in, come in, come in. Why did you phony up that alibi for Rosemary's husband, Mr. Hobson? Huh? Oh, because I knew he's not the man who fired those shots at her. Were you there? Yes, as a matter of fact, I was. Would you like to hear about it? I would. Well, first, I'd better tell you a little about myself. Now, for the past year, I've been interested in politics. If I do say so yes, myself, Yes, yes, I... I know. You ran for assembly. Come to the point. Well, in a way, this is the point. My wife's a professional woman, and her own career keeps her busy a good deal of the time. Mm. Well, like the movie magazines say, a clash of careers and so on. Mm. That's how I happen to <clears throat> take up with Rosemary. I didn't know she was married. And, of course, when I found out, I dropped her like a hot, hot potato. potato, yeah. Potato, and then she started blackmailing me. Did you know about that? I still don't. Well, I think I can convince you. Go ahead. Well, I received a series of threatening phone calls from Rosemary. And I finally decided to go to Donegan and tell him the whole story. Oh, he was as mad as a wet head. Wet head. Well, he said he'd stop her. And I believed he was the right man to do it. Mm-hmm. Well, last night he phoned me. He said he'd had a little, uh, little caucus meeting with her and assured me I'd have no more trouble. But no sooner had I hung up that phone when she called again, making another outrageous demand. I decided then and there to take things into my own hands. So happens I'm a crack shot. And I knew that I could come close enough to frighten her without actually hurting her. Yeah, you were laboring under a false impression. Huh? Oh, oh, oh yes. Yes. Well, uh, you believe me now? Up to a point. Well, I'm afraid that's all I have for you, Mr. Spade. Well, uh, I have something for you. Oh, uh, uh, what's that? Look up here. You see this bruise on my head? Oh. Well, all in the game, you know. Touche. Now, hold it, hold it. I I only... Lie still. I'll get it. Yeah? This is Rosemary again. Listen, I want to talk... Listen to you, cheap ward healer. If you don't have that dough for me tonight, I will have no other recourse but to smear your fat puss all over the front page. Yeah, look, Rosemary... And I am just the individual to do that. You may think you are a wolf in sheep's clothing, but in my opinion, you are nothing but a worm. Yeah, well, look... Goodbye, you rat. And rat. Hey. Hey, Rosemary. Hello. Nuts. Oh, wait a minute, Spade. Well, what did she say? You can read it in my report, along with a bill for my services. No, I'm so sorry she had in. You do that, sugar. Hello there. Likewise. Are you talented or just interested? I could be. 
Uh, in the meantime, is uh, Rosemary Fowl still here? Did she have an appointment today? Uh, yes, honey. I uh, called this morning. Uh, she oh, was well, here then. You must be mistaken, darling. Right. The office didn't open till noon today. <laughs> yeah. Uh, could I uh, talk to Miss Wilkerson? She hmm? isn't here just now. Oh, she she never gets in until one. Not until one. Huh? She's over at KQW cutting a transcription for our new show, Goal of the Girls and Gay. Oh, oh no. <laughs> I mean, Gale of the Girl and Gold. <laughs> uh, don't you mean Gale of the Golden Girl? That's it. Girl of the Golden Gate. You said it, and I'm glad. Well, anyway, she and him. Uh-huh. Good morning, Maggie. Any calls for me? Oh, yes, Miss Wilkerson. Your heart's... Oh. Well, Miss Wilkerson, I was telling the German you weren't here. <laughs> Obviously, I am. Did you have an appointment? I uh, talked to you on the phone this morning. Spade. Oh, Rosemary's friend. Well, you might talk. Uh, she'll be out in a moment. Oh, what a distressing business that was last night. Rosemary tells me you saved her life. Well, uh, that's a slight exaggeration. In fact, the whole thing was a mistake. Oh, really? I understood that... Oh, here she is. Rosemary, here's your friend. Oh, Sam, I ever glad to see you. Yeah. What's the matter? Plenty. Oh. Well, thanks loads, Miss Wilkerson. I hope the recording is better on this one. I'm sure it is, Rosemary. We'll call you when the client makes up his mind. Oh. Well, thanks again. Come on, Sam. Goodbye, Mr. Spade. Goodbye. Sam, what is this new development that appears to be griping you? Uh, why didn't you tell me you were shaking Hobson down? Uh-huh. And who's been feeding you this pile of gross falsehoods? Look, Rosemary, you may be an actress, but with me, your audition is over and you did not get the part. And just what are your future intentions in regards to me? None whatsoever. I'm sorry I ever met you and I'm going back to Bumpus Hell. <laughs> went back to the office, swiveled my chair into a comfortable position, opened the February number of Sheriff and Outlaw to page 112, Betrayal in Bumpus Hell, Chapter 5, Stampede. It was disappointing. There was a lot of stuff about bawling cattle and dust clouds and Flo and Curly standing on top of a butte, not liking what they saw, when somebody yelled, Stampede. Red Gillis was riding ahead of the cattle and his horse stepped into a chuck hole and he sprained his ankle, red of the horse, it didn't say which. But Red was lying prostrate on the path of the avalanche of tossing horns, not liking what he saw. Uh, uh hold it a minute. Let's see. Uh, it's anything on page, uh, 113. Uh, uh, learn to be a private... Uh, uh, hello. Spade, this is Hobson. Come out here right away. Something terrible has happened. Such as? Rosemary is here, and I, I think she's dead. <laughs> In here, Spade. Oh, I don't know how she got in. Oh, yes, I do remember I must have left the door unlocked. Where were you? Why, I, I uh, just stepped out to get some cigarettes. Did you prove it? Why, uh, no, I'm afraid not. I got halfway and found I didn't have any money and came back. You came back, walked through this room, went in the bedroom and didn't see the body until you started back? Well, yes, the lights were off. I, uh, I stumbled over it. This is the gun? Yes. She did it with my own gun. Oh, I never dreamed her love for me would drive her to self-destruction. Of course, now it's clear what really lay behind our poor, clumsy effort to blackmail me. It was a desperate move to get me back. Oh, I'll never forgive myself for driving that poor girl to this. Don't worry about that, Hobson. This isn't suicide. Murder? Oh, great heavens. What will Belita say? Belita? Yes, my wife. Belita Wilkerson? Yeah, professional name, you know. I was explaining to you before that... Oh, that's my wife now. What in the world will I tell her? Never mind, I'll get it. Hello? This is Rosemary, for the last time. Who? And I'm just calling to tell you that you have stalled around too long. I have talked to your wife and told her the whole sordid pitch. Why she wants you back, I will never know. But I sold you cheap, and you weren't worth a cent more. I am a girl who does not like to do things halfway, but you were just too late. Goodbye, you fathead. Yeah, Rosemary, I guess we were all too late. I called you, Dundee, and then, like the rat I am, made off with your prize suspect before you and your boys from Homicide arrived. We arrived at the Belita Wilkerson Talent Agency just as the boss was shutting up shop for the day. She had the recordings under her arm. All right, Belita. I'll take those. Oh, what are you? Warner! Yeah. Mr. Spade! Unlock the door, Belita. We're going back in. Warner, why are you... You'd better do as he says, Belita. Well, all right, but... Give me those keys. I don't... Inside, both of you. Where do you play these records? The recording studio is just through there, but you can spare yourself the trouble. I admit I tricked Rosemary into recording those blackmail speeches and then played them back over the phone to Warner. If trying to hold on to my husband is a crime, then I'm a criminal. Oh, now, believe him, my dear. Come on, <laughs> stop that. we got to get busy. I 
I phoned the Hobson house and you were still there, Dundee. You said it was an open and shut case against Hobson and deliver him at once or kiss my license goodbye. But when I told you my diabolic... <laughs> Diabolically ingenious scheme. You said yes, you'd be glad to because it was a sure way of getting rid of me once and for all. It took us nearly two hours to get things ready in Belita's recording studio. We took the parts of Rosemary's so called audition records that we thought would fit the occasion and dubbed them onto a single side. We played it back once, then I phoned you at headquarters. Homicide. Lieutenant Dundee. Spade, Dundee. Everything's ready here. Did you pick up Donegan? Oh, yeah. He's here. Donegan? Hold on. Okay, Belina. Start the record when I give you the nod. Yes, Mr. Stade. I didn't say it, Donegan. That's for you. Thanks. Yeah, who's this? This is Rosemary. Huh? I forgive you for everything, oh. but there are some things I cannot it's forget. You Rosemary, love. it sounds like We have you. meant a lot to each other, but after what Ro- you have done to me, it is time you Rose- stay through the nose. Rosemary, Rosemary I didn't mean it. When I followed you to his house, you went right in like you lived there. I just went nuts. After what you have done to me, it is time you stay through the nose, you rat. I am a girl who listen, does not Rose, like to do things halfway. Listen, honey, you're you not going to throw up like at me. I'm glad to hear your voice. Too. I thought you were dead. We have meant a lot to Okay, you. kill it. Rosemary, are you listening? Rosemary! Hey, no, she's still on the line. I want to talk to her. Take him, Paul Hound. Wait a minute. Take him. Uh, Sam? Yeah, Dundee. Congratulations. That was a brilliant piece of work. Good. Sam, you still on the line? Yeah, I'll be all right, Dundee. I just fainted temporarily. Say it again, will you, pal? Yeah, as I was saying, congratulations on a brilliant piece of work. Well. But I have never in all my years on the force heard of such a wild, insane, illegal, unethical, and downright cruel method of extorting a conviction. Thank you, Dundee. I feel better already. Period. End of report. But, but Sam, what happened? Effie, I thought I had made that abundantly clear. No, In order to discredit her husband's paramour, Belita gave her a come on about an audition and had her play the part of a blackmailer reading lines from a script which she, Belita, had prepared and thereupon proceeded to play said records over the telephone, well knowing that her husband would erroneously believe Rosemary to be a blackmailer in fact and would drop her like a hot spud. No, Sam, no, I don't mean... Don't interrupt. It was my inspiration, I, Sam Spade, to use... Belita's fiendish device for a higher purpose. No, Sam. No, yes. That is what I'm, no, Sam. I, I meant the Western story. Betrayal and Bumpus Crick. It is not Crick, Effie. You can't say H over the radio, Sam. Oh, yes, you can. Bumpus Hell is the post office designation of a hamlet right here in California. It is? Mm-hmm. Hmm. Well, well, anyway, what happened? Did Red Gillis ever find his brother? I didn't quite finish, Ev. Go type that up and I shall. <laughs> Oh, Sam, what's the matter? You don't look at all well. It can't be. It doesn't happen. It's a misprint. That's what it is. What, Sam? What? Maybe the writer was tired. Oh, Sam, it's only a story. That's what you think. Well, did Red Gillis find his brother? I won't tell. Oh, no, Sam. Now, don't be childish. Oh, well, all right. Remember the sheriff he shot on page one? What? Yeah, it turned out to be the new school mom. Oh, how ornery. A woman, huh? <laughs> Good night, Sam. Get off. Good night, sweetheart. <laughs> this is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Since the world began, woman was...
was meant for me. Well, Sam, I must say, this is the shortest honeymoon in my experience. Yes, have you been keeping something from me? Well, I wouldn't blame myself if I did. We didn't exactly telegraph this punch. Come on in, Angel, and I'll tell you as much about it as I think you should know. And what, may I ask, is a large parcel with a pink ribbon around it? Love letters. What else? Well, I must say, for a whirlpool romance... Whirlpool? I mean, writing all those letters... When did she find time to get acquainted? Stop pulling at that blouse. What's the matter? Does it itch? Sam, now that your marital status is no longer quo... Well, Sam, these little routine informalities... Don't you think we should be a little more stilted with each other here? In the hereafter? Then, perhaps, and not a minute before. To Sergeant Joseph Walsh, Bunko and Fugitive Detail, San Francisco Police... From uh, you know who, license number one three seven five nine six. Subject the uh, easy yet. Subject the uh, love letter caper or how to be happily married though single. The start of it was last Wednesday morning. I had just arisen, shaved, bathed, weighed myself in the bathroom scales, and decided on a breakfast of black coffee and rye crisp. Noisy stuff. Oh. <clears throat> Special delivery. Sign here. Oh, now hold this, will you, Sonny? Yeah, but, but, but what do you call this? Some kind of Italian soda cracker? Rye crisp, low in calories. Take a bite. Oh, you no could thanks. lose a pound or two yourself. Mm. There you are. Eat the change. Thanks. I'll smoke it after dinner. The first thing that fell out of the envelope was a photograph. Glamour type. It was inscribed to Sam, body and soul, Ella. The letter was in the same tone of voice. Sam. Sam. Oh, Sam, my darling. Last night was so beautiful, but now my arms are empty and I'm filled with strange fears for the future. Unless I see you soon, I don't know how I can go on living. Come to me tonight, my darling. Wait until the house is dark. Then slip in through the west gate and I'll meet you beside the fountain. If you fail me, I don't know what I'll do. But I know you won't. All, all, all my love forever, Ella. I uh, read it over again, looked longingly at her picture and shook my memory down. I couldn't even remember ever meeting a girl named Ella, but I did remember that last night was definitely not beautiful. In fact, I had dropped 35 bucks in a blackjack game, not deductible. After I had tested the letter for invisible ink, codes, and ciphers, etc., with negative results, I decided it was either A, a crank letter, or B, bait, or C, a camouflage call for help from a damsel in distress. I took another look at said damsel's photograph and decided I would investigate her distress. I then phoned my secretary and told her to look up the night bus schedule to Atherton, the return address on the envelope containing said love letter. It was around 11 in the p.m., and the moon was just clearing the treetops behind the Comstock mansion when I slipped in at the west gate for the instructions in Ella's love letter and took a plant beside the aforementioned fountain. The house was in darkness, and I didn't see the ladder until the moon cleared the chimney pot. There was a girl climbing down the ladder from the second story, and she had a suitcase in her hand. When she reached the ground, she looked around anxiously, spotted me, and flew into my arm. Sam! Oh, Sam, my darling, you didn't fail me. Oh, my precious, hold me. Never let me go. I love you. I love you, too, but now look. I'll explain it all later. We'll have to hurry. I think he suspected something. Who suspected Please, what? Please, there isn't time. Come on. Oh, the hey. watchman. We'll have to go out the back way. Come on. Hey, there. Come out here. Hey, you. Hey, hold it. Get down. No, let me go. we got to get out of I here. I said get down. Oh. Shut up. Down there. Oh, a couple of pounds, Mr. Comstock. They had a ladder up to the second story, the hall window. But I scared them off. Oh, not all. Well, let's have no more shooting. I'm trying to scream. Come on. It's our last chance. If he looks in that room, I love you. I love you. What room? Wait. Well, my room, of course. Where are you planning on going? Anywhere. Just so I get away from him, I love you. I love you. Who's him? My uncle. He's been holding me prisoner in that house. Oh, come now. I tell you, he's insane. He'll tell us both if we're caught, so please come on. <laughs> I went, because A, I don't like being shot at, and B, there was a wild possibility that she was indeed a fairy princess on the lamb from a dragon. I discounted half a B when we reached her getaway car. It was parked in the alley with a motor running. 
When she insisted that I drive, I hesitated whether to head directly to police headquarters or nail her the stupid way. I was weak from being on a diet, so it was Hobson's choice, more familiarly known as Spade's Folly. What is this place? It's where I live. You wouldn't lie to me. What about that? Look at the address. Your love letter arrived here. Come on. Here, let me carry your bag. No, no, it's all right. I'll carry it. Hmm. Come on, come on. It's okay. No cops, no booby traps. Now, let's have a look in that suitcase. No, you must Come on, I... come on. Give it to me. Oh, no, you can't. Why not? Because you'll get the wrong idea. Oh. Well, well, well. What have we here? I knew you'd get the wrong idea. The only thing you seem to have missed is the Hope Diamond. That jewelry is mine, every piece of it. Uh -huh. It's all I have in the world. Poor kid. Let's see now. Diamond bracelet, not more than ten grand. Emerald necklace, second hand, of course. All told, I don't imagine this stuff will net you a penny more than a hundred thousand bucks. I know, but I'll just have to get along as best I can. I don't have any money of my own. Yeah, why did you write me that crazy love letter? Because my uncle reads all my mail. I didn't want him to know I was hiring a detective. Why did you? I couldn't very well walk around with all these jewels without some protection, could I? Oh, my uncle, he's followed me here. Suppose it's the cop. Oh, no, it's he. I know it. Where can I hide? In here? Don't you have a bedroom? Yeah, but it has a window and a fire escape in here. Uh, go on. But, but go I... on, go on. Spade. Yeah, I... I suppose she's told you about me. You were uncle? Oh, good heavens, no. I'm Stuart Mason. I'm a fiancé. Or was, till she ran away with you. Uh, maybe you'd better step inside, Mr. Mason. Thank you. Uh, sit down. I'd uh, like to... No, 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 no. I just brought a few things I'd like to leave for Ella. Here. This bundle of letters. Her uh, love letters to me. I suppose she'll want to destroy them. <clears throat> now, wait a minute, Mr. Mason. Don't jump to any rash conclusion. I saw her come down the ladder. I saw her throw herself into your arms. Yeah, but... I... I can't blame her. I've been a coward. I oh. told myself it was for her own sake that I discouraged her from escaping with me. But now I know that... Well, it was at least partly fear for myself. But I might die as the others did. Yeah, but, uh... What others? The men she's known. They've all died under mysterious circumstances, and... Didn't she warn you? Well, uh, all she told me was that her uncle was insane and wouldn't let her out. <laughs> Crazy like a fox. As long as she remains unmarried, he controls her money. Three million dollars of it. Uh-huh. Well, only the brave deserve the fare. Alas, if you'll just give her these letters and tell her that I... You, uh, tell her yourself. Come on out, Ella. Stuart, why did you come here? Your letters, my dear. And I... I wish you every happiness. Stuart! You too, old man. Good night. Oh, Stuart, Stuart, darling, I can explain everything. Don't try, my dear. Oh, Stuart! Stuart, come back! Hey, Ella! Hey, Ella, your jewelry! Your, your love letters! Hey, we'll take care of those letters, Spade. Keep the gun on him, Riley. Inside, you. Over there, sweetheart. What do you want? Mr. Spade, I've been aware for some time that you've been carrying on a surreptitious love affair with my niece. Look, uh, Mr. Comstock. What, Jim Riley? Don't worry, Mr. Comstock. I advise you against trying to jump him, Spade. Why should I? You're both nuts, but not crazy enough to take a shot at me here. Try me and see. I wouldn't waste the energy. I haven't made a penny on this caper so far, and it doesn't look like I will. Ha! Huh. Not a penny, he says. The king's ransom and jewels extorted from a foolish, lovesick girl. Oh, how did I manage that? Don't you play the innocent with me. This packet of love letters will satisfy the police. Blackmail. You're crazy. Those letters weren't written to me. You deny that Ella has ever written your letter? One too many. In fact, one. Well, how do you explain these? Darling Sam. Sam, my dearest one. What? Sam, my great, big, beautiful detective. Dated last October. Hey, let me see those Watch things. It. I told you not to move. Yeah, yeah, so you did. Well, uh, what now? Very well. Give me the... Give me the police department. Yes, it is. Hello? This is Hugo Comstock. I want to make a complaint. Uh, uh, blackmail. Oh, man. Hello. I want to... Uh, 
Yes, yes, Sergeant. The name is Hugo Comstock, and I'm making this complaint on the behalf of my niece, Miss Ella Comstock. The name of the offender is Samuel Spade, a private detective. Huh? Well, of course I'm sure. Yes, I'm holding him at his apartment now. The address is... Uh... Oh, you have it. Well, I'm not surprised. You better hurry over here. Right away. He's threatening violence. You really think you can make that stick? Mr. Spade, I'm sure I can. <laughs> Dirty words and foul imprecations were forming on my trembling lips. But he had letters from his niece to one Sam, a great, big, beautiful detective. And I had the jewels, and before the night was over, Sergeant Walsh, you had me. Booked, bothered, and bewildered. What bewildered me was how to raise the $2,500 bail. Sam Spade, innocent dope. I mean dupe. The United States Armed Forces Radio Service is presenting the weekly adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Up the times to my breakfast of rude prison fare. They didn't serve any rye crisp, but what they did serve was even less fattening. I thrust my emaciated arms through the bars of my cell and clawed at the lapels of a passing bondsman and begged him for sucker. He says I didn't need any because I was it. I hurled him aside and sat down to think. About then, you, Sergeant Walsh, hold through in front of my cell. Okay, Sam, get moving. You're free. Gee, thanks. Who stood my bail? Great kidder, aren't you? Sergeant, am I to understand that the charges have been dropped? Get out of here. All right, I know when I'm not wanted. Mine not the reason why. And don't come back. Your inhospitable words cut me to the quick, Sergeant, but I bit my lips, swallowed my pride, very low calorie, and strode bravely out into the sunlight, a free man, I thought, until I bought a newspaper. Right there on page one, it said, Heiress reveals secret marriage to private detective. Blackmail charges against Sam Spade dropped. All a mistake, says Uncle. Next to the item was a picture of Ella leaning over a hot stove in my kitchen. It was captioned... Surprise bride prepares breakfast for incarcerated mate. We'll keep things hot for him, says Mrs. Spade. Sam, darling, your breakfast is ready. I'm on a diet. Take off that apron and sit down. I did it for your sake, Sam, darling. Wouldn't it have been simpler just to have dropped the charges? Oh, it wasn't difficult. The nicest man forged the license and the certificate for only $10. I know a guy who would have done it for five and thrown in some fingerprints for free, but that's not the point. But, darling, don't you see? If you'd just gone free without being married to me, Uncle Hugo might have done something worse to you. Like kill you. Nuts. Who are these ex-admirers of yours who are supposed to have been knocked off by your uncle? Name three. Well, there was Ralph Bettinson. He died of vapor lock. Of what? It happened in the mountains. Something went wrong with his car, but they couldn't prove it because it blew up and burned after it went over the cliff. Hmm. And then there was poor Freddie Push. They called him the piggy bank suicide. Why? They found five dollars worth of pennies in his stomach. Oh. And then there was poor Nicky Nato. He was a ballet dancer. That's and... enough. Now about those letters. Why was your friend Mason returning love letters you'd written to some detective named Sam? Well, that was just coincidence. He always went by his initials, you know, like GBS for George Bernard Shaw, SAM is for Stuart Andrew Mason. Stuart Andrew is his pen name. He writes detective stories. And the rest of the coincidence was the, that love letter you inadvertently mailed to Sam Spay Detective, thereby sending your uncle out gunning for Sam instead of SAM. What could I do after he read my diary and my confession? to myself about S.A.M. and the references to his brilliant mind on criminal subjects. Well, you were a natural stand-in for S.A.M. Pronounced S.A.P. But I wasn't going through with it, Sam. Not after I met you. Why not? Because the moment I saw you, I, I knew that all those things I'd said in that love letter were really true. Really? Last night was so beautiful? I think I... I think I must have dreamed of you. I did. Oh, Sam, darling, I... I'm so lost and frightened. Jimmy. You don't know what my life has been. Oh, I can imagine. Boyfriend's dropping dead right and left. You're the only one who can stop it. If Uncle Hugo thinks we're really married and he can't use my money anymore, then he'll stop having accidents happen to people. Won't you please be my husband, Sam? Is that so much to ask after what I did for you? Yeah. Oh, go on. You spring me out of that blackmail frame so I can help you compound a felony. But, Sam, what am I going to do? You forge the marriage, go forge a divorce. <laughs> Where are you going? Back to jail. I'll see you there. Ow! Oh! oh, dear me. Hit your foot, did it? Cast iron. 
Don't make them like that nowadays. My foot. Eh? Your foot. I meant the strong box. Oh. Oops. Uh, coming in or going out? I think I'll sit down for a minute. Oh, Sam, you poor dear boy. Here, let me take off your shoes so it can swell if it wants. Get away from me. I only wanted to help. I love you. Well, I don't love you anymore. Oh, ho, ho. first little spat, is it? Who is this guy? Oh, Sam, I'm sorry. This is Curtin. You can say that again. Curtin's. Harwood L. Curtin's. L. for Lacey, attorney at law. I represent the estate of the late Gertrude Comstock, Ella's mother. Uh, you, Mr. Spade, have married into, uh, shall we say, money. Look, Curtis, it's time to raise the blinds on a couple of things. In the first place... Please. I... As you know, Ella, your grandfather, the late Commodore Ezra Comstock, uh, left his fortune to be divided equally between his legitimate heirs, that is, your mother and your uncle Hugo. Upon your mother's death, the residue of her part of the estate was left to be administered by your uncle Hugo as he saw fit until your marriage at which time it should go to you. Well, where is it? Yeah. All in good legal time. First, here is this old strong box. I mean, strong box. <sighs> Containing family mementos handed down to you from your grandmother. <clears throat> it was your mother's wish that this be delivered into your hands upon this uh, auspicious occasion. <clears throat> Here is the key, in addition to which I leave with you both my best wishes for your future happiness. Good day. Uh, Mr. Spade, I shall forward along to you the statement of my fees for services in this case. Wait a minute. Who's paying my fee? Uh, no more questions, please. Good day. Well, I guess we might as well open it. Oh, I'm sleepy. Oh, no. Let's see what's in here. All right, let's. It didn't take long to go through Grandma Comstock's mementos, and I got more and more wide awake as we went along. The strong box contained four items. A teapot, a bundle of letters, a photograph album, and a family skeleton. The letters were love letters from one Elmo Pinckney. There was a tin type of said Pinckney in the album. He was a dead ringer for Uncle Hugo, which might have been a coincidence, but wasn't. I started scanning through the love letter. Find any money yet? Huh? Well, there's a Confederate 10 spot. I'll let you know if I hit any pay dirt. Well, at least she left me a pot to make tea in. What? But if there wasn't any money, why wouldn't Uncle Hugo let me get married? Now, look, why don't you go and wash out that pot and make some tea, huh? Probably leave. Oh, something in it. Hmm? No money. This grandmother's marriage certificate and the mother's and Uncle Hugo's birth certificate. Let's see those. Oh, cracked. I might have known. I wonder who that is. That will be your Uncle Hugo. Well, that doesn't need to worry us anymore, does it? Yeah, put these things back in the teapot and put the teapot on the mantelpiece. But it's cracked. So am I, so do it anyway. Come right in, Uncle Hugo. You too, Cousin Riley, you fool. Very funny. Now, now, don't be silly, Riley. Mother, accept your poor old uncle's blessing on this happy occasion. I don't want your blessing, Uncle Hugo. You're a mean old man, and you killed all my fiancés. Well, it appears that Mr. Curtins has already brought you a legacy. I believe I recognize your grandmother's strong box. Mementos of a strange romantic chapter in the history of a great family, Mr. Spade. You, who have joined that family so uh, unexpectedly, will have a privilege that even I was never granted. Oh, how come? My mother was a strange woman in some ways. I'm sure she was. I suppose we shall never know what prompted her to leave these personal allotments to Ella's mother, nor why my late sister chose to keep their contents a secret from me. <laughs> I don't suppose I might be allowed to just a peek into that Pandora's box. Go ahead. Help yourself. Really? Well, uh, well uh, <laughs> there's nothing but a photograph album and a bundle of letters. Love letters, Uncle Hugo. They seem to run in your family. Would you like to read them? You, uh, you have no objection, Ella. Me? Why should she have? And I can give the whole story to you in a nutshell, Uncle Hugo. It seems that Grandma Comstock fell in love with a handsome rascal named Pinckney, a deserter from the Confederate Army, and eloped with him to New Orleans. Her family pursued her there, had Pinckney arrested, got an annulment, and whisked her back home in time for her scheduled wedding to Ezra Comstock. These letters were written to her by Pinckney while he languished in prison awaiting court-martial. Here's the last one. Read it for yourself. Oh. Lydia, my darling, in a few hours I face a firing squad. Please, no tears, no regrets. I'm glad that you are married to a man who is worthy of you. Comstock will be a better father for our child than I would ever have been. Farewell, my love. Huh. So that was a secret. Nothing so extraordinary about that. I think it's very tragic. 
think of her married to a man she didn't love about to have the child. And her lover facing a firing squad. Nonsense. Sentimental nonsense. Well, what do you know about such things? I should know a little. After all, I was that child. Oh, I'm sorry, Uncle Hugo. I... Ah, wow. Fine old piece of spoon. What? This teapot. I don't remember seeing this here before. Uh, just something I picked up in a junk shop. Uh, it's a very rare piece. Do you mind if I look at the mark? Go ahead. Ah, indeed. A genuine example. Pity it's cracked. Oh, oh. Now, that was clumsy of me. Well, there's no good saving the pieces. I'll just toss them in the fire. Wait a minute, Comstock. I'll take care of it. Oh, it's no trouble. Well, well, what's this? It's uh, your birth certificate, Uncle Hugo. You got it. Oh, no. What are you going to do with it? Put it back where it came from. Righty. Yeah, Mr. Comstock. Spade, I'm going out of here, and I'm taking that strong box with me. And don't think I won't kill you to get it. He will, Sam, just as he did the other. And you, too, if you don't shut your trap. Hand it over, Spade. Sure. Come and get it. Okay, let's have it. There you are. Ah! Riley, what's wrong? Oh, my foot, it's broken. Oh! Sit down and rest it. Oh! Oh. Hold it, Comstock. I've got the gun now. Well, Spade, it seems you've won the day. How does it feel to be a rich man? You'll have to tell me, Comstock. The reports of my marriage to your niece are slightly exaggerated. And that's about it, Sergeant. I'm sorry I can't furnish you with the forged papers Ella used to back up that phony story of her marriage to me. A fire broke out in the wastebasket, and I accidentally dropped them into it. As for Comstock and his guns, O'Reilly, I will gladly press charges against them on the blackmail frame until Homicide decides whether there's a case against him on the mysterious deaths of Ella's previous fiancés. Period. End of report. But, Sam, why? Why what if? Did he want that old cracked teapot? Well, because Grandmother's love letters plus the documents on that teapot prove that Hugo was not a Comstock but a Pinkney and hence not entitled to one red penny of the Comstock fortune, which was left, if you recall, to Grandpa's legitimate heir. Well, who was? Entitled, I mean. Ella, but if she never married, she'd never find out, you Well, see? she doesn't deserve it. Hmm? After making a pigeon out of you the way she did. I agree, sweetheart, but how else could she afford to pay my fee? Well, I certainly hope you soak her. I fully intend to. Go type that up while I falsify an expense account. No, still a couple of fingers in there. Break out another glass. Oh, no, I meant the expense account. Oh, that. Well, it was nothing much. Just bus fare. Uh, free breakfast in the pokey? Nah, no, no, that would be the sign. Well, I took the liberty, Sam, of drawing up a statement. Did you look it over? Yeah. Hmm. New letterhead. Well, it's only a sample I had done in huh? spending your approval. Do you? Well, uh, yes, yes, very classy. I like the coat of arms, but I'm not quite sure about the motto. Oh, but then you are the greatest private detective of them all. Well, <laughs> you know best, Effie. And then, for an extra dollar a hundred, we could have it printed in Rady Ink. In what? Luminous Ink, Sam. Shines in the dark. Even as you and I. Oh, Sam. I'm glad you're still a bachelor. Go home, all the same. <laughs> Good night, Sam. <laughs> Good night, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Private Detective, is a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education.
Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. And to Dr. Ludwig Zoya, 1241 Leavenworth, San Francisco, from Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, Edith Hamilton. No caper? No caper. Dear Doctor, if I owe you an apology for not keeping you informed on the progress of the assignment and for letting it drag on as long as it has, then I'll have to go on owing you, which makes us even, because you don't owe me anything. The start of it was a month ago. 32 days, 8 hours, 3 minutes, and 45 seconds, to be exact. Ah, Mr. Spade. Dr. Zoya. Good to see you. Let me think. How long is it? Uh, three years since I visited your office. That was when you were my leading suspect in the Denov case. Ah, uh, yes. Poor Denov. Uh, it was he who pointed out that we psychoanalysts are not unlike you detectives. Uh-huh. We probe, we question, we follow up clues in order to find out what is the dark secret which has nervously disturbed a human mind. <laughs> But we are limited. We have only our patients' words and our interpretations. Sometimes that is not enough. And that is why I need your help in this particular case. What case is that, Dr. Sawyer? Uh, please do not interrupt the free flow of my thoughts. Pardon me. Naturally, my ego feels a certain resentment against my id for asking you for your help. What makes me think I need a detective? Well, uh, my head was just asking my ego the very same question. Oh, you too feel resentment. We must analyze that later. Bring yes. me your dream material. Right, well, well. Now, now, now to the case. Oh, yes, okay. This woman was referred to me by her physician. She has suffered a complete nervous collapse because she thought she recognized a certain person crossing the street, a person she had not seen for years. Who was that? My patient's son died under mysterious circumstances three years ago, and the woman she thought she saw was her Mm daughter-in-law. It was widely reported in the newspapers at the time. Perhaps you remember it. Carter Hamilton? Carter Hamilton. Oh, Roanoke, Virginia, Hmm. 1946. The uh, mother accused the son's wife of murdering him. Daughter-in-law was hauled up before the grand jury, but not indicted. Dropped right out of sight uh, afterwards. Good, you know that case. Well, actually... My patient is suffering from an agonizing sense of guilt. Unconsciously, she thinks that she herself murdered her son. Did she? Well, there may be something tangible at the bottom of so profound a feeling of guilt. You mean you want me to help you convince her that she really is guilty? No, 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 no. That is for me. But first, we must find out. What we must find out is somebody else, whether they are guilty. What? Go all the way to Virginia, solve a crime that's been off the books for three years? No, 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 no. The daughter-in-law is actually here in San Francisco. Well, if I remember right, uh, she wasn't the only suspect. Well, whether she is innocent or guilty is of no importance. It is only important that we know. What? Excuse me. Yes, Miss Case. Mrs. Hamilton is here, Dr. Zoya. Oh, oh, good, Miss Case. Send her in. Uh, This is my case. I mean, my, my, my patient. I want you to meet her. Oh, good afternoon, Mrs. Hamilton. Good afternoon, Doctor. The woman who stood framed in the doorway was a tall, commanding figure, impeccably dressed in black, with an easy hundred grand worth of black pearls wound around her neck and a black veil covering her face. She walked in ahead of you, displaying not a sign of nervousness, and stopped directly in front of me. Very deliberately, she lifted the veil, revealing a youthfully old face, deeply tanned and set off by snow-white hair. Only her enormous violet eyes showed any expression. She stared at me for what seemed like a full minute. Yes, you do. You look like the other one. Uh, Well, perhaps you had better explain, Mrs. Hamilton. My daughter-in-law, Edith, was very much in love with another man before she married my son, Carter. He jilted her. Carter was second choice. It was I who talked her into marrying him. That's why I'll never rest until my son's death is avenged. Uh, We must analyze this desire for vengeance. Oh, yes. Yes, I had a dream last night. I dreamed that Edith was dead, stabbed with the same bone-handled hunting knife she used to kill my son. Yes, yes. yes. Well, no, no. no. You just lie down on the couch and relax, Mrs. Hamilton. I'll be with you in a moment. Come, Mr. Speaking. This is the most disturbing new development, her dream. You must get to that girl as soon as possible. Her life may be in danger. You mean the old lady is mixed up enough to take a shot at her? Here. 
Here is the address. And take this briefcase. Why the briefcase? Well, there are legal papers in it regarding the Hamilton estate. They require her signature. I had Mrs. Hamilton arrange for you to take them to her instead of the attorney. Uh, I'm supposed to pose as a lawyer. While I'm there, I'm supposed to shake a confession out of her. And while I'm typing it up, I'm a bodyguard. You're getting a lot for your money, Dr. Zoya. I spent the next hour or so in a newspaper morgue briefing myself on the old Hamilton case. The victim, Carter Hamilton, was the 28-year-old tail end of an old Virginia family whose blood was as rich as it was blue. The accounts of the killing were sketchy. At the old plantation, Carter Hamilton had been found one morning by his mother, dead and dead, of a stab wound. The knife was never turned up. Somebody had wiped everything in the room clean of fingerprints, which sounded like robbery until it was established that nothing was missing. The state was counting heavily on Mrs. Hamilton Sr.'s testimony in their case against the daughter-in-law, but an odd angle I'd forgotten. The old lady had clammed up in front of the grand jury, and the case was dropped for lack of evidence. Then there was a picture. She was the kind of a girl who looks her best in a riding outfit with her freckles showing, and then surprises you by looking even better in full makeup with her shoulders showing. Candid is the word that best describes her features. Large, widely spaced eyes, a generous mouth, and an expression of unaffected sincerity. It was with a certain reluctant eagerness that I kicked myself up Stockton Street to Pine, across Pine to Bush, and up three flights of stairs. Yes? Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Edith Hamill? Yes. You must be from the attorneys. They wired me you were coming. Come in. Thank you. Not that I'm in hiding, but I'm curious as to how they got my address. Would you like a drink? Oh, well, not right now. Can I fix you one? In about 20 minutes, maybe. I'm still wondering how... How they located you? I, uh... I think the elder Mrs. Hamilton saw you on the streets. Oh, is she here in San Francisco? Yes. Is that so surprising? No, it's a large city. What is surprising is her staying on after learning that I was in town. She's not very well. In fact, I uh, think she's had some kind of a nervous breakdown. I'm sorry to hear that. I'm very fond of her, you know. In spite of everything? No, I didn't know. Uh, maybe I should explain. I'm a private detective local. I was hired here in San Francisco to bring these papers to you. Oh, you found me. I seem to be a little slow in introducing myself. I'm sorry. Sam Spade. Well, if it had to be a detective, I'm glad it's you. But I can't help wondering why they didn't send a lawyer. <laughs> Lawyers cost $50 an hour. I only cost 10 Oh. In the private eye stories, it's always... Twenty-five bucks a day and expenses. I wish those writers would get abreast of the times. I'm sure they'll catch up. But if you're being paid by the hour, perhaps I can keep you here a little longer. I'm glad you said that. You remind me of someone. Pleasantly, I hope. Yes. Oh, yes. And sadly, too. Your husband? If you don't know about that, I hope you'll never find out. I'll leave that up to you. His hair was like yours. He was thinner. And his eyes were blue. Maybe we shouldn't wait till five o'clock for that drink. It was a funny kind of a drink. I'd never been hit by one before. Black velvet. After two of them, I even began to hate myself a little less. And after the third, I decided there was some mystical connection between the drink and the color of her eyes. Black velvet. much about music, but the way she went at the piano, you knew she wasn't afraid of it, and probably wasn't afraid of anything. The pieces she played were like her, bold and at the same time delicate, simple but with a web of complexities in the background, brilliant but always colored with sadness. What's the matter? I want you to take me someplace. Where? Any place. Dinner. I don't, I don't care. I... I just want to go someplace with you. With you. Hey. 
What is it, Sam? I uh, thought we were going out. I never paid much attention to San Francisco before I met her. It's quite a place. There's a little park up on Russian Hill where you can stand and look out over the houses of the marina to the Golden Gate. There's an island in San Francisco even worse than Alcatraz. It's in the middle of the lake at Flashacker Zoo, and instead of gorillas, the population is nothing but monkeys. There are only two laundries in Chinatown. And out at Golden Gate Park, they have a band concert every Sunday afternoon. Maybe it was just the bright weather, but... Everything looked clean and shiny, as if somebody had taken a scrubbing brush to all the buildings. We even fed seagulls. At first, she never went any further into her past than the day before yesterday. I couldn't very well charge her for the progress I was not making on the case, so when I learned that she'd sent old Mrs. H. to a nursing home for a two-week rest and Edith did not need bodyguarding for the time being, I took a job that took me down to Los Angeles for a few days. I was awful glad to get back, and not because I don't like L.A. Oh, Sam. Oh, darling, you were gone so long. Hey, hey, the posies. Oh, give them to me. Well, I like that. This is the last time I make a fool out of myself buying flowers. I'll love them later. Hey, you're trembling. What happened while I was gone? What happened to me happened before you went away. You know that. Sam, while you were gone, I had a lot of time and I did a lot of thinking. And I came to a very important decision. There was something I knew I had to tell you. And I wasn't so sure I could get through it. Oh, look, Angel, it sounds serious. I don't think this is the time. Oh, but it is. Yes, it is. Here. Here. Take it before I change my mind. What is it? I wrote it all down. Sit here, facing away from the piano. And don't say anything until you've read it through. Oh, okay. The opening sentence hit me straight between the eyes. It said, I, Edith Hamilton, of my own free will, make the following confession. It was addressed to the district attorney of Roanoke, Virginia. Sam? Sam! And that, Dr. Zoya, was when I headed back to your office. Not to have my head examined, it was too late for that, but to tell you that I was resigning, Miss Caper. On the way, I placed two ads in the classified sections of three papers. One under office space for rent and one under situations wanted. Ex-private detective desires position as night watchman, prison guard, asylum attendant, or any more pleasant line of work. And I really meant it. The United States Armed Forces Radio Service is presenting the weekly adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Mr. Spade, what is it? You're disturbed. Disturbed is not the word, Mr. Zoya. Is it because you've been with her a week and a half and there's yet no progress? Let us analyze the situation. The whole setup has been rotten from the beginning. You send me to that girl under false pretenses. You tell me to worm my way into her confidence. Now, one moment. Did I tell you this? How else did you expect me to get a confession out of her? Should have got the play when that old lady said I looked like a man Edith was once in love with. You thought she'd fall for me, didn't you? You thought I'd take advantage of it, didn't you? Well, you could hire somebody else to make love to her. I'm a detective, not a gigolo. So she did make a confession to you. Why do you say that? When a patient comes to a psychoanalyst for help, a situation develops which we call transference. Now, this means that the doctor represents to the patient someone in whom he can confide, to whom he can unburden himself, such as a parent or a loved one. Well, then let's not go on with it. No. Well, at the moment, at the moment, that is... What you feel toward me at the moment is what we call negative transference. You wish to continue to make love to her, but you feel guilty about it, so you blame me. Well, what then? What are you driving at? In this love affair of yours, we have a similar situation. Uh, But what she feels for you only resembles love. It is transference. 
You resemble a former lover. Yeah. And that is why it only took a week and a half for it to reveal everything. Oh, sometimes I think I am too ethical or too old. Come now, why don't you tell me? You'll feel better. There's nothing to tell. She had it written down. I didn't read past the word confession. Well, what did you do with it? I destroyed it. I see. Well, <laughs> now Miss what? Case. Miss Case, Miss Case, what, what is it? Mrs. Harrelson, she's... Oh! It was Mrs. Hamilton, all right. But she didn't look much like the dignified old lady I had met in your office ten days before. Her high-piled white hair was hanging in two ratty pigtails. She was wearing a nurse's cape over a flannel hospital nightgown, and in her hand was a thirty-two caliber gun. Mrs. Hamilton, why did you leave the nursing home? You lied to me, Dr. Sawyer. That place... It's nothing but an asylum. Well, you know that isn't true. Come, give me the gun. You're tired. You must rest. Yes. Now I can rest. I've killed her. What? Well, Miss oh. Case, she's fainted. Get some water. Let me see that gun. I'm going to eat this place. Get an ambulance over there and don't stop to analyze anything. Edith was slumped forward over the piano keyboard. She was barely breathing. The old lady wasn't much of a hand with a gun. Four of the slugs had punctured the big studio window. One had torn a flesh wound in the shoulder. The other had penetrated the right side, just below the rib cage, and there was not much bleeding at the wound of exit. Her face was pale and the skin cold to the touch. I gambled on a hunch she was suffering mainly from shock, moved her over to a couch, drew a blanket over, and poured hot coffee into her. After a bit, her color started coming back. Then she opened her eyes. Oh, I... I thought you went away. I uh, must have dreamed it. Lie still, Angel. Don't try to talk. Oh, well, that's the... Please, please, don't let them know what happened. Don't... Take it easy. It's only the ambulance. Oh, I've got to save Mother Hamilton. You see, I've got to get rid of that knife and the... I can't let it hang. <gasps> I rode in the ambulance with her. She was still unconscious when they carried her into surgery. They told me she was out of danger. When they threw me out that night, I went back to her apartment. What she'd said about saving old Mrs. Hamilton and getting rid of the knife gave me a new slant on that confession I hadn't read. The pieces were still on the floor where I'd thrown them. It took me nearly an hour to put the jigsaw together. And when I did, it was still a puzzle. In her story of that morning three years ago, she confessed to finding the body before the official discovery, to hiding the knife and wiping the doorknobs and surfaces in the death room to get rid of fingerprints. She couldn't remember anything that had happened in the eight hours between 1 a.m. when she had left her husband drinking in the library and gone upstairs to bed, and approximately 9 in the a.m. when she found herself standing over his body with a knife in her hand. I stretched out on the sofa to think it over, and then I drew a blank. Spade, wake up. Uh, what? How did you get in here? Well, I've been reading that so-called confession. Very interesting. We must analyze it. You analyze it. I'm going to call the hospital. I've just come from there. How is she? Uh, physically, nothing serious. Mentally, she's not so good. She keeps asking for you. Yeah? She thinks you can help her. Uh, it's definitely there, the delusion that she's in love with you. What makes you so sure it's a delusion? Uh, don't answer that. When can I see her? Well, it's best that you wait until she comes home. That will be next Tuesday. Look, you're supposed to be a first-class head doctor. Can't you cure this amnesia of Edith's? I thought I explained to you last night when we were discussing transference. Please, Dr. Zoya, please. I know you mean well, but don't. I beg of you. Well, it's not important. When she gets to know you better, she will realize that her love for you is irrational. And then she will remember everything. <laughs> I kept myself busy like crazy until Edith checked out of the hospital. There wasn't much talk between us at first. Even her music was reticent, little rambling improvisations that sounded like children's songs or lullabies with something just a little acid mixed with their simplicity. Then as the days went by and her strength and confidence started to return, her music became serene and graceful. It became like her as she sat there at the piano in front of the big window with its afternoon sun streaming down on the San Francisco hilltops 
while at the same time the April fog bank started its nightly prowl in through the Golden Gate. And that was like her, too. And like her music. Brilliant, but with a touch of melancholy. And then one day it was all warmth and brilliance, and she was smiling. Sam? Yeah, Angel. I remember now. So that's it. I woke up this morning feeling so happy. And then I knew I was on the verge of it. Because I knew that however bad the truth might be, it was worth not remembering. Even if I was a murderer, you'd rather know, wouldn't you? No, no, I wouldn't. Why? I thought I knew you so well. <sighs> Darling, are you angry? Yeah. But... At me? Yes, you. The first time I came here, I tried to give you a fair warning. You should have figured the score when I told you I was a private detective. You'd even read the stories where in the end the detective doesn't have any choice but to turn in the beautiful dame, no matter what his personal feelings are. Maybe you didn't think they were true to life, or maybe you thought I was an exception to the rule because you are. Well, I'm not. Truth is, I was hired to get a confession out of you any way I could, and I think in the back of your mind you'd known it all along. You want to have your confession and eat it, too. You probably learned as a child that it's smarter to tell all and be patted on the back than to be found out and get spanked. How can you be so smug and so self-satisfied and so... Whatever made me think I was in love with you? Just because you looked a little like someone who was... Zoya was right. Only he thought you were kidding yourself, too. Zoya called it transference. I call it baloney. Goodbye. You come back here. You can't just leave like... That, Dr. Zoya, is why I never heard a confession to turn into a lover's quarrel. But I understand she paid $25 an hour to rattle it off to you. I have before me your telephonic message. I haven't had time to analyze it, but at first glance I take it to mean that Edith was innocent of everything except destroying evidence. Motive, to spare her mother-in-law the anguish of knowing that her son was a suicide. I'm sorry, now that I know what her story was, that I didn't stay to hear her tell it. But that, as you would say, is not important. At least I cured her of that love delusion you were so worried about, even though it took a month to do it. Period, and a report. Oh, Sam, sacrificing yourself so self-sacrificingly rather than shatter a mother's delusion. Have some other time, huh? I'm sorry, Sam. I'll go type this up. Well, here it is, Sam. Sam! Where did he go? Sam Spade Detective Agency. It's me, sweetheart. Sam, where did you go? I'm downstairs in the bar. Well, Sam, there's so much noise on the line, I can't... I'm drowning my sorrows. Well, you don't need to shout. Oh, hold the line a minute. Yes? May I help you? Oh, no, I'm sorry. I was hoping I might find Mr. Spade in. Hello? Would you like to leave a message? Well, tell him Edith Hamilton called. Oh. Oh! Yeah, are you still on the phone? Who? Oh, pardon me. Y- yes, dear? What happened? Are you taking a bath? Nothing, nothing at all. One moment, please. Miss Hamilton, I have him on the line. He's he's downstairs in the bar. And if you'll hurry, you can just catch him, I'm sure. Oh, downstairs. Well, I will hurry. Thank you. You're welcome. Sam, are you still on the line? What's the matter with you? Nothing, nothing. Just go ahead and draw on your sorrows. But don't get loaded. Good night, Sam. Well, uh, good night, sweetheart. I'm going to take piano lessons. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Dove. Marine Tuttle is Effie. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education.
by transcription. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective, brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. Detective Agency. Me, sweetheart. Sam, where have you been? I've uh, been tasting the bitter with the sweet at Miss Wigginson's school for girls. Sort of a uh, special course in homicidal apiculture. Apiculture? Mm-hmm. There were apes involved? Effie, where is your Latin? Apis, apianus, of or pertaining to bees. Oh, oh bees, of course. It was a bee caper? It was a beekeeper caper. Oh, that's funny, Sam. That's the honey. Effie, put these words down in your little book. Honey, sweetness, hives, combs, etc. Never mention them again. What? Keep things humming, sweetheart, and I'll be right down to drone my way through my report on the queen bee caper. Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. You know, during the summer, when you spend so much of your time out of doors, it's important to pay special attention to the care of your hair. To keep it right in place, to help keep it from getting dry, use America's favorite hair tonic, Wild Root Cream Oil. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. Use it every day. If you've never tried it, ask for it in the 25-cent Get Acquainted bottle, and ask for it by name. Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. To be or not to be? Hum. Oh, hello, Sam. Hiya, Sam. How's tricks? Oh, Effie, really, this jargon, this patois. Don't you think it's about time we spoke like educated people? You know best, Sam. Every time I visit one of our institutions of learning, I find out something I didn't know. Oh, Sam, that's incredulous. Well, you just know everything. Yeah, I guess I do when you come right down to it. The bee, for instance. Bees are a genus of insects of the Hymenopterus order. What? Hymenopterus. Living in society is composed of one queen, or perfect female, a few males, or drones, and an indefinite number of undeveloped females, or neuters, which are the workers. That's me, I suppose. A neuter. Well, that's for you to say. Of course. And you know what else about the bee? What, Sam? Confidentially, it stings. (coughs) Date, uh, July 10th, 1949... To Miss Elizabeth Cowley, Miss Wigginson School for Girls, Seacliff Drive, San Francisco. I wonder about girls sometimes. And that's bad, Effie. Bad. Oh. From Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the Queen Bee Caper, dear Miss Cowley. I uh, was singing a medley of sorority drinking songs as I opened the wrought iron gate, walked up the garden path past those cast iron deer and presented myself at the big brass bell pull beside that massive panel door that stands guard between the outside world and your sheltered inmates. A little housemaid, wearing Zimity, let me in and led me to your office. I sat on your chintz-covered sofa and looked at your drapes with their thriving beehive motif and waited for you with my back half-turned to the open door. <laughs> yeah, hello, how are you? Girls, break it up. Break it up now. Go on, go on. Haven't you ever seen a man before? Run along now. You'll be late for physical ed. Go on. Miss Cowley? No, I'm not Miss Cowley. Oh, no, of course not. No, I was just hoping. You're Mr. Spade, aren't you? Laurie Thomas. I'm Miss Cowley's assistant. 
Uh, nice day, yes. Uh-huh. Uh, don't bother to move. I'll lean over you. Mm-hmm. Put this report on her desk. Mm, sure. Miss Collie will be here in just a minute. Oh, thanks. It's so warm in here. Next time, wear a mailman's uniform and a 50-year-old stoop. You'll find the temperature's exactly right. Yeah. I mean, yes, ma'am. See that you do, then. Oh, Glory. There seems to have been a misplacement of some of the hockey. Would you check on it, please? Oh, surely. Nice to meet you, Mr. Fay. <clears throat> I'm Elizabeth Cowley. You may sit down. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Spade, I'll be painfully frank with you. A thief is at large in my school. Oh? Well, uh, you probably have a good answer, but I'll ask it anyway. Why not call in the police? I have a good answer, Mr. Spade. My girls come from San Francisco's finest and wealthiest families. Mm-hmm. Miss Wigginson's has had an untarnished reputation for more than three generations. I'm sure. As headmistress, I must handle this matter with the utmost discretion. Mm-hmm. Frankly, I already know the thief. Are there any questions? Well, uh, only one timid one. Who is it? I regret to say a faculty member is to blame. Glory Thomas. She was in here a minute or two ago. Oh, really? Well, uh, by Miss Thomas, you find any of the loot stashed away in her room? Well, no. Uh, no, not exactly. I haven't recovered any of the stolen articles, but I'm sure Glory's responsible. I'm certain she's the thief. You're just sure? I, I thought perhaps you might establish definite proof against Glory. You mean you, you want me to frame her? Oh, no, Mr. Spade. I, you misunderstand me. I don't think so, Miss Collie. Oh, dear. I, I was afraid this would happen. I told Ursula. But then I... All right, I'll ask. Who's Ursula? Mr. Spade, I... I think I can trust you. It was Ursula who instructed me to call you. Ursula Cavanaugh. You know the name. The Ursula Cavanaugh inherited all the real estate, lives in Cavanaugh Towers penthouse, hasn't set foot out of there in 20 years? Yes. Mrs. Cavanaugh is our school's benefactress. She is, of course, on the board of trustees. She is, moreover, a dear personal friend. I see. Oh, yes. We were classmates together here many years ago. Ursula's quite unlike myself. Married well, though a widow now. Rather aggressive. Frankly, she wishes to have... Glory Thomas discharged, but her connection with the dismissal must not be known. Now, I don't suppose I can ask you to take the assignment now. I'm a detective, Miss Collie, not a frame-up artist. I had to have my name called up in the lobby, and then two elevator trips later, I faced her on her penthouse terrace. Ursula Cavanaugh looked like a 1910 stock company lead out of Charlie's Ant. Smoking a black Italian stogie and gripping a cane like a shillelagh. Two men were on the receiving end of her black snake whip of a tongue. A youngish guy, stockbroker type, and an individual in a morning coat who looked practically nude without a butterfly net. Oh, you're a fool and an incomplete, Jelinek. I lost all patience with you ages ago. Not only are you incompetent, but you're also dishonest. Don't mind telling you that when the board of directors meets on Thursday, I intend to instruct well, uh, them. Really, to have... Miss Cavanaugh, I, I've tried not to uh, discommode you in any way. Uh, I endeavor in every detail to fulfill my responsibilities as manager of this hotel. Don't interrupt me. Uh, Auntie, I think you've got Jelinek and me all wrong. Now, the truth the is... The truth is, we... Gerald, you're both a pair of thieving scoundrels. Now, get out, Jelinek, before your weasel face ruins my digestion. Very well, madam. I remain at your service. Ah, no back. Oh, no stunk. And as for you, my dear nephew... Uh, I think I'll toddle along, Addie. I ought to get back to the office. Control your little impulses, Gerald. I admire a little larceny in any man, but not at my expense. I was beginning to think I'd become invisible in that rarefied penthouse atmosphere. She hadn't even blinked at me while Jelinek slunk back to the lobby and Gerald toddled along to his office. The terrace was a riot of bloom. I don't know much about flowers, but she must have had them all there. Off to one side, a little man in a blue smock putted around a wooden structure on a stand. I'd become aware of bees humming amidst the flowers when she finally spoke to me. You're Tom Spade, aren't you? Sam, ma'am, the fun-loving Spade. Picked your photograph out of the other detectives. Looked like you got spunk. Why'd you come here? Curiosity. I met Glory Thomas out at Miss Wigginson's. I liked her. I wanted to see the type that would strong arm her out of a job from a safe distance. Spunky. Come over here, Mr. Spade. I want to show you something. 
Take it. Yes, ma'am. That'll do for now. Work at the other end of the garden for the time being. Yes, ma'am. Oh, pig is my gardener and beekeeper. Most taciturn individual. You know what this is? Well, I didn't, but now I can see it's a beehive. Yes, my own beehive. Fresh honey from a tea and fruit cake every afternoon. Fine old tradition. Observe this hive, young man. Honeybees are the most intelligent of all insects, surpassing even the ants. And why? <laughs> because one female controls a community of many, many thousands. I am against it. Yes, Mr. Spade. The queen bee reigns supreme. The males are drones. Quite useless. The female workers perform all necessary labor. No waste motion. No dissension. Well, some of my best friends are drones, and I just can't I stand them. I think alone. you understand me, Mr. Spade. I wish Gloria Thomas removed from San Francisco for an excellent reason. My nephew, Gerald Long, the young man who just left here, has developed absurd romantic notions about her. Yeah, so you want the romance busted up. But if you try to break it up openly, your nephew might get stubborn and even marry her. On the other hand, by framing her as a thief, you ward off the affair until you can figure out some other dirty trick. I knew you'd understand me, Mr. Spade. I admire bluntness in moderation. Well, what do you say to joining forces with me? Just one thing, Mrs. Cavanaugh. Nuts. <laughs> Next morning, I put through a call to Nickinson School for Girls. It had been my intent to talk to you, Miss Colley, to tell you I'd left my hat in your office, but somehow I found myself talking to Glory Thomas. And somehow our talk resulted in a cocktail date at the 10 o'clock Scholar Bar and Lounge. I shouldn't have come, of course. Oh, uh, exam papers to grade, no doubt? Stacks and stacks. Hmm, soft, velvet-type hands. Well, what's this on them? Stain. I teach our girls chemistry, among other things. Mm hmm. How about me taking on a night school class for the other things? You're crazy. You don't need any education. Well, I can always use a postgraduate course. <laughs> You're really crazy, Sam. I needed this. We'll make a night of it. Maybe. Gerald won't object, huh? What's that mean? Who have you been talking to? That hateful old woman? Mrs. Cavanaugh wants to put the boots to you, Glory. She called me in to frame you. I could kill her. Oh, easy now, Glory. Don't talk to me. I thought I could take it. I thought I could be patient and wait while Jerry ironed everything out. But not now, though. I hate that selfish, domineering old woman. I hate her nephew, and I hate you. Well, well that'll do to start with, honey. Now let's get down my list. I hate... Don't the... let me go. I've had all I can take for one night. Wait a minute, Glory. I was... Hey, you forgot your bag. Hey! She disappeared around the corner as I came out into the street. It was starting to rain. As I stepped off the curb, I slipped and turned my ankle. As I limped onto Montgomery Street, I saw her disappearing into one of the tall buildings on my side of the street. It could have been the Cavanaugh Towers. I step and a half into the lobby thereof a few minutes later. As I came in, Jelinek, the manager, was getting off the elevator. He swatted himself several times in the neck and then went into a door marked private. No trace of glory in the lobby. I looked in the bar. She wasn't there, but Albert Piggott, the beekeeper, was having a stinger. Who? <coughs> now I'm beginning to feel good. I feel... Hey, who's this? I know that. Why, it's Mr. Spade. Sit down, Mr. I don't have Spade. time just now, Mr. Piggott. Tell well, me... Sit down, you... sit down, oh, sit down. Oh, oh, easy, easy. I'm... Easy. I'm fired. Have you heard? I'm fired. Just a worker out of work. Turned out by the Queen Bee. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Piggott. I imagine Mrs. Cavanaugh wasn't too easy to work for. I told her to keep away from the bees when I wasn't there. Well, she's gone and disobeyed me. One of the workers must have stung her. She's got a temper, you know. Ooh, my. Must have smashed the eye with her stick. Bees were everywhere, all over. And then she fired me. Well, when was this, and why did she fire you? Oh, about, oh, just... Now, maybe half an hour ago, I knocked, and then there wasn't any answer, and then I let myself in. It was all dark. I couldn't even see her. Heard the bees, of course, but couldn't... Who was I? And I said, Mrs. Cavanaugh, you, you disobeyed me. And in this voice, this awful voice, she said, Mr. Pickett, you're fired. Get out. This awful voice in the dark. And Mr. Mr. Pickett, mind you, never before just Pickett this and Pickett that. And they, hey, where are you going? Hey! I didn't bother to stop at the desk to get myself announced. I took the passenger elevator and then operated the penthouse elevator myself. No hands. 
over to answer my ring. The door was unlocked. I went inside. Crossed through the empty apartment to the terrace. The rain had just stopped, and the sunset cut a sudden shaft. First, I heard it. The humming of swarming bees. Then I saw the overturned beehive. Then I saw Ursula Cavanaugh sprawled back in her chair, her stick and Italian stogie on the floor, while the bees clustered greedily over the fruit cake and honey set out on the table. I wondered if those most intelligent of all insects had the answer to Shakespeare's question, Oh, death, where is thy sting? The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead, socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. Remember, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil contains lanolin. It grooms the hair naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So if you want your hair to be more attractive than ever before, get the generous new 25-cent size of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's leading hair tonic, on sale at all drug and toilet goods counters. It's also available in larger economy bottles and the handy new tube. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too, and mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. And now, back to the Queen Bee Caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. Sam Spade. Oh, oh yes. You shouldn't have gone to see Mrs. Cavanaugh. I didn't make any promises, ma'am. Ursula was quite upset by your visit. Called me after you left her. Quite angry about it, Mr. Spade. Oh? She wanted to see me today. Our weekly half-day holiday, you know. But I simply couldn't face her. I'm sorry if I sound I finally managed to doze off after everyone left for the afternoon. Have you called before? No, this is the first time. I'm at Mrs. Cavanaugh's place right now. Indeed. Does Ursula wish to talk to me? She can't. I beg your pardon? It might be a good idea if you'd come over here, Miss Carley. Mrs. Cavanaugh's dead. What was that? Mrs. Cavanaugh's dead. And since you're her oldest and closest friend... Yes, Mrs. Spade. I'll come immediately. <laughs> Well, you came on over, Miss Carley, but meanwhile, nephew Gerald Long arrived, also Piggott, whom I called down at the bar, and who sobered up with remarkable rapidity on hearing the news. Gerald was shaken up by his great aunt's demise. We waited for the family doctor to arrive and watched Piggott entice the bees back into the hive. You turned up soon after and tried to soothe Gerald's nerves. The hotel manager, Jelinek, also flooded in. The doctor diagnosed cause of death as shock from formic acid. The secretion bees inject into the bloodstream with their stingers. We all stood around thinking our various thoughts as the doc voiced this verdict. Piggott was the one who voiced an epitaph. She really knew nothing about bees, you know. The queen bee was all important, she thought. But there's always a rebel in every hive. The queen bee is always deposed sooner or later. The worker bees go on and on. But the queen bee... Can't rain forever. After that, we all left and went our various ways. Poor old Pickett shouldn't have said that. And he must have been a lot drunker than he seemed. Because he was found next morning in his garden in Marin County beside his overturned beehive, 
a victim like his late employer of fatal bee stings. Think you'll get away with this? Don't threaten me, Mr. Long. I've been bullied long enough. I don't intend to lose my position here now, Mrs. Kavanaugh's gone. I've taken all I could stand from her, and I don't intend to let you walk all over me. I'll do whatever I think needs to be done, gentlemen. Well, if you're trying to insinuate I that I have I can cause you as much trouble as you cause me. Maybe more. With what I found out about you now, get out I... Get here. Go on, beat it before I break... How did you get in here, Spade? Door was open. Well, if you're here to collect any kind of bill, I want to know what services you rendered. Nothing's rendered yet. But I figured you might like to know that Aunt Ursula was murdered. Murdered? Oh, you, 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 you can't say that. Not my whole Shut up, Jelinek. You need proof to back that up, Spade. I've got it. Piggott. What? Piggott's dead. How do you know? His doctor just called me. Yeah. Well, that's why I know your aunt was murdered. I've just been out to Marin. I had quite a session with that doctor. Oh, where's your proof, man? Who'd want to kill her? Well, I... Oh, stop it. Practically everybody who knew her. Uh, really, now, I, I must protest this disrespect to the Shut members up. of the... Go on, Spade, go on. Start getting specific. Well, specifically, Piggott's doctor, because of what I suggested, examined the dead man again, found the mark of a hypodermic, plus the fact that a concentrated solution of formic acid killed Piggott. Piggott's next-door neighbor said he'd been stung as often as 10 and 12 times a day. That meant he'd build up a certain immunization to bee sting. Are you suggesting that someone murdered him with an injection of uh, commercial formic acid? I thought I'd made that fairly clear. And what would the motive be? To keep him from talking about his employer's murder. I see. Well, is that all? Yeah, except that his neighbor told me somebody answering your description called on him this afternoon. My... Oh. Well, yes, but uh, Spade, look here, I can explain Allow that. Allow me. I... Hello. Gerald, hello, darling. I'll be through in about an hour. I just got to check supplies in the chem lab, and then I'll be home and show you what a cook I am. You better be pretty I'm honest. sorry. Just a second. Here's Gerald. For you, Gerald. Your wife. Oh. I... Hold on a second, honey. Uh, Spade, look here. Now, you, you can't drag her into this thing. When did you get married? She... Yesterday afternoon. Husband and wife. No testifying, huh? <laughs> Well, I don't think I'll need your testimony. Jelinek's face fell four inches into his ascot tie as he heard himself lose exclusive hush money rights to the above information. Pausing only to enjoy a hearty laugh at his discomfiture, I went on to my next and final port of call, Miss Wigginson's School for Girls. This time, there was no girlish tittering as I entered Miss Collie. No dewy young Amazons clutching hockey sticks in their grubby little hands. For a very good reason, as you told me. My girls are dismissed for the day, Mr. Spade. Because of poor Ursula, of course. Really disrupts our routine. First our weekly half-day holiday yesterday and now today. Yeah, I'd like to talk to Miss Thomas in the uh, chemistry lab she is, I think. Very well. I'll take you to her. She knows nothing of our first meeting. I've talked to her. Oh, well, in here... Yes? Oh. What do you want? Thought we might talk. There's nothing to talk about. Well, we could talk about this hypodermic needle. Put that down. I'm using it for an experiment. Or, uh, how about a formula? HCOOH or CH202? What? That's formic acid. Mm Mm-hmm. Miss Connolly, you said yesterday was a half-day holiday. Did Miss Thomas stay here in school? Why, no. She rarely does on Wednesday afternoon. That's why Mrs. Cavanaugh had a visitor, didn't she, Glory? Did she? After you ran away from me? All right. I, I did go up to see her. I, I was so mad about, about what you told me. I intended to hand in my resignation and give her a piece of my mind, and I, I... But she was dead when I got there. Oh, Glory. No. And I... I just got panic-stricken and ran. Yeah, murder's a pretty scary thing. Murder? What do you mean, Mr. Spade? Mrs. Kavanaugh died from a hypodose of formic acid. Somebody familiar with chemistry would use that method. Then, then that could mean... Mm-hmm. The acid could be made up in this lab. The hypodermic could be this one here. I didn't kill her. I didn't. You say you were scared. You were so scared you ran all the way to City Hall and married her nephew. So you found out. Uh, Jellyneck found out first. He intended to squeal the old lady, but she was dead when he got back. He knew her will disinherited Gerald if he married without her auntie's approval while she was still alive. We married after she was dead. But, but that didn't matter. 
After I saw you, I told Jerry if he was any sort of man, he'd marry me, will or no will. He did. And yet this morning, he drove over to Marin County to see old Piggott. You think he was trying to shield me? I tell you, she was dead when I got into that room. I don't know anything about Piggott. One moment. I believe I recall that Mr. Piggott said Ursula spoke to him when she uh, discharged him. Glory, you must be mistaken about the time you entered that room. She couldn't have already been dead because... Yes, uh, she could have and was. The killer was almost caught by Piggott. She hid behind the curtain in the dark and spoke to him. Miss Cavanaugh was already dead, but... Uh... I see. Mr. Piggott thought it was Ursula's voice, but it was yours, Glory. No, it was yours, Miss Collie. What? You committed both murders. You had access to the murder weapon. You had the half-day holiday to do it in. Mr. Spader. Even at that moment, the finishing school schoolmarm had to say, Mr. Piggott. Well, I'm not sorry for it. Ursula misused her power shamefully. And now the queen bees deposed again. Oh, you're brighter than most men, Mr. Spade. You too understood the significance of Mr. Piggott's remark last night. Yeah, I could have been a little brighter a little sooner. You helped give yourself away when you asked me if I'd called you earlier yesterday afternoon. Why, Sam? How could she? Well, Kavanaugh bullied her since childhood. Then you came on the staff and your ability scared her. The queen bee being deposed and whatnot. When Kavanaugh wanted you framed, she saw a chance to get rid of both of you. She hoped her murder would look like an accident, but if it was recognized as murder, you'd be the logical suspect. Oh, you're much too clever, Mr. Spade. Let's get it over with. Yeah, let's. It's up to those drones of homicide from here on in. And a report. Sam? Yes, Evie? How come Gerald went out to see Mr. Piggott? Well, Gerald didn't care about the will, but he didn't want to boot a fortune out the window either. Glory hadn't told him she'd seen his aunt, so he called on Piggott to find out when Piggott last saw Auntie alive. Go type that up. I am completely well, and when you return, we shall Indian wrestle. Certainly, Sam. And now, listen to this. Shopping notes. Tonight or tomorrow, get a family-sized bottle or handy tube of Wild Root Cream Oil, America. By transcription. Sam Spade Detective Agency. Finitum est. Mr. Who? Finitum est. It is finished. Latin. Oh. Sam? What's left of me, sweetheart? Well, where are you? What happened? Who did it? Here. Everything. And what? What? Now, I ask you first. Sam. Now you're making sense. Well, did that Mr. Mortuous get in touch with you? The Mortuous Neil Neasy Bonham. Oh, Sam, stop it. Second year Latin, F. Speak well of the dead. You mean he's dead? If you have tears, prepare to shed them now. This one ends up worse than Rigoletto. Have your extra handkerchief ready, get some organ music on the radio, and I'll be down to dictate my report on the tears of night caper. <laughs> Nasho Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. You know, just a little Wild Root Cream Oil in your hair can mean a world of improvement in your general appearance. Just try it and see. See how Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose dandruff. Yes, you'll be glad to discover that just a few drops of Wild Root Cream Oil make a big difference. So if you've never tried it before, get the 25-cent Get Acquainted size and ask for it by name. Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. Many, many things, Eph. But it's also kind of... raw. Oh, Sam. 
In time, Effie, my wounds will heal. Oh, I'll bet that 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 Mamie Gagan had something to do with it. I could tell when she came in here that she was going the to be... mortuous Neil Nisi Bonham. Huh? Latin. Speak well of the dead, remember? Oh, she... Uh, one thing at a time, sweetheart. Let's get this over with. I want to find a doctor. Oh, you're so brave, Sam. Carrying on in the face of... Of your face. Sure, sure, sure. You won't be satisfied until you just... Just die for your profession. Yeah, well, if I do, Neil Nizzy Bonham, Effie. Neil Nizzy Bonham. That means? Latin means, uh, you have bony knees. Oh. Uh, date July 24, 1949 to Miss Daphne Arlington from Samuel Spade, San Francisco, license number 137596. Subject, the tears of night. Dear Daphne, I hope this will clear up a few things in your mind. I hope it'll let you know how you got where you are and what happened to put you there. It all has an illogical beginning, middle, and end. At three, yesterday afternoon, my loyal secretary and confidant, Miss Effie Perrine, a doll, who has been rehearsing a cockney play for television, flung open my office door and said, Miss Mamie Gagan to see Mr. Spade. I said, cooey. Miss Mamie Gagan looked everything the name implied from her lately blonded hair to her genuine alligator shoes. I might add, she weighed in at approximately 160 and was in very good condition. You, Spade. I am he. Uh, sit down, please. Ah. Don't you believe me? I hate gum shoes. They all stink. Uh, something in your background. Perhaps as a girl. I'm just assuming that you were one. Oh, uh, gum shoes are nosy. They talk too much. That's why I don't like them. Here. For me? Who else, stupid? Oh, and it says, uh, pay to the order of Samuel Spade, $100, signed Manny Gagan, co-signed Johnny McCall. All right, is it good? You wise guy or something? Sure it's good. I'm the treasurer. Get your hat. In this weather? We gonna go see Johnny. McCall? Yeah. Uh, why are we gonna see Johnny? Johnny wants you should do something for him. Oh, uh, what does Johnny want I should do for him? Come on, Spade, what's the matter with you? He'll tell you. I just love to hear you talk, Mame. That's all. All this gas ain't getting us nowhere. The boss is waiting. Gumshoes talk too much. Yes, ma'am. Well, maybe we do, but ours is a lonely profession. Mamie led me to a large Cadillac parked in a no-parking zone. She tore the ticket up and ate it. We got in and charged through traffic towards Burlingame. About a half a mile this side of the main highway, we turned off to the left... Pretty soon, we were winding up a private road to a fine old colonial mansion. There were three private patrolmen were guarding the entrance. They all needed shaves. They kind of nodded as we went up to the front door. Naturally enough, it didn't open, but a peep shutter did. Yeah. It's me, Feely. This is the private peeper the boss wants to see open up. Okay. How are you feeling, Mr. Feely? Screw, screw. All kinds of folks around. This way, Spade. Mamie, I got your peeper. Okay. Inside. Here he is, Johnny, flat feet and all. His name's Spade. I I know, I know. I picked him myself. Go on, beat it. I hate gum shoes. Boom. (laughs) Ah, don't mind, Mamie. She's kind of bitter. Yes, she is. We did a lousy job on our hair last time. It's all streaky. Yeah, I noticed. Go on, sit down. Nice place, Johnny. Nice place. How's the gross? Oh, ain't as good as running beer, but... Them days are gone. I do all right. Two crap tables, two faro games, a little roulette in the living room, but I have to be careful. Yeah, uh, you seem to have plenty of muscle outside to keep you safe and comfy. Ah, punks, all of them. But the best I can get nowadays, no good gunsels left. Guess they all got married and settled down or something. All right, Johnny, it's cool and it's nice out here. You make a living and I got a check for $100. Why? Well, in my line, I don't generally have much use for a private eye. I don't generally like them. Neither does Mamie. But I can use one right now. Ever see this before? No? Well, it's a little bit of necklace. Necklace case. Called mm-hmm. the Tears of Night or something. Yeah? And it's worth quite a chunk of Gitas. These four diamonds are good stuff. Dame named Daphne Arlington left it here a week ago when she went in for a plunge at the roulette table. She left it for a standby till she raised the cash. Kind of screwy, Dame. You know, a widow with a lot of money... Boyfriend named Lenny Epich. He mm-hmm. paints or something. Mm-hmm. Well, she sent me a check today for the five G she lost, and I just want you to take this thing back to her. That all? Yeah, that's all. I got my dough, she gets a necklace. You're a licensed bonded investigator, insured, it's safe with you. I couldn't trust any of my punks with it, and I don't like to be seen in public, so you just take it back. It's all very simple. Uh huh. Now that you've told me how simple it is, suppose you give me the unexpurgated sequel. 
Did her uh, check bounce? Yep. All right. You want a drink? There wasn't any check, Sam. She called me a couple of hours ago and said if I didn't have this thing back to her by tonight, she'd call a load of cops and come out here and tear the joint apart. Not such a screwy dame at that. You're stuck. You telling me. If she comes with cop, I'm closed for season. I'm getting old. Oh, you're not old, John. Ah, Feely was running the table, and I didn't know he'd taken this thing for security until we counted it up. Stupid Feely. Uh, I should have pushed his mush in or something. Letting a dame like that make us a setup. Well, maybe you'll do better next time. Oh, ain't gonna be no next time, Spade. Well, here's her address. Here's the ice. Just take it to her, and I'll chalk it up to experience. You better get yourself a new boy at that table, Johnny. You telling me. You telling me. Well, uh, Bye. Lenny, I thought you'd never get here. The performance begins at 8.30, and you know how the traffic is, and if we're going to have a bite to eat... You aren't, Lenny. Where's Lenny? I don't know, Miss Arlena. I'm supposed to deliver some jewelry. Jewelry? That would be mortuous. 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 Uh, yes, but I, uh... What are you looking at? Your throat. Really? Well, really, Mr... Mr. Mr... Spade, Sam Spade. Well, really, Mr. Spade... I'm only waiting for Lenny to get here so we can make the first curtain a streetcar. And we're going to be late if he doesn't get here. You can understand that, Mr. Spade. You're going to be a little early. Streetcar doesn't open until Monday. And then already, and he hasn't shown up. Well, good night, Mr. Spade. Hey! The white ermine cape you were wearing and the black strapless thing needed a touch. But you had it. A diamond necklace. In fact, the tears of night, the same one I had in my pocket, Daphne, was hanging around your lovely neck. I rebuzzed your buzzer and knocked on your door for quite a while until it was quite evident that you were not going to open up. Under the hallway light, I snapped open the necklace case. Mortuous, you had said. And mortuous was what it said stamped inside the case. A gloomy word with a gloomy address. The White Hotel on Turk Street. Hannibal Mortuous, at your service, sir. If ever a man had the look of death, it was this one who had its name. He was older than old, cadaverous, and in his skull-like head, his eyes were white. He was wearing a flannel nightshirt. Uh, you, you find me a bit indisposed, Mr. Spain. The clerk at the desk said it was a matter of jewelry. Therefore, Hannibal Mortuous is at your service. Now then, sir, what is so urgent? I uh, came to ask you about a diamond necklace. I found your name stamped on the inside here. Uh, House of Mortuous, most respected name in diamonds, as well as all the lapidary arts, most respected. Fine jewels in the name Mortuous is synonymous the world over. I am the last of four sons. Uh, well, but what continues, Mr. Spade? Well, I just want you to take a look at this. Mm-hmm. And how do you come in possession of the tears of night, sir? Well, a, a man named Johnny McCall, who runs a gambling club, hired me to deliver it to a lady named Daphne Arlington. She lost it at the roulette table. She left it there until she could raise the cash. <laughs> deplorable, deplorable conduct on her part. Daphne Arlington, uh, most indiscreet young lady, to be sure, to be sure. I recall my interview with her when her late husband, uh, Sidney, ordered this necklace. A lovely body, propelled by a ridiculous mind. For shame, such conduct, a gambling house, the tears of night, a pawn. Well, this is real, then? That isn't phony? Mr. Spade, I am a gemologist. The house of mortuaries, of course, it's real. Take a good look. When an artist creates a dazzling thing of beauty such as this, would he be so unlikely as to forget the time, the patience, the agony of his creation? See how each stone is carefully mounted to capture every single pinpoint of light. Mm -hmm. An incomparable masterpiece. Mm -hmm. An incredible money. How much money? Well, on the wholesale market, about 10000 Arlington? He paid twenty five, but he had it, as I say. Incomparable. Yeah. Yeah, well, I uh, saw another one just like it tonight. Ridiculous. 
The finest workman at best could only create a crude resemblance. This kind of work demands an artist, sir, an artist. Uh, but tell me, uh, Latin in anguis elba, huh? Oh, my second year in Latin escapes me. Uh, sneak in the glass. Uh, something wrong? Uh, something wrong, yeah. You you were concerned for the safety of this piece. I have a small safe in my room. You may have the key if you care. I'll take it with me. Thank you, Mr. Mortuous. My pleasure, Mr. Spain. Omnia mortuus bonum vocat est. All speak well of mortuous, of panza. Good evening. <laughs> In the dismal lobby of the White Hotel, I asked the night clerk for some wrapping paper and 20 cents worth of stamps. It was a hunch, plus the fact that outside in the street, I spotted two of Johnny McCall's unshaved gorillas. They were looking up at the front of the building. Mr. Mortuous must have switched off his light or something because their eyes suddenly dropped and I saw them separate, one on each side of the front door. With shoulders carefully hunched, I stepped out into the lonesome night. I hoped they would think I was carrying my 38, which I was not. They didn't. Here's the people, Candy. You want to ask him for a match? Candy's nearsighted. That's too bad. This him, Ernest? You got a match, Spade? Yeah, that's a close. Candy asked if you got a match. He's a dummy, Candy. He don't answer. Got a match, Spade? What did I tell you? He's a dummy. He don't look like no dummy. Take your hands off. He's a dummy, all right. Ain't you, Spade? See, he's a dummy, Candy. I told him about you being nearsighted and he wouldn't answer. He don't talk. Go on, smart boy. Tell him, tell Candy how sorry you are about him being nearsighted. I told you he was a dummy, Candy. All private eyes like you. Candy asked you a question. He wants to know if all private eyes is like you. I don't like no dummy. We ask questions and he ain't told us nothing. That makes him a dummy. Maybe we find out something if we went through his pockets. Yeah, even a dummy's got pockets. Ain't that right, dummy? Hold him, Candy. <laughs> All right, boys. You played the scene real good, and I'll see what I can do for you. Hey, you talk. Yeah. Make him talk again, Candy. Yeah. Make him talk bigger, Candy. <clears throat> bigger. Bigger. Uh, he, he talks real nice, but he don't say much. Think maybe he's tough, Ernest? Yeah, maybe. Hold him up. <laughs> See? He ain't so tough. No, I wasn't. I didn't feel like talking on that quiet little street where the only noise was my face pounding on their fists. I didn't have the necklace anymore, but they had to find out the hard way. The hard way for me. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Now, here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead, socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. Remember, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil contains lanolin. It grooms the hair naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So, if you want your hair to be more attractive than ever before, get the generous new 25-cent size of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's leading hair tonic, on sale at all drug and toilet goods counters. It's also available in larger economy bottles and the handy new tube. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too, and mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. And now, back to the Tears of Night caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. I remember trying to wake up a couple of times. I was dreaming that we were driving along in a giant Cadillac. 
Big Mamie was sitting on my lap. She was eating a diamond necklace and spitting out cherry pits, which Mr. Mortuous grabbed, looked at through his jeweler's glass, and then tossed into a roulette wheel. Then we had a blowout, and the whole car vanished with everybody screaming, De Mortuous, De Mortuous. Somewhere around 7 in the a.m., I began to get a feeling, several feelings, and all of them hurt. I had been dumped in the grass in a fairly nice neighborhood. In your neighborhood, as a matter of fact, Daphne. And five minutes later, I was climbing the steps to your apartment. I thought maybe you'd let me wash my face in your bathroom. Also, you seemed the logical one to question, since nothing else made sense. You were sitting in a large chair. The drapes were drawn, the door was slightly open, and only the light from the hall seeped in. You had the phone on your lap. The receiver was off. My guess was right. You were looking at nothing. <laughs> oh. oh, Mr. Spade. It's you. You came back. You've been in an accident. I don't think you'll need this. Oh, yeah. Well, then, Mr. Spade. Well, then, I... I suppose you've met some people tonight who know a great deal about me. A gambler, a jeweler. Did they tell you about Lenny Eppich? No. He's really a dear, Mr. Spade. Qu- quite the nicest boy I've met since Sidney was killed in that horrible automobile accident. Sidney and I had so many things together. I, I do think he enjoyed being alive with me, I mean. I cried when Sidney was killed. I really did. I cried. I'm sorry, Jeanette. I didn't know what to do. I cried. That was three years ago, but Mr. now I have Lenny. He's really a dear. I do think that Lenny will be a very prominent artist someday. I, I do. Lenny asked me to marry him tonight. He did? I, I've been very lonely since Sidney died. Lenny isn't interested in, in my money. Lenny has some m- money of his own. What? What? I didn't My tongue adjusted to my mouth. Did, did that ever happen to you, Mr. Spade? Sometimes, yes. But, but, perhaps I should see a correctionist. I'm glad you came by again. I didn't know you were a detective the first time. Who told you? Why, Mr. McCall. He... I really can't understand, Money. Please, Miss I I know it must be strange to you. Look at them. But but some people live for it. Some people die for it. Please, look, please, Miss Arling. We can't get anything done. Look. Look. They, They do look so funny. Very funny. I've seen them count money. So much money. And I I, I really believe that that is all I live live for. Look, look. You were pointing at something across the darkened room. Took me ten seconds to find the light switch. Stretched out on your floor, they looked funny, all right. Candy and Ernest. Both of them as dead as you can get. Hello, darling. Darling, darling, uh, I've been waiting all night. I knew you'd telephone and give me your answer. I knew you'd marry me. Your name, uh, Lenny Eppich? Well, well, yes, but I was expecting... My name's uh, Spade. I'm a private investigator. I'm calling from her apartment. Daphne's? Now, listen. There's been a couple of murders here. Murders? She's had quite a jolt. She's going to need you and all the help she can get to bring her out of it. I've called homicide, and it might be pretty rough for her. I'll be right over. Bring a doctor. Right. And a lawyer. I'm afraid she'll need one of those, too. I've got a good one. We'll be there. Thanks, Mr. Spade. He showed up about the same time the crew from homicide got there. If the answer is a good guy... He talked fast and urgently, as did the doctor and lawyer he brought with him, and through their combined efforts, you were removed not to police headquarters, but to the private hospital in which you are now a patient. 
It was obvious from the powder test that you could not have fired the forty-five which ended the lives of Candy and Ernest. It was also obvious that the murders had been done elsewhere. But who had done them remained to be seen. Ah, Spade, I've been expecting you. Come in, come in, sir. I've been amusing myself with your chessboard. Sit down, sit down. Oh, you had a hectic night. Yeah, your boys were pretty rough. Uh, Candy and Ernest, uh, two men of another world, Mr. Spade, not our world. Allow me to apologize for that action. I uh, want more than an apology, Mr. Mortuous. And if that's my gun and it looks like it, it's got a hair trigger. And if you'll pardon me for saying so, your hands are a little shaky. I underestimated you, Spade. Such an ingenious method of protecting the tears of night. Why, sir, by the simple expedient of placing it in an envelope and mailing it to yourself from my hotel lobby, you hired as guardians the entire United States Postal Service, not to mention the armed forces. Thanks. What happens now? We wait for the mail. Just tell me where I'm wrong, will you, Mr. Morseless? McCall wanted me to get caught with it. He didn't know it was real. You'd made a phony for him. Only you found out it wasn't phony when I came to your place. Then there was a double cross. If you can bear my vanity, I have invented a new word. Triple cross. It has a ring to it, hmm? Oh. Including Mamie, hmm? Mamie and her friends have been very valuable to me, but I must necessarily exclude them from sharing the profits. Mamie knocked off candy in earnest? Abetted by the last of the house of mortuous. You planted them in Daphne's place. Mamie and I. A crude touch, I thought, but it had a purpose. I happen to know that Mrs. Arlington has for a long time been on the verge of a nervous breakdown. With two cadavers in her living room, she was very unlikely to discuss a bogus necklace with the police. And I doubt very much if she knew she was wearing the original or the imitation. Flighty girl. That's the lousiest thing the House of Mortuous ever did. She walked in and found them. If you had merely returned the real necklace to her, it would have been simple to make an exchange, and none of this would have been necessary. But then, I know, I know. You just sit here and wait for the mail. We wait for the mail. What about your other playmate? I'm afraid I'll be sought for a murder in two or three this night. Mamie. She got it too? Yes. Where are the police going to find her? Oh, in my hotel room, which I departed hastily once the room clerk had informed me of your ingenious method for protecting the necklace. I shot her there. You were cheap. Cheap, sir? I don't understand. A $10,000 necklace? It's not quite a king's ransom, you know. The tears of night are worth five times that. I'm afraid I misinformed you as to their value. I didn't want you to become suspicious. You are a really horrible, terrifying old man. I suppose you think you'll get away with it. I don't intend to get away with it. An old man, yes, but I intend to spend my remaining years... They'll pick you up before you get to the airport. I doubt that. I shall turn the tears of night into cash. And with a well-laden purse, I shall guarantee to elude the police over half the world. In two years, perhaps three, they'll get me. But I'll have spent the money and... We have a visitor. Caution, Spade, I do shoot well. I'm sorry, tell them to go away. I'll be right beside you. All right, open it. Look, one side, Spade, I got a gun. Obvious. Me, me. I thought I'd find you here waiting for the mail. You dirty... You didn't do such a good job on me. Caution, my dear, I have a gun, too. Everybody but me. I can last long enough to let you have it. Not so good, my dear. Your loss of blood has made you groggy. You're still good enough to... Well, well. It was almost a photo finish. He kind of leaned into the wall with a pained and amazed look on his face, and he seemed to try to walk. Uh, Mr. Spade. Mr. Spade, sir, I believe I've been shot. I'll need a little assistance. I could... I can't seem to hold my feet, sir. I can't seem to hold my feet. This was an awkward plan, Vesta. The mortuous Neil Nisi Bonham's paid. Or if your second year Latin escapes your memory, speak well the day. Period and a report. Oh, 
All those people. Four and all. And that poor girl, Daphne. How she must have felt when she saw it. Oh, Sam. Yeah, it was pretty bad. You, you poor darling. Well, it's about time. Now you go right home. In fact, I'm going to take you home. Yeah? Then what? Well, You are a registered nurse, maybe? Hmm? Well, I... Go type that up. I am completely well, and when you return, we shall Indian wrestle. Certainly, Sam. And now, listen to this. Shopping note. Tonight or tomorrow, get a family-sized bottle or handy tube of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's favorite hair tonic. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. Sam Spade Detective Agency? Me, sweetheart. Oh, Sam, I'm so glad you called. Why? I don't know, I always am. Was it a good case, Sam? I didn't like it. Where are you? Mark, San Mateo. Oh, was somebody killed? Yes. And, well, do you know who did it? Yep. That's good. No, that's bad. Bad? Believe it or not, F, I wish I didn't know who killed who. I don't understand. Oh, Sam, you sound so downhearted. Well, I'm sorry. I'll try to loosen up. Stay where you are, sweetheart. I'll be right down to dictate my report on the champion caper. <laughs> Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Before bringing you tonight's mystery, I'm going to take 28 seconds to tell you something that isn't a mystery. It's no mystery why so many millions of men, women, and children have well-groomed hair these days when America's favorite hair tonic, Wild Root Cream Oil, costs so little. Just 25 cents will buy you a get-acquainted bottle and show you how neatly and naturally Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair, how it relieves annoying dryness and removes loose, ugly dandruff. Get Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. And now, with Howard Dove starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. Oh, oh, Sam. I read the afternoon paper. I don't understand it either. Stop that. Really, after all this time, you'd think I'd be acclimatized to all kinds of human storms. I've got my pencil all ready. I'm myself again. I'm ready, Sam. Sam? Date? Date, August 7th, 1949. To... To whom, Sam? Jack Manelli. To Detective Lieutenant Manelli. Homicide <coughs> detail, Sam Mateo Police. From Samuel Spade, license number 127596. Subject? Are you listening, Sam? Subject, the champion caper. Dear Manelli. You were there for the end of it, and I was there for the start of it, which is in the reception office of Elliot Champion's brokerage house in San Mateo, and where I first met Mildred Champion. Remember that old salve, how a woman in love is always beautiful? When I went in, I had no idea she was in love and no idea she was beautiful. Not because she had lately been crying, but her sallow face without makeup, framed in a wisp of blonde hair, wasn't flattered by the shapeless black dress, cotton stockings, and low-heeled shoes she was wearing. Certainly not the going idea of beauty. Nor did her conversation reveal anything to indicate love. Oh, yes. May I help you? Uh, Mr. Elliot Champion? My name's Spade. Spade. Uh, S-P-A-D-E? You don't have to write it. He's expecting me. Your business, Mr. Spade? Private. I have to have a little more than that, I'm afraid. Oh, is this hot here? Uh, Mr. Champion can't stand fresh air. Obvious. Uh, That's what makes it so warm in here. 
I'm sorry. Yeah, it is hot. Uh, just flip the switch and tell him I'm here. Well, what is it, Mildred? I, I was just going out. Uh, Mr. Spade is here. Uh, says you're expecting him. B but I don't find him listed in your appointment book. Don't be an idiot. Send him in. Send him in. You may go in now, Mr. Spade. He always liked that? He's nice today. Sorry, Mildred. That's your name, isn't it? Uh, his office is the first on the right. Don't bother. I'll find it. Thank you. I'll, I'll just go to lunch. Mr. Champion? Well, don't just stand there. Come in and shut the door. What I have to discuss with you is private. I don't want that snoopy niece of mine listening to our conversation. She's out to lunch now. But does she listen in often? All the time. Why? She didn't know who I was. <laughs> I outsmarted her there. I called you from the drugstore on the corner. I don't want anyone to know who you are, why you're here. Oh, now, where did I put that light, huh? Behind the inkwell. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm a dangerous man to play games with. Joseph's found that out once, and if he keeps this business up, he's going to find it out again. No games? You're dangerous. Say, are you mocking me, Spade? Just wondering what you're talking about. I just told you, you got ears, haven't you? Joe Josephs is back in town, and I'm not going to fool around with him. Mildred told me you were nice today. Oh, she did, did she? Well, Mildred talks too much. That's what's the matter with her. She talks too much. And you'd fire her, only she's your niece, and you'd have to pay somebody else three times what you pay her to take everything she has to take. Get out of my office! Oh, no, no. Wait a minute, Spade. Oh, it's just hot, I guess. I... Uh, who has turned on the heat? It's Joe Josephs. He was released from San Quentin this week. And I've been receiving telephone calls from him telling me to beware and to watch out and a lot of other nonsense. What was he doing at San Quentin? Two to five on an embezzling count. He's an ungrateful scoundrel, that's what he is. Why, I took him into my office as a junior executive, and six months later... He got tired of the $20 a week you were probably paying him and decided to dip into the bin. Only he did a bad job, got caught, you testified against him, now he's out and he's sore, and he's threatening you. Uh, and every time you yell cop around this town, there's always some snoopy reporter hanging around the sergeant's desk. Ain't that the truth. Listen, Spade, I've got a half a million dollars tied up in this business, and I don't want anybody thinking I might get knocked over by some loony with a grudge. And uh, that's why you didn't tell the police? Don't you believe me? It'll do for now. You'll think of something better. Now, see here, impertinence is 25 one thing... Twenty-five a day and... No. That'll be forty-five a day in expenses. I want you to find Joe Josephs and bring him to me. Nuisance warrant? More than that. I've got enough stuff in that desk drawer to send him back to Quentin if I have to. Oh, what kind of stuff? Left over from his trial. It'll be grand larceny this time, and they don't stop at five years for that kind of thing. You withheld evidence? I withheld... Uh, the... Get out! My back was only eight feet from the window, and it came through from the other building across the court. The silencer either ruined the marksman's uh, aim, or he was just a bad shot, because out of six tries, he didn't connect with a thing but the desk lamp and a wastebasket. By that time, Champion and I were both on the floor. Champion on top of me. I kicked out to get loose, and he kicked me back. I gave that up and twisted around for my gun. Across the court, a window was open, about six inches, one corner of which was full of a dark-sleeved hand and a gun arm. I fired at it from what is known as number six position. It's him! It's him! Get him, Spade! Get him, Spade! What do you think I hired you for? I didn't bother to answer him. I went through the window, onto the fire escape, and over to the next building. I did more. I went in that building, which was apparently vacant, down the stairs, and started out the back entrance. Hey! Hey! Oh, sorry. Curly, watch it. Watch it, will you? What's the big hurry? Hey, he came out of this building. Which way did he go? Who came out of what building? This building, right here, just a second ago. Here? Yeah. Who? Him. Who? The guy who just ran down what these stairs. What'd he look like? Well, he was... Well, what'd he look like? I say, what'd he look like? Huh? Who? What? Where? Thanks. Don't mention it, Curly, any time. <laughs> I couldn't tell her what he looked like because I hadn't seen him. After a careful search of the building, which revealed nothing, I decided my suspect had eluded me for good, and I returned to the office of Elliot Champion. He was sitting on his green leather chair, wearing an expression to match. Uh, missed him, huh, Spade? What does Joseph's look like? Oh, I've got a couple of snapshots here somewhere. I... Oh, yes, here. Let's have a look. I was later to regret having those snapshots in my person. They showed a tall, thin-faced, haunted-looking guy. An old-looking 28, good face, shock of black hair and dark eyes. I've seen plenty of cons and Bezla type, and he wouldn't have been cast in the part in my movie. 
There was nothing about him to indicate that he'd embezzle $2,000 or use a silencer on a gun. I dug two thirty-eight slugs out of Champion's wall and went down to the street. Spade! Oh, Spade! He was a heavy set man in a dirty white Panama hat and seersucker suit that didn't fit him around the middle. Hey, just a minute, Spade, just a minute. He crawled out of a black sedan, jammed a cigar in his mouth, and began sweating. He needed a shave. He'd always need a shave. Hot afternoon, ain't it? Yes, sir, sure is hot. Sure is a hot afternoon. Here, here, my card. Lemuel Drigger, Confidential Investigations. Guess I should ought to have some new ones printed up, huh? I guess you should ought to, Lem, and change the name while you're at it. Huh? Didn't the commissioner bounce you nine years ago for rolling a pack before you did the booking? Oh, let bygones be bygones, Spade. I'm in business for myself now. How's business, Lem? Punk. Try another racket, Lem. Uh, uh, Spade, you been in to see old man champion, maybe? Maybe. Uh, I was just going to go in to see him myself when I spot you pull up. I recognize you from the pictures in the paper last week. I, I figure maybe you and me ought to talk. Uh, what did you figure you and me maybe ought to talk about, Lem? Oh, you make it tough for a guy, Spade. We're, we're in the same business, you know. What'd you go see him about? So long, Lem. Hey, wait a minute. I'm an old gumboot, huh? A fat old gumboot who couldn't get a trick as a housekeeper or tail in a punk, is that it? Okay, Spade, okay. You're full of vinegar now, but just you keep my card. You'll want to see Lem Drigger before it's all tied up. You'll want to see me. Screw, Lem. But he was right. I did want to see him because when I got down to the Chronicle office and looked up a morgue on the Joe Joseph's trial, the first thing that jumped out at me was the name Lemuel Drigger. Lemuel Drigger, private detective who had been employed when Mr. Champion had become suspicious of Joseph's account irregularities, and who, together with Mr. Champion, caught Joseph's red-handed, and who willingly offered his testimony the same at the trial which convicted Joe Joseph to San Quentin for five years. The file also gave the name of Joseph's lawyer, a man named Anthony Spezer. The phone book showed an apartment address on Geary. That's you, Aggie? Hold on a minute. I was just trying to get dinner over before you showed up, but I guess I'm late tonight. Who are you? Mr. Spezer? That's right. My name's Spade. I'm a private investigator. I'm trying to locate a former client of yours, a man named Joseph. Come in, come in. I was expecting Aggie, but come in. Thanks. I always fix my own dinner, poached egg and half and half. Ulcers. Name Spade? Yeah. Want an egg? Uh, no thanks. I'm on duty. Mind if I finish? It's up to you. Uh, uh, who's your client, Spade? Elliot Champion. Joe Josephs is back in town, and he's been making telephone threats and throwing 38s around. 38s, huh? Mm-hmm. You know where he is? Joe was a nice kid, but a calendar job. Born with one war going on, a depression on deck, and another war in the hole. Makes a difference. The calendar got him. Everything was against him at the trial, too. I couldn't do anything. He thought I let him down and told me so. He got real sore when they read the book at him. Threatened champion and that private dick, uh... uh Lem Drigger. Drigger and everybody else. Said he was railroaded. You were his attorney? I know, I know, but he didn't have a chance in a million of beating that rap. He thought I ratted when I took the guilty plea in court's mercy, all for a lousy two grand. Well, he's done his time, and he's out now. He hasn't gotten in touch with you? Nope. No threats? Nope. Have a right to you from prison? Nope. Any idea where he'd be in time? Nope. Is it possible he has a mother? Nope. Then I guess I leave you to Aggie. We play records. Aggie used to be a violinist. Well, it's up to her. Uh, Spade. Uh, Spade. Yeah? If you find Joe, tell him where I live. I'd like to see him. Why? I don't know. Maybe I just want to see what five years in the pen does to a kid like that. Yeah. I'll bet you do. Yeah? Is this you, Mr. Spade? Who's this? This is Mildred Champion. Uh, remember me in my uncle's office? I remember. Mr. Spade, you're looking for Joe, aren't you? Well, I know you are. You don't have to answer me. I think I can help you find him. I must talk to you right away before something terrible happens. Please come out to the house before something terrible happens. It's right in the corner. I got out to the house as fast as I could, but not before something terrible had happened. 
spade. Spade! The front door was open and all the lights were on, and Elliot Champion was lying at the foot of the stairs in the front hall, holding his lapel as if it would get away from him. Spade, Spade, don't touch me. Don't try to move me. It's in my lung somewhere, and I... I never thought... It didn't look like there'd be much use, but I beat it up the stairs to the hall phone to call emergency ambulance. Hello? Hello? What the... Uh, this is Joe. So you hired a private eye to look me up, huh? <laughs> well, he'll never find me, but I'll find you. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Champion, I'll be seeing you real soon. I uh, didn't get it then, but I got it a second later. I grabbed for the banister, missed, and hit the top railing. A pair of hands held me up long enough to go through my pockets and then let me go, and that's the last thing I remember. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Now, here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead, socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. Remember, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil contains lanolin. It grooms the hair naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So if you want your hair to be more attractive than ever before, get the generous new 25-cent size of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's leading hair tonic, on sale at all drug and toilet goods counters. It's also available in larger economy bottles and the handy new tube. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too, and mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. And now, back to the champion caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. The neighbors had complained of gunshots, which was fortunate for me. I still might have been lying at the bottom of those stairs in Champion's House, Lieutenant, if you hadn't walked in, applied first aid, asked me my name, and listened to my story. You considered the threatening phone call after my client's death as a cover-up and promptly sent out a general alarm on Joe Josephs. I took an aspirin and a taxi cab for home. Halfway uptown, I discovered the pictures of Joe Josephs were missing from my wallet. And that is why I was absent at the medical examiner's inquest this morning. Instead of going home, I went out to San Mateo, jimmied the lock of Champion's office, and violated city ordinance number 352B. My dead client's desk revealed one important item. An income tax voucher dated August 17, 1944, noting him delinquent. Then I found another important item. Same for 1943. His secretary's desk was even more interesting. What I found there led me to, one, call her home. Result, no answer. And two, to revisit Attorney Spezer. I found him poaching another egg. All right, all right, I'm here. It's late, Aggie. What's the idea? Unless it's Beethoven, I don't... Oh, Spade. Aggie, have a show? Yeah, left early. Has to work tomorrow. Oh, it's too bad. What's with you? Still looking for Joe? Yep. Any leads? Wish I could help you, Spade. Elliot Champion was shot and killed in his home tonight. No. Is that all you have to say? Joe do it? Maybe. What? You uh, don't seem scared for a mouthpiece Joe didn't like. If you mean should I be next? No. I'm not scared, Speed. The kid should realize by this time I liked him and did all I could. You've been here all evening? Aggie. Could you prove it? Yep. You may have to. Did you know Mildred Champion was married to Joe Josephs? Yeah. How'd you know? It's a secret. I found this marriage license in a desk drawer. Nosy, eh? Huh? I found something else. Champion didn't pay his income taxes all the time. Well, a lot of people are like that, Spade. Me, Len I... Len Trigger testified against Joe at the trial. So did Champion. Mildred worked in the office, but she didn't testify. Wife can't testify against husband. 
Real good story, Spade. But uh, what about Joe? Champion had something on Lem Drager, and Drager had something on Champion. Joe's in between. You tell me, huh? Huh? All right, I'll tell you. It's all about a green kid hired into a brokerage firm to be framed on a phony embezzling charge to cover up a tax delinquency. You want to finish it? I can't. I don't know it. You've got ideas, though. Yeah. Yeah, Spade, you're right. I've got ideas. And all of them make me sick inside. That kid stood there and told me he was innocent. He said it a million times if he said it once. And he told me he thought Champion was short with the income tax people. And if Champion was short, he could phony up a book and get a worn-out private detective like Drigger to testify that there'd been a fraud and Joe takes the rap. If that's what happened, they did it pretty good. Did you uh, mention anything like this at the trial? Surmise is not admissible. There was no way to investigate it and no way to prove it. Joe was a nice kid, Spade, and he told a good story. I've been fooled a lot of times. What do you think? I haven't met him yet. All right, he's done his five years. He came out. Now they want him for killing the man who sent him up. His whole life's gone. And for what? Spade, I hope you don't find him. I hope nobody ever finds him. But we did find Joe Joseph's lieutenant. He was right under our noses all the time. When I called you, you told me to come on down to the morgue at the county hospital. We both stood and looked at Joe Joseph's. Ah, uh, it's a funny thing, Sam. We had an alarm out for an hour on this guy. We've been looking all over for him, and he turns up right here. Only he's dead. He's been dead since last night, about seven. Seven? Same time Champion was killed. TB. Just got the whole story. Had it awful bad in prison on a sick ward his last two years. Mm -hmm. Wanted out awful bad. When his time was up last week, he made him release him. But he wound up here, died in the hospital. He looks awful young to be a con and all. I don't know, Sam. He's just a kid, isn't he? Up until then, you had some kind of case against Joe Josephs. But when the medical examiner reported that my client had been shot with a thirty-two, the rest of it began to fall into place. Lem Trigger's office was a dirty room over a shoe repair shop on Mission Street. The glass on the door hadn't been washed in five years, and neither did anything else. You could hardly tell where the office left off, and Lem began. Oh, hello, Spade. I've been waiting for you. I thought you'd get over for some talk talk. What made you think that, Lem? Well, you're here, ain't you? All right, let's make talk talk. Did the silencer ruin your gun? Huh? Come on, come on. I want it all. Hey, you're... You phoned tonight after Champion was killed. You've been phoning him right along, saying it was Joe. No, just a minute, Spade. We're in the same racket. And you shot at him with a silencer on your 38th this afternoon to make it look real good. You can't prove anything. I didn't kill him. One slug out of your gun will match that up. Every cop carries a 38. You were a cop once. Now, Spade, you got this all you wrong. You because you thought he'd called you in for protection. He I... called you in once on another job. Listen, I know what you're thinking, and but business I... was so bad, you had to drum it up, didn't you? Joseph was released from prison and it was unnatural, only it didn't work. Champion called me instead and you tried to shake me down. Well, I only thought we could kind of work together, you know, make it a good thing. And I, I told you once you should try another racket. But you didn't take my advice. Now you're going to have to. What do you mean? Because your license will be revoked pretty quick. You got into a lot of trouble about two minutes from now. I did? I was right here. What are you trying I to... I swore out a complaint on you for assault and battery. Hey, wait a minute. I ain't done nothing to you. Champion's dead, and yes, I tell you... Yes, you did, that... Lamb. You tried to strike me, and I had to defend myself. I... And I did make out a complaint, Lieutenant. I phoned your office, and two of your men were on the way out to pick him up when I heard a footstep outside the door. I knew who was there and what she was there for, and I did the only thing I could think of at the moment. And it was lucky I did it. Her own thirty-two was in her hand when she came in the door. She looked at me and Lem's smoking gun in my hand, looked at him stretched out on the floor, then she looked back at me, and the gun fell from her hand, and she began to cry. <gasps> Hello, Mildred. I wanted to do it. I came here to do it. I know. Why? Why did you... To stop you. Why? My bullets went into the ceiling. He's just knocked out. No. No, he ought to be dead. Dead. Uh-uh, uh-uh. No. No, no. Not anymore, Mildred. You tricked me. You knew I was coming here. And you know he should die. You know it. That won't bring Joe back. How many real tramps have you met in your life, Mr. Spade? <sighs> Lots. And some who just thought they were. Well, you met the genuine product yesterday. My uncle, for example. 
He stole money from himself and made it look like Joe did it. I know about that. And this one? Why didn't you let me kill him, too? Why? Oh, easy, easy. <laughs> when I, I went over to see him in the hospital the first time, I knew he was dying. He had that look in his eyes. Helpless. And he knew what they'd done to him. And he couldn't do anything about it. But you figured that you could. So you killed your uncle when you found out Joe died. And you came here to kill them. They killed him. They killed Joe when they sent him to prison. Five years I waited for him to get out of that awful place. I waited to hold him in my arms and tell him it was all over. Five years I waited to help him forget his hate and my hate. Five years I loved him so much every day. Oh, easy. And then he came back to me the way he did. Those pictures were all I had left of him after five years of waiting, loving him. Now he's dead. What can you or I or anybody do about what they've done to him? Look at me, Mr. Spade. Go ahead, look at me. I'm not what you'd call beautiful. I'm not even very pretty. Nobody would ever look at me twice. Well, Joe looked at me. And he loved me. Now he's dead. And I'm dead inside. I'm dead inside, and I'll be glad when I'm dead outside. <laughs> Period and a report. Oh, Sam, they were so unhappy. Yeah. I had a notation that I won't be around for the coroner's inquest. But Sam, you can't do This that. report, when duly notarized, should be admissible as testimony. I want to get out of town for a few days. Sour ragged. And now, listen to this. Later this evening, if you happen to stroll down to the corner for cigarettes or ice cream, why not also pick up some Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic? Your whole family will like the way Wild Root Cream Oil grooms the hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose dandruff. And ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. Well, here it is, Sam. Didn't make any mistakes. Of course you didn't. Are you really serious about getting out of town for a few days? I am. The world's too much with you, huh, Sam? Effie. Well, I know it's poetry, Sam, but it seems kind of appropriate right now. I don't care if she did kill those two men. I feel sorry for her. What's that got to do with poetry? Well, it's kind of poetic justice. Oh. Why did she dress the way she did in, in, in that black dress and low heels? A uh, form of penance, I guess. Of mourning, of absence of her missing lover. Yeah, no, no, no. Look, look, you'll have to type it all over if you keep that up. But, Sam, it's all so beautiful and tragic. Yeah. And you watched it all happen with such understanding. I'm so proud of you. Hmm. Oh, Sam. Come on now, come on. Dry up and go home. Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. <laughs> The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. Tonight's Adventure with Sam Spade was written for radio by E. Jack Newman. Music was directed by Lud Gluskin, with score composed by Rene and Pierre Garrigan. Join us again next Sunday when author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another Adventure with Sam Spade. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. 
start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie, keeping all the gals away. Hiya, Charlie. Get wild road right away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective, brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. Sam Spade, Detective Agency. Me, sweetheart, Shaman Spade. Shaman, not Sam? Uh, An old Indian word signifying wise man. And it's true, Effie. I'm a lot wiser man than I was yesterday at this time. Oh, really, Sam? Really, little papoose. Put on some war paint, a few turkey feathers, and your best open-toed moccasins. Where are we going, Sam? Why, to uh, Ted's TV for a rousing repast of ground corn and dried buffalo meat. Oh, well... Uh, Don't quibble, Effie. Get the wigwam ready, sharpen my tomahawk, and lay out my herringbone breech clout. I'll be right in to dictate the Chicago... Uh, the, uh, Ah, the Indian caper. From the land of the sky blue water, they brought a captive maid, the Red Wing. Oh, here I am, running skunk. Running what? Skunk. He was a famous Indian detective. You sure you're not making this up? Oh, no, Sam. Oh, no. He was a scourge of Indian lawbreakers. A scourge, huh? Even so, you have two minutes to think of a better name. Oh. Rippling string? Not virile enough. Um, crunching muscles? <clears throat> too, uh, too virile. What is that stuff you've been getting me, anyway? To, uh, Lieutenant L.J. Myron, San Francisco homicide detail. Better take it back. Copy to Chief Black Cloud of Santee, Dakota Indian Reservation. Oh, murder. Attention, federal Indian agent from Samuel Spade, San Francisco, license number 137596. Uh, subject, the Shargagagag, uh, the, uh, Shargona, uh, call it for now, the Indian caper, and quiet to you. I was sitting in my office, quiet. I was sitting in my office, doing absolutely nothing when something interrupted me. First, it was a buckskin smell, then the soft tread of moccasins, followed by the sound of a rattle. His uh, beaded clothes were wrapped in a rich-looking embroidered blanket, and his multicolored headdress reached to the floor. His face looked like the model for the Indian head nickel. How? Who? My name, Chief Black Cloud. How do you do, Chief? You, Shaman Spade. Uh, Sam. Shaman, Indian word for wise man, prophet, seer. Sam. Newspapers say you good scout. (laughs) Well, they exaggerate, so, you know. Chief need to hire good scout for job. Well, uh, shall we talk? You come for powwow in Chief's Council Lodge. Now, where's that? St. Mark Hotel, fourth floor. I see. You have reservation. <laughs> <clears throat> well. You ride with Black Cloud. He have iron pony on street made by great Indian chief, Pontiac. And he actually had a council lodge at the St. Mark, fourth floor... Outside the door of his room, two braves were standing, arms folded. One of them was the first Indian I'd ever seen with hair on his chest. We entered the room. Indian file, of course. The chief had apparently brought in his own decorator. The walls were covered with hanging animal skins. A weathered canopy of thatch hid the ceiling, and on the floor, genuine hand-woven rugs. No expense had been spared. In one corner of this room stood a full-size teepee. Two squaws shuffled out of it. What else? The young one glided forward and handed the chief a long Indian pipe. Shaman Spade, this fairest Indian maid of all. Only person in world important to Black Cloud. Name, Little White Lilac. Uh, how do you do, Little White Lilac? It's nice to have you here. She wise, educated girl. Graduate Smith College. Nice. All squaws out. Oh. All squaws out. Squaws no good at powwow. Well, you know best, Chief. Now we powwow. Uh, you get paid well. Chief Black Cloud owned 130 oil wells near Tulsa. Oh, Oklahoma, huh? Not Oklahoma. Indian land. Union mean nothing. 
Union temporary thing. I see. Indian here long before white man. This is true. And Indian will be here long after white man. All right, Chief. All right. Chief Black Cloud come to San Francisco village five days ago for powwow with big engineer. Uh, anybody I know? His name, Clarence Hobart, engineer for Arundel and Amaskeek Consolidated Engineering Company. Uh-huh. Fine Indian name. We have powwow four days. Hobart disappear. And uh, you want me to find him, is that it? Chief tired of San Francisco. Want finish powwow. Get back to Santee Dakota Reservation. Clarence Hobart. Okay, I'll see what I can find out. Good. One moment, Shaman paid. Sam. Chief have something you guard for a few days. What's this? This beaded wampum belt. Ancient relic of Nipmuc tribe. Nipmuc. Here in Tipi Semak. Too many light-fingered chambermaids and bellboys. You uh, want me to hold on to this for you? Yes. Wampum of great sentimental value. Woven by ancient wise man, Tani Luka. Tani Luka. Tells interesting story in history of tribe. Mm, Guard it well. Haven't lost the wampum yet. Uh, is that all, then? One more thing. We smoke pipe of friendship. Right. I smoke. Here. Yeah. Now, you smoke. To, uh, to friendship. <coughs> Now I know what happens if the bag of Lucky Strike doesn't buy. When I left Chief Black Cloud's fourth floor lodge, there was only one brave standing outside the door. The hairy chested Indian was probably taking five. The wampum belt was about three feet long, made up of hundreds upon hundreds of little colored beads. They were woven into a picture pattern, very pretty. The interesting story undoubtedly could have been translated instantly and told fascinatingly by Red Rider. But then he has a smart horse. I put the wampum belt in my pocket and headed for the offices of the Arundel and Amistee Consolidated Engineering Company. Fine old Indian names. I inquired about Clarence Hobart. They referred me to his partner, Anderson Watts. (laughs) Hobart disappeared? (laughs) Absurd. Why, you couldn't lose him if you wanted to. He's as wide as a barn door. Yeah, well, uh, Chief Black Cloud seems to think he is missing. Well, now, look here. Are you going to take an Indian's opinion over mine? I might. Well, just because he doesn't show up for an appointment doesn't mean he's disappeared. Why, one day when we were on a cantilever project in New Orleans... (laughs) Uh, Yeah, some other time. If uh, Hobart hasn't disappeared, where would he be? Anywhere in the world. The man's unpredictable. Brilliant engineer, but moody. Every now and then he goes off alone to scheme up some fantastic thing like... Maybe cutting off the Gulf Stream and turning Cuba into an iceberg. I like it. But he always comes back. Disappear? <laughs> oh, no, no. Not Hobart. Yeah, well, uh, can you give me his home address? <laughs> well, here you are. Try it if you like. But I'm sure he's not there. I called this morning and nobody answered. Honest engine. <laughs> I left this utterly charming man and started for the address he had written down. I was taking the shortcut through the alley on Sutton Street when I heard the rattle of beads and a naked brown arm of considerable size reached out of the murk. I grabbed for it, but he slipped out of my grasp and sped swiftly and silently up the dark alley into the fog, leaving me with a handful of Max Factor No. 8 Iroquois makeup. I continued to Hobart's house without further incident. Found it just off Chinatown. Uh, Mr. Hobart? Oh... I thought you might be somebody else. Who else? Hey, take your foot out of the door. Uh, just let's talk a minute, shall we? You want me to call the police? I don't think you will, Mr. Hobart. All right, out with it. What's on your mind? My name is Sam Spade. I'm a private detective. There's an Indian named Chief Black Cloud who's worried about you. I'm old enough to worry about myself. Now, stop bothering me. Go away. Look, I'm going to tell the chief where you are, you know, because that's what I was hired to do. You'll... Ah, uh, yeah, you're right. Confidentially, I've been on a two-day drunk. You know how it is. Who, me? Ah, tell him to phone me tomorrow. I'll talk to him. Oh, hi, Sam. Hi, Sam. Hi, Sam. Well, what are you doing here today? This is your day off. I just wanted to show you something. Happy, first do me a favor and put this wampum belt in the safe, will you? A wampum belt? Genuine Indian art. Oh, it's beautiful. Tell us a story. You know what? Yeah. It'll go beautifully with... Oh, oh Sam, I forgot. Hmm? There's a girl waiting in your office. Well, good. Well, Sam, don't you want me to show you? And there was indeed a girl in my office. It was little white lilac, Chief Black Cloud's fairest Indian maid of all. Only a uh, heap big change had taken place. She still had the Indian color, 
But gone was the headband, gone the buckskin dress, gone the squatting squaw, the St. Mark Tapey. Little white lilac stood revealed in the thin disguise of a modern white woman's cocktail dress, complete with pale face 20 carat perfume. It was a transformation worthy of a high-priced medicine man. But more surprises were to come. Hello. How? I've been waiting for you. Yeah, well, a big brave just returned from hunting party. You can drop the teepee talk. I'm civilized. Well, okay. What's on your civilized mind? Chief Black Cloud gave you a wampum belt. I want you to give it to me so I can destroy it. Uh-huh. Well, I, uh, I gave my word to keep it, and I accepted the promise of money for its protection. Now, you wouldn't want me to be an Indian gift... <laughs> I mean, violate my ethics, would you? Sam, if I must tell you, Chief Black Cloud is insane. Not if he keeps you around. Must we have these juvenile references to my personal beauty? Juvenile? <clears throat> well, sorry. Uh, you are Indian, aren't you? Of course. I am a Nipmuc. Nipmuc. That wampum belt is secret to undreamed of wealth. Mm-hmm. Greater than the fortunes of the ten richest families of this country. Wow. Chief Black Cloud is wealthy from oil, but that belt make him more powerful than the Bank of America. You mean he could take my car back? You think this is a joke, don't you? Well, I love the way you tell it, though. He's going to use it to destroy modern American civilization. Oh? To pay the white man back for what he did to the Indian. I see. He wants to start a giant Indian revolution. And you want to destroy the wampum to save all this, hmm? Exactly. And now you'll give it to me, won't you? Uh Uh-uh. What happens in the next chapter? Sam, you have to believe me. Why? Why do you think the chief is here conferring with an engineer? He wants to get at that wealth. Hobart's going to make him wealthy? Now, really, little white lilac, isn't this all a little white lie? Sam, if I take you to Hobart and he confirms what I've said, will you believe me? I might. Come on. She took me by the hand and she led me out of the office and up and down several streets until we arrived at a frowsy-looking brownstone. We entered, still holding hands, and came to rest in an apartment that looked just recently occupied. I guess that's what it looked like, because you couldn't tell much. It was being lit by either one ten-watt frosted bulb or by fireflies. This is the place. Yeah, a little uh, dim in here, uh, wouldn't you say? I like dim places. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, Where's Clarence? I'll get him in a minute. First, Sam. Uh, yes, Violet. You've been so nice. I have? I want to find some way to thank you. I'll wait while you like it. I can start by kissing you. Mm. Please. Mm. Say. The kiss was great. In fact, it blew the top of my head off. After this, there was a free fireworks display, followed closely by a giant roar that sounded like Niagara Falls with a cold. It was a short feature, followed by a long period of dark black silence. When the curtain came up again, I was lying in an alleyway. I was stiff and cold, my head throbbed with pain, my brain was a jumble, my suit was torn and dirty, my patience was at an end, and my anger with little white lilac knew no bounds. I uh, went out of the office and changed clothes and get a drink. The phone was already ringing when I opened the door. <sighs> Sam Spade. This is Chief Black Cloud talking from St. Mark TP. Yeah. What's on your mind, Chief? Ten minutes ago, bellboy delivered to Chief Black Cloud box. Inside box is scalp of engineer Clarence Hobart. I hung up the phone, fell into my chair, snapped on the lights, and fell out of it again. My office had been massacred. The place had been ransacked thoroughly and looked like the morning after a Comanche smoker. And you guessed it, my safe had been drilled open. The ancient and valuable Nipmuc wampum belt was gone. At this point, I decided what Chief Black Cloud needed was a detective. Now, here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. Remember, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil contains lanolin. It grooms the hair naturally relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So if you want your hair to be more attractive than ever before, get the generous new 25-cent size of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's leading hair tonic, on sale at all drug and toilet goods counters. It's also available in larger economy bottles and the handy new tube. Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too. 
And mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. And now, back to the Chicagogog, Manchagogog, Shabonagon, Gamog Caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. I found Chief Blackbird sitting cross-legged and looking disconsolately down into a small cardboard box. Both squaws, including little white lilac, were on one side of the room grinding corn. Lilac looked through me as if I didn't exist. I sat down next to the chief, looked into the box, and recoiled. It was a real, no imitation, 20th century scalp, and the red hair was certainly Hobart's. Scalp comes with note. Let me see. Note written in Algonquin dialect. I translate Honor Chief Black Cloud, return to Santee Dakota Reservation and die proper death fitting to old man. Here you will meet violence unto death, even as this man did. What's the point across? Uh, look, Chief, it isn't that I'm scared, which I am, but I just decided to pull out of this caper. What? I've heard some things about you that don't sound too good. You hear what? That you want to start an Indian revolution to settle an old score with a white man. Who tell you this? The fairest of them all, little white lilac. She tell you... I'd never talk to you. She not only told me all that, but she... Quiet! Speak. When did little white lilac tell you these things? She came to my office today. That's a lie. I never left this hotel. We will see. Kalanuka. You... Yes, Chief Black Cloud. Did little white lilac leave hotel today? Little white lilac with me already. Why, you... Uh, never out of sight. Enough. Go away. Kalanuka speak with tongue of truth. Little white lilac, I have grown from baby. She also speak with tongue of truth. Somebody lie. Now, look, Chief, I know what I'm talking about. You... Chief does not need help of double-tongued man. Return wampum belt to me. I pay you. All right, I'll... Uh... Well? Uh, Chief. Chief, heard enough lies. Return wampum now, wait belt. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I got a small but biting bit of truth to relate. Somebody stole the wampum belt. Wampum belt gone? Somebody broke into my office, drilled the safe, and took it. You stole it. was stolen from me. Return Wampum or you not live until sundown. I'll return it if I can find it. Then you can pay me off and we'll call it even. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Now, here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead, socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. Remember, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil contains lanolin. It grooms the hair naturally relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So if you want your hair to be more attractive than ever before, get the generous new 25-cent size of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's leading hair tonic, on sale at all drug and toilet goods counters. It's also available in larger economy bottles and the handy new tube. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too, and mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men... And women and children, too. And now, back to tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. I walked outside muttering frightful white man's imprecations. Cutting through the hotel parking lot, I suddenly noticed the chief's iron pony made by Pontiac. There was a leather bag on the seat, sort of an Indian overnight case, and sticking out of it was a blood-stained tomahawk. This was of decided interest to me, and so were the rest of its contents. Somebody had a giant engineering project afoot because there were order receipts for such things as two LSTs, four underwater hydraulic drills, a diving bell, a dredging barge, and a steam derry. Well, back again, eh, Spade? Yeah, back again, Mr. Wash. Still looking for the missing Clarence O'Bard? Not anymore. Well, I knew you'd realize the futility of it. I found him. And I trust you found him in good health. Old Hobart the bug on health. <laughs> Why, once when we were in Cleveland... <laughs> I uh, think he's dead. It was the Ohio River Bridge, John. Dead. 
Did you say Hobart dead? Scout, anyway. Uh, Mr. Watts, what was Hobart working on with the chief? Well, I don't know exactly. Uh... Well, let's go look at his desk file and see if we can find out. In a bottom drawer under a lot of miscellaneous papers, we found a large manila envelope marked Black Cloud. It contained some topographical surveys of an area containing a lake. On the back of one of the surveys was written in fine print a series of 37 letters that looked like a whole group of Indian words strung together or a code or just doodling. It started out Chagaga something or other. I left Mr. Watts sitting in his office with tears in his eyes, a new role for him, and made my weary way back to my place of business. Effie was standing in the middle of the office with a shocked look on her face. Sam, look at this office. How did it get like this? Oh, my files and everything. Come on, I'll help you pick things up. And again, by the way, uh, what are you doing here? It's still your day off. Well, when you were here last time, I wanted to show you something, but you were so anxious to get to that girl. All right, I'm here, and I'll look. What is it? A new suede coat. How do you like it? The color is rust. Well, I suppose... <laughs> Effie. What? What's that you're wearing as a belt? Oh, now, don't be mad, Sam. I, I just had to. It went so well with the coat, and when I saw it, Chief I couldn't... Chief Black Cloud's wampum belt. You didn't put it in the safe. Well, now, Give Sam, it to don't me. don't be mad. Give it Please. to me. Right. Wait right here. I'll be gone for half an hour, and then I'll come back and take you out to the best dinner in town. Oh, I should go home and change first. I had taken only four steps down the hall and somebody hit me from behind. I rolled and he went with me. We fought a quick, quiet, and decisive fight. And at the end of it, I held him in an arm lock and let him back into my office. Come on. What happened, Sam? It's that early. I had an unexpected caller. Come in with me and take notes. Now, sit there. All right, all right. Now, who are you and what's on your mind? I'm nobody and I got nothing on my mind. <laughs> Spring, you're one of the braves that guarded the chief. Uh, yeah. And you're a phony Indian, lousy makeup, and Indians don't have hair in their chest. All right. My name's Grit Hammond. I'm a cowpoke. I should have stayed where I belong, out on the range. Well, why didn't you? Oh, uh, once I said I'd do anything for that gal, now I wish I hadn't. She brought me here. Why? Oh, oh. What did it have something to do with buried treasure? She was going to give me a big cut. Where is it buried? I don't know. She was going to tell me. I took Hammond around to homicide and left him in their safekeeping. While there, I got the latest flash. They had found Clarence Hobart dead and Les Scalp down by the waterfront. There were no clues except the blow on the back of the head and lipstick on his mouth, which was enough for me, having been through the same course myself. Then I proceeded to St. Mark, fourth floor. Little white lilac met me at the door. You can't see the chief. Why not? He's asleep. One side. When the chief sees what I've got, he'll wake up screaming his wampum. You have it? And with that, she pounced. I pushed her off, but she came back and got a hold of one end of the wampum and tried to pull it away from me with disastrous results. The wampum came apart, and in a second was nothing but hundreds of beads rolling different directions all over the place. In fact, it was no more. Oh! What happened in Chief Council Lodge? Chief cannot sleep. Well, I brought back your wampum, but now it's all over the floor. Wampum belt destroyed? Yes, it's destroyed, you stupid old man. You talk to Chief? Yes, stupid. You had the world in your hand. You didn't know it. You wanted it all for yourself, to tear down the earth. It could have been used to live. What are you saying? To live the way I'm supposed to live. Now nobody will have it, not even you or that fat engineer who wanted it. Little white lilac, shut mouth. I've been shutting my mouth all my life. You're a stupid, ignorant, disgusting old man. You'd be better off... His big hands were around her throat. He stood there, anger and betrayal in his eyes. Then his hands dropped and he turned away with tears streaming down his face. It was then that the fair Indian maid went for him with a knife. And that was my cue to step in with a pale face weapon. And now, listen to this. Not only Dad, but the whole family goes for America's favorite hair tonic, Wild Root Cream Oil. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, removes loose, ugly dandruff. Get a family size bottle or handy tube today. And ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. Little white Lila. Yeah, well, I don't usually hit women, but uh, don't feel too badly, Chief. She uh, helped kill Clarence Hobart. Now, Chief, believe anything. Yeah, uh, Chief, why did you want an engineer? Design woven in wampum describes location of hidden Nipmuc treasure. 
Many, many years ago, Nipmuc tribe live in Valley of the Berkshires. Discover only gold vein in East. Mine gold and keep for decoration. Kennebec Indians want gold. Start out on warpath. Nipmuc Indians bury gold. Move village. Divert stream into valley. Make lake. Gold there today, underwater. Where is it? That secret chief keep locked in head. Chief, once had evil plan for gold. Now you forget. Make pilgrimage back to ancient ancestral camp and die. Send me bill. Chief, leave village of San Francisco for good. Period and of power. Oh, say, it's sad. It is, it is. Vanishing race. Mm -hmm. Just think, the days of the Colt and the Winchester are gone forever. But the day of the Remington is still with us. Go to it and tight this up. Tomahawk get in Chief Black Cloud's bag. A little white lilac planted it there. If anything happened to the chief, she, as the only other living nip muck, would inherit the wampum. Well, she could have gotten the money by just waiting. Oh, shut up. Sam, hmm? you notice anything about the report? Yeah. Hey, you got the name of the caper right. The uh, Chagaga... Oh, what is it? Chagagagog, Manchagagog, among the Mog caper. You've been going out with an elocution teacher. Oh, Sam. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tolman and Gil Dowd. Musical direction by Lud Gluskin with score composed by Rene and Pierre Garrigan. Join us again next Sunday when author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keeping all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get Wild Root right away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Sam Spade Detective Agency. Me. Oh, Sam, it's you. On the filter and in the flesh. Any messages, phone calls, letters, uh, telegrams? Uh... Just the usual. A bill from the landlord and a notice from the telephone company. Well, dispose of them as usual. You sound awfully chipper. Have you been on a case, Sam? Did you make some money? Yes, I've been on a case. No, I did not make any money. Oh, your client got murdered before he could pay you? Wrong again. My client was a woman. She did not get murdered and she could pay me. Huh? And she did. But you just said she didn't. True, Effie, true. Things are not what they seem. Well, I'm a little confused. You just said that... And she... I meant every oh. word of it. Stop registering bewilderment. <gasps> all, all is paradox. So, uh, sharpen your pencils, straighten your seams, get out your notebook, and prepare to be confounded by the contradictions I shall contradictate to you during my report on the honest thief caper. I'm not looking over for the oh. clover. Oh, oh. Sam, hello. Look alert, girl. We have many things to do. Up, up. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, you say the strangest things on the phone. Don't I, I? <laughs> I don't believe I quite understood what it was all about. A natural misunderstanding. I didn't understand it myself. Uh, uh, date? Uh, uh, two. Uh, Sergeant Frank Nilgus, uh, robbery detail, San Francisco police. From uh, Samuel Spade, license number 1776. Uh, you're fast today. Subject, uh, Ben Comiskey. Who? Ben Comiskey. C-O-M-I-S-K-I. Sam! 
I went to Elbert High School with a boy named Ben Comiskey. Is he the same one? Very likely, yeah. Oh, Sam, tell me, did he turn out bad? Is he good? Did he get married? Down, uh, Effie. Well, Sam, I knew yeah. this boy. I want to know. This is one mystery you're not going to solve by reading the last chapter first. Dear Frank... It was one of those days. The sky was black and it looked like rain, but when I put on my trench coat, the sun came out. At breakfast, it looked like I'd ordered fried eggs and I wound up with pancakes. Also, I discovered I was wearing one blue sock and one black one. After that, I gave a cab driver a five instead of a one and let him ride off with a change. And there was one other thing. Sam, bank just called. You're overdrawn. They're nuts, Ev. I made a deposit two days ago. I checked, Sam. You didn't. You're nuts, too. I made out the slip myself, and I... Oh. Give me, Sam. I'll take it right down. Uh, yeah, better do that, Angel. Yes, excuse me. Oh, oh. Can I help you, miss? Is, is this, this Mr. Spade? Uh, come right in, miss. Sit down. Uh, uh, miss Perrine, you may go and uh, uh, do that. Hmm? Uh, instruct them that if such a mistake occurs again, I shall take my account elsewhere. Yes, sir. Now, uh, uh, please sit down, Miss... Uh... My name's Louise Miller, Mr. Spade. I, I want to hire you. How much will it cost? Well, now, Miss Miller, let's uh, let's talk about it a little I first. I haven't much time, Mr. Spade. I have to be at the office in a half an hour, and I have to cross town. You see, I... Well, Mama thinks I should forget all about him, but I can't, and I... Well, here, I've, I've got $95. Will you please do something to... Just something. Oh, come on now, come on. I'm sorry. That's all right. Now, uh, who is he? What's he done? And why does Mama want you to forget him? Ben. Ben Comiskey. He's hmm. my... We were going to be married pretty soon. We, we even picked out our furniture. We... No, no, no. It's all right now. Go on. What's he done? Well, they say he held up a store two nights ago that... They picked him up on the street today. He's he's in jail. Mm-hmm. Well, if he's innocent, I'm sure they'll find that out. He, he won't even see me, Mr. Spade. He, he won't see anyone. He, Ben's good and kind and sweet, and I love him, and I want to marry him, and I want you to find out why, he, what it's all about. Look, Miss Miller, I, I think you should be in the office of a good lawyer. I'm sure... He doesn't that... want a lawyer. He, he won't even see the public defender. He, he doesn't want anything. Oh, please... Please, Mr. Spade, I, I just want to die if Ben went to prison. I, I just want to die. <laughs> I'm uh, no sentimentalist, but faith is a thing we're a little short on these days, so we came to terms. It was a grade she could pay me after the job was done if there was any job to do. She left for work, and I phoned you, Sergeant Milgus, and found out Ben Comiskey had already been arraigned and was being held in the city jail. When I dropped in 20 minutes later, you walked me back to his cell. What's it all about, Sam? I don't know. Just looking into it. Hey, he won't tell you anything. No? Kept his trap shut all the time he's been here. As far as we've been able to find out, no previous record, no background. Well, maybe it isn't so bad for him at that, huh? First degree, Sam. Liquor store proprietor, man named Potter over on Army Street, identified him in the morning lineup. Mm-hmm. Just like that. Picked him out of a dozen guys we hauled in. Then what? Yeah, we send a couple of the boys out to Comiskey's room and find all the dough in the dresser drawer, 900 quants. Mm-hmm. Yeah, now what? Take it easy, Comiskey. This is Sam Spade. He wants to talk to you. Ben Comiskey was tall, dark complexioned, about 29 or 30 years old. His hair was black, straight, and closely cropped. His features were regular, not good, not bad. I've seen plenty of hold-up men and gun-toters in my day, and he wouldn't have been cast in the part in my movie. I didn't know what I expected to say to him or what I expected him to say to me, but I didn't expect what I got. What are you trying to do? Get out of here. I just got here, Ben. Well, you can just leave. Hasn't a citizen got any rights, even in jail? Well, they start to lose them when they use a gun to make a living. I don't want any lectures. I haven't got any to hand out. I'm a private detective. A friend of yours hired me. She thinks you're a pretty nice guy. Louise, huh? Why won't you see her? She's nuts. She ought to have a head felt. What's she worrying about anyway? I'd say she was worrying mostly about you. And I'd say it's the sick kind of worry that gets into a girl when she loves somebody. She shouldn't. She's nuts. You said that. Did you uh, rob that store? The guy who runs it says I did. I suppose I did. Why? For laughs. 
The complaint says you make 65 bucks a week in an architect's office. You can eat on that. Look, Spade, go back and tell her this. I didn't want furniture at $10 a month for the next 80 months. I didn't want a car the same way. I didn't want her working and me working and getting nothing but wrinkles. Tell her I got caught and to go and find a guy who can pay the way. Is that all? That's enough. You're charged with arms robbery in the first degree. That means not less than five years. I know it. Shut up about it. Why'd you turn down a lawyer? Hadn't you heard, Spade? They're holding up my indictment. I'm a prize pigeon. They think maybe I knocked over ten or twelve other places in town. Did you? Sure, sure. But don't worry about me. And tell Louise not to worry about me. I've got a million bucks salted away, and I'm going to buy my way out through the DA's office. Okay. Have it your way, Ben. But an hour later, I found myself strolling around Ben Comiskey's old neighborhood. A man named Gabrini, who owned a grocery store, remembered him and liked him. A woman in a bakery shop told me how he'd gone into the Army as a private and been discharged a first lieutenant. A phone call to a Mr. Henderson, a light architect, revealed that Ben Comiskey was in line for a raise and promotion. All in all, I was getting a composite picture that didn't look quite right. I decided to try his mother's place. It was on Lombard Avenue, a street that starts on the waterfront. According to the penciled note above the doorbell, it was out of order. The slot on the mailbox read, Mrs. Anastasia Comiskey. Yes. What is it, please? Uh, you're Mrs. Comiskey? I'm busy now. I fix lunch for my son. He come back from Cincinnati. Please. Oh, uh, well, uh, Mrs. Comiskey, I'm here to talk to you about Ben. He's your son, too, isn't he? Yes. Ben is my son. Well, uh, I'm trying to help him, Mrs. Comiskey. Why? He has no money. I have no money. A friend of his, Louise Miller, hired me. Oh, Louise, she's a foolish girl. Very foolish. Her heart should not be with Ben. I think he's a very lucky man to be loved by somebody like that. If not for her, Ben would not be in jail, in trouble. Oh, you don't want to help my son. She don't want to help him. she will leave him alone if she wants to help. Ben is bad. Not good like my son, James. James is always good. Times he's away, he sends me money. From what I hear, Ben's always been pretty good, too. Always one good son, one bad son. What's going on, Mom? Oh. Who's this? He's come to ask questions about Ben. Huh? I'm Jim Comiskey, Ben's brother. Oh, my... Uh, you run on in, Mom. I'll talk to this gentleman. All right. Get out of here. Look, I'm just trying... If you've got any questions to ask about Ben, go to the police. They can give you all the answers. And stop bothering my mother. She's been through enough in the last two days. If I catch you around her again, I'll break you in half. The man who slammed the door in my face had the same angry look and the same angry glare of Ben Comiskey. The angry Comiskey brothers definitely wanted nothing that looked remotely like help, it seemed to this casual observer. I went back to my office to wait for six o'clock. That's when I intended to call my client, report my opinions, and drop the case. But at 5.30, she called me. Mr. Spate? Yeah? This is Louise Miller. Oh, yes. I was just going to call you. I'm afraid I haven't been able to do much. It looks like... I know, Mr. Spate. I, I, I just telephoned downtown. Ben pleaded... Ben pleaded guilty at the indictment this afternoon. He, he's going to be sentenced tomorrow. And that, to all appearances, Sergeant Milgus, was the crop. But two hours later, and for the second time in one day, I found myself doing what I didn't think I'd be doing, walking around a dull, gray, two-story apartment house on Adams Place. My ex-client's address, to be exact... I was wondering what a lonely, distraught girl would be thinking the night before her boyfriend was shipped away to prison. I found out. I got a whiff of it as I walked down the hall. It was coming out from under her door. I had to use my shoulder. The room was acrid and stinging with gas fumes. And Louise Miller was stretched out on the floor in a six-foot kitchen. When I picked her up and carried her out, I wasn't sure whether she was dead or not. Ten seconds after I'd found Louise Miller, I'd called a police ambulance, and in a matter of minutes, an intern was working over her with a pull motor. 
Her breathing became regular and her pulse picked up, but she was still unconscious. Lieutenant Kelsey of Homicide showed up and said it was obviously a suicide attempt, which is his kind of ingenious thinking. I thought not. If she were going to commit suicide, she wouldn't have called first to pull me off the caper. She'd have let an insignificant detail like that take care of itself. No, she was too strong to pity herself and too sure of what her intuition told her to believe even Ben Comiskey's confession. With that kind of faith, I owed it to her to poke around the ashes while they were still hot. I did, and turned up a live coal in a faded blue shirt and wrinkled brown pants. Bert Singleby, by name and by vocation, manager of the Greystone Arms Apartments. What kind of a girl was she? Oh, nice, clean, sincere. The kind mothers always want their sons to marry. Boy, I wish I'd listen to mine. Yeah, uh, did you know her boyfriend, Ben Comiskey? Oh, salt on earth. What? I can't understand him pulling a hold up like that. But then, you know, the war did strange things to yes, me. Yes, I guess it yeah. did. Oh, I almost stayed in Europe and married myself up to a French doll myself. Yeah, I bet. Uh, but Sandra, that's my wife. She'd have hunted me down in Tibet. It was easier to come home facing music. Yeah, well, about Louise, uh, you know any reason why she might commit suicide? Frankly, no. No. I met her in the hallway tonight, and she said, Mr. Singleby, she said, Ben didn't do that hold up because I'm pretty sure I know who did. Well, I figure she's just keeping up a front, but if she did really know that Ben didn't do it, she wouldn't have turned on the gas now, would she? No, she wouldn't. Uh, did she tell you who she thought did it? No, that's all she said. She's a quiet girl. Not like my wife. Now, Sam. Yeah, uh, did you see or hear anything that might have been suspicious or unusual around her apartment tonight? Now, look, I don't want to go around breaking up any homes or spreading dirty gossip around. Unless it involves Sandra's relative. Uh, Mr. Singleby, I promise you, sir, that I'll treat any information you give me confidentially as long as I can. All right. Now, listen. Sandra told me not to say anything because, it's you know, it's a lot easier to rent a suicide apartment than a murder apartment. You know that? Confidentially, I'm a humanitarian. But if you tell anybody I said this, I'll well, I'll just lie about it. I'll never tell a soul. Well, we were out of butter, see, so I had to run down to the store. Well, when I passed the mailboxes outside, a guy is standing there. He asked me which apartment Lewis Mil- or Louise Miller was in, and I said 12B. What did he look like? Oh, we'll see now. A 5'10", medium build, tan suit, dark shirt, sort of a wide brim hat. Kind of flashy. Mm-hmm. Wore three or four big rings. Diamonds, they looked like. Three yeah. or four big diamond rings on each hand. The Iceman. Why didn't you tell all this to the police? Bert! Bert, who are you talking to? Don't you dare say a word about that poor girl. That's why. That is why. Sandra always says, keep your mouth shut and you keep out of trouble. But me, I don't know. I just love... Bert, talk. stop! Talking too much and close that door. Yes, Sandra, dear. I'm closing it. The Iceman. I'd heard about him for years, a Chicago import, but I'd never bumped into him before. He'd been headquartering at the Red Spot Cafe, the uh, kind of a place that Skid Row winos visit when they want to slum. It was dark inside, but I strode manfully to the bar. Yeah, something. The Iceman here? What do you want him for, huh? He's a friend of mine. You're a friend of whose? What are you giving me? You got bull written all over you from the top of your stupid head to the bottom of your flat feet. He had the tan suit, the flashy rings, the dark shirt, and the wide-brimmed hat. He stared at me with eyes that were icy and insolent. He rubbed the knuckles of one hand into the palm of the other as if he just ached for a chance to bruise them, which I was sure he did. Four guys sauntered over to lean on the piano, and as ugly as they were, I knew it wasn't a barbershop quartet. Two more left the bar and stood behind him, and a few others got up from nearby tables and joined the group. I should have brought my team, but I hadn't. You're a friend of mine, huh? Well, if it isn't Claude Bettering, the juvenile delinquent of 1940. Is that so? Now, you're a real brain. Who are you, Brainy? Sam Spade. Oh, now, ain't that a pretty name? You got something on your mind? I just wanted to talk with you about what you did to a girl named Louise Miller tonight. Never heard of her. Sounds cute, though. Girls are a lot easier to push around, aren't they, Claude? Call me Ice. Claude? (laughs) Some guys are just as easy as some dames. Where have I been all night tonight, fellas? Here, Ice. You heard that, Spade? I've been here all night. Any of you guys ever hear of a Louise Miller? Uh, sorry, nobody ever heard of her, see? Well, she has a lot of friends who have. The police, the people down at Mercy Hospital, and me. And uh, none of us are going to forget her. Or uh, what happened to her. And who did it. Got something you'd like to do right now, maybe? Yeah. But I'll pick my time. All right. Enough of this cheap chatter. I don't want to be seen talking with you too long. I got my reputation to think about. 
Now blow before I take one hand out of my pocket and push your stinking face back through that door. You'll need both hands, Samson. <laughs> Go on, you creep. Fellas. All right. As I went rapidly through the door, Claude Bettering was standing, oily smile and all, polishing a couple of his oversized rings on his lapel. It was a picture I said I wouldn't forget, and I didn't. I went and rented myself a car, parked it down the block from the Red Spot Cafe, and waited almost all night. I knew that Louise Miller was not the kind of a girl who would have anything to do with a guy like Bettering. And if he came to her apartment, this must have been for some unloving purpose. Probably to keep her from telling who actually did the holdup Ben Comiskey had confessed to, if she found out the truth. Finally, a bunch of palookas came out, Bettering included, climbed into a car and drove off, me after them. One by one, Bettering dropped his men off at their hotels and apartments until he was finally alone. He uh, stopped at a brownstone on Hobart, and I caught him just as he opened the door of his apartment. Well, the tough guy. You're going to find out. Don't think I'm easy. And he wasn't easy. He was three inches shorter and 25 pounds lighter, and wherever he had picked up his reputation for toughness, he earned it. But I never enjoyed a fight in my life any more than that one. I batted him through his knees and then to the floor, and he still wouldn't give up. You stinking creep. Why did you beat up Louise Miller? I didn't. Why? I didn't. Why? I didn't. Why? I... The apartment house manager identified you. He's a liar. Who did you do it for? Nobody. Who? Nobody. Who? You stinking creep. I'll push your face. In. Who? Who? Push your face. In. He went out. Quite a guy, the Iceman. I used his phone to call the police and tell them to pick him up for attempted murder. Then, with dawn coming up and my energy going down, I went back to the city jail, got a pass, and woke up Ben Comiskey. Why don't you stop messing around in my business, Spade? Did you ever really love that girl of yours? Get out, you sadistic jerk. Well, she's in Mercy Hospital now. You can send her a card. Write something nasty on it. So long. Spade. Yeah? What? What? What's she in the hospital about? What do you care? Tell me, please. Somebody turned on the gas in her apartment and tried to kill her. It's nothing, really. Please. Who did it? Who did it, Spade? I think it was a guy named Claude Bettering. They call him the Iceman in certain circles. But why? That's what I'd like to know. Who's Bettering? I don't know. Your girl believed you were innocent, Comiskey, but you said you weren't. My guess is that somebody figured she knew something and tried to shut her up. I think uh, Bettering was hired by somebody. Spade, look, I, I don't have any dough, see? But I want to get out of here for one day. Do you know anybody who can raise the bail? I, I won't skip, and I'll pay back anything you want. Why? I got to see somebody. I don't think I can. Who do you want to see? My lousy, dirty, low-down, no-good brother. He hired Bettering? Who else? He did everything. He's always done everything wrong. He held up that liquor store, but he's on parole, a two-time felony offender. One more rap and he'd go up for 20 years. I did this for him. Yeah, look at me. I did it for him, and he tries to kill my girl. Your mother said he was a good boy, hardworking, lived in Cincinnati. Me again. I told her all that. She believed it. I started the whole stupid lie and had to go through with it. I could explain two years, three years to her, but not 20. He promised he'd go straight. He promised... I see. I even sent her money I earned and said it was from him. Oh, you never saw anybody like me before, did you? No, I haven't. Get me out. Get me out, Sam, and I'll drag him in by his back teeth. Thanks anyway, but I'll do it myself. Spade, let me do it. Let me do it, please. I drove over to Mrs. Comiskey's house and knocked on her door. She came out in a house coat, hair must, and sleep still in her eyes. Yes? I'm uh, sorry to bother you at this hour, Mrs. Comiskey, but is your son home, Jimmy? Uh, Jim? No, he went He went out last night. He didn't come back yet. I see. Uh, when do you expect him? Well, he didn't say. 
He didn't have to because I saw a closet door move and I was in and across the room. In a second, I pulled the door back and Jim Comiskey came out, gun and all. Jim! Jim! Jim, don't! You're going crazy! She hurried across the room, threw herself between Jimmy and me, and started wrestling the gun away from him. He put one hand flat on her face and knocked her halfway across the room. I went at him. He shot, but it went into the ceiling. I didn't give him a chance to do it again. Don't! Don't! You held up the liquor store, didn't you? Yeah. And hired Battery to kill Louise Miller? Yeah. And you're going to take your own rap from now on? Yeah. Yes, I will. And he did. Period. End of report. Oh, Sam. That poor old lady. Yeah. Yeah, she lived in a dream world built by a son who had too much heart and not enough common sense. But, Sam, that that man in the liquor store identified Ben as the holdup man. Well, when he saw the both brothers together, he realized he'd made a mistake. At night, with a hat pulled down and a collar up, anybody could have confused the Comiskey brothers. Sam, why is the world so cruel? Because people live in it. I'll go on and type it up, huh? Well, here it is, Sam. And if you don't mind my saying so, it's a lesson to everybody. If you say so, Ed. Honest, Sam, I'm just infuriated. Now, now, don't go too far. Misplaced love, devotion, it just isn't right. Now, hand me the glass. Well, this kind of thing could be going on all Glass, uh... If it weren't for people like you who step in and take things in hand. Take the glass! Oh! Here you are, Sam. Thank you, Miss Brain. Honestly, Sam. Well, just honestly, that's all. Are you finished? Well, I... Well, just... I, I have some sociological feelings, too. I'm just not an automat or secretary who turn on and off with... Come here. Come here! With each new case, I have feelings... Effie, I just kissed you. I know what... I just kissed you. Oh, Sam. Delayed reaction. Must be the heat. Oh. Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart.